Okay, we are streaming. Hopefully the people can hear me. Just going to get my earbuds in. And um, with that, I'll be counting on these gentlemen to handle everything uh, because I'm going to start a call. And uh, okay, let's start with Jameson. Um, okay, here we are. Hello. There we are, good sir. Okay, we're streaming live, just so you know, and uh, of course I'm just totally unprepared, as always, so I will uh, <laughs> try and uh, just start calling people, and um, let me uh, just message Amanda Ute here, who says she hopes to be available shortly, and uh, so let me um, respond to her with a... Uh, Okay, I will call now so you can jump on at leisure. Uh, I will uh, call now so you can jump on at leisure. There we are. And uh, then follow up with that. And uh, Pac-1 Morales is with us. Oh, I like your new... Uh, you called Pack One, right? Uh, one group member. Yes. Call? Okay, good. Yes. And and so uh, let me add Amanda, and uh, let's also add, uh, of course, uh, Solomon, and hopefully he's there. I know it's his new year, and uh, we will call. Uh, I almost said Reverend Moon, uh, because of course remember uh, the Moon call. Yeah, <laughs> that's right. And, oh yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. It's you know it's very interesting how George Bush was a part. How how George Bush uh, Senior was a part of that. Mm -hmm. Was Junior a part of that too? Not that I know of. Uh, the it was it was definitely a senior thing. Uh, that's uh, something I'll go into again in the future. But um, it's amazing uh, the power that was welded by South Korea at that point in time. Is there anyone we're forgetting at the moment? Uh, Peter, of course, doesn't come on for an hour. But what's um, if you look at the people that I called? Is there anyone else you can think of? I mean, it's all uh, the usual suspects, is right? Brendan. Uh, I added uh, Brendan and uh, what do you call it? And um, I also added Daniel in case he's, you know, well, he usually comes on later, I know, yeah. notice. Right. But, right, you know, just, just in case, you know. Yes, understood, understood. And uh, so um, right now, let's see if anyone's responded in Messenger. So I'll need to go back there. And I'll be counting on everyone, uh, yourself included, to, of course, hold the fort, so to speak. Um, let me go into oh, Messenger. That I can. That I can, sir. Okay. And uh, give him of U.S. Navy CNO on Twitter was sent by Peter Moon. I will call as usual. I will call as usual. Call as usual, sir. And uh, let's see now. Uh, what does Salman say? He must say something. Uh, Pack one uh, got his hard copy yesterday. Uh, cost just ordered. Okay, wonderful. Everybody's got getting in there. Where did Salman go? Uh, is he like uh, that, that's unusual? Salman. Hopefully he's still with us. And uh, let's take a look here. I uh, see no reason why he wouldn't be um, calling. Call. Uh, call and. Uh, Oh, I gotta show you guys the uh, creepy ass thing they're digging out outside of my house, outside uh -huh. the fire hydrant. Oh, could it be any less or more creep, more or less creepy than what you produce as artwork, which looks strangely, like I said, like tattoos on various skins that you've uh, you skinned somebody for their tattoo or something, so you could frame oh. it. Oh. Yeah. Oh, it, it it is actually because it's 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 like right on top of the fire hydrant, and they're claiming that these are lines for Verizon, and I'm like, okay, they're lines for Verizon, yet they only they spent all day with this with this loud machine drilling a hole in in the freaking uh, ground that was like vibrating the entire basement, and they, <laughs> and. Wow. Uh, and whatever they put down, they just covered it with like some black black cement, and that was it. And it's just a small patch of land, and and there's some area up the block because uh, I guess they were moving these lines that Verizon had. Um, I guess they had these they had these ugly ass things that popped out of the ground that looked like these uh, these sort of cubicle these large green cubes that held held all the wires and shit. Mm -hmm. But um, well, you know I. 
I, I was just thinking I was just thinking about the way they had put like the surveillance uh, system, the, the surveillance outside your home across across the street. And I was like, man, I hope they're not trying to pull some shit like that. <laughs> well, even if they were, what would it matter? I mean, it's like, uh, what would they find out about you that they don't already know? I mean, that, that's well, what puzzles my, me is well, why they. Well, my concern, my concern isn't what they would find out. My con- uh, everyone knows I'm pretty much a transparent case to begin with right. uh my my concern would be them trying to cut the broadcast like while we're or like they were doing, doing with me doing live shows yeah yeah, yeah. and, and yeah took... yeah that that's my concern uh and uh so uh that's uh that definitely a concern and i appreciate that uh i you know but remember what they were doing with me was at the root of the broadcast whereas uh in in your case um you know, the call is, is riding on me as opposed to anyone else. Whereas before it was vulnerable, it is not vulnerable now in that sense. So right. the, the, the only thing they could do is cut you off, which would be uh, uh, a problem. It would be a problem because you're the only person I have as relief, really. <laughs> so uh, that's a problem. Uh, but uh, other than that, it's not much of a problem. Uh, it's a problem enough, but... Um, you know, so but if they're that desperate, where they're just going to cut off my relief, then uh, you know that's that's pretty fucking lame. Even though as important as you are, you get my point. Uh, yeah, it, it's, you know, I, I do. I mean, it's not like I'm. Uh, it's not like I'm whistleblowing or anything in my free time. I'm just. I'm just. Uh, that, I'm just recovering from a hangover right now. So I mean, <laughs> that's 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 my day. Yes. Yes, and definitely appreciate it. Uh, you know, we're, we're right up there together with the hangover. And um, Okay, so let me try and uh, ask you, despite your hangover, to, uh, you know, uh, do what you can to... Uh, uh, it looks like Salman's not with us for whatever reason. No, actually, he, he just came on. Oh, did he? Okay, thank God. Um, so, Salman, I definitely appreciate your being here more than I can express. Happy New Year. And uh, do uh, express to us how you're even able to spare the time to be with us on uh, on, on New Year's Day. Uh, deeply appreciate it, and I hope that you've had some time to spend with your family and loved ones on this day. And, um, and you can tell us a bit about that as well and whatever plans you have over the next few days. <laughs> well, that was, so you said he was on or well, did he, did well, he see well, you? Well, I see well I see his icon. Um okay. he, he he might not be available for whatever reason. Um so in, you know in that case I could sort of hold down the stage. Um yes, yes I'm sure you can and uh I'll count on you to do so. So uh what about uh with uh let me see is there anyone else who's coming up pack one did you call him i forgot yes i did oh, i did okay. uh, so he's, he, on. he's he's on in that sense he's on in that sense he, he was on and he just uh he went off so i think that he was uh he might be busy with something okay. uh, you want me to try him again sure by all means uh see what you can uh i, I mean scare i don't up. and uh that's because you know as is always the case when i come back from these holidays <laughs> Uh, okay, I heard something. What was that? Okay, okay, that's probably uh, that's, uh, uh, brother Shake. Are you there? Hey, uh, that's, okay, no, no, no. That, that was probably uh, that was probably Peck, uh, because I was calling Peck Juan. Mm-hmm. That because you were calling Pack One, what? <laughs> then no, uh, no, 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 no. happened, or uh, I'm not even looking at what's going on. I think the... I think we uh, Salmon Shake is back. I think. Uh... Do you hear me, Brother Douglas? Finally, yes. Thank God. What is going on with you? Are you all right? Having some uh, issues with my microphone. Okay. So apologies. Oh, no worries. Yes. Hopefully that can be fixed uh, before our next interview because that's. Uh, you know, I, I understand the problems with these technical things, and I don't know what kind of microphone you have, a Yeti or whatever. Is I, I have a Yeti, and every once in a while you just have to buy a new one because, yeah. the, you know, 
Uh, but other than that, we can hear you now. And I don't know if you heard what I said, but Happy New Year. And uh, certainly we are um, ecstatic that you could find time with us at, in such an important time as New Year. So uh, inform us what you are doing with your family. Hopefully you had some time to spend with them. And also let us know uh, what plans you have over the next few days, because this uh, this New Year's period lasts uh, more than uh, a single day, of course. It's like Asian Lunar New Year um, in that sense that it's about uh, three, four days. And um, you can tell us what your personal, uh, uh, shall we say, uh, routine is for uh, for these times, especially in COVID, of course, the routine always changes. But yeah. um, anyhow, God bless you. Thank you so much for being with us and, and present us with, uh, of course, uh, everything that's going on with yourself right now. Yes, Brother Douglas. My apologies. I was running a little late and also had some technical difficulties with the mic, but I'm glad to be here. I w wouldn't want to spend Islamic New Year's any other way than with JMO and Brother Douglas and all of Team D. And the, the be beauty of um, the Islamic New Year is that basically you have this time that you spend with your, your family to commemorate the New Year that, that's ahead with all of its challenges, rewards, and basically, you realize that both good times and bad times come from Allah. And you have to learn how to embrace it with the challenges and the rewards. And just know and pray that you are given the strength by that divinity to be able to handle those challenges. So today basically was the start of 1443 AH. And AH represents after Hijra, which is when the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, and his companions were persecuted by the Quraysh tribe and the idol worshippers in Mecca. That's when they had uh, basically migrated. So that, that basically starts the official history of Islam, uh, basically all, like almost 1400 years ago. So this year, it basically marks, they call it Muharram to the month of Muharram. So we just spend time with family. We have gatherings. I was just with my family a little while ago. So I had to get all of that situated, spend time with them and uh, spend time with all of you tonight as well. So it, it all works out with a balance, and we just pray. And I pray for you, JMO, all of our t team, Dietrich, Daniel, that Allah blesses all of us for the new year ahead with, with everything that we deserve and more in terms of all the greatness that is yet, yet ahead in terms of what we're doing for humanity, for ourselves, for our families. And it's just a blessing, Brother Douglas, and I greet you. With Aslam Alaikum, peace be with you, JMO, all of us, and may God Allah give us good prosperity and rewards for the year ahead for what we're doing against the cult and what we're doing for humanity in all of this um, this great time that we're living in. It's such a um, interesting time to be alive, and as I even spoke with the elders of the family, that that the human family is going through a basically an interesting period for these next 10 to 20 years and it's definitely interesting to see where is humanity going to go from this point on and how are things going to change such as jobs and relationships and the ways people make a living to support their families as we head into this like really technical and connected world with the internet so i had some interesting conversations with the family as well and it's it's everything is usually a food for thought as we're in this life to basically increase our light, our knowledge, try to be the best that we can be and abide by all of the lessons that come and reflect that, OK, the previous Islamic New Year, I could have done this better. I could have said this better. I could have uh, treated somebody better. So when, when the New Year starts, you think of the time when the prophet, peace be upon him, and his companions were being persecuted by the pagans and think all of their sacrifice, all of their struggle, just to get you to this point, you don't want to let them down. You have to continue to keep fighting the good fight, keep that fire burning inside of you, and do the best that you can in your life, in your education, in your family, for yourself. And that's that's the beauty of uh, this entire uh, New Year's, Brother Douglas, is just to just do what we're doing right now. That basically represents what what is what what does the new year represent is to always stand up for the right thing mm. yes thank you that is beautiful of course everything that you say is always uh pure art and uh flows 
as poetry. Uh, and, um, and because of that, I'm simply blessed to have you with us. Uh, honestly, the both of you gentlemen, and you're both uh, poets, of course, and I will count on both of you with your poetic talent to hold the stage while I make myself some tea and uh, I'll be back in about 10 or 15 minutes and uh, when we bring Peter Moon on by that time hopefully I'll be oxygenated and caffeinated enough to uh, uh, come out of one crash uh, from drug abuse and, <laughs> and merge into another and uh, that way we uh, you know follow the usual cycle of crash and uh, and and uh, stimulant uh, etc that um, it, that is so indicative of uh, what would normally be a spiraling lifestyle of course uh, uh, honestly I'm one of those few people who doesn't delude myself when I say that it's different in my case it was because it really oh, is it really is it Thank really you. is yeah Thank I you. could not do what you do uh, without a doubt and I wouldn't try to man I would say that what little I do is 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 enough um and I do it in the spirit of off well I've learned to do it in the spirit of offering it to uh several the, the deities and you know infernal entities that I work with and it has been yielding pretty good effects I mean I've been I've been having interesting things happen like finding twenty dollar bills on the street and whatnot. So I mean, so oh. <laughs> and, and 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 statistically, that's rare. That that is yes, very much so, especially in this day and age, and especially in a heavily populated area. And um, so um, the universe is responding to us, and uh, this is this is wonderful. Uh, my love for you uh, both is unbounded. Uh, honestly, without you two gentlemen, life would be uh, impossible in terms of carrying out uh, the program. I am going to, of course, now tend to myself and uh, eat, refresh myself. I'll be back in about 10 minutes uh, or so, uh, and uh, I will go mute during that period of time. I'm sure both of you can fill the void. And uh, before I go, I'll take a little look into a uh, live stream. As a matter of fact, uh, this is something that I'll, I'll probably refresh myself just a little bit, come back and deal with the live stream uh, links. Uh, and, um, okay, let's make sure that we're, we're even broadcasting. Let's see what's going on with the studio here. We're trying to connect to the software here. It says excellent connection. I, I know that we're live streaming by the online broadcasting studio, but it looks like we might not be broadcasting. Uh, Sarah Thomas says lighting incense to bless everyone listening. God bless you, Sarah Thomas. She says evening, everyone. So, okay, if she can hear us, then we're we're playing, but maybe no one can see uh, the image. Is How is it? Can both of you see the oh, image? Oh, your image. Yes, yes. I could see your image. Okay. Yeah, I see it. Okay, good, good. So, because I cannot. <laughs> oh, I, I also wanted to comment on one of the uh, images that you posted on the Facebook. I wanted to say nice shirt, the one that says, fuck you. <laughs> yes, yes. Um, I love it. Yes, one of them. Yeah, go on. And I and I noticed you never, dude. You're the one person I've noticed in this um, who never ages. Well, you're very kind. You're very kind, and it, I do age, but it's not necessarily as noticeable. Uh, and uh, of course, a lot of makeup is applied, and uh, there's uh, changes in physiology that do happen at time to time. I mean, my dentist. Uh, maybe I'll speak about this more later. Uh, you, you can bring that up when we're talking to Peter, because uh, I like to rave about the dentist uh, when, when he's here in particular. But uh, the the young lady who was working on putting back the uh, temporary crown the other day and got cement all over my face, and she's got a chip of cement that is actually at the bottom of the temporary crown that uh that i've been you know worrying at with my tongue because it's so irritating but uh, aside from that when she was uh, placing her fingers on either side of my jaw and asking me to open and close my mouth she felt a kind of tension and a snap and she was saying does that hurt and i was explaining to her how they had to unhinge my lower jawbone in order to staple my lungs to my rib cage in the past so she was of course just astonished i mean there's you know that's oh do you have you have one of those jaws that pop when you open it she was saying that and um because cause my mind does the same thing too but not 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 for any reason of uh having you know it just always happened mm-hmm 
Yeah, and that's probably has you might want to speak to somebody about that because that usually has something to do with a kind of uh, tension in the mouth that uh, the dentist would interpret as uh, probably means it's you're prone towards grinding your teeth at night and might need a night guard. Um, uh, so, um, but but uh, you know, so they were talking about that concerning myself, uh, you know, fashioning a night guard, but with, you know, let's, let's get these other teeth fixed first before they even work on something like that. Now, um, thank you everyone for putting in the upvotes that you have, uh, deeply appreciate it. Uh, I'm deeply concerned because I cannot see the image, uh, that I have uh, placed within to, you know, it just keeps telling me that an error occurred. So it's not showing me any image, uh, but I'm glad everyone else is seeing it. And if you can, yes. Okay. And the image also has it has the uh, pay, it has your PayPal on it. It has the subscribe at douglasdietrich.com. Okay, right, right over the young the, right over the young lady's blanket, right? Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Yep. Wonderful. All right, my love to all, and thank you, Sarah Thomas. She says can see images and hear you all. God bless you. I'm so glad it's working for everyone else, um, and uh, that's all that matters. So I will be back soon enough, uh, and um, you know both these gentlemen will keep everyone. Uh, uh, informed and entertained uh, they have plenty to speak of and then we'll um, we'll go in some other directions soon enough the time is flying and uh, certainly glad to see Marcus Grix here uh, Marcus Grix is saying you're live bro and also let us know Marcus Grix if you can see the image is just one of those things that disturbs me because I keep refreshing the page and it, it's not working. Uh, but uh, so long as it's working for everyone else, that's all that, that matters. Uh, God knows what's going on in my section because uh, as uh, the, um, uh, oh, uh, the techno geek, I think he calls himself or something, cyber geek or techno geek, as he was saying, of course, uh, even with Comcast doing what they, they can, uh, they won't be doing enough yet until they start my new, this should be they should be starting it now i should be getting four times the internet speed and uh uh but um since they're not charging me for that until next month maybe it doesn't start till next month i, I forget how they operate this thing but it's you know it's just so stupid um all right then is it like so, one of those uh, unlimited data plans uh i i don't know what it is it's it's supposed to just uh it's not the, the term they used uh but it probably removes whatever data caps they have on it now and it, it's frustrating to think of that but that's just like uh you know uh, they, they've got it arranged so that you have to pay more or get a new plan in order to get better service in my case i'm paying less and and so you know i can't wait for this to start uh but it's like one of those things where you start on this annual plan and it starts off cheaper and then after a year they increase it and then that's why i basically change the plan every year uh so uh it's um but uh, each time it works out to, to the benefit because they're offering something new. Uh, but it's just, you know, it, it's just so it's, much. It's, it's something that should have been a given from the beginning because uh, I remember there was a time when they didn't really even cap data like that. You yeah, know? Yes, like, yes. But then they it's, it's like it's like yeah. It's like, what the fuck, man? It's like everything they can gouge. Everything they could gouge money out of, they're going for, and and this is this is a this is what I call runaway capitalism, which is as broken as fuck. In which the people on the alt right are always like, "We need free capital. <laughs> <laughs> we need to be able to do whatever we want." And they're the ones getting fucked by it. Yes, no, that's a that's a good um, that's a good topic to start off with is the fact that companies uh, have too much power and their prices are they're raising their prices now uh, uh, more than they have before. It's uh, uh, so it's yeah, it's 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 a problem. And um, so aside from that, I did receive the envelope from Salman Sheikh with his wonderful letter. And uh, it has the $100 money order. God bless you, Salman Sheikh. And of course, um, I, I want to let our man um, Stephen Myers know that I'll try and email him the link um, sometime soon uh, towards uh, the show dedicated to himself, which was the... Um, 
uh, last transmission before tonight's. Um, Salman Sheikh, the only reason I haven't dedicated a show to him is because uh, we have the fortune of having him on with us. And so we have a kind of uh, symbiotic relationship uh, where um, we at least are, you know, every show is dedicated to Salman Sheikh in its own way. <laughs> and it changed Thank you, brother Douglas. Yes. Much love to you. And I encourage everybody on Team Dietrich that if you're capable to do so, please send brother Douglas whatever support that you can than your capability to do so he needs our help and he needs our support and that cannot be emphasized enough and it's very important that we stand behind him yeah thank you god bless you and and i certainly do need all the uh support that uh people can spare in hard times like this of course it's a, a miracle that i get help from the people that I do, uh, but uh, certainly if it does not put yourself out, uh, you know, your assistance is always, uh, it's always needed. And uh, he, it's, it's just one of those things where um, it's the nature of the beast. And uh, yeah, I'm just very thankful that only due to the fortune of uh, good deeds that I did in the past. And well, I don't know if buying children off the street is a good deed, but <laughs> that's how I wound up with a surrogate son who's able to at least supply me uh, a, a, um, a life that I otherwise would not be exposed to and uh, provides me sustenance that otherwise I would have to prowl for. Uh, and um, I related the story about how when times were hard uh, back uh, when I was uh, much younger, I uh, could easily just lure tourists into alleys while in drag and uh, ineffectively mug them. Uh, it was uh, a lot different in those days. Uh, of course, uh, San Francisco is one of the few places where people still carry cash, especially tourists, because they're trying to hit prostitutes or uh, street hustlers, and therefore cash is what is used. However, all of that is changing now. It is, it's uh, when you take prostitutes to hotels, uh, you don't want this on the record where your employers can see it or your wife can see it. So therefore you go to hotels that take cash, but there's no, there's less and less hotels that are taking cash now. Uh, so it's become more and more impossible uh, to uh, e even uh, have tourists that are, that are carrying money anymore to even find that. Of course, at this point in my life, uh, uh, as I speculated, if I didn't have access to uh, the transfusion associates, as they're called, the Harima blood boys that are maintained by the particular Silicon Valley mogul that my son is married to, then I wouldn't have the, the access to blood that uh, sustains me, uh, and I would have to prowl for it, and that would mean that I'd be mugging people for their blood instead of money. Uh, and uh, either way, this is... This is we, just has the potential to get too problematic without your help. So <laughs> I do appreciate everyone to, uh, you know, uh, donate what they can, uh, if they can. Uh, but uh, yes, uh, I'll leave these two gentlemen to speak about whatever they wish, but uh, companies possessing too much power and taking advantage of that to jack up the prices exorbitantly in whatever it is that they're, they're pushing, usually services these days, as opposed to even uh, products. Uh, then, uh, yeah, yeah, it's it's almost entirely a service sector. It's it's not even uh, we're not even producing anything. We're not even manufacturing any real physical hard products anymore. Yeah, yeah, and and um, anyhow, let me go mute. I'll leave you two gentlemen to talk. And again, I want to thank our man uh, Jameson Reese for putting a face on his icon uh, that isn't some bizarre demonic goofy little homunculus and, uh, <laughs> and do that I'll go mute yeah, and, um, yeah, yeah my demon Spongebob yes yes uh, alright then both you gentlemen thank you so much I'll, I'll be right back so so uh, Salman I was listening to the guy you interviewed like uh the other day um with the kings of Edom I found yeah. that very fascinating um I honestly would never have even known that there was a uh, a family or a group of people who have like that level of power who are just all over the world Oh yes you know? definitely brother Jmo and you know that even that episode uh, the the first one that I did, basically, he's a Sufi whistleblower. That first he lived in America, and then he ended up going to Germany. And even there, the cult was giving him and his wife a hard time there. They ended up poisoning his wife, and his wife passed away 
God rest her soul in peace. And with himself and his daughter, he went to Australia about a few years ago, and he's been there since. And he's like in a, um, a safe part of Australia. So he's been okay there and doing what he's doing from that part. But it's it's interesting what he described about the cults of the kings of Edom, that no matter where you go, JMO, that you will be in this struggle, that if you're struggling against the cult, even our stream, like midstream, you saw that it got attacked where it got interrupted. By- oh, yeah, 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 yeah. That was very interesting. That was ex- uh, they literally just shut. They, they literally just tried to shut them out. Yeah, that's that's right. And um, it's it's very interesting because everything that what Brother Douglas is saying, he's confirming everything, even as a um, Sufi whistleblower and somebody who's like on his own side of the spectrum of things. And he's confirming. I, I even discussed about the um, the anti-vax propaganda going on besides like, you know, his uh, persecution by the cult. And he said it's all Dugan and all of these um, people yeah. that are mixing in with the right wing crowd in America so he wants to come back and speak with me um, in the future to talk about this anti-COVID propaganda and this anti-vax propaganda and why Dugan is behind. And a lot of the Russians with, who are basically preying upon the right wing um, people in America to basically use them as their conduits to push that nonsense here in America and why many of the why the infrastructure is getting harmed by that with the waves and COVID coming back and the Delta coming back. Because there's a certain fraction of the population that is not following what's being advised. It's because of these little cultists like Dugan and his crowd and the, you know, the cults of the kings of Edom. So all all of that is true. And I'm glad that Brother Douglas, with all of his years of knowledge and what he's been telling people, is being vindicated from other sources as well who are verifying all of his info. Yeah, I mean, uh, this is this is something that goes. Uh, this goes far deeper than the uh, what do you call it? Those George Soros or Bill Gates or all those regular billionaires who everyone keeps you know propping up as being the source of all this stuff. Yeah. I mean, those those guys are pretty much fall guys. Mm-hmm. And um, this uh, the the cult of the kings of Edom. They're international. Um, they have so much money and power. It's not. They have so much money, and they're in such high positions of power. It's not funny. Yes. And, and that, what, that's what he emphasized, Jamo, is that um, basically the top leadership positions of all races, religions, countries, and groups, they're all connected to the cult in some way. While those your average rank and file member of any said organization has no idea what's going on at the top. Yes, and I, I believe that what they're trying to do is exterminate a large amount of the population. Mm. And uh, I see that actively happening with them, uh, you know, doing this all, all this uh, propaganda against vaccines and whatnot. They are, they're, sub- they're basically using a tactic of subversion to try to just, you know, rip, you know, countries apart from the inside out. And uh, for people who don't think that COVID-19 is that much of a financial impact, it, it, it's, it's, it has a devastating impact on many nations yeah, economically. Yeah, that's right. I, I agree with you completely. And people have to take this seriously, Brother J-Mo. And uh, even myself, I'll have my second vaccination on the 24th of this month. So... Once I have that, I'll be fully vaccinated and I will still continue to wear the mask because it's not always it's, it's not always about you or it's not always about me. It's about others, too, that you yes. don't spread, spread this virus. But it's, you know, like what I said, it's the people in the West. They, they are just being used by these cultists to spread this anti-vax propaganda. I mean, in my home country of Pakistan, because uh, it comes from an Eastern culture, they have their own issues. But. I'm glad that in the aspect of discipline, they were able to get things under control in terms of making sure that they're wearing masks. They got the vaccines and they were getting fined for those that were not following it. So and they said, if you want to run a business, you want to go to school, you want to do this or that, you you basically have to get them to get their act together. So I'm glad that some countries are getting this situation under control. And there was somebody that I knew 
from Pakistan that got the Delta and they died within seven days. So you're right. The cult doesn't want the people here in America to take it serious because it, it only helps them when people get sick and die. Exactly. And and the thing is, uh, uh, when you have a sick population, that, that puts a tremendous strain on the government. That puts yeah. a str- tr- tr- uh, tremendous strain on the uh, economic system. And what this does is it further... It takes whatever middle class there would have been and pushes them into the lower lower echelon, so that it's just the high and middle and low class, which we have, uh, which we will wind up having just two classes: a slave class and a uh, wealthy elite class. That's yeah. exactly what they want. That's exactly right. Have you ever seen that movie from Hollywood called uh, Elysium? Yes, I did. I did. I remember seeing that uh, years ago. So you you see like uh, what's resembled in that movie, right, where you have these billionaires that have kind of escaped off the space and you have this uh, basically this working population that's left alone on Earth while these other guys have kind of es- escaped on their own. Um, I guess this uh, the civilization that they have off world. And it just goes to show you that that's basically the cult kind of giving you a message in that movie, even though like it's got its like own story, which is fiction. But it's still resembling what you're perfectly describing that they just want a certain types of classes eliminated so they could have more control over lesser people. Exactly. They'll have more they'll have control over more people because uh, there, there, there won't be uh, there won't be anyone who's competing with them. They won't have any yeah. competition, and uh, they'll basically be able to do whatever degraded and deranged things they do, which don't seem to serve anyone's purposes. I mean, mo- most yeah. of what they seem to do is just kill people. That's all they seem to be good at. Yeah, that's that's exactly right. But you know, ultimately, we look at these things that are happening in the world. I believe something will come out of it, and I, I, I think only time will tell. Right now, we're in the 2020s and the early 2020s. Now we'll be in 2022 uh, in a in a few months down the road, and it's just this decade is just going to be interesting with the bio warfare and with these different diseases that are coming. Now, this Sufi Sheikh Jamo, he believes uh, the the aspect of COVID that it's something that is. Um, I mean, most people say that it's like uh, was created in a lab or it was uh, it was, I guess, from the animals or whatever theories that are out there that are not confirmed. Now, this shake says that this is basically from God directly. This is a this is an off world virus that came here to basically tell humanity to get its act together. And we're still not doing the right thing. We're still hurting each other. We're still depriving each other of resources. There's chaos, war, disease. So from his point of view, he believes that this virus is real and we need to take it seriously. And this is basically an off world test from almighty God himself for humanity is that let's see how you will survive this test. And it's unfortunate that even with something as uh, as with a calamity like of this level, we're still not taking it seriously. And you still have the cultists and these different agents of darkness and chaos that are basically misguiding humanity they're misguiding them and and the aspect of these different people that are saying that oh this is going to happen to you that's going to happen to you Uh, there's so many people that i know that got the vaccine they're absolutely fine and i know so many healthcare workers even here in the philly area jmo that are just frustrated they're saying what are we supposed to do we're trying to save lives but people are just not listening to us yeah, I've encountered people in Staten Island, you know, even in the hospitals who are not vaccinated. Yeah. And, you know, they, you, sometimes you'll see nursing staff walking around who aren't vaccinated. I don't know if they're vaccinated or not. I don't I don't ask them, but they'll be walking around with, like, no mask on and whatnot. Yeah, yeah, that's and, right. I mean, it's just lack of consideration. That's what it is. And, 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 and it's just, it's very concerning. Um what basically what they're basically doing is just watching us tear each other apart vi- pretty, pretty uh, much virologically um and it's interesting you said that this was a sort of divine uh a divine uh thing because uh that is that that 
that aligns with the gnosis that I believe uh, some of the people of the left-hand path within the uh, occult world were also echoing. Yeah, exactly. And this Sufi Sheikh, besides being a Sufi master, he's also what you call a white occultist. That's what he describes himself as. So him following the path that he did, experiencing heartbreak with his wife and his father, the same way that Douglas's family was affected in that same manner by standing up against these forces. That's basically his analysis of it, is that this is a off-world test from the divinity. But unfortunately, even with something of this level, humanity still continues to fall down even lower and lower. So I, I, it's interesting that even those from the left-hand path have that same analysis. Yeah, they had attributed this to being the work of a uh, one of the four horsemen uh, of the apocalypse. Uh, they had uh, they had attributed it to uh, Ethnorox. Um, mm. Now uh, the Ethnorox deals with death. There's one that deals with uh, plague. There's one that deals with like uh, famine. There's one that deals with like uh, where's it? Uh, we have uh, Ethnorox, Streefax, Zaltar, and um, oh my goodness. And uh, and, and, and uh, I was just curious as to uh, the, these names. Uh, this is a particular oh, kind uh, of uh, uh, Agraxith. Yes, yes, Agraxith. Yeah, yeah. These the oh, well, these are the beings who are supposed to be working with. Uh, um, they're supposed to be working with Abaddon mm -hmm. and uh, the god Apep to sort of uh, bring humankind to its end. It's close. Uh, so these are like sort of like uh, they would I, I, I wouldn't more or less consider them anti-gods since they are serving a divine purpose. But they uh, the purpose they serve is they're like the four horsemen of death of the apocalypse or something. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that makes complete sense. And that's the same thing that the uh, the sheikh was professing in like from his like white occultist background. It's the same exact version. Mm hmm. And, and so, uh, it, both of you gentlemen, of course, we're speaking about magic. I'll probably be forced to speak about that tonight in Arc of Narrative. Uh, and uh, it's something that I don't usually speak of, but uh, the situation, the historical situation demands it. I'll be covering, of course, uh, the Hiroshima and Nagasaki bombings. And uh, that will uh, require me to go in areas that I've never gone into before, simply because most of the time uh, we were covering more technical aspects of uh, those terror attacks on uh, Japan. Uh, just so people understand, of course, there's many historical convergences uh, this weekend, uh, in, and I'll go over them. Uh, but uh, in terms of uh, Sarah Thomas, she says, uh, yes, love that interview also, JMO, fantastic, Salman. So I guess the two of you gentlemen were referring to your interview that you conducted, uh, Jameson being interviewed by Salman Sheikh, correct? No, no. Uh, I was talking about the interview that Salman Sheikh did with another gentleman on the uh, cults of the kings, kings of Edom. Okay, and it and, was it was like yeah. a, a third part, and so uh, I had wound up uh, because I had uh, listened to that interview. It really intrigued me how um, how many uh, how there are uh, how there's an sort of Arabic uh, family. What do they call themselves? The Baha'i or something? Yeah, so that, there are like these uh, different elite families and different elite occult families that this uh, sheikh was describing. And basically in his uh, information that he provided, he proves everything what Brother Douglas is saying in terms of his own persecution by the cult and how when he was in America, then he ended up going to Germany. And in Germany, the cult had ended up poisoning his wife and he <sighs> took his himself and his daughter because their life was in danger he had it basically went to a uh, like a country area in australia where it's like relatively more safer than being in germany or the states at, at the moment so he he describes everything about these different cults that these really powerful elite families that are in the middle east because our attention is always on the west that the people running the show are in the west but he describes like some of these real hidden masters that nobody knows about that are really truly running everything and he describes that the cult that all races religions countries and groups and leadership positions of top 
uh, I guess, national places in general that they're all connected to the cult in some way while your average rank and file member doesn't know what they're defending or who they're serving. And he describes his like persecution and basically the loss of his father, the loss of his wife and everything. Uh, I even bring up Douglas in the interview and he confirms everything what Brother Douglas is saying as the truth. And this is from a, a Sufi perspective, which goes to show that this is not to be taken lightly, especially with the type of knowledge that Brother Douglas is providing all of us, that we have to understand his solutions and the things that he's teaching us and know that there is a real problem out there with these agents of chaos and how can we through education and awareness can take a stand against them so Bro brother douglas is making a big difference in the world and I'm, I'm grateful for that god bless you i'm very honored and uh, privileged in in that sense and I certainly appreciate the fact that you are uh, verifying, validating what I'm saying by consulting people who would be the primary targets of this kind of persecution. Uh, honestly, these uh, individuals, each in their own way, is reliving the persecution of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, in their own way. Uh, it's, uh, it's the same as Christians... Uh, uh, who are martyred uh, in the sense that they uh, uh, are persecuted for their beliefs to the point where uh, at points in history they literally die for them. Uh, this is really where we're at right now. And uh, it starts, of course, with a character assassination. And as uh, Salman Sheikh once uh, related to something that I, I think really cannot be overemphasized, uh, it's a situation where, of course, not only do they character assassinate you, but um, they harass you to the point where they try to provoke you to respond in such a way that you can be arrested and therefore develop a criminal record. Uh, yes. And uh, so please tell us something about that, examples of your own experience or that of people that you know. Oh, yes, Brother Douglas. I also wanted to emphasize that the people out there, like the decision makers, they are listening to Brother Douglas as someone who plays video games and uh, plays Assassin's Creed and all of that. When Brother Douglas talked about Rat Girl in San Francisco, a little after a little after that, the Assassin's Creed, like the newest franchise that they have out, they announced that we have this expansion coming out called the Siege of Paris. And in that in in, in that uh, Siege of Paris, you play as a female assassin. And she has the power to summon rats to attack her enemies, which kind of like just confirms that, <laughs> that these people are listening to Douglas and they're just following his stuff. So they, they owe you royalties, Brother Douglas, for that uh, putting Rat Girl in, in Assassin's Creed. That's but incredible. <laughs> I, I mean, you know, I, I, it's, you know, I don't know whether to be, whether to be flattered or to uh, be angry. I mean, truthfully, of course, the person who would deserve the royalties would be Rat Girl herself. Uh, and, uh, and, and by the way, it needs to be emphasized that, um, she's, she's not a pleasant individual <laughs> in, in her own way. This is like, uh, but, um, it's interesting that they, they've taken a character who they're trying to pass as sympathetic and giving her this power to, now, now I, I realize you may not have played the game yet or interacted with it. Uh, do you have any idea as to why she has this particular power or, or why she's uh why she would have that resonance with the rodents to be able to control them and moss like that well uh they're gonna release the dlc uh, it's called the dlc which is downloadable content which is basically further episodes for the main game that continues the story so when next week it comes out i, I will find out what it is how she uh the female assassin gets that power to summon rats to attack her enemies and I will make sure I, I share that with you. But in terms of uh, the question that you asked, Brother Douglas, is that you always got to keep your cool because with the cult, they will use things and uh, street theater and different forms of gang stalking just to try to get, to get get for you to react. And this I have relayed this before that when I was going to the dry cleaners one time, there was this gentleman that was walking past and he had this real angry look on his face and he spit at my shoes. And ha had I reacted or, you know, uh, I would have screamed or I would have gotten into a fist fight with him, whatever would have taken place right around the corner. There were two to three patrol cars like these guys were ready for something. 
and a few of them were standing outside. So they, they would have heard the noise. Boom. Okay, now we got them. So if you give somebody a reason to get you, then they'll get you. And that's one thing that I learned living in America from an Eastern perspective is that America is just one big mind game. And especially if you're dealing with uh, like cultists that are after you, as long as you don't give them what they want, it's like a parasite. They eventually, they will not go completely away, but their efforts will kind of get minimized in a way because they know they're not getting a reaction out of you. And nine out of 10, a lot of these guys won't do anything physical because they want you to take the blame for whatever they're trying to set you up for. So you don't have to worry about getting into any kind of fight. It's ultimately your reaction emotionally or I guess from a logical or spiritual point of view that when they do street theater or they do like uh, different kinds of harassment in the car or have certain people walk past you or say something a very personal or private that only you might know. But, you know, they're known to do those kind of things as well to try to get under your skin. Just don't just don't react. And that's one thing with the, with the Sufi Sheikh that I had spoken to. He, he says the same thing. He says that this is a everyday business for me. And once you get used to it, you don't react to it, then you take their power away because at the end, those cultists have no power. Now, look at all these people that try to come after Douglas and try to silence his voice. Douglas is still here, standing strong. Aquino's not here. The Bukaki Beret's not here. There's so many people. (laughs) There's so many people that try to come after him that are just not here because these people, they fall into their own hole and good is always destined to win. And that's why we continue what we're doing with confidence and conviction and positivity, knowing that what's meant to happen will happen. And our and we put our faith in Allah, God, that as long as we stand up against evil, even they know that good will win. So just don't react to them and just basically remind them of their fate when you don't react to them. Yes. Well, I have to. I have to put. I have to say, it depends on the context and situation as well. Because again, we are in a pandemic, and certain things like them mobbing you, like getting in really close proximity to you in mass numbers, can be fatal. So, um, you know, I, yeah, and it's a form of assault. Yeah, you, you, yeah. Honestly, when somebody is coming in this day and age, in an age of pandemic. That is an assault when somebody is like uh, rubbing themselves up against you. <laughs> and, uh, uh, so I, mean, I, I had to call some guy out today because I was like uh, sitting, I was I'm sitting in the ferry and this guy starts to lurk around, and he's like, uh, he's I, I forgot what color he was wearing. He was wearing either red or blue because they always use those colors, you know, the wet, yes. red, white, and blue. You know, it's just the American thing. You know, they're, they're trying to pull that meme. But this guy comes. He, 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 so By I'm, the way, I'm, for, I'm, for those people who don't believe that, the man who try, who assassinated, if for all intents and purposes, George Wallace and uh, basically crippled him for life, which damaged his political career at a time that he was running for president against Richard Nixon. Uh, and, and this was probably arranged via the Richard Nixon himself. Almost certainly he had something to do with it, uh, but that's a whole different subject. But the point was the assassin was dressed in red, white, and blue. If you take a look at his suit, um, the man looks bizarre, he, he, but he's dressed d- basically draped in the American flag. So this is what the uh, the products of these mind control programs uh, promote themselves as patriots. I'm sorry, go on. I just had to yeah validate well, what you're this saying. guy was getting in my space and so i just basically told him straight blank i said i, I told him motherfucker you come up you come you you try to come up in my space i'm gonna fucking knock your ass out and 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 he 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 listened to me and he 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 just went away and went to the other side of the boat and said okay i'm not gonna fuck, 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 fuck <laughs> well you're lucky he responded in that sense it's uh yeah so many people who don't but go on Yes. Yeah, well, well, this goes to show you because uh, with his level of closeness, you know, it would have been a problem for me because you know I'm I'm sitting out back on the ferry boat for a reason. I'm the only one out there, and because the airflow is blowing from the direction that the boat is going, mm-hmm. I I don't have to worry about getting any of those coronavirus particles from people. And so this guy getting up in my space while I'm trying to you know 
drink my uh, drink my uh, beer and whatnot, you know, it, that that's going to be a problem. And 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 uh, I also have brought up in the past that uh, there's there's something in the human psyche that is intrinsically dysfunctional. Uh, I don't believe that this was like gang stalking concerning my experience at all but one time i was i can't remember where was i it was uh, either a uh, like a bus stop or was it a tr it couldn't have been your average bus stop it wasn't the average bus stop that's for sure it was uh something to do like one of the uh, bus stations where you have like a what do they call them a central um kind of like a, a terminal like a, it was either in a terminal or it was the waiting room in a general hospital situation where um, it was empty. It was just you know, it, empty. <laughs> and we're talking about just row after row of what amounts to literally hundreds of seats. And uh, so when I was sitting down, then uh, two black guys uh, come in and, uh, you know, every right to be in the facility as much as myself. But... Uh, for some bizarre reason, they both uh, sit right next to me, uh, and it seems like they both came from opposite ends of the terminal, and they didn't know each other, but, you know, then they sit down, uh, start talking to each other just casually in, in the sense, not that they know each other, almost in the sense of, oh, uh, you think a bus will arrive, or do you think appointment will be called? I can't, you know, I can't remember what the situation was. Of course, this is what happens when you have as many experiences as I do over as many years as I've lived. But uh, the, the was point... it that situation, Brother Douglas, where you were getting a uh, a birthday cake for your parents and you were at that bus stop? No, no, no. That was an actual bus stop. That was an actual bus stop where it was just very small, very, very different situation. But thank you for remembering that. That's a similarity that I was bringing up before, where at that point I did suspect maybe this is a setup in the sense that not again, not even with gang stalking, but I thought of it more as a, set up in terms of petty crime that yeah uh, it was uh, uh what they were trying to do it was it was a coordinated attack they were trying to they were probably trying to size you up and mug you that's that's what i was thinking yeah it it, it struck me as uh by the way the situation that they're referring to in this case was uh where i was a bus stop i was bringing home a cake for um probably my mother if i remember correctly and uh what happened was that this uh, old white lady uh looked fine in presentation what you would say for an older lady uh who presents herself well you would say she's handsome they actually use that term for older ladies uh and uh so she this handsome old lady not particularly well presented in the sense that she's dressed in a refined sense but uh uh color coordinated and uh you clothes are presentable etc it's, it's presented well enough and uh obviously not homeless or or somebody uh impoverished or something like that and uh so she uh, starts talking to me and uh when she starts talking to me and casually she's speaking to me uh then i can smell the uh the, the smoke from the crack pipe of this black guy who looks as thuggish as you can just imagine in terms of a negative ghetto uh presentation of himself uh jamaican dreadlocks uh, he's uh inside of the phone booth which they used to have adjacent to these bus stops they don't have them anymore uh, and uh, which goes to show you it dates the experience to not that long ago, but long enough, uh, probably before some of our listeners were born. Uh, but uh, he, he's he's just smoking in the in the you know the telephone booth next to the bus stop and uh, close enough where I can smell the the crack smoke from his crack pipe, uh, the burning metal, and because they use steel wool to filter their uh, uh, their oh my crack. Gosh. Yeah, yeah. So that steel wool. Yeah. So that burns up and of course goes into their lungs and all that good shit but at any rate um so at that point i said god this this is like a setup it's like they're cooperating together like they somehow met each other on a craigslist or something <laughs> said, let's get together and you know set people up you know the uh uh the fag hag and the uh and and the black thug would set people up at bus stops and and mug them or it's just bizarre so i i wound up 
I, if I remember what I did, I, I, I left the situation, just took my cake <laughs> and wound up walking the rest of the way home, which I had tried to avoid doing. But, you know, it, sometimes it was just better just to walk. Uh, and uh, these days, of course, I wouldn't be in that situation because I take cabs. But then I've told people about the horror of, of the experience with all too many cabs. And it's you're, you're putting your life in the hands of people who you're locked in with, literally locked in with. And you'd better hope they make it to the destination without an accident, because if they have an accident, you're not getting out of that cab alive because you can't get out. They've got you locked in. Uh, literally, you're the prisoner until you reach um, whatever destination you're heading towards. Uh, oh, it's interesting you bring that up because I, I ran across an advertisement where they were they, they had a lawsuit that was uh, going on for like uh, these major uh, cab companies like uh, uh, I don't know uh, name one um, uh, like Uber or something like that you know um, because uh, women were getting sexually assaulted yes. by the cab drivers yes yes that's uh, that... and um, yeah. and it's interesting how on Facebook like I, I these guys uh, obviously these men are like ooh, ooh, ooh. They, they, they're like poking fun at it and i'm like i'm like dudes this is a fucking serious issue thank you how the hell are you how the hell are you pointing uh how the hell are you poking fun at that because they're fucking idiots give me a break it's like the time that i had all the idiots on with me saying uh oh we're gonna talk about women's issues and you know and especially (laughs) justin white's you know (laughs) girlfriend at the time or potential girlfriend someone who would have been his girlfriend uh said oh you know i'd like you to talk about women's issues with douglas dietrich and then when he gets on what do these men talk about uh they they talk about sports and bullshit you know just the things things that men talk about but basically sports you know unbelievable unfucking believable and and just no consciousness whatsoever uh and uh so then i broke in uh basically exposed them as the idiots they were and started then on women's issues i mean this is why women can't relate people uh if there's guys out there wondering why they can't get a date well you know the majority of you aren't worth dating because you don't even care uh to speak to women's issues or uh, even listen to them you you just simply don't fucking care uh and uh that's that's why um uh they are where they are so um okay peter moon just gave me the thumbs up so uh i will be calling him to be bringing him on as for the other case where i was in that uh bus terminal or the general hospital waiting room or whatever uh the 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 first thought that came to my mind by the way i didn't feel particularly threatened by these two black guys i did move (laughs) i I did relocate but uh to a different seat but it was more of just annoyance and uh just with all of these people i've i've always been cognizant of this potential uh as someone who just grew up in in ghettos all of uh my life uh, is that uh you're cognizant that people carry scabies and 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 bed bugs and everything else potentially oh yeah 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 especially especially when people try to brush really close i mean that's 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 horrible especially out here in new york you know yeah yeah in a, in, a, in a congested city, uh, someone getting too close to you, someone brushing right up on you like that, that they they, they can easily uh, have bed bugs, fleas, whatever the hell they have, you know, transfer over to other people. That's been known to happen. Yes. But my, my, my joke was that this is basically some kind of physics phenomenon where they're basically like dust bunnies. It, it's just it's just this is how dust clusters, you know, build up under your mattress. Basically. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. They're, they're, they're like uh, uh, they're like um, attracted to this like negative charge or something. Yes. Yes. All these people that gather for no reason in a, in a completely open space. So Peter Moon is now with us and uh, welcome, Peter. Now that you're here, I can start. Um, I, I, I can start uh, basically, you know, coming to life, so to speak. Uh, oh, shit. I've got some tea that's seeping in the kitchen. I'll go grab that. But fortunately, now that you're here, these two gentlemen and you can hold the stage quite readily. But before I do that, Peter, uh, tell us about what you and I will be doing. Uh, and I'll explain to everybody the convergence of everything that's going on tonight and the convergence of everything that's going on. Wednesday, which you might not be aware of, but it's all part of uh, the phenomenon that you're speaking of, the Montauk biorhythm. Tell us a bit about that and uh, what you want to bring to people's attention concerning that, etc. 
Well, yes, um, this uh, coming Wednesday, four days from now, or is it three days from now, <clears throat> August 11th at 9 p.m., uh, we will, Douglas and I, I, I will be doing the lead in with it, is that we'll be uh, going into an in-depth in depth discussion on what is known as the bi Montauk biorhythm. And the Montauk project climaxed on August 12, 1983. And as I got involved with the Montauk project, Preston Nichols explained that there's a major biorhythm every 20 years. And it runs from August 10th to August 14th. And the Philadelphia experiment uh, connected to the, in 1943 during this time period, connected to the Montauk project in 1983. This was a major biorhythm. And I will be discussing biorhythms, the nature of biorhythms, and as it applies to the bigger picture. Uh, and there's quite a, a lot of historical, the Egyptians consider this the high holy days of Egypt. It was not insignificant to them. Uh, Napoleon recognized it, Cleopatra recognized it, uh, sometimes known as the birthday of Isis. And this is an exciting time. We're coming upon this. So while we'll be giving this discussion uh, on August 11th, which is the anniversary of the date I actually met Dr. David Anderson, and is the anniversary of many of my adventures in Transylvania, not by, um, by intention, but by circumstance. I go... I end up going to Romania during this period because of the scheduling of Atlanticron, the camp I attend and lecture at, not because I want to go to Romania and go, aha, I'm pursuing the biorhythm. Uh, and I generally end up in the cave around that time period uh, or on that time period. I think I went into the cave on the 14th, which is part of that date. Mm -hmm. So this is what we'll be discussing. It's very interesting. It's very fascinating, and anything uh, Douglas has to add uh, will be more than welcome. Uh, another thing I will share with you, Douglas, before we before you take your tea break, mm -hmm. um, is, and I don't know if I mentioned this to you, but I will mention it again, because it, it's right in line with the theme of synchronicity and biorhythm. <clears throat> I, had, uh, I, I, I had signed my contract with uh, L. Ron Hubbard's C organization, mm -hmm. uh, which, which was a billion-year contract on April 28, 1972. Wow. And when I got my walking papers, I, what you call, bureaucratically routed out or left that organization with uh, uh, following their protocol. I didn't just leave. Right. They gave me my walking papers and I, the date was the 28th of April, uh, 1983, 11 years to the day I had officially signed a contract with them. And I thought this was a very, I said, this is weird. I said, why is, I remember the date. I said, because it was the day after my mother's birthday. I said, wow, this is weird. I said, why is this? This was to become a, the new principle of my life, synchronicity. Yes. However, only... Recently, did I realize that this was the day uh, that the peace treaty with Japan went into effect on 28 April 1952, a, uh, approximately nine months or so before I was born. Wow. And yes. this was this. But this is like, wow, Emperor Hirohito's birthday. So yes. I was in synchronization uh, with the Showa emperor, meaning crane emperor. The crane who is uh, heard but not seen, right. and and so I mean, this is this is fascinating stuff to me that I you know the synchronicity carries through my life and it has more meaning now than it did a year ago uh, prior to the publication of, of the Roswell deception, which is is still getting steady sales with it. Uh, Wonderful, it's going good. It'll go better. Yeah, it's just the word is just getting out there. Yes. And it's all guerrilla marketing, really. This is truly an insurgent and subversive form of information distribution. 
this is something that is uh, being done against the will of the establishment. And uh, that's why we had so much fun with uh, uh, Bruce Springsteen and Obama getting together, trying to present themselves as renegades. Uh, honestly, they really want to be as cool as uh, the men around Team Dietrich are. <laughs> that's it's as if they're, you know, fighting from the bottom up, uh, trying to change the world uh, when they're the faces of uh, why we have so many problems, uh, certainly among those faces. Uh, this the, is one of the problems of, of material success is um, in uh, the Grateful Dead being a prime example. Uh, the Grateful Dead were the cutting edge of culture in uh, 1960s San Francisco. They lived right on Haight Street, on, Haight, on the Haight-Ashbury District, yeah. which was the cutting edge of what was going on in America at that time and in, in the whole Western world, actually. Um, and they, and I, I was thinking of a, a concert they gave with many of their peers in the music industry, and they were always weird yes. in the music industry because they didn't do regular sets they just played spontaneously. And it wasn't until they created a couple of albums that they kind of had to force them into regular disciplined songs, The Working Man's Dead and American Beauty, that they really began to catch on. Because then people would buy their records and have coherency. The Grateful Dead's coherency was a uh, an amalgam of spontaneity that was best appreciated under the influence of LSD or some other <laughs> drug. <laughs> yes, because their music it, sucks. It could be yeah. appreciated that way and recognized for spontaneity of creation and interpreted sort of like a dream machine. Yeah. It could not, it was not uh, compatible with mass consumption whatsoever. And that's not making a judgment on whether it was good or bad. It, they weren't consumable. Right. And, and when they would do their regular songs, which they would do in concert, and they would do with often a flourish or an a, added to it, uh, they might turn a, a three-minute song into an 11-minute song and, and enhance it. And if you were on uh, a drug such as marijuana or even getting a contact high from the marijuana, it would be more... Uh, of an, uh, I guess what you'd say, appreciable. Yes. Just like you can appreciate food better if you're uh, under the influence of cannabis. And for those of you who have not taken cannabis, and I'm not recommending you do so, Thank you. you will have a heightened sense of uh, culinary taste. They call it the munchies. <laughs> I don't and, know if that's exactly a heightened sense of culinary taste. It's simply like more like a hunger pang uh, as opposed to that. For some people, maybe the food, maybe they have a heightened sensation concerning the food with the taste buds. But for most people, it's more like just a, like your, your stomach starts gnawing or something like that. But, no, yeah. no, I, I could, I could, I would say, taste. see, taste is a, is a perception. It's a t perception in Scientology. It's a perception in Qigong. It's a perception to anybody. It's one of the five senses or the, when they reduce it to five senses, taste. So like a connoisseur of food uh, can taste subtle things in the food. Um, somebody who just eats meat and potatoes, you know, won't notice subtleties in foreign cuisines. So and I'm not a big one for this. But I, I do have a somewhat refined palate only because I've eaten in different cultures. Right. So, I mean, I, I don't consider myself a, a big aficionado of food. However, I have some appreciation of it. But anyway, I would say my influence under cannabis was distinctly like if I was eating potato chips, I could feel every last uh, taste of the potato chip. If it was a, a piece of meat uh, with with flavoring, I could feel every last flavoring or whatever it was. It was not just a hunger, but wow, this, you know, 
scrambled eggs never tasted like scrambled eggs or whatever it was. It's a heightened sensation, what I would call an amplification of sensation. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's like you're feeling, uh, tasting on steroids. This has been my experience. Mm -hmm. um, and everybody can have, you know, their own experiences. But um, to, to get back to uh, the money uh, spoiling mm -hmm. the cutting edge, like the Grateful Dead were, were on the cutting edge of culture. And that was drug culture. It was rock culture. And it was sort of beyond the frontier. They called themselves, well, they, they when the Grateful Dead, uh, what is it, disbanded, they, when Jerry Garcia died, they called themselves further with a U-R at the end. That was the theme from the famous bus trip of Ken Kesey. We're going further. That was the meme, further. We're going beyond the cutting edge. And so it was, I believe, in the late 60s, there was a, a concert in England which had the Grateful Dead, Joni Mitchell, and people of their ilk, although they weren't exactly from the same crowd. But... And, and what happened was the crowd, which was very leftist, was protesting and they probably even throwing fruit at stage because it wasn't free. And they were insulting uh, the, all the rock bands that were, that were espousing anti-war and peace and love. You're not free. This isn't free. We shouldn't have to pay. And I think the, the rock bands tried to explain to them there's something called economics. And, and here you have the rock musicians trying to convey economics to a communist insurgent crowd. Right. And it's, it's, it was crazy. Now, that they were right to explain that, you know, we can't come here for nothing. You know, uh, they probably weren't even all that wealthy themselves at the time. Uh, Joni Mitchell might be the exception. But the... So, so in other words, the crowd is just, they're young. We want things for free. And what they had to pay to go to a concert then was nothing. I mean, even in today's terms, if it was two and a half bucks, five bucks at the most, and it wasn't that much money. Like, you know, if I, if I remember when I worked as a dishwasher, I made a dollar 80 cents an hour. Minimum wage was a dollar 70 or something. Right. So if you were paying, you know, five dollars, that's a, few hours worth of work and and what would that be today if you were getting minimum wage of something like ten dollars an hour that would be 40 bucks that would be cheap for a concert uh, by today's standards so people were like so the grateful dead became uh a month and nowadays when whoever they, they play whatever they call themselves it's big money involved. They said they can't even quit playing because so many families are supported by the infrastructure it takes to take them from town to town. So it's like they become owned. They become a consumable commodity to the degree they're creating consumable commodities. So they, they become uh, amalgamated into the infrastructure of the establishment by reason of their popularity, it, aside from any of their... Uh, malfeasances or non-malfeasances. So th this is one of the trappings of uh, becoming a consumable. You yeah. become consumable and then you become, uh, you pander to economics and the people who run economics. And, and the equivalent of that today would be a lot of what we saw going on in Seattle. Uh, Brendan Zogit's observation about uh, the individual who was effectively the handler uh, of um, Lena Shea, the man who came in, Zachary Garrett, and uh, just flipped her like a switch. And as soon as uh, she was triggered by his arrival uh, on, on the scene, even though they were at different ends of the North American continent, her behavior based on his arrival into the world of uh, where I interact with people, uh, trying to reassert himself into uh, uh, Team Dietrich in this bizarre way of asking for money uh, for um, uh, supposedly a home invasion and somebody had been murdered, etc. Just the whole bizarre story that came with that doesn't need to be reiterated. But uh, he uh, was uh, continually showing up uh, in um, basically dressed for street battle 
the way so many of the people in Seattle were, which was where he was uh, ensconced at the time, uh, had relocated himself from, uh, you know, he was moving north consistently. It was originally he had started in the American Southwest and then uh, was moving up through um, uh, California into the northern uh, states. And then uh, he was finally there in Seattle just in time for all of the big... uh, uh, battles that were going on, uh, and they were street battles. And of course, people were dying. People can uh, look this up if they don't remember this and uh, confirm there were casualties in the streets. And uh, he, he was, uh, what Brendan uh, ascertained was that he was part of, quote unquote, this Freelandia movement, which was demanding everything for free. So things haven't changed. I mean, you still have lunatics out there who have no concept of economics who just feel that, uh, you know, in these societies where they've tried to eliminate monetary exchange and capital, uh, these collectivized societies, uh, uh, you pay in blood, you pay in blood, sweat and tears, uh, toiling away in the field, uh, trying to produce food uh, en masse, as opposed to uh, working as a wage slave. Uh, and uh, believe me, the wage slave, uh, uh, that lifestyle, as horrible as it is, is preferable <laughs> to working under uh, pain of death uh, for, for no money at all other than food. Uh, so uh, that this is, but this is what they were basically asking for, was that everything be free. It's just bizarre. So this, this kind of mentality hasn't changed. And it's, um, they were predicting for a while uh, so far, this hasn't manifested. Uh, I thought for a while it might, but um, it didn't seem to go anywhere. This kind of info socialism, uh, they were using the stupid term nano socialism uh, for a while uh, that uh, some uh, futurists and, and future trends uh, experts were predicting as a potential kind of terrorist movement. And uh, the concept was that uh, th- these would be people who uh, basically say that there's that, that all information should be free, that there should be no such thing as intellectual property. Uh, the interesting thing is that the communist Chinese certainly act as if there isn't when it comes to everyone else's intellectual property. Uh, they'll copy and steal everything that they can. And uh, the uh, in clone uh, products, uh, whether they're software or automobiles. Uh, But uh, when it comes to uh, the the kind of uh, their own kind of payback or feedback, it's not like they reciprocate. It's not like they offer freely. No. And, And, you know, the United States, if the United States were to completely fall, it is the hallmark of upholding intellectual property, the United States copyright system. Uh, All, other nations kiss the ass of the United States in regard to that. Uh, you wouldn't find such ownership of of, indiv- of intellectual property outside of the United States with such a uh, it's it's much more compromisable mm-hmm. in in say Europe and what is it in Africa? In Africa, they didn't have intellectual property, you know, uh, as such as we would know it in the United States. It's sort of a United States export. Right. Of course, they had it in Europe to some degree, but um, it, it really came of age in the United States. And, and owning intellectual property, uh, I, I have a certain, I guess what you'd say, appreciation of it. However, if you look at who really owns the intellectual property in the United States, most of it, it's Hollywood mm-hmm. and the exploiting of it. Yes. And that is a negative, and and they keep putting out the same movie to keep cashing in so much. And this is, you know, this whole comic book thing where they've been exploiting the comic book properties, and people, even the comic book fans, are getting tired of it. Hollywood will exploit, uh, and you know, it's it's what's the, the phrase Hollywood where old movies go to be remade. <laughs> yes they yeah, die and, and get reincarnated or or quote unquote rebooted <laughs> oh my god it's a form of uh of abuse really as you say uh, by the way so what i'll do is uh I'll, I'll grab my tea i'll be um gone a few minutes because it's steeping and i have to shake out the strainer and all the rest of that uh but uh when i return what i'll do is i'll explain to everybody um what is convergent today uh concerning taiwan father's day today is taiwan 
on Father's Day, and of course I was celebrating uh, throughout the weekend. And uh, it's uh, it, it's a pity that um, I couldn't um, speak to Brendan about some of the things that I was going to speak to him about. I tried to contact him actually. Well, I was uh, up at one of the estates, and uh, you know, my my son dragged me away from that, and that was fine. Everything you know happens as it needs to happen. Uh, but what was interesting was that. Um, uh, I, I found some of these old uh, quote-unquote histo maps that I had shown uh, to our man Jameson Reese the other day when I was talking about Melanesia and I was talking about uh, various uh, things concerning the Australian uh, geopolitics uh, because Louis Rogers in New South Wales had uh, been so kind as to donate 136 Australian dollars, which evens out to $100 uh, in uh, American currency. And uh, because of that, I ran across several things I, I would like to bring to people's attention. And I'll, and I'll go into that, too, when I return, because it's good for Peter to hear these things. And I certainly want his opinion on some current events. Uh, but uh, when it came to everything that went down uh, during the holiday, obviously, I'm just decompressing now. I'm going to grab my tea when I return. I'll, I'll talk about some of these convergent days and just how convergent the Montauk biorhythm is uh, come Wednesday, which is only 72 hours from now, three days from now. And uh, that's when on Wednesday night, as soon as Peter arrives, which will be uh, basically um, 9 p.m. Eastern Daylight Time, then uh, we'll start talking about uh, just how convergent it is because, uh, well, I'll explain it when I return. But in the meantime, I'll count on these two gentlemen, Salman Sheikh and uh, Jameson Reese, to explain to you some of their um, incredible synchronicity they've been experiencing concerning the occult. It is, of course, Muslim New Year, and uh, perhaps uh, Salman Sheikh can give a bit of a background um, into that because it's so much more than even uh, what Salman said. In the um, Islamic uh, tradition, of course, there is uh, uh, Muharram, and uh, he, it basically, by the time that it ends, uh, it's, uh, well, I mean, it ends on the day that is traditionally believed in Islam to be the day that Noah delivered uh, all life on earth, essentially. <laughs> and uh, also, aside from that, uh, if I remember correctly, what was the other traditions uh, that uh, uh, come to mind? Uh, there was, aside from uh, the, um, uh, the significance of uh, the Noachic age uh, that uh, was, um, was always integrated into that, uh, there was, uh, oh yes, there, there was, of course, for the Shia Muslims, uh, the, uh, it's known as Ashura, and uh, that was, of course, the battle in which uh, one of the, the grandson of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, died at the Battle of Karbala. It, now, correct me if I'm wrong on that, isn't that in Afghanistan? Uh, but um, anyhow, I'll leave uh, uh, Salman Sheikh to speak of that. Also, yes, the day of Ashura is significant aside from, uh, I believe the Muslims called Noah Nu as a prophet. They believe him to be a prophet. But uh, it was also the day Musa or Moses was saved from the Pharaoh of Egypt, uh, saved from the Egyptians by Allah. Uh, you know, and, uh, Salman can provide a little context there. I'll go meet for now and I'll be back within a matter of minutes. Yes, uh, Brother Douglas, and good evening to Peter. I hope you're doing well. Thank you. Uh, first, I wanted to say that the uh, the biorhythm, which will occur on August 2023, it's so interesting when I read the Montauk Project, and I highly encourage everyone to check that book out at Skybooks USA. It's um, what's going to happen in August 2023. It's going to be the next general election in the, my home country of Pakistan. And right now there's going to be some, I guess, diplomatic issues between them and India, and both countries are nuclear armed. So if anything happens in that geopolitical part of the world, August 2023, when the next biorhythm happens, would probably be a good probability if uh, something does happen because of the biorhythm and the elections happening. And during the elections, they always tend to do stuff to get, you know, get the sympathy and uh, the support of the voters so that's an interesting part of the world to observe during that time when the biorhythm takes place. And in terms of the uh, the, elect, uh, the, um, the Islamic New Year, today many spiritual people, uh, Brother Peter, also say that this is the Lion's Gate, the 8-8 portal that a lot of the 
spiritual community talks about, but the Islamic New Year in general basically commemorates the persecution of the Prophet at, at Mecca with the Quraysh tribe that was persecuting him, and that basically marks the beginning of Islam. And the, the aspect of this New Year is basically to reflect upon your successes, upon your shortcomings, what could you have done better with your friends and family, what lessons did you learn in terms of suffering, and how can you be a better person for the following year? Is there something that you could think better, do better, know better? Some goals that you can outline for yourself, some things that you try to achieve. And it also te- tells you to believe in faith. And it, the, the word faith in Arabic is called maktub. And maktub is basically telling you to just have faith that everything in your life, you're always going to be where you're meant to be, the people that you're meant to going to be seeing, and the things that you're meant to do. And just how this beautiful aspect of uh, synchronicity and circumstance that you point out, that everything kind of led you to the K, to meeting your wife, to all the stuff in Romania. It's basically the highlight of what this new year is teaching us, too, is to have faith in the grand scheme of things and to just try your best with the time that God has given you in this world. And with Ashura coming up, that's uh, celebrated by the Shias. And also the Sunnis as well, the Sufis, all in Islam in general, which commemorates the uh, the slaying of the grandsons of the Prophet Muhammad by the enemies. So they they celebrate that. Uh, basically, it's basically a mourning in a way. So besides that, it's this is basically a time to give thanks and to believe in the grander power, just like how Brother Douglas pointed out about Noah and Moses, that even though they were in dire circumstances. Uh, God always made a way for them to escape their enemies and the obstacles that got placed in front of them. Okay, thank you. And 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 it's um and it's interesting because uh this aspect now we're looking at these uh these next two years so 2021 and the biorhythm coming in 2023. It's interesting how with the current events and the world with the way that it's taking place within the next two to three years how that will shift. And I would love to get your perspective as well in terms of world events for the next two years, not just in America, but the world in general, in terms of how it's going to lead up to that pivotal uh, moment. Well, the the pivotal moment for me, and I will be discussing this uh, on Wednesday, is August uh, of 2023, when there is a what is called a kite in the sky. And this is very positive. <clears throat> I will uh, digress to some extent while I have this opportunity to discuss. I, I have mentioned in the past that I have a friend who is a medical doctor, a pulmonary specialist, meaning a lung specialist, and he has been on the front lines of COVID. I spoke to him today and I asked him for his candid view on the front lines of what he told me. And <clears throat> I, the first thing I told him was that, that according to data I had read that I didn't know to be correct or incorrect, it sounded reasonable. Uh, I, I heard an immunologist speak on TV, and he said that the the vaccine, if it technically it's really not a vaccine in the traditional sense, but whatever it is, it's a medication that's been identified as a vaccine. It is very narrowly targeted at this specific coronavirus. It's narrowly targeted. And because it is so narrowly targeted, in other words, it's not a general immunity, it's a narrow immunity. So that when the virus receives this threat from the immunity, it then mutates into variants. And because the vaccine is not made to build up the immune system, it makes it vulnerable to the mutations. And if one has a strong immune system that is not dependent upon Uh, vaccines or similar artificial 
inseminated or injected uh, instruments, one has a stronger immunity to these variants. <clears throat> and he said, yes, he agreed with that. He agreed with that. He also told me that the Delta, that it's been very busy and that they don't test for the variant. They just treat the case. And it's been deemed that 80%, at least 80% of the cases are the Delta variant, but they do not test specifically for the Delta variant. They just treat the case. And that he said that, I, I made a comment that it pre predominantly, this seems to be politically uh, identifiable. People who are vaxxers are liberal Democrat, anti-vaxxers tend to be Republican or to the right. And he said that he said, that is just the Coliseum show. He says it's much deeper than that. He said that the people's pro stance for vaccination or anti-vax is very deeply embedded in their own ideology. He says it's very deeply rooted and that they tend to seek facts which support their ideology rather than, and this is on both sides, rather than to address. He said he is open to all viewpoints. He is not prejudiced either way. He did get the disease because he was treating it. He was right in the face of it. He recovered from it. It was very bad. This is back last fall. And he said that uh, he would have to get the vaccine or he would lose his job. So I didn't ask him if he got the vaccine. I assume he has, because when he first told me there was no vaccine. So um, he said that this coronavirus, and he said last year, he said, this is gonna be with us until February of next year. And he was right, it was. Now, since February, beginning mostly in April, when it began to wane down, it's re-resurrected itself as primarily as the Delta variant. And he said, this will be with us through the next season, you know, with the, the cold season. And he says it will last till February. How bad it will be and how restricted it will be is, is, a, is an open-ended question. I, I personally don't think it's going to be as harsh as it was. Um, there are new ground rules in New York City. I read some of them in the New York Times, and from what I read in the New York Times, these are not going to go over well with the businesses. I don't see them standing up because people will want to live their lives. And um, that's what I see. That's, that's my forecast based upon, you know, kind of what he told me and just what I see with, with uh, common experience. I do see people masking up, but it's also not enforced. In fact, one of the things that, that pisses me off when I go into a grocery store, they don't give a damn about the the hygiene squirts anymore. You know the the sanitizers. They don't keep them up, right? And it's disgusting. It's, <laughs> it's it's disgusting that they just have this, you know, piece of shit sitting there not being attended to. And you try and put your hand on it. And it's like, what? Why? Why even have it there? Take it out. It just attracts germs. Scum. Yes. <laughs> yeah, and so it's like if you're gonna do it, what? Oh, so you don't need to keep your hands clean now that the thing is gone, and it's really not gone, according to, you know, it's like they're being, like, look at, I don't care where they stand, uh, or where I would stand. If it was my store, I would keep it there. If I was anti-vax or pro-vax, uh, I would keep it there because it's, you know. We're living in uncertain times, and hygiene is good, safe conduct, whether 
you're worried about catching something or not. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes, no, that's appreciated. And especially now that we've entered this phase of uh, hygienic uh, obsession, you may as well maintain it uh, to a degree. Uh, I personally would argue and advocate that once people are vaccinated, uh, and we have the cards to prove it, then they should stop harassing us about masking. I, I don't think the vaccinated uh, need to mask. Uh, and uh, it, I, in that sense, I'm compromising or, you know, meeting halfway. I, I, well, do... I think that they're said to be, they're said to be, it depends who you listen to, they're said to be bigger spreaders uh, because they, they've, you know, your well, point's well taken. I mean, that that point has been yeah, made. I mean, I don't. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, as I say, I think unless you're in a really high concentration of some area, I don't think the if you know, if you maintain basic uh, self protection, you, you're not you're not your odds of getting it are not great. Right. And I don't trust the testing. Um well, the testing's fucking also, worthless, but go on. <laughs> yeah, I would also reiterate uh, what my doctor friend said, and he is such a such a beautiful man, uh, such a wonderful man, uh, just in the way he speaks and and his sincerity and his, uh, uh, you know, he's not like your average American because he's he's Romanian, but he 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 knows both cultures, he knows them so well. Uh, he's succeeding in the American culture, you know, so he, it, but uh, he said that, uh, you know, what he told me, and I've done this every day since he told me, is 10,000 international units of vitamin D3, 3,000 uh, milligrams of vitamin C, and I take the liposomal because I have a, a type that is, it's much more digestible to me. I know it didn't work with you, Douglas, but it's <laughs> its very digestible. Maybe I have a better brand uh, than, than you had, mm -hmm. but uh, it's, I take that. It's, it's much, it's the, it's the most compatible vitamin C I've ever take. It's not like putting those crystals and drinking it and wincing. Right. Um, Oh, by the way, I, in all fairness, I, I got used to it. It was basically I was preparing it the wrong way. It was completely my fault. Uh, so, I just take a couple of pills. Uh, I just take a couple of pills, and it's it's so it's great. I don't even taste it. Which even when I take pills of vitamin C from CVS or something, those are hard pills, and they taste. You still taste them, and they taste like acid. You know, it's crap. It tastes like it's it's very harsh. Uh, if you take the bite, the emergency, that's got some sweetener in it. That tastes great. It can make you feel better right away. But that's that's not something you typically take every day unless you're ill. And then I take the 50 milligrams of zinc. You don't take a lot of zinc. 40 milligrams is what's recommended. The pills all have 50 milligrams. So the zinc, the vitamin C, and the D3. I'm taking heavy doses of that every day. Um and I've only had a few challenges where I felt like I was going under the weather a little bit. One was precipitated by sleeping under the air conditioner, which got to me. So I, I took the emer emergency and the, uh, what's that, airborne, mm -hmm. and I, I got better right away. I wasn't even sick. I just felt the, you know, congestion. And I think I had another one where I took the same thing and I just, I wasn't even getting sick. I was it's like where you're feeling a little and you, you just take it. Right. So uh, that and, and aside from the fact that I'm not around people, um, I, I don't choose to be around people, except with the exceptions of when I went to California, where I was around, you know, a house gathering of, you know, my old neighbors and friends and family of the deceased and um, and in church and what was yeah, so I'm, I'm, I'm not I'm around. But I sit there and I look at the guys at football who were sitting there and we're in direct contact with each other, you know, huddling or, or talking. And I say, you know what? We don't even think about this stuff. We just go out and play. And we're breathing fresh air. And I've not heard of any of any of us getting sick from COVID. Uh, there's nothing like fresh air. And and uh, it's uh, so so anyway, so much for my 
diatribe. Oh, on no, that. Deep, oh no, deep, deeply appreciate it. And by the way, just a, a little something. So, by the way, uh, I want to qualify this. Understand, everybody, that uh, I am as antithetical to Wikipedia as you can imagine. And uh, probably one of the greatest blessings was the fact that when uh, that uh, that queer gang stalker, uh, Stephen Outrim, who had so wanted me to service him sexually and then was so resentful when I didn't that uh, he gave uh, Richard K. Cole Jr who gave us our upvote for tonight, our downvote, that is, uh, the one we've got so far, a uh, million dollars to continue gang-stalking me the rest of his miserable life, uh, where I live rent-free inside of his head, uh, as I do in Stephen Outrims, uh, that individual, had he succeeded in maintaining the Wikipedia page, of course, and since everybody was customizing it to be far more beneficent towards me, uh, and therefore Wikipedia changed their policy towards Douglas Dietrich, and now I'm uh, in the position that uh, John Lear uh, was in, just basically, uh, y- y- you know, verboten. Uh, as is Peter Moon, by the way, just so people know. Uh, y- had there been a Wikipedia page uh, for either one of us, but particularly in my case. There was one for me once. Interesting. It was very, very sparse. Yeah. It was very little. And then they took it down. Around the same time, they took David Anderson's down. Interesting. And uh, they took World Genesis Foundation down, but they had to put that back up, I think, or Atlanticron. They, you know, it's St- Stephen, what was it? Stanton Friedman even called it imaginary. This, there's no Atlanticron. Interesting. You know, it's just, just like this such bullshit. And it's it's becoming, it's so lame. And it's, it's becoming tiresome. Um, in fact... Uh, you know, it, it's interesting. Maybe I'll go more into this on uh, Wednesday. But I had a dream last night where I was uh, had gone back into time into 2018, mm-hmm. and I was uh, I was being these guardians appeared. These guardians appeared were like sort of like psychic astral trolls mm-hmm. that were trying to stop me, mm-hmm. and they were very weak. One of them, I, who was uh, supposed to be a martial arts expert, I turned him into a pretzel. <laughs> and that was a very good sign. It might mean that um, not only am I penetrating a time barrier, but which is interesting, but I might be breaking through to the media because these media negotiations are still ongoing. I have very mixed feelings about them. I can really... I can. I'd be happy to just leave them alone, uh, but they've improved since I last spoke to you, Douglas, privately, um, or or the prospects have improved. But still, it's like, you know, it's about controlling the narrative, because, and in fact, I was talking about this with a friend of mine. If if I can control a narrative, on any sort of dialogue, and I'm not talking about a show like this which is heard by few. If I can get in and control a narrative on some show like Ancient Aliens Mm -hmm. that's watched by uh, millions of people, Mm -hmm. it's a very powerful narrative. And then if I, and and then where I would be most challenged if I brought on somebody like you, I I would get crap for that. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Or flack. And I'd say, well, this this is this is relevant stuff. People need to hear that. It's like controlling the narrative is so important. Yet, it it's going to stimulate interest. It's certainly going to interest people. But there's also an aspect where it if I get up there and start talking and telling the truth uh, about certain things, it's going to cut. It's people are going to cut off. Mm-hmm. Even people that are interested. Like when I talk about the Montauk Project, people want to keep it at the level of mind control. They're not going to want to move beyond to the medicine of the medicine man and where it led me both to Qigong and to Romania. Because the Romanian issue is a very sticky issue for people. It's like you don't go there and it's not like What's that show, Fantasy Island, they used to have? Yes. Yeah. Uh, 
Fantasy Island, I mean, these people would be fed back. They would be given strife before they could achieve their whatever it was. They would have harrowing ex adventures. Uh, but it, it, it's like, okay, you're going to Fantasy Island. Yeah, you're going to be met with your evil twin or the equivalent thereof, or potentially you're going to face your own demons. And this brings us back to what we were talking about last time with this, these Arabic jinn, for lack of a better word, you were describing of H.P. Lovecraft. Yeah. Because I didn't overdo it on the reading of the subject in, in Kenneth Grant's Outside the Circle of Time and in the Night Side of Eden. But basically, when you go in, it's like, if you could imagine every beautiful aspect of the tree of life and all the beautiful life that is on the earth that is so praised and loved, all the beautiful things of nature. There are so many, he calls one book the night side of Eden, because there are so many things inside of it which are not so beautiful. And like, and I, and I don't mean to plug Christianity at all here, but there's a reason the Stations of the Cross in Christianity, particularly Catholicism, are so grueling. It's because, you know, it's like it results in the exaltation and resurrection of the highest part of one. I, I don't mean to advocate Christianity in any way, but I don't mean to dispel it either. It's like there's this principle, and of course people polarize into the negativity and they never resurrect. Uh, or seldom do, at least in the context of, of normal humanity. So it, it's like th there's this great negativity. And the, and the great problem with dealing with this subject of H.P. Lovecraft is the problem of though those who have gone before us have polarized into the negativity and they don't uh, transcend or appreciate uh, the day side of Eden. They go to the night and they stay there. Mm -hmm. And it's not mm -hmm. that the night can't be beautiful. It certainly can. But so, so in, the, in the recognition of, of what this phenomena is that holds life together, it's, and I see him using names that might be Greek, they might be Egyptian that complement the Arabic or vice versa. He's... Um, so it's 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 very interesting that all of this um, aspects, and, and so if I talk on a subject in a free dialogue about Montauk, those night side aspects of individuals will be stimulated or re-stimulated, and they will just sit there in. You know, go want to watch zombie movies. Give me more zombie movies. <laughs> Why is zombie so popular on TV? Zombie popularity kind of weaned or waned with uh, with COVID. It's not as popular as it was. It's still popular, but uh, now, now they got another disease. Yeah. Uh, but so, so in other words, the the free dialogue of of talking about you know when when you begin to talk about the inner earth and the and the vibrational frequency of contacting the inner earth. This is something that people are not ready to hear because they they've got the frequencies jammed with ancient aliens and modern aliens, and they continue this consistent diatribe about aliens instead of other things that are much more uh, remunerative in terms of the health and healing and consciousness of people. Um, David Childress, by the way, mm -hmm. his company, uh, ordered a few copies of your book. Excellent. And I said, why did you order these books? Because the catalog just went out. It's too late. It mm -hmm. won't get on to the next. Oh, we've got it on the website. So they put it, they're selling it on their website. Is is That's good for us, right? <laughs> I think, yes. Yes, yes. Because, see, 
I always know, no. See, David, he, he never really bought the Roswell story. Mm-hmm. He never bought it. Right. Uh, right. That's right. And uh, we, we knew that about him. And uh, he pretty much had said as much to Joe Boyer that uh, he agreed with, oh, I agree with the majority of what Douglas Dietrich says, which, uh, you know, I, you know, God knows what people mean when they say that other than that. Yes, they know that basically I'm what I'm saying is the truth. So it's, it's just their way of being noncommittal, really, because they're so afraid of offending all of uh, the alien cultists. Uh, I'll probably go a bit into that with Salman Sheikh uh, when I conduct my interview with him. And tonight would be the night to go into uh, why, of course, I had to cancel Penny Bradley and reschedule with her for September 11th. So I will be uh, interviewed by Penny Bradley on the 11th of September. There are some other people expressing interest. I'll uh, get back to that. I still, um, oh, Salman, you know, if you've ever uh, made any judgment call on uh, what you saw with the individual who wanted to interview me, I gave you some links about him. We've heard from uh, uh, Jameson Reese and Peter Moon about their impressions about that. So, you know, your impression would be helpful as well. Uh, and uh, I, I may contact the individual, I may not personally. I, I think that uh, Peter is more than welcome to contact him and just say, um, you know, uh, Douglas Dietrich is very, he, he's just had a lot of experiences with uh, people that are negative and uh, he's very leery. And uh, But if you do an interview with me, Douglas will probably feel a lot more uh, comfortable with uh, coming on as uh, after that. And I think that that would be nice for Peter to approach that particular individual we've been discussing with that offer. And uh, certainly that would um, act as kind of like a, uh, a precedent that would uh, uh, help me decide whether or not the person is, uh, shall we say, I won't use the term worth speaking to or something like that, but whether the person is trustworthy in the sense of... Uh, uh, not just uh, there for some kind of, uh, shall we say, setting up some kind of attack of some sort. Uh, in oh, the, yeah, yes. No, that, that's fine. I, I mean, I, I don't think much of an attack could be generated. Any attack at this point is going to sell books. I mean, that, your points it, well it, taken, it, and it certainly sell books. Yeah, and, and certainly. Yeah. Go ahead. Oh, I was just going to say, I fought my way through every ambush, but it's the point is, why put myself in the position where I have to fight my way through an ambush? It's just, like, you know, it's it's just one of those things that... Uh, um, what was conducted by Nicole Froelich, of course, was much more indirect than that. It was similar to the uh, ambush conducted by... Uh, the uh, Henrik Palmgren, which is where they interview you and it's copacetic enough, but then it's pre corded And then when they uh, finally put the, publish the interview, they've just edited everything out uh, and they don't publish any of uh, what you've provided, which is uh, various uh, PDFs, the publish, uh, the portable document formats that you send them, etc. Nothing gets integrated into the interview the way they said they would, etc. That is a passive form of ambush. Uh, but uh, it's actually much harder to deal with and uh, it doesn't get nearly the attention and is far more damaging because nobody has any idea that you were ambushed. They just think that you were up there and uh, that what you said was incoherent when it's simply been spliced and re-spliced. Uh, so that that being what it is. Um, the book changes things because the yeah. book is now is now a document that can be scrutinized and it's really with the way the book is written Mm -hmm. it's really hard to argue with it yes you could argue some points if you were really uh anal retentive Mm -hmm. and you could say well but we don't have this we didn't see what he saw so how do we know it's true but it doesn't really matter because if you look at the whole context how could those points not be true yes and and, it's It's all based upon a coherent logic. Here's the coherency, and the book creates a coherency. And so if you don't like it, you avoid it, but it's there. So for people, it it makes you less vulnerable to these type of attacks you were experiencing because you're sitting on sort of a flaky platform of the Internet, which is is just herky-jerky by its very nature. and I'm, I'm criticizing the platform of the internet, not Understood. you. Yeah. And 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 so it's like, oh, rawr, rawr, we can pull out the rug from under him. And now 
you have a book that, that people can read and people can uh, argue with, but what's the point of arguing? Because it, the more you argue about it, the more it will flower. So yes. the, the best tack is to avoid it if you don't like it or you can't. Handle this is it. the power of the written word, yes. which is a form of grimoire or grammar. It's 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 a magical act. A book is a magical act. It's so true. Uh, and, and, and there's no mal intent with this book. It's not malicious. It exposes war crimes. It exposes malevolent intent on both sides of the Pacific. Uh, so it does not make the Japanese good. It makes their position much more understandable because they were indulging in war crimes. Because, and that's explained too. But uh, what's what's more not recognized is the Americans' war crimes and heinous behavior. So yes. it's all and 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 there's you know. Uh of course, just to contextualize this from my perspective, I would argue that uh, despite the war crimes committed by the Japanese, they were on the side of light and good, as opposed to the Americans on the side of darkness and chaos, uh, for reasons that I've articulated before. Yes. Yeah. And th that do appear in the book, and there's no question that the Americans started the whole ruckus going back to, to Commodore Perry. Yes. There's no question that the, the Japanese were defending themselves. And, you know, what is all is fair in love and war. And in this case, we're talking about war. So, uh, of course, the Japanese being guilty of being human beings, many of them indulged in things that were better not indulged in. <laughs> <laughs> you know, uh, it, it, I mean, war, war is, is, is horrible on both sides. So. Uh, oh, yes. This is this is one reason why, uh, we, without going off in this tangent, oh, God, I, I had one guy who wrote me on uh, Facebook at one point. It's, it's just amazing the, the, the things that people say. Uh, if anyone has any cognizance of my background, and any cognizance of everything I've been exposing. Obviously, I'm personally and historically uh, saturated in blood and, uh, and, and atrocity. And uh, somebody was approaching me as if I were naive when I was speaking of uh, American war crimes at one point, uh, just basically saying essentially that war itself is atrocious, etc., as if I didn't know that. Uh, this is one of those things that is uh, the kind of challenge that you deal with. Um, you know, as an example, I'll go into um, just to uh, remind me, uh, because this should come up in Arc of Narrative tonight, just briefly, just just as an example, uh, when I was speaking about the uh, the British uh, that were going to deliver their uh, atomic bombs that would be provided by the United States to them, and the United States was going to use them as in theater uh, out of uh, Burma, if possible. Uh, to try and bomb the home islands of Japan uh, because the Americans uh, didn't have the capacity for a number of weeks to, uh, to, do, to do so themselves. Uh, then when I was speaking of the subject and then that Mark Felton uh, individual who's over in England uh, just basically was listening to my transmission and then uh, pumped out his own video on that, uh, you, you literally based on verbatim on everything I said and just uh, dug up, you know, some images he, he was able to easily retrieve because I was pointing out to people that there would be leaks of information at this point in time. And then uh, presenting that on his channel where he's hailed as this, this great researcher, etc. Uh, and of course, he puts out, you know, pretty much videos based on everything I say, where I've talked about the incredible number of foreigners who worked with the uh, uh, Third Reich, the uh, the whites who worked with the Japanese, white soldiers in the Japanese empire. He's he's basically put out videos on all of this. Uh, so, so he he lives off of me, uh, this individual, only because he's a published author with multiple books behind him. He presents himself as this this great researcher who's just nonstop, you know, doing all this intensive research where he somehow digs up things that nobody else has access to. And all he does is listen to Douglas Dietrich. 
Now, the, as people have written me before saying, oh, this guy's stealing your work. But as I pointed out, you know, history, you can't really steal history. It's history. Uh, the point is, of course, people are stealing something. They're stealing something is the fact that none of this would be out there without myself. So they are stealing that because I'm never credited. And uh, people are only now beginning to be exposed to all this. And uh, the point is, they don't know who the primary source for all of this leakage was, and it was Douglas Dietrich. So that point does need to be made at some point, and that will be outed. It will be outed by the book itself. As Peter said, the book is an act of magic. And uh, so uh, we've, we've, we've definitely got it out there now. And uh, I, I, I do feel that at some point, either through uh, the other books that we produce and uh, eventually I foresee hopefully an uh, expansion of this book as well and a revision of it. So to add on other things we didn't add in the original or at least until that uh, time might happen, uh, electronic appendices or the like. Uh, this is something that... Uh, will uh peter and i will talk about then people will be exposed to other aspects of the book that you know the contrarians will always throw up an argument but the point is i always have something to say because what i am working off of is truth and uh therefore there's no need uh f for me to do anything other than to uh explain what people can understand but they're always trying to deny and and that's they're just reflexively doing so it's cognitive dissonance uh, but most people who just read through it will intuitively recognize this as the truth and uh, understand it immediately as so. Uh, one of the things that uh, I did say I was going to point out was uh, several of the convergences that happened today and on Wednesday and into next weekend. Uh, this is a very, very busy time for myself in terms of social obligations and just uh, for so many cultures and their uh, convergent um, celebrations and uh, what they're going through, the new year for the Muslim world, uh, etc. But uh, before I go into any of that, uh, one of the things I was going to point out was this Wikipedia link that I sent to everybody who's on uh, the call right now. And this Wikipedia link is about Christmas Island. And uh, it uh, came as a result of just basically what I was looking into concerning Melanesia and speaking of in our latest transmission before tonight. And this is incredibly important in information, very relevant, uh, and will probably wind up in one of our future books aspects uh, thereof will wind up in one of our future books. And so uh, the point that I made about Wikipedia was like, even if my uh, page had stayed up on Wikipedia, in a sense, it would have been a bane uh, simply because I would constantly have had to have monitored it the way I do Facebook pages, uh, just because anybody can go there and just add on whatever they want. As a matter of fact, it's worse than a Facebook page because uh, unlike people just adding comments or uh, uh, glitching in, in some minor way, uh, they can alter the very text. <laughs> so since they can alter the content of the page itself at will, uh, then it's a bitch to monitor. And, uh, you know, honestly, uh, you can't do it on your own. You have to do it circuitously through either an agent or a, uh, a, a false IP address so that people cannot trace it back to you because the person who the page is about cannot alter the text. Uh, so the first thing they do is identify your IP address uh, and then they will not allow you to uh, alter the page. Uh, and, and so I, I don't know if you knew that, Peter. I don't know if you, you were aware of that, uh, but it's one of those things you probably didn't care enough about it to even, you know, dig into it and find that out. Uh, but uh, that's the way Wikipedia works. In other words, if somebody sets a page about yourself, you can't touch it, but everybody else can. Isn't that sick? Does that make you sick? I mean, that's, uh... Well, I mean, I, I just found that I tried to write a biography of myself and they just gave me a bunch of shit for it, you know, and, and I could have, you know, and it's not like you were even saying anything outrageous about yourself, right? <laughs> no, 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 no. And it's all published stuff, and it's like, okay, I could have gotten David Childress and other people to vouch for me, but why do I want to even kiss their ass? It's 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 more cachet to to have them ban me, yes, than to be on there. Yeah, well, I mean, you know, theoretically, if you're on there, it, you know, it can give you more visibility and links but yes you know i'm okay without it and it 
I mean, it, and it, one has more cachet by being banned by it. Like, why the hell aren't you on there? Yeah. And I was on there by a third party. Mm -hmm. And I wasn't necessarily happy what it said, but it did identify me and, and, and said who I was. Although I am mentioned, mm -hmm. you know, the Montauk Project, they can't avoid that. Mm -hmm. So I'm mentioned uh, in the Montauk Project. Well, it's interesting that I'm scrubbed completely and uh, that uh, Michael Aquino had himself scrubbed as well, albeit in, in terms of himself, it was for criminal reasons uh, because uh, he obviously didn't want people to constantly talk about his uh, child trafficking. <laughs> So, uh, uh, in the case of, uh, as Peter Moon can attest, Wikipedia had this entire page where they were talking about how they had to protect Michael Aquino and cover Michael Aquino's ass. That's a fact. And uh, so, uh, screenshots exist of that. And uh, this is, you know, because he was a, as they said right there, he was a Wikipedia, he, he was a primary contributor to wikipedia so that tells you everything you need to know this is the kind of evil that we're dealing with but that's all to qualify the link i provided these gentlemen so the reason this link is so important is that uh in my research about melanesia then i found out more about uh this island that is so pivotal uh, to much of the research that I was doing. And this is Christmas Island. And, and just so people that have some understanding of how to pronounce Christmas Island in the Kiribati language, uh, understand that the uh, Kiribati language is very, very different. And the alphabet means completely different things in the Kiribati language than it does in English. So basically the uh, name Kiritimati, uh, which is what you're going to see in writ. That's what it, it's going to look like it says. Kiritimati, that is actually in the uh, Gilbertese language of the Gilbert Islands, which is now part of the nation of uh, Kiribati. Uh, the T-I combination is actually pronounced as S. So uh, the K replaces G and uh, the R replaces L. So it's actually pronounced Kirisimas. So when you look at that, uh, if you're reading it in the Gilbertese uh, vernacular, that well, their language, uh, it's, it's going to be Kirisimas Island because it was discovered on Christmas uh, by Captain Cook. And uh, so uh, everybody, however, just looks at that as, and they're just going to read it as Kiriti Mati. Uh, but um, that's not how it's read. Anyhow, for what it's worth, it's the, um, it, that island has the greatest land area of any coral atoll in the world. It's about 150 50 square miles. And uh, be, that would be about 388 square kilometers for all of our um, listeners in the rest of the world. And its uh, lagoon is roughly the same size. Uh, and uh, so it's, it's very large. Uh, Beautiful but, beyond belief. It, it, thank you. Thank you. It is. It is. And uh, the entire island is a wildlife sanctuary, ironically enough. Uh, access to five particularly sensitive areas is restricted. Now, what makes this so ironic, and, and by the way, it is a primary tourist attraction because it is the first country to celebrate New Year every year because it had, they rearranged the entire fucking dateline, the international dateline around it. Uh, you can actually check this out yourself and the nation of Kiribati managed to get the world to rearrange the goddamn IDL, the international dateline, around their country so their country's all in a single time zone. And that put their furthermost, uh, the, the, their uh, easternmost islands uh, into tomorrow, literally into tomorrow on the same Pacific uh, day as uh, other nations of the Pacific like Japan and Taiwan. And it, it's just, uh, they're in a different day uh, 24 hours ahead of us. And so uh, with that, they became the that island in particular at the ass end of uh, Kiribati, whose capital is way over on the western end uh, on Tarawa. Uh, they basically have this little island, uh, which is the first to see the new year every year. And uh, so this island is a tourist attraction and all these people go there so they can be the first in the world to celebrate the new year, uh, ironically enough, uh, all of this ignores 
uh, the uh, nuclear history of the island. And uh, this is what's so important. So if you scroll down and, it, uh, and another aspect of the island, which has to do with the Spanish Civil War. And all this has to do with, of course, the fact that uh, Franco was a fascist who uh, had every intention of rebuilding the Spanish Empire. And uh, as a ally of Adolf Hitler, who, of course, survived the war on the surface world, uh, it was in the 1948, well, you can see that in the entry of Wikipedia. Uh, when you scroll down, you'll find that Spain claims this island, that Spain says this island belongs to us. And uh, this was actually uh, it brought up after World War II. They don't say that in the Wikipedia article because they're, they're too stupid, but they, they bring up eight, 1948. They bring up uh, a researcher of the Spanish National Research Council. If you look at Spain's sovereignty rights in this Wikipedia article, claimed the island in 1948. They said, oh, this is a historical curiosity. Uh, but Spain remains uh, one of the strongest uh, foreign ties to this this bizarre little island nation. And uh, on it were all these nuclear bomb tests. Now, this is where it gets important, because if you take... Outrageous a and disgusting. Thank you. Let's just bomb this area, because... Uh... It's out in the middle of somewhere. Yeah, well, it goes beyond that. Between May of 1957 and September of 1958, the British government tested nine thermonuclear weapons on that island for Operation Grapple. And then in 1962, the uh, United Kingdom cooperated with the American Empire on what they called Operation Dominic in which they exploded, they detonated a further 31 thermonuclear weapons on that island. And um, during all that time, <clears throat> about 20,000 British servicemen and about 524 New Zealand soldiers and 300 Fijian soldiers were all deployed to Christmas Island from 1956 to 1962. And all of these men were unwittingly placed in, uh, aside from the harsh conditions with limited resources uh, that uh, would cement Britain's place in history as a thermonuclear power, they were all totally irradiated. And the long-term... That's what I was going to ask, because and they didn't protect the people. They didn't evacuate them. Yeah, they didn't evacuate them. They were experimental subjects. <laughs> yes, the local people still live on those islands and the U.S. still refers to their island, where they live, as Pacific Proving Grounds. That's the name that is on Department of Defense maps for their island. And, and what was the what was the effect in the population? We do we know this? Do they, you know? It's you, like of course they're they're all devastated. I mean, sterile, uh, cancerous, tumorous. Uh, every horror that you can imagine, their lifespan is at most uh, half a hundred years for the men, uh, if they're lucky. Uh, so they've halved, they've cut their lifespans literally in half. Uh, the women tend to live a little bit longer, uh, but they tend to give birth to monsters. Uh, it's a terror. It's, it just goes on and on. This is the horror of this island. But if you take a look at the photograph on that Wikipedia article, and you go down to the nuclear bomb test, there is a photograph of three men that looks entirely innocuous. You just see three idiots. It says the bombs, this is what makes this so important. The bombs were hoisted by balloon. This is the East Point balloon anchor. So these men are standing on a balloon anchor, and what they did was all of these bombs were blown in the air, uh, held aloft by balloons, to test if they could be delivered by Aerodreadnought. That is what makes this island so incredibly relevant to the Americans and the British trying to emulate what the Japanese could do to them. Except they were using bombs, the Japanese were using Bio biological. No, biologicals, but the Japanese had every capacity of delivering nuclear weapons. And this is what the Americans were testing to uh, basically see if they could uh, emulate this, uh, do this what? themselves. So uh, you you get the point. So that photograph is. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Is, is yes. So uh, wow. I mean, and you can look up Operation Grapple, which is the name of, of the test sites on Christmas Island. Uh, yes, it's. Uh, just typical 
evil Disgusting behavior. Yes. Yes. And uh, by the way, I want to thank everybody in the chat room. Nancy Volker, welcome. Hey, honey. And uh, Douglas Marks, thank you so much for being there. Chris Collins and Maria Gregorich is with us. God bless her. Sarah Shields, hi to you, honey. And Peggy Wood, mwah, mwah. love you, ladies. And uh, so with that, uh, I do want to explain the importance of uh, today's date and all of the convergent dates. Uh, first off, uh, it is, of course, today. Uh, of course, I've been celebrating throughout the weekend, but uh, it is uh, today is uh, Taiwanese Father's Day. And in Taiwanese, it's known as Taiwan Baba Baba J or <laughs> Baba meaning double eight, uh, eight, eight and Baba meaning like daddy in the uh, in the Chinese language. Uh, so it was during the World War Two years. That Father's Day was celebrated on the 8th of August, uh, and that is uh, because uh, the double A, uh, August 8th, uh, is uh, colloquially referenced as Baba, which sounds very similar to the uh, Chinese word for uh, the informal, uh, familiar uh, term for father, which would be daddy. Uh, the Taiwanese or the Chinese version of that would be Baba. And so the double eight Baba Day became Father's Day, Daddy Day in uh, in China. And of course, the original Republic of China, uh, when it dominated the mainland, wanted to celebrate the lives of the soldiers who died in World War Two and to honor both those who fathered them along themselves as fathers. And uh, they chose the date for all the reasons I've just given. And uh, they trust tradition of Father's Day. It dropped off on the communized mainland, but it was continued in Taiwan. And uh, so it's not an official holiday, but it's still the day that everyone observes. And uh, people will take their father out for dinner or give gifts, or at the very least, they're obligated to call them and acknowledge them. And so, of course, I was given the full treatment by my son. And of course, the uh, escort that he arranged for me was from Taiwan. And uh, that was uh, why you see that Taiwanese girl in the uh, image tonight. I, I don't know if Peter can see it because we're, um, like I said, I can't see the image myself because of some glitch <laughs> in the system but hopefully everyone else can see the image and aside from that it is also of course this uh, is the girl without which is the one the girl with the black hair or the orange hair oh oh that's on the promotional banner is uh one of the blood boys who i took blood from uh while i was uh well, what are you what are you referring to on the you mean if i go to the uh the youtube yes Yes, that's it. Hopefully you can see the image there because like I can't see it, but hopefully everyone else can. Uh, so it, it's still distressing to me that I can't, but um, uh, so long as you can see it, then I know everybody, everything's all right. And uh, so... Uh, well, I must say that uh, she looks a bit like a biofax. <laughs> the reddish brown hair, right? Yes. Oh, that's delightful. Very pretty, but looks... Very biofaxy. Oh, that's cute. Uh, that's uh, probably one of the, the reasons why uh, my son selected her. Yes, that's uh, he, he, and uh, if I could see it, which I I guess I can see it. it uh, yet she does have that look. Does <laughs> holy shit. Yes. By the way, the only way I can see the image is to go to the online broadcasting software. So uh, when I, I, I see it in software, and I've just noticed now that w what Peter is, uh, is saying, yes, that's that does have that look. Oh my God, I, I didn't notice that. Uh, but now that now that Peter said that, I can't get that out of my head. This is like uh, one of those mind worms. Um, so aside uh, from all of that, uh, yeah, I want to explain to people the significance of our next episode uh, and why you don't want to miss it, because uh, the Montauk uh, phenomenon uh, will be taking place, and I'll explain it in depth on that day, the next transmission, not tonight, uh, but it will be the 12th of August, will be on the... Um, eve day of essentially japanese halloween uh so uh this will be the soriki or the ancestral spirit season uh which uh is a four-day holiday in japan it is uh essentially one where they celebrate their halloween 
in the sense that the old Celts celebrated theirs. In other words, it's very serious. We're not talking about trick-or-treats or anything for kids, but at the same time, everybody participates in the celebration, but it's not kids going around asking for candy. This is where your dead relatives come to visit, and you have to set up the food to honor them, feed them, and uh, all your dead relations are visiting, so you're you're respecting them. These the, the they, a lot of people call it Ghost Week in the West, uh, but that doesn't do it justice because to the Japanese, there are so many different types of ghosts and um, many of them are negative. Uh, these are not negative spirits. These are your relations. And uh, so what's interesting is that this episode tonight in which we have the uh, Taiwan Father's Day uh, and because of the lunar calendar and its vicissitudes, what with the um, uh, Muslim year being at least 10 to 15 days shorter than the Gregorian calendrical year as a lunar calendar, it uh, goes by the moons, the cycle of the moons. But uh, it's it's because they don't have 13 months like they should. There really should be 13 months on any lunar calendar. Uh, they, then they, they're shorter than the Gregorian calendar. And then the result is that it changes like Asian Lunar New Year. Uh, the Muslim New Year keeps changing every year by the Gregorian calendar, which is fixed to the solar dating system and uh, rather artificial and unnatural. Well, let me say something about the calendar. Yeah. Um, it, it, it is such an abomination yes. that we... This is a manipulation of time, the calendar itself. Yes. Because um, a calendar, a lunar calendar, is based upon lunation, is based upon the menstrual cycle of the female. Yes. Which is a, this is your biorhythm. Yes. This is your biorhythm. And your biorhythm is the cycles of the feminine, which results in birthing, it results in menopause. It, it, but so you have. I mean, I, I don't think a, a full month is technically twenty-eight days. It's probably something like twenty-eight and a quarter. I don't really know. Uh, yes. But uh, if it was twenty-eight and a quarter, you'd have three hundred and thirty-nine days plus twenty-eight and a quarter uh, would be. 347, well, you know, you, you're going to have, let me see, if I go 28 times 13, 364, okay, that's one day, so you, you're going to, that's probably going to divide up that one day is, it's not 28, 28 days, it's going to be 28 and a quarter days, or 28 and one twelfth of a day, which, you know, might have an interesting correspondence to the Zodiac. However, yeah. the point, the main point here, you could adjust the calendar so that you have a full contextual year uh, yeah. because they still have to add, it's really 365 and a quarter days. Right. So, you know, which is interesting, if it, you know, it, it would all divide, you could divide it differently. It's just not how we think. Because we've been programmed to think in terms of the solar calendar, but we still have to make up for, with it for a leap year. So why couldn't we make up for the the spare time with a, a certain day or something, well, well, uh, whatever it I, is? I, I feel that as the world, what we're have, what we're experiencing now. I don't want to go too deeply into this right now, but what we're experiencing with the bifurcation of um, hostilities between China and America, in particular. Uh, and Britain severing from Europe, we're going to see a world uh, once again uh, severing into autarkies. And important. when we <laughs> see when we see these autarkic empires uh, develop as the world uh, progresses into the future, we're going to see them sever to the point where you will see different calendrical systems evolve. But I do believe that one of these uh, civilizations uh, or cultures will manifest this more natural calendar of 13 lunar months and uh, also 
uh, that would be zodiacal in the sense that I'm one of those people who advocates the 13th zodiacal symbol of Ophiuchus. So uh, if, uh, m if that symbol were recognized zodiacally, which many astronomers, or rather, excuse me, astrologers, are violently against, and this is because they invest thousands and thousands of dollars in computer software so they can work with the 12 sign zodiacal system. If they were to introduce the 13th sign of Ophiuchus, of course, then all kinds of new software would have to be produced and they'd have to reinvest again. And they don't want to do that and retrain themselves. So, uh, but uh, my mother would be an o Ophiochian, uh, an Ophiuchus uh, sign if, uh, if we recognized uh, that 13th sign. And uh, people are... <laughs> Important that you say this because uh, a friend of mine who's a healer explained to me people invest a lot of money in healing devices yeah uh, and they they work but then there's a counter effort and they work for a certain amount of time but they've invest so much money in them they keep advocating them when they're no longer they have a they have a short lifespan yes and so this is the problem this is you know, they do better even if they lost money to invest in the 13th sign because their astrology would be more accurate. Thank astrology, uh, as interesting, as intriguing, and insightful as it can be, could stand for a lot of improvement. Yes. Uh, people, people... Uh, talk up their ass, even professional astrologers who are very good. And the key to understanding astrology is to understanding archetypes. And they can they can speak very beautifully, uh, poetically and pragmatically at the same time. But uh, if they were to embrace this, uh, it, it would, uh, especially this... Uh, this this uh, symbol I'm not uh, used to pronouncing it. Ophiuchus. Ophiuchus is means serpent bearer. Yes. Uh, yes. A, a man or woman grasping a snake, and and this is of course, uh, state the snake uh, that, that has a lot of symbology. It's the snake, the the human controlling the snake. Yes. Uh, not the other way around. So I, I don't know what signs it's between. Uh, it, it, the Sagittarius and the um, Libra. And I mean, yeah, you know, it's a tarot. Sagittarius exactly. and Scorpio? It's something like that. Yeah. I mean, because I was a Libra. My dad was a Scorpio. But if we were to recognize the 13th sign, my mother, who was Sagittarius, would be Ophiuchus, which actually suits her so much better. Uh, this is, of course, the serpent bearer who is associated with Imhotep, the first uh, Egyptian uh, doctor and embalmer who created mummification. And, uh, and of course, he's also the bearer of the caduceus, which is the serpent stick, which is used by the medical doctors because the venom of the serpent was used for healing. You can take the poison and alchemically uh, turn it into something that is a healing potion or use the uh, serpent's venom to create anti-venom. That's the symbol of the snake, that what can kill you well, can it, also... It says here, it says Ophiuchus is from November 29th to December 17th. Yes. Therefore, it would be between Scorpio and Sagittarius. Thank you, yes. Uh, but here, go. this is a, uh, a different calendar mm -hmm. because it, uh, it changes... It changes everything. Well, I'll send you the column that I wrote on it. I'll, I'll remember to send that to you within a, f a few days, uh, certainly, hopefully soon. And uh, I still have to send you some time-stamped uh, episodes. And uh, I'll certainly time-stamp tonight for you because I'll be speaking of things that are very relevant to what we'll be writing about in the future. But uh, one of the things that I'll talk about is, of course, the Department of Magic uh, in Japan that uh, the Americans, of course, I'll go into this in Arc of Narrative tonight after Peter retires, but I'll go deep into the atomic bombs out of obligation because, as I said, we had the uh, Islamic New Year convergent with the uh, Taiwanese Father's Day, which both of them happened to fall this year uh, right between the bombing of Hiroshima and Nagasaki 
anniversaries. And uh, the uh, I'll go into that in arc of narrative, but it was Friday that was the anniversary of the Hiroshima bombing. And uh, tomorrow will be the 76th anniversary of the Nagasaki bombing. So I'm obligated to speak of those events. And one of the things I'll talk about is uh, why the Americans didn't simply bomb uh, Tokyo when, uh, by the way, whoever tells you some bullshit, the way the Americans feed you the line of shit today, where they'll say, oh, we had to preserve the emperor so that he could officiate the surrender, you know, bullshit. All the Americans uh, wanted to do was destroy the emperor and uh, uh, they wanted to bomb Tokyo uh, and specifically the palace. And think about how Tokyo was fire burned and uh, when they firebombed Tokyo, uh, devastated so much of Tokyo and yet the Imperial Palace continued to stand. It stood through all of that. And any Americans who tell you, oh, we avoided bombing it, you can't control fire. You can't control the direction that fire goes in. Uh, and the idea that they would avoid bombing the palace uh, while somehow burning everything around it is absurd. Uh, but there is no physically rational explanation for the palace standing. Of course, it was my mother's department that kept it standing and it was based on magic and then the americans of course said that oh it's militarily and by the way i'll bring this up in arc of narrative tonight but anyone can confirm this themselves uh you'll at least confirm it by what you cannot find which you won't be able to find anything but keep asking keep probing why didn't they just bomb the goddamn palace and uh the americans if you find any response to it at all You'll see the Americans pushing shit like it was militarily impractical to bomb the palace. They'll, you actually say things like that. What does that mean? Uh, militarily impractical has to do with practical conditions. Then they bring up the bullshit of we wanted to preserve the emperor. It's a ter it's all crap. Uh, it, it, they always it would have been quite easy to bomb the palace logistically. Yes, it would have been logistically. Incre yeah, incredibly easy, but they could not. And uh, in their most highly classified documents, uh, documents that uh, literally the classification is that if you saw them without the right security clearance, uh, then you theoretically needed to be shot, literally executed if assessed without proper clearance, uh, non-cleared uh, personnel or anyone who saw these documents was to be terminated uh, immediately. Those documents said it was every attempt that was made to bomb the palace uh, resulted in mysterious forces somehow uh, destroying the plane uh, that was conducting the bombing, that those planes never returned from their missions. And so they just simply stopped sending them. There were too many uh, planes that simply just, well, none of them returned from those missions. Uh, and so uh, all of that has to do with the Department of Magic uh, which was, uh, of course, thousands of years old. And uh, their entire purpose was to protect the state. And so I'll do my best to explain a bit about the uh, Department of Magic in Japan, my mother's affiliation with it. And uh, she wasn't part of the effort to protect the palace. These were people who were dedicated specifically on site uh, who protected the palace. But this is something that they had done uh, for the government for thousands of years. So very important to explain that. And so that's the convergence of all those factors with tonight's program. With uh, the program uh, for Wednesday, of course, we've got the convergence of uh, the beginning of the Japanese spirit season with the Montauk uh, biorhythm and why I had to cancel um, the interview with Penny on Saturday the 14th was because that's Chinese Valentine's Day. Uh, by the way, for those of you who don't know, uh, the Chinese celebrate three Valentine's Days a year. Uh, but this is one of the more important ones that goes back thousands of years and uh, has to do with, of course, uh, an ancient legend, which I'll explain uh, on Saturday the 14th itself, uh, rather on Sunday of that weekend. And, of course, that weekend, uh, throughout the uh, weekend of the 14th to the 15th, uh, August 15th, will be the anniversary date of the emperor's speech. 
And uh, that was, of course, uh, something that we speak of in the book. So do read the book and uh, you'll find out more about that speech than you've ever uh, heard about before. Anyhow, I just felt it was somehow, uh, you know, I couldn't on on Valentine's Day itself uh, be conducting an interview. So I'll be spending Valentine's Day this coming weekend obviously involved with other affairs. Uh, And the weekend after that will be the Chinese Spirit Festival or the Zhongyuan Guiji, uh, the Ghost Festival of China. So this is uh, August. uh, The summertime is actually the time of the piercing of the veils between the worlds for the East Asians. And uh, so that should put everything into kind of a perspective for everyone. And uh, what I'd like to do now is uh, have uh, Peter Moon do some analysis concerning a topic that, uh, you know, uh, here's what happened during the weekend was I was able to clear some things with Sugar Daddy. For those of you who don't know, uh, my son, who I purchased off the street uh, years ago as a young girl, uh, suffered from gender dysphoria, ultimately was able to afford sexual affirmation surgery thanks to the work she did with, of course, the gang that I'm involved with, the underground network, the Tong. Uh, you know, I use the term gang affectionately. Uh, but uh, because of that, uh, she ultimately became a boy, as she had always wanted to become, and then married someone who has been able to gift myself uh, a higher quality of life in terms of what I have available to me on the days that there are holidays, and I'm invited over to celebrate with my surrogate son. And in exchange, of course, I do provide security advice and uh, consultation and my blood, which, of course, uh, this is ironic because I also take advantage of the situation to drink the blood of others. All of this is based on uh, the Silicon Valley obsession with uh, maintaining youth and uh, rejuvenation through blood transfusion. And uh, my blood is quite exceptional for reasons I've explained before, having been a product of a military experiment that literally killed and reanimated me under the uh, medical malpractice of Dr. Dr. John Henry Hagman. I, I, I stutter his name because I hate this man so much. Uh, and, uh, yet people feel that he's gifted me. Uh, he certainly did so without my permission, but, um, at any rate, that being said, and to be gone into another time, uh, one of the things that I had to clear with Sugar Daddy was Jeff Bezos has been involved. He's, he's, he's involved in so many businesses and has such an impact on our economy. I really couldn't rake that sky over the coals like I wanted to until I had an opportunity to talk with my son's husband to make certain that if I did so, I wouldn't be somehow impacting anything he was involved with. So I got the clearance from him that I could shit all over Jeff Bezos tonight, which I... (laughs) which I will be happy to do. But before I uh, turn towards uh, pissing all over uh, Jeff Bezos, I want to have some fun with uh, Cuomo. So this is what I'm going to turn towards our friend Peter Moon towards. Uh, Of course, our man, Jameson Reese, also lives in New York, but he's had time along with Daniel Arola where we've pissed all over uh, Andrew Cuomo Cuomo so far. But uh, let's turn towards the Andrew Cuomo uh, saga for a bit. But first, I do want to remind people that today an Olympics like no other came to an end. It's been 12 days of resilience, anxiety, shattered records and broken dreams at the Olympics all in the shadow of a deadly pandemic. Uh, Now Tokyo is handing over the Summer Games baton to Paris during the closing ceremony, or they certainly did today. Uh, That kicked off at 7 a.m. Eastern Daylight Time today. Uh, And what's so crazy about all of this is that uh, if people were bitching about what was going on in uh, Japan, and I gave a uh, a link to the time-stamped episode concerning the Japanese Olympics of 1964 to Peter Moon. I, I He probably hasn't had a chance to review that yet, but I look forward to it when he does and uh, what his uh, response to that will be. And I talked about how the 1964 Olympics of Japan, how they basically rubbed it uh, in the faces of all the world that they had won the war and uh, how that uh, pretty much was their way of building up a clientele with the rest of the world. And how people back then were saying, God, the Japanese are are so far ahead of us technology, technologically. How did this happen? You know, people were saying, these British in particular were saying, we're still in the steam age. 
and the Japanese have moved into a technology we haven't even evolved to yet. Well, you know, no fucking shit. It, it's like, uh, and these crazy people think they won the war. I mean, talk about the insanity. Uh, but at any rate, it's like the Asians always say, humor the white madman, humor, humor the crazy white guy. Uh, but uh, in terms of where the games are going to next, if you think it was awkward in Japan uh, with what's been going on, the Beijing is picking up the goddamn Winter Olympics. So think of how it's going to be in communist China. People are bitching about, oh, yeah, well, athletes were having a hard time with exposure to COVID. In communist China, they lock you down as, well, basically, they put you in prison <laughs> when you catch COVID, like it's a crime. Uh, so let's see how the Olympics goes down there, motherfucker. And, uh, but, you know, aside from uh, that, which will be something to look forward to in the most negative sense of uh, morbid entertainment, uh, going back to further morbid entertainment, perhaps even more so, Andrew Cuomo, well, Governor Andrew Cuomo of New York has always loved drawing attention to himself. And this is, after all, the man who signed a contract for a book about his leadership during the coronavirus pandemic, even as the plague was still a raging. And even so, it's hard to imagine what Cuomo thought would happen when he himself requested an investigation into allegations that he had sexually harassed multiple women including members of his staff. And that new investigation by the New York Attorney General's office found at least 11 credible accusations of sexual harassment against Governor Andrew Cuomo. What the fuck did Andrew Cuomo think would happen? Before I turn this over to Peter, who I desperately want to hear from concerning this subject, this last Tuesday, New York Attorney General Tish James announced scathing findings herself, so saying that Governor Cuomo sexually harassed current and former state employees in violation of both federal and state laws, adding thereafter that his behavior corrodes the very fabric and character of our state government. Now, James's team reported it had found at least 11 credible allegations against the Democratic governor, and though the report does not recommend criminal charges, it should spell the end for Cuomo's career in politics. Nearly every prominent elected Democrat in the state has called for him to resign, and President Joe Biden uh, said um, a few days ago that Cuomo should step down. And, and he's also facing criticism over evidence that he sought to hide data about nursing home deaths during the pandemic. So what I'll ask Peter and I'll provide him three observations of my own, uh, is how did we get here? And of course, the first thing that comes to my mind is really credulous coverage. I mean, I wondered in May of yesteryear about CNN's inexplicable decision to let Cuomo's brother, Chris, conduct a series of softball interviews on primetime TV with him. I mean, Chris Cuomo also advised his brother privately, which CNN itself said was completely inappropriate, and yet they let it stand. And then, of course, we've had single-party supremacy. The, the states dominated by one party, like New York, they foster these mediocre, well, in Cuomo's case, he's actually flawed <laughs> in terms of leaders. And now other Democrats like Tis James and top state legislators might finally force him out, uh, though Cuomo has accused them all of bias. Uh, and, of course, we've got this demagogic decay. I mean, Cuomo and former President Donald Trump have always been more similar than either would like to admit. And as Cuomo's troubles multiplied, he pulled straight from Trump's arguments against accountability. So afternoon of Tuesday, this last week, Cuomo not only denied that he sexually harassed anyone, even though he acknowledged some of the behavior that has been allegated against him. He even showed, and I am not making this up, Peter. He showed a slideshow of pictures of himself touching people's faces, insisting the gesture was not sexual. And he said, I want New York state government to be a model of office behavior. Of course, some accountability at the very top would be one place to start. So, Peter, take it from there. <laughs> Tell us 
What do you think is going on in well, this man's mind? Well, it's it's very important to understand the the media uh, with with Chris Cuomo and Andrew Cuomo. It's very much like wrestling, where <laughs> you have a good guy and a bad guy, and and one of the things with wrestling is the bad guy will do outrageous things and he will maintain his position as champion or whatever he is. And people like sort of root on for the sidelines and it makes no sense whatsoever. And this is what TV is. It's a caricature uh, of responsibility and of, of power. Um, neither one of these guys uh, should be taken seriously uh they're 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 very i guess what you'd say powerful in terms of their ability to hold their audience um chris cuomo is a complete joke uh and this is <laughs> irrespective of his politics i don't mean to endorse his politics but just his personal behavior it's just it's a joke why would somebody pay him millions of dollars to represent the news what 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 is the mindset of this it's like we're going to give you these guys behave like they're on steroids and you think why would you want that now uh i can understand uh cnn well it's it's hard to understand cnn because these people are so biased it's not funny um it's hard for them to tell the truth they can't report on something that's innocuous to their position, but it's it's like they're they're so prejudiced. And in the case of Andrew Cuomo, he's like he's he's just digging in to his position because this is about power. The Democrats have demonstrated that all they're interested in is power, and power is power. You can't argue that power is power. It's all about power. It's not about right. It's not about wrong. It's about power. Um, and they want power. So Cuomo is digging in and he's saying this is politically motivated. It's biased. It's his right to do this. And this is moving into the impeachment phase. It's already moved in. The, uh, assist, uh, the district attorney is not in as very limited powers of prosecution in such a case. They're basically there to do a finding and turn it over to, and, and there's multiple prosecutors in New York State who are pursuing criminal charges against Cuomo. This has nothing to do with the impeachment. This has to do with his, uh, either his nursing home issue or the accusations against the women. And he is taking to task every single woman, implying that they're uh, compromising true women who are have been abused. He's compromising the women that have truly been abused in this world by, you know, saying that he abused them. They're, they're, he's mudding up their reputation. Uh, so he's very outrageous and he is going to be impeached. He's been given until next Friday to present his evidence. If he doesn't present his evidence, I don't know how you can produce a negative other than those stupid pictures. Um, <laughs> show him to be overactive in kissing people. Uh, <laughs> and so, so in other words, he can produce, he, uh, he has to turn in all his evidence by next week. And after that, he doesn't have opportunity to present any more evidence. And they are going to impeach him. They need 51% of the New York State Assembly to impeach him, which they will do. And then it goes to the Senate. Now, in addition to the Senate, the New York State uh, Supreme Court or certain judges, I, I don't know if they're appellate judges, they're not called the, they don't have the same type of uh, court system they do in California or in the federal, but there are judges, I think they're appellate judges uh, who will participate in the vote with the, the New York State Senate. And that requires a two-thirds majority, just as we do in the United States Senate, to 
try, there will be a trial and a conviction or a uh, not guilty. And this puts the uh, Democrats in the hot seat. The judges could be his savior. I don't know how they, because he probably appointed some of them. Because if the, the people in the Senate uh, vote to acquit him, they are going to be vulnerable to losing their position. Therefore, it would be in his interest uh, to uh, offer them positions in industry if they vote if they vote for him, you know, because they might lose their seat. Well, if you lose your seat for voting for me, then we'll make sure you're hired by such and such. Of course, that's not legal, but that's that's what one would expect. Uh, so to, he needs two thirds of they need two thirds of the Senate to convict him. And as they say, they will convict him unless the, these people are going to have to stand up to public ridicule if they vote to acquit him. And then the, the judges could be his saving grace. I don't know where they stand politically, only because they're not answerable. Most judges are appointed for life. So they they could be, they, they I mean, if they are appointed for life, they could be his saving grace. And then he just says, well, I won and you lost. What that, are you going to do about it? That might be a strategy, but I, I think that's almost if giving him too much credit. I don't know if he's thinking that far ahead, uh, but maybe that was his strategy all along. With his it. lawyers are. Yeah. Okay. His lawyers are, uh, and yeah, and, and you don't know what behind the scenes politicking and angling he is also doing. Um, he's very much, he's a very, this isn't about who likes and who doesn't like, it's about who controls the votes, who controls the politics of New York State, which are very, very dirty. Yes, yeah, and, and they always have been. But by, by the way, I'm hearing some background noise. Is that uh, is it is there someone who has a radio on or, or something in the me. background? Uh, yeah, it's uh, yeah. I know it's not. I know it's not Peter. Uh, I was just curious about that because uh, you, you know. And uh, by the way, when Salman Sheikh was speaking to us, I, I was just wondering: Do you actually live near the park, what? Salman? Uh, like uh, where uh, the uh, because I noticed when you were speaking, there was some background noises, like some people shouting to each other, like they were playing basketball or something. I was just wondering if you actually lived near the park where you feed the birds and do your pull-ups. <laughs> just curious. Yes. Um... Sorry about that. That was uh, the background noise from the TV. Oh. But uh, I, I, I do live uh, near the park. It's like a block or two away from my home. So when the 4th of July usually happens, I hear the fireworks all the time. So now it's kind of like quieted down. And so it, it's it's better now, now that we're heading towards the, um, the school season. Uh, what's going to happen is uh, this park that I go to, the local township is going to most likely turn it into a school. And because the, the area is big enough, so most likely this might be the last summer at the park. Because what happens at nighttime is you have a lot of uh, people that do like illegal activities at night. So once it's able to be a school zone, then the cops will be able to do their job by enforcing the school zone and be able to do what they need to do to kind of clean up the area. So um, there, there's always a positive that comes out of each situation as well. But uh, on the other side, um, I'm glad that uh, P Peter brought up the uh, the serpent energy and these these different aspects i spoke to a psychic from new york about two days ago and i asked him about my future wife and he said your future wife will be somebody with a serpent energy who tames you and uh basically completes that completion of the masculine and feminine energy so i found that interesting that that was brought up in terms of the the serpentine energy and also with the with the biorhythm uh, with August uh, 14 and 15, and it also is the Independence Days for India and Pakistan. So uh -huh. that's when they celebrate their Independence Days. And also in 2023, when the next 20-year cycle completes, will be the general election in Pakistan, which is a very pivotal and geopolitical um, importance because of uh, America leaving Afghanistan and how the Civil War is going to kind of break out in that area. So that, that, that would be an interesting part of the world to watch for the next two to three years. 
And uh, also what you said about the guy that wanted to interview you. <laughs> you always have to trust your intuition, Brother Douglas. Always trust your gut, your intuition. And that's what the Sufi says also, that God is in your heart. So if you trust your intuition in that aspect, then you do what your heart tells you to do in regards to how to handle the situation. It sounds good. Of course, I'll still speak with you privately later as to what your own impression was. But I, I, I would, uh, if, if, if it's not feeling right to you, then it's mo most likely not. So that's I would support your intuition in that regard because he's somebody that's projecting that energy onto you, onto your spirit in terms of whatever he's trying to get out of you. Okay. So what, whatever your intuition is in that regard, I support that 100% because... Uh, I, I know that it it kind of clicks to you. You do get that information yeah. from God and the universe and whichever way you perceive it. Yes. Yeah. And uh, so um, I, another individual is expressing their interest in interviewing me. I'll, I'll bring him up with uh, everyone later privately. But uh, that I, I seem to feel less, uh, you know, tension about in that sense. So uh, as, as Salman says, there's an intuition about about this sort of thing. And uh, when it comes to what, uh, uh, yeah, oh, um, uh, Maria, I'll um, send uh, it to her later. I'll, uh, let me just send that to her. She, uh, she has her own kind of psychic ability in this sort of uh, field. And so uh, I'll, she wants a photo, and that way she can uh, make some decisions. And uh, I'll, I'll uh, this tell her that now in the meantime uh let's uh they turn towards uh this back to these subjects because of course they're just so they're just so salacious and uh i have just way too much fun with them i really shouldn't have this much fun with them because they're just so you, you know they're, they're, they're low chakra <laughs> but uh, andrew cuomo's downfall uh which is uh as peter said it's actually uh, he, he, Peter is saying it may be ongoing, but at the same time, we all know an element of it is imminent. Uh, but uh, it's both, you know, it's been gradual, and at the same time, it's happened swiftly. And, uh, you know, it's shocking, and at the same time, it's really predictable. Uh, but uh, during his decades in politics and three times as, well, about three terms as governor, if I remember, he's banked enough ill will among enemies and his erstwhile allies uh, to sink a political career a dozen times over. And yet he also seemed uh, to have a mastery of the mechanics of power, a knack for self-advancement and preservation. And uh, so those skills that helped him... Uh, Oh, by the way, Jameson is saying that, um, Jameson, what's going on right now? Do you care to talk about this? Tell us a little bit about what's going on with yourself, what you think. I am tripping balls, man. <laughs> I, I, I'm like seeing like, like circles spiraling and uh, like the room feels like I'm underwater or something. This is really cool. Uh, so Continue. Is, it's not necessarily a negative. Maybe you could no, share with us. Oh no no no! no. Oh. This is this is actually quite 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 good. This is quite pleasant. Um, this just happened uh, spontaneously, or was there, was there some element that you took? Or? No no no. The, 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 there's a uh, there's something I wouldn't recommend anyone do mm -hmm. uh, that was involved. <laughs> you oh. know the usual. What, what, what would that be? Uh, I mean, obviously you're not recommending it, but I'm just curious. Would you care to share? Oh, oh I think I had, um, okay, I had, um, I had eight triple C's in the morning. I had, um, what do you call it? Triple C's is drug nomenclature for, explain that to uh, us. Coracetin, cold and cough, high blood pressure formula. Delightful. <laughs> and, Go uh, on. And, and and then I had like the um uh, what do you call it? I had a beer of the Natty Daddy, mm -hmm. and then like uh, to top things off, I decided to take eight more. Um, to I decided to take eight more triple C's to like you know just get rid of the hangover. Uh huh. And it's, now it's just by the way, is the breakfast of champions, of course. But you, you mean you just get up in the morning and just feel like uh, I'll. I'll <laughs> I'm just going to do this. It just uh, suddenly like comes to you to like uh, uh, pump no, yourself. No, 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 no. It's I have to do it. I don't have a choice but to do it because I'm 
kind of addicted to it. Okay. Okay. That's the not so positive aspect of right. it. Right. Understood. But, But you're but enjoying the, yourself now. Go on. Yeah. yeah, 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 I am. It's, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's kicking in and everything seems like, uh, everything seems like, well, everything seems more vivid. Mm -hmm. I feel like I'm awake for the first time mm -hmm. today. Okay. It's, uh, well, hopefully you can stay awake for the rest of the night. <laughs> and... Oh, oh, I, I definitely will, sir. Okay. And as for Cuomo, I, I think the reason why he decided to um, put himself um, to put himself out there was because I think he wanted to celebrate his accomplishment. In, in other words, he because I, I yeah. think he he's showing off basically. He's showing off his power. He's like, look at what I did. He he he's like in in a sense inside of himself. He's proud of himself because he's just that twisted of a individual. <laughs> That somehow he feels this is masculine, uh, you know. Maria. It's, it's 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 gratifying for him to be able to um, to 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 replay everything. He was quoted as saying by one of the women says, you know, he quoted himself as saying, "Well, yes, uh, you know, you women like men of men of money and power." He identified himself like, you know, I I have money and I'm powerful, like I'm attractive, which is true. Some women are attracted to that, but it's. It's sort of a disgusting situation. Yeah, well, to say the least. I mean, <laughs> no, the uh, basically um, he's insisted, of course, that these women all misunderstood his words, his actions, and intentions. All eleven of them. All eleven of them. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Honestly, I, I think he should be imprisoned because the next step for him will be rape. Well, have you heard of this guy? Uh, I think his name is Sean DeWatson or Sean Watson. He's a quarterback for the Houston Texans. And he has all these incidents with all these masseuses he hires. He flies them in because he's very wealthy as a highly paid quarterback. And he's a very good quarterback, by the way. And he's... He, flies in all these masseuses and they all complain about him. He's trying to turn the massage into a sexual gratification uh, incident. And they all complain and there's like all these multiple complaints. And uh, it's like it, it kind of died down in the press, but they don't know what to do with him. The team wants to get rid of him, but they can't get rid of him because nobody wants to trade him. They've got all this money and it's, it's just a real PR problem. But I mean, It's like the problem. The problem is this money shit is taking the. Uh, the problem is people are focusing more on money than what's right and what's wrong. That's why this world is degenerating. Well, but I'm saying is he has all these people accusing him. He's obviously mis, you know, calculating what he wants. He should be hiring uh, escorts who, who pretend they're massage massage therapists. He would do far better. It's like it's he's basically trying to hire a prostitute. So he's creating this ridiculous situation for himself. Um, and of course, um, Cuomo is is not doing the same thing, but he's doing something similar where he's making continual uh, miscalculations in trying to secure uh some sort of and he has a girlfriend apparently but uh he that it, it should be pointed out that he was married to one of the kennedy family one of robert kennedy's children and this was considered they were considered a power couple uh and of course she got rid of him doesn't have very nice things to say about him they have some children in common but this was the cuomo dynasty with the kennedy dynasty and that that's what was originally being groomed uh And he just is just a complete, you know, guilty of extremely boorish behavior. He has no uh, social skills whatsoever. Yeah, he has I, power I, skills. Yeah. How the heck did he become governor with with, with, with no social skills? Because New York is just that fucked up. But it, it's, oh, basically, it's basically, power. yeah. I'm, I'm sorry. Go on, Peter. Power. It's power. It's power. And 
you you know he's I mean, his father was the governor of New York. Right. His father, his father was very powerful. And what was most notable about his 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 father, Mario Cuomo, was Mario was insistent there was no such thing as the mafia. He would publicly <laughs> proclaim <laughs> there was no mafia. And whenever the God, and this is when I first came to uh, Long Island, when whenever the Godfather would be on TV. It was only not even 10 years old at that time or a little over 10 years old. They would put this big disclaimer on it. This is not to profile Italian-Americans. Uh, Italian-Americans are, you know, some of the greatest noble people in the United States. Uh, this is just a fictional movie. And that was at the insistence of Governor Cuomo. And he, he's sitting there making these raging comments. And, you know, Cuomo was a pretty, for the most part, even keeled guy. He didn't, you know, he wasn't like, he wasn't in your face like his sons. Uh, he was much more uh, low key. But what what happened was his wife's father, who I believe owned a grocery store, was shot in a mafia killing. Jesus. And he kind of had to shut up about no mafia after that. <laughs> He kind of apologized and admitted there was a mafia. And I, I think it was like, you know, it wasn't the mafia telling him to, to do it, no. but it was sort of obvious. So uh, Governor Cuomo, the current Governor Cuomo, his, his uh, father and his father, his grand, uh, would have been his uh, grandfather, was apparently shot by the mob. Uh, I don't know what it was about. Um, I would imagine that somebody wasn't towing the line. Yeah. It, and, it, and if he was saying there was no mob, it's probably because he had mob affiliations. Yes. Yeah. And, and it, but it's just such a ridiculous thing to do. It, it only attracts more attention to what he's trying to deny. Uh, I think it was just a, what, 2018 that Joe Prococo one of uh, the father's right-hand men, who later became one of the sons. He was sentenced to six years in prison for bribery and fraud. Uh, so Cuomo's basically come to rely more and more on um, just basically losers. Uh, uh, back in 2011, he came into the governor's mansion with a coterie of trusted advisors, you know, the heavies, the attorneys, basically, the wise and pros. And then uh, now it's more like uh, just uh, uh, yes men. I mean, basically, he says he surrounds himself with, in his own words, mean girls, you know, whatever that means. I guess that means that they're mean because they say no. <laughs> now, now, here is a quote from uh, Sammy the Bull Gravano about Cuomo. Ex, this is from the Newsweek. Ex Gambino crime family underboss Salvatore Sammy the Bull Gravano on Saturday slammed New York Governor Andrew Cuomo's disgusting alleged sexual misconduct and urged Italian Americans in the state to get rid of the embattled politician. Gravano, a former New York mobster turned podcast host, I didn't know that, responded to the state. Maybe he'd have it on. He could stuff you didn't know, Douglas. Yeah, there you go. He said, I told you who was the Italian connection to those Japanese. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Responded to state. He responded to state attorneys general Letitia James's Tuesday release uh, of 165 page, which outlined 11 women's sexual misconduct allegations against Cuomo. Gravano told Newsweek by phone Saturday that New Yorkers of all political affiliation should also be infuriated by Cuomo's attempted cover up of tens of thousands of covid 19 nursing home deaths last year. Gravano said Cuomo killed more people than the mafia did in this country. <laughs> he sent thousands of recovering COVID-19 patients into nursing homes. This guy is literally the worst of the worst, Gravano said of Cuomo in a YouTube video released Friday, which highlighted allegations of both government corruption and sexual misconduct against the New York governor. He used public funds to write a book so he could make $5 million. He put people who have the coronavirus in old age homes, 13 or 15,000 senior citizens died. This is more than the mafia killed in the entire time they were in this country. He's probably right. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> you know? <laughs> Send him a copy uh, of our book. <laughs> yeah. The Brooklyn-born ex-gangster said he's bothered 
that the governor and his brother, CNN host Chris Cuomo, are of Italian-American heritage. Yeah, they're giving the Italians a bad name compared to the mafia. <laughs> <laughs> the mafia is pissed off at him. He condemns Chris Cuomo for notoriously comparing the term Fredo from the Godfather to use of the N-word towards black people. Gravano argued that both Cuomo brothers have tarnished the legacy of their late father, Mario Cuomo, who died in 2015. I'm a New Yorker. Quote, I'm a New Yorker. I don't know how people look at 12 to 15,000 people dead. He can blame Trump or whoever he wants. But I know if you gave me an order to put those people in their nursing home with all those old people, if you put a gun to my head, I wouldn't do it. Don't blame somebody else. You are in power. Um, boy, you know, I mean, uh, quote, I mean, Gravano is like, uh, you know, doing what he can to redeem himself by saying this stuff. Uh, Impressive uh, in that sense. I, I'm uh, just uh, glad that, uh, uh, you know, you've got these people who are uh, turning against Cuomo. I mean, it's certainly what he needs is to be turned against. Uh, this is an individual, of course, who uh, has just uh, in, embarrassed himself to the point where it's like, uh, honestly, it's, it's a form of masochism at this point, what he's uh, putting himself um, through. Basically, uh, it's all the same kind of, uh, how would I say it? it? It proves that the personal is inevitably political. I mean, his treatment of his accusers, it mirrors his dealings with his colleagues in state government, or, or rather his constituents, which is to charm, bully, gaslight, and lie. Uh, I, I mean, the impression that I get is of a guy looking for a chance to cop a feel or make a subordinate feel ill at ease and whether it's about the sex or the power may be beside the point. <laughs> I mean, going back several years, uh, basically as the pandemic uh, shrinks Cuomo's circle and limits his contact with the outside world, uh, he comes off as a combination of Howard Stern with the, the things I would do to you. Uh, as uh, he told executive assistant number one, uh, per the report, one of his mingle mamas, uh, his, his words are just so poetic, are Colonel Kurtz from uh, Apocalypse Now, so far upriver, increasingly isolated, surrounded by toadies and severed heads. <laughs> and McCall oh, here's, here's, a, here's a good story for you, Douglas. And this involves me. Uh, when I first went to work in 1985, in December, for this company, I was uh, doing leasing for computers. And it was my first week on the job. It was December. And I'm like, I, I think I brought $30,000 into the company on my first week. And I was walking. I gone down to the Gramercy area downtown. Uh, Manhattan, and it's a very cold December. And I'm, I've am i got this check from Dr. Kreider for $18,000 in my pocket. And I'm going back to the office, which is in the Korean section of Manhattan, near 30th Street. And I'm walking back. And it's cold. And I'm walking on the street, and I see out of the corner of my eye, a man that is John Gotti. I don't know John Gotti is, mm -hmm. but I, I sense a menacing presence. <laughs> this guy's sitting in a car, and it must have been Sammy the Bull driving. And I see this guy looking at me, and I don't look at him. I know I'm not supposed to look at him. Right. I just keep going straight. This is called street smarts. Yes. I said, don't need to look like some curious Dumbo at who this guy is. I'm minding my own business. This guy is completely menacing. I'm walking down the street, and I walk right by this steakhouse. It's Spark Steakhouse. I remember it. I just walk by, deliver the check, take the train home, and the next day I read in the paper that uh, – Gambino boss Paul Castellano was whacked right in front of that steakhouse, probably 
I think I heard the gunshots go off. You know, there's a car backfiring or whatnot. Right. I right. don't remember if I did. Right. But in the city, that sort of thing is like background noise. But I get what you're saying exactly. Well, yes. it, it's a big thing, but it's like you know. So anyway, I don't remember if I heard the shots or not because I could I could be imagining that. But I remember seeing. Oh God, I just went, was in front of that steakhouse. I missed this thing, you know, within a short time period because Gotti. I later read was sitting down there making the, he didn't do the hit. Right. He was there to make sure the hit was done. Yeah. And then that's how he became the boss. And so like, I, I remember that, but but that's just sort of my background in, in, I remember my boss partner that I was involved with at the time, he says, oh, people love this stuff. They love this stuff. In other words, the reporting on it that was in the press. <clears throat> okay, now it says here, that Mario Cuomo was a mafia denier. Uh, <laughs> he says, it's he's quoted as saying that the mafia's existence is a lot of baloney and just a word invented by people. When, uh, and it says, uh, the gov when, when Castellano was whacked in front of the steakhouse, uh, the governor urged reporters to refrain from invoking the word mafia in reference to the hit. Cuomo then criticized the Roman Catholic archdiocese of New York for refusing to bury Castellano in sacred ground. Cuomo once had presidential ambitions, but abandoned them due to speculation about mob connections, particularly involving father-in-law Charles Rafa. This would be Andrew Cuomo's uh, grandfather, who suffered. Now, I thought he was shot. It says, suffered a near-fatal beatdown in 1984 outside a vacant supermarket he owned in Brooklyn. In a November 1987 cover story, Mario, Mario Cuomo and those mob rumors. Uh, even though he was a denier, uh, Cuomo was a denier, William Fugazi, one of his earliest political supporters and bosom buddies, was a Genovese crime family associate. Fugazi founded the National Ethnic Coalition of Organizations, of which Cuomo was a member. And in 1986, the governor appointed Fugazi to head the New York State Statue of Liberty Centennial Commission. Uh, one time, Lucchese acting boss Al Diarco testified in a 1997 trial that Fugazi had ties to Genovese boss Vincent Giganti. Fugazi and Roy Cohn were co-promoters of the second and third Johansson-Patterson heavyweight title fights in 61 and 62, and Cohn's decide ties to fat Tony Salerno are extensive. Uh, in the mid '60s, Fugazi was a co-owner of Julius's restaurant in Greenwich Village, which during the late night and wee hours morning was converted to a gay bar. So, um, <laughs> so, so you know, I mean, it's like, uh, according to this, Cuomo was in bed with a Genovese crime family associate. He acts uh, like it. He acts like it, and that's where that sense of of privilege comes from that sense that I can get away with anything comes from that. Yeah. Go on. Yeah. And, and Mario, you know, he was the politician. He was the nice guy. He, he, you know, he would make, uh, you know, comments, but he, he wasn't like, uh, you know, he, he just wasn't anywhere near as obnoxious as his sons, right. you know, because he was from an earlier generation. He probably grew up uh, struggling, if not poor, because of his generation. So he was, and these kids are entitled up the kazoo. Yes. Uh, so th that's uh, that's that's the governor. Um, that's the governor. It, it's. Um, I don't know how much longer he will be the governor. <laughs> That's uh well, you know, the crowd he's surrounded with now, they they, they might be good for Albany, but they, they just don't understand the bigger themes in life. Uh, I, I think this guy is like, uh, uh, yeah, he's he's just he's just gotten too small. He's he's just shrunk. He's he's like. Well, well, this is what they didn't like about John Gotti, yeah. is that he made himself a celebrity, and he made he made the mob identifiable. And, you know, he, he was getting too much press. Yes. yes. And the mob doesn't like press. Yeah. And, you know, so it's like, you know, he's sticking out like a sore thumb. And I I don't think it's it's good to stand out like a sore thumb. 
and he has many political enemies, and he looks like an absolute buffoon, uh, <laughs> yes. defiant. But you know what? We'll see. This is fascinating because it's all about power. How long can he hold on to his power? Um, you know, Trump was holding on to power. If he exercised more power, more ruthless power, he might have been able to, more forceful, he might have been able to... Uh, maintain it. Maintain it. But he didn't cross that line uh, because he probably knew that if he did, it, it might cover consequences that he could not handle. He knew when not to... He knew what lines he wasn't going to cross. Uh, I, I would argue and, that he he tried. I would argue that he tried. He could have. He could have. He could have sent in militia to do the vote counting. He could have done that. Yes. And 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 whether it looked outrageous and whether it was right or wrong, he could have had the votes count. Uh, and and Biden, for all of his all of the uh, dislike that's generated at him by. The Republican contingent and it is not anywhere near the hatred that Trump aroused by his detractors. Of course, the media was feeding the flames, and they don't feed the flames against Biden. They 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 deflect them. Well, well, but, uh, understand, of course, Biden has the advantage that he's an empty slate. I mean, <laughs> the guy's I, a back. You know what, Biden, for all of his is. Uh, imbecilic qualities is more of a sympathetic figure to his detractors than Trump, who is just hated uh, beyond belief by his detractors, many of his detractors anyway. Uh, you know, they just they just completely uh, deranged uh, by him, whereas the people that hate Biden aren't, you know, it's like they, they feel more sympathetic uh Pathetic. They think he's pathetic. Uh, but and even people who thought Trump was pathetic, they, they just get, you know, very vehement. And some people could completely lose it over Trump, completely discombobulate their emotions over Trump's personal demeanor and behavior and all that. So uh, Cuomo, I'm surprised Cuomo doesn't arouse even more outrage because He's he's much more imbecilic than either of these Biden or Trump, in my opinion. He's he's much nastier. He's much yes. more criminally inclined than either one of them. Yes. And and he's not as clever. You know, he's 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 only they say, you know, he might they said before the five million, he was worth nine hundred thousand wow. dollars. Um, Trump. Trump is, you know, buried his finances amongst Tons of lawyers. Biden, uh, you know, has his Chinese money and all that, but, you know, he manages to not a attract enough attention, whereas Cuomo is just... Uh, yeah, ah, just, Cuomo's just, he's, he's just too out there. Uh, one of the things I'm going to do right now is the temperature is dropping a bit in San Francisco. I'm going to switch to um, this longer-sleeved garment uh, while so I'm doing... I'm sorry. So what temperature is it going down to? Oh, it's uh, it's it says it's 57 degrees Fahrenheit, but uh, you know it's uh, it certainly feels lower than that. Uh, it, it's colder. 57 in... degrees is cold in San Francisco. It might as well be 37. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. The Thank fog, you. The fog and it yes. just it's a it's a cool city. Um, not always, but it's a cool city and. Um, yeah, it's it's very understandable. Fifty seven in in New York is quite tolerable. Yes. We've had very cool weather here for uh well, for tell New us York. about that while I while I switch into this. Yes, tell us about that. Well, the weather's not too interesting. It's it's been uh cool here. Uh AC has not been needed and uh, maybe a little bit in the last few days, and then we've had rain. Um but um, yeah, you you don't want to go to San Francisco without a sweater. <laughs> yes, yes. Perhaps jacket. 
Yes, and so many people. I was telling people before you came on about how back in the day, um, every once in a while, when I was uh, desperate for money and uh, would dress and drag and uh, lure people into the alleyways and mug them effectively, and just how, of course, back in those days, people carried much more cash. And uh, in terms of the, uh, you know, these days, I was telling people about how uh, even today, most people who are tourists coming to San Francisco would tend to carry cash because, of course, many of them would be coming over to use the prostitutes or the street hustlers. And, you know, that's a cash type of industry. But then I was bringing up the fact that oftentimes you would take them to hotels and you don't want that to show up uh, where your boss can see it, your employer, or where your wife can see it. Uh, either way, it's equally bad. And so you would want to put cash down for those hotel rooms. And yet they've uh, they've altered the hotel industry in San Francisco where hotels do not like hotels do not like cash. Yeah, that they're no longer taking cash. And so the it's it's. It's incredible. I don't know how this sort of uh, lifestyle or industry is going to mutate to deal with that. Uh, but, uh, of course, these days, thank God, uh, I do have my listeners and my fellow sponsors. The way to do it, the way to do it is you have the prostitute have a, have a credit card. Yeah. And they give the prostitute the money and the, she puts it on her card. That's the way to do it. Uh, so you, you would have to have the, uh, the hookers... Um, you know, the pimps would have an American Express card that would say Joe Pimp, and then he'd have his, and then he'd have his American, and get, you know, put people on your American Express card. You know, they can, and you pay the bill, uh, and you can put a credit limit on it. Oh, so you God. can say, you know, uh, Sally can have, you know, $500 credit, you know, and Mary Jane can have $500 credit. They all have their American Express cards, and the Joe Pimp gets, you know, uh, Delta flight miles on him, you know, <laughs> Tim can fly anywhere he wants. Uh, oh. yeah. So that, that, that would be the efficient way to do it. Or, or, uh, maybe cryptocurrency would be even better, but, th but that's the way to do it. You know, you know, pimp, it would make a good American express commercial, at least on Saturday Night Live, where you have the pimp with the American express card. Yes. Yes. Uh, this is uh, the new economics that Peter is describing. So that turns us, of course, towards uh, where um, it's, uh, you know, it's time to talk about some of that economics. We've got uh, billionaires Jeff Bezos and Richard Branson, uh, who have both raced into empty space. Uh, Elon Musk says he wants to die on Mars. Uh, all three men say that combating climate change is important to them, but they remain invested in carbon intensive businesses. And without a hint of self-parody, we've reached a new epoch of human progress or, or digress, uh, the billionaire space race. So the world's richest man, and by the way, I would argue, and I believe Peter here could, uh, could pre pretty much agree with me. I, I think that he's the world's richest man we know of, but there's honestly men that are richer than him that pay not to be listed in the Forbes 500, so to speak. And uh, they pay to have unlisted numbers, so to speak. I've always said that. Uh, there's got to be the old Rich, like the Rockefellers, etc., who just by sheer massing over time have got to have more than what Bezos has got, has supposedly earned. Uh, but uh, the world's richest man that we know of strapped himself into an expensive, well, basically an explosive dildo to hump into space and the dick jokes they all made themselves at that point and speaking of cockspewy the billionaire space race further serves to legitimize the benevolence of these great fortunes and all the emissions these titans emit uh, so you've had this amazon billionaire jeff bezos who finally conquered a new personal frontier by traveling to space with his blue origin crew just days after the fellow billionaire richard branson did it there's no machismo about this at all but what really captured everyone's attention was the interesting shape of the rocket itself. It immediately inspired a lot of jokes and drew comparisons to the 1999 Austin Powers movie, The Spy Who Shagged Me, and all the jokes were pretty NSFW, not safe for work. Uh, but thankfully, this is my job, so I'm covered. Uh, Jeff Bezos' trip to space wasn't any bid to save humanity. 
It was a PR stunt by a billionaire pretending he cares about the rest of us. So month before last on Instagram, the Amazon founder, Jeff Bezos, released this slightly awkward and all too obviously staged video where he invited his younger brother, Mark, to launch 62 miles into the air to just above what is known as the Kármán line, or the Earth's border with space. And the Bezos brothers, along with another extremely wealthy person who paid 28 million U.S. dollars via auction for the opportunity, and the uh, barrier-breaking aviatrix, Wally Funk, uh, which is a great name she got monikered with. Uh, her parents must have hated her. And by that and her appearance, I swore she was a dude till I looked into her background. Uh, they all together took the first human flight on Blue Origin, that space exploration company created by Bezos, to become the oldest ever person to fly in space. And not to be un well, not to be outdone by another billionaire, Virgin's Richard Branson uh, beat Bezos to the chase by flying to space on the 11th of July. And Wally Funk may have finally achieved her lifelong goal of visiting space, but she still plans to take the Virgin Galactic trip she paid $200,000 for over a decade ago. So Branson maintains that he wasn't racing Bezos to space, but that his engineers just happened to sign off on his trip after a successful test flight on May 22nd. Bezos the Bozo and Branson the Buffoon both hope their space ventures will bring tourists on similar trips sometime soon. Elon Musk, the munchkin who hopes to die on Mars, won't be the first or second billionaire to go to space in a rocket he helped fund, but he is winning the billionaire space race in a different way, much to Bezos's chagrin. Musk's company, SpaceX, won a highly competitive bid from NASA to bring Americans to the moon as early as 2024. If we're counting on these fuckers to bring us back into hard vacuum, we are well and truly fucked. Bezos is contesting the loss of this multi-billion dollar contract with an army of lobbyists to get Blue Origin a contract too. And according to The Intercept, Blue Origin spent $625,000 on lobbying in the first three months of 2021. And if their, well, if their efforts are successful, Bezos could get an additional 10 billion US dollar contract of his own. Uh, still, what unites all these men, the Three Stooges, beyond their immense wealth and thirst for hard vacuum, is some desire to save the Earth, particularly from climate change. And this has driven Musk's investments into Tesla, his electric car company, and his solar ventures. And Bezos announced last year he would commit $10 billion to an Earth Fund to combat climate change. He even brought, well, he purchased the naming rights uh, to a sports arena in Seattle and christened it Climate Pledge Arena to make sure no one forgot about his environmental largesse. Now, Branson, for his part, may have been ahead of the curve in his book titled, if you can believe this, Screw It, Let's Do It. Branson wrote about Al Gore, giving him a personal presentation of his film, An Inconvenient Truth. And to quote his, well, from his own published writ, as I sat there and listened to Al Gore, I saw that we were looking at Armageddon. And Branson soon pledged, three billion dollars over 10 years to develop alternatives to fossil fuels to power his airline. And if successful, Branson declared at the time, we can carry on living our lives in a pretty normal way. We can drive our cars. We can fly our planes. Life can carry on as normal. And yet, as the journalist and social critic Naomi Klein wrote in her own 2014 book titled, This Changes Everything, and subtitled, Capitalism versus the Climate, immediately thereafter, Dick Branson made his alternative fuel pledge. Branson went on an airplane procurement spree. Virgin Airlines' emissions soared by, at the very least, 40%. So Branson became the punchline for Klein's entire thesis, Green Billionaires Will Not Save Us. So all of this is truly a global burning. We're getting burned by a bunch of assholes. Mm. 
And despite their shoddy at best record of reducing emissions, these billionaires have come up with a way to square the circle of owning emission spouting companies and saving the world by going into space. And as Bezos has tweeted on multiple occasions, we go to space to save the Earth. In fact, I found out by looking back through his sordid career that during his high school graduation speech, he suggested that we need to go to space in order to, well, in order to, his words, get all people off the Earth and see it turned into a huge national park. Of course, since it's global, it wouldn't be national. <laughs> now, during a 2019 keynote speech on his extraterrestrial ambitions, Bezos elaborated on this vision, arguing that unless we leave Earth, we will always be constrained by increasing demand for finite resources, and that by going into space, for all practical purposes, we have unlimited resources. If we're out in the solar system, we can have a trillion humans in the solar system, which means we'd have a thousand Mozarts and a thousand Einsteins. This would be an incredible civilization. You know, it may be a shock to Jeff Bezos, but there may even be a thousand Mozarts and Einsteins moving packages in his fulfillment centers right now, being forced by our system to pee into bottles instead of achieving their personal potentials. But acknowledging these possibilities would be a hindrance to Amazon's balance sheet, and thus Bezos' multiplanetary ambitions. And yet Bezos' view that because of the insatiable need for growth that makes it almost impossible to mitigate climate change, we must move into the stratosphere is all too widespread. The fellow billionaire, Peter Thiel, who funds space exploration through his Founders Fund, shares similar conclusions. In a space manifesto titled New World, the Capital Fund parrots all these tired tropes about the American frontier story in order to justify settlement on Mars. And because of cultural and economic decline, not to mention climate change, the species' best hope this Peter Thiel manifesto so states, is to blast off into space on a phallic rocket. Now, this view, promulgated by Bezos and all these other ultra-wealthy space entrepreneurs, is older than that of the American frontier story. Colonization on Earth was always rationalized with the need for more resources. When Europe was running out of raw material, the natural answer was to colonize further rather than make any changes at home. This was also the rationalization of the earliest formations of uh, American imperialism. Of course, ever since the first tribe walked out of the Great Rift Valley and crossed the Sinai Peninsula into Asia, humans have always been explorers. We've crossed continents, then oceans, and in the 20th century left Earth itself. There's glory in our species' expansive nature, and as the TV show says, space is the final frontier. However, Jeff Bezos is not my astronaut. Bezos's Blue Origin trip was an empty calories honor for an egonaut, not an astronaut. And Bezos declared in the video announcing his flight, If you see the Earth from space, it changes you. It changes your relationship with this planet, with humanity. But it remains to be seen if going into space will change Bezos' view of humanity at all. Last month, the New York Times reported that the billionaire views people as inherently lazy. One person close to him told the paper, What he would say is that our nature as humans is to expend as little energy as possible to get what we want or need. Well, in contrast to that, think of Sally Wright. One of the... Well, she was one of 35 people selected from 8,000 applications after receiving a Ph.D. in physics. Ms. Ride spent 843 hours in space aboard the space shuttle Challenger, where she was charged with operating the robotics arm. They called it the Canada arm, I think because it was made in Canada. And I wonder if, when peering down at Earth 300 miles below, she registered satisfaction from her hard work or the reward of pursuing greatness in the agency of others? Was it freeing to be in space, on a craft judged only by her skills and character? I may never know. What I am certain of is that mission specialist Sally Kristen Ride is a United States astronaut, 
and went to space for all mankind. Such being precedent, I myself felt more disdain than any wonder watching Richard Branson's Joyride and Jeff Bezos' soulless flight to the Karma Online. Now everybody gets a For All Mankind trophy. There was no ground broken here. In 1903, the Wright brothers completed the first powered flight for the American Empire. In 1961, Yuri Gigarin was the first acknowledged Allied sky soldier in space. In 1969, Neil Armstrong was the first acknowledged Allied military airman on the moon. Those are milestones worthy of some celebration by their sponsor states, accomplished as they were under conditions of combat against the Thousand Year Reich in exile. In 2004, Bert Rattan's scaled composites carried the first people into space on a privately built spacecraft, a merchant milestone of sorts. But Jeff Bezos's Blue Origin flight wasn't the milestone it's chalked up to be. What was accomplished on the 11th of July with Branson and the 20th of July with Bezos? Well, one of Bezos's passengers, Wally the Funk, became the oldest person ever in space. Sure, pioneering pilotess Wally Funk's trip to space with Jeff Bezos at age 82 is reason to celebrate. One of the original aviatrices and a long ago on members of the Mercury 13, the all female astronaut corps, all passed over by NASA in the 1960s, that decade I myself was born. Ms. Funk was overlooked for space flight in the 60s, but got a second chance to defy gravity and 60 years of exclusion from space with Jeff Bezos. Of course, after the flight, she reminded us that when you're 82, you have zero fucks to give. She was disappointed in both the view and the length of the flight, and she found the cabin insufficiently spacious for the rolls and twists and so forth she wanted to do. Still over a decade ago, Funk paid $200,000 for a future ride on Virgin Galactic's suborbital plane, and it seems she has no intention of giving up her seat. And to quote Funk's own agent, Loretta Hall, at this point, Wally is planning to fly with Virgin Galactic too. And another of Bezos's passengers became the youngest person ever in space. Now this sounds like something, except that he bought his way onto the flight. Actually, his father, a private equity billionaire, paid for the recent high school graduates estimated $28 million ticket. You know, in comparison, the youngest among Sugar Daddy's campus of transfusion associates has been acting up, if acting up is terrorizing all the rest of the blood boys in the harem. He constantly assesses the household for weaknesses and then makes brazen attacks on his older brethren and anything resembling domestic harmony. My son's hubby doesn't seem to have any idea how to deal with this aside from arranging counseling into the lad's tutorial schedule, so he gifted him a thousand dollar iPad. His wife told him he was sending the wrong message, but he reminded my son that the message could have been 28,000 times worse. So there'd be that to ponder by way of parceling privilege. Now, before I get into this in depth, I do want to remind people, of course, it's very late over on the eastern coast. Uh, uh, and uh, Peter Moon, I do want him to respond to some of the economics of this, because one of the things I do want to bring up is how all of this is impacting our world economically or the kind of economics that it's based on, the egonomics and the like. But, uh, you know, I'm sure that Peter Moon had his own dreams of astronautical voyage at some point in his youth. I mean, certainly everybody entertains this sort of thing. But he managed to, uh, well, he managed to get involved with going into time, if not going into space. And, uh, you know, before you take off for tonight, because it's probably closer to bedtime for you, uh, do tell us a bit about uh, some of what that brings to mind and also do yes, remind yes. us. And, and, of course, I was uh, motivated uh, to some degree to be an astronaut. I'm not sure why, uh, because it, it was like the, the final frontier is the way it appeared. And I, it wasn't not anything I seriously pursued, uh, but it was something that I said, wow, this is neat. And of course, when I read, Arthur C. Clarke was one of my favorite 
science fiction authors because he was so pragmatic about uh, science and he he understood the science of being able to put put people on the moon and in outer space and and in Mars. And I, so anyway, I remember doing uh, it was during the summer of 1969. I was doing U.S. history class in the summer school, and I did a report on space. We could do different reports, and I I, I went into the reader's guide, and you know I did it all according to the way you're supposed to do research, and I read articles about space exploration, and it became very evident to me that there were all sorts of economic reasons to explore space. Because if you looked at NASA, there was all this industry that had spurned. It was positive. And people say, why do we spend all this money on space? Well, because it makes more money. But th this stuff doesn't get talked about. If you read the articles, yes. So I was to do pros and cons. All I could find was articles that were logical for, ex for exploring space. There was not one logical argument for not exploring it or not pursuing it. Now, um, as I read, I thought, wow, this is far out. We could have colonies on the moon. We could have colonies on Mars. And it was very evident to me that if you took the knowledge of people like Robert Heinlein, Arthur C. Clarke, and uh, Isaac Asimov, to say nothing of the rank and file scientists and engineers you never hear of, if I had the money, I knew at that point, if I was a 17, 16 year old kid with money, I could hire these people and I could create a colony on the moon. Not through any great uh, engineering knowledge myself, but from hiring people. I said, this is a no brainer. You could do this. There was enough knowledge. A Heinlein goes into it in great detail. Um, so here it is 60 years later, uh, plus years later, and these billionaires have money. They can hire people. They have a license to create. And I wonder, this is their own ego, uh, being creative and it's a lot of ego. I don't know how productive it is. Um, Elon Musk leaves a lot to be desired, but he's got his finger <laughs> on the pulse. I love the way you say that. By the way, in all fairness, Blue Origin's reusable rocket is a real technological achievement, but that was news back in 2015. None of the July astronauts were even the first space tourist. That empty calories on it belongs to Dennis Tito, who paid $20 million for a ride on a Russian rocket back in 2001 when both of my parents were still alive. And Tito spent a week in space, living on the International Space Station, the equivalent of nearly a thousand 11-minute trips on Blue Origin. Eh, astronauts my ass. Apollo 11 and... Chris Columbus traveled 240,000 and 3,000 miles, respectively, to reach the moon and the Caribbean Isles. New Shepard 4 traveled 0.026% of the way to the moon. Put another way, on the 20th of July, we watched a man plant a flag three feet up from base camp at Mount Everest and expect to be knighted. You know, sometime in the not-too-far-flung future, Pete the Moon Man will be back in Montauk. He could swim a half mile from shore, and I bet my bottom dollar he can do this, and then thereafter declare that he's discovered Spain. I mean, that's what we saw. I mean, <laughs> take it from there. <laughs> well, I will also uh, it, it respond to what you said. It was like... Uh, as I got into Scientology, I remember talking to this guy, Ed Petty, who was a staff member at the Mission of Davis. And uh, he said, I was talking about, you know, astronaut, and he says, he made this comment, and he says, it's like sending a caveman into space. He said, an astronaut is like a caveman going into space. He doesn't know anything about anything. 
of course, know something about something or he wouldn't be going there. But he he was disparaging uh, the astronauts view about the spirit, you know, and it's like, wow, you could you could the spiritual the travel of the spirit is much more exciting now uh, to go into inner space. And now b- between the uh, precipice of time travel or going into the inner earth, these are much more interesting than going into an inhospitable climate on the moon or Mars and carving out an existence. It seems very heroic and pioneering and all that sort of thing. Um, But it's like, uh, what do I want to do that? Do I want to go out and and go to Antarctica like Admiral Byrd and uh, sit in the cold for six months? No, no, I don't want to do that. I mean, it's... Uh, yeah, you saw what happened to him. He nearly died from his uh, gas range, which he had to keep on to keep himself warm. And yet, of course, he was dying from the poison of it. Uh, so it was the longest winter he ever spent. It was awful. Um, it, it destroyed him. Uh, and he pretty much, uh, you know, changed after that. Uh, he survived it, but he definitely was not the same. Well, yeah, and, and so it's like, this whole idea of being the astronaut is the external world. The internal world is something that's very important. Uh, what's going on inside of you? Um, and, and it's not that the external world should be ignored or excluded, but uh, I mean, it's all this great stuff going into space. I really enjoyed Hubbard's attitude about any anything that was uh, invented by this civilization, he was so cynical about it. Like you know, he just said, "Oh, you know, here they are doing this again." <laughs> uh, he was not impressed by anything that was done, and he he considered it was just a, a reinvention of stuff that was done on the whole track, and there was very little that was new or innovative. Um. And and he, he was really sincere about that. And he thought that this civilization, everything that they did was just a knockoff of, of stuff that was done before. Uh, it's not that there might be anything he might not praise, but he was generally unimpressed. So what are these? Um, these people are very wealthy and they have a certain amount of creative flexibility. And... It's like, you know, if, if the, the, you don't hear them talking about time, I can't imagine that in the, in the secretive world of these people, they don't, you know, you think they would have heard something of David Anderson or something, and even on lines separate from what I communicate on, uh, who are these people? He probably David probably doesn't want to have anything to do with them. I was about to say uh, they're beneath his dignity, and in terms of uh, uh, they themselves, uh, they're in their own little world. These people are hearing only what they want to hear. Um, I, honestly, um, you know, uh, with Jeffy Boy, uh, the Bezos bozo, it's his money, and he has a right to spend it on what he wants. But if Mr. Bezos was genuine about doing something more than crashing a canary yellow T-top Corvette into a Bosley for Men franchise, he could raise the minimum wage at his firm to $20 an hour. <laughs> I mean, this oh, is... No, no, I, I've, I've, I've heard not just him talk, not him talk about it, but the analysts about Amazon. He runs his, and, I, and I'm not, you know, begrudging him for this or complimenting him for this. It's, this is what... This is the successful formula for running his company. It's a business dynamic. And uh, Hubbard pointed out, not incorrectly, in one of his books, he said that when uh, the guy who owned the Hershey company, Hershey, yeah, when he started uh, being nice to his employees, they revolted against him. They wanted more. So it's, it's like there's a formula of business is you don't indulge your employees. You don't kiss their ass. In fact, you do the opposite. And this is not that you shouldn't be nice to people, 
this is a formula of business. You, you run it like like you you know when you're you're have a horse and you have a reins on a horse and you you got a stagecoach. You don't kiss the horse's ass. You work it. You sometimes whip it to 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 make it propel. You let him know who's in charge. Uh, this is a very it's a principle of business. And 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 this is you know, this is very Saturnian, very bottom line. But if you do anything else, the business is going to weaken. The stock price is going to go down. I'm not saying this is good or bad. I'm saying this is the way it is. And this is why they found out that if they they rotate the staff of Amazon every two or three years and people quit because they're dissatisfied, it's a better uh, business formula than if they kiss their asses. Now, you see what happened with uh, GM before it reorganized. They gave everybody benefits. Uh, as somebody said, you've got it made in the shade if you work for GM. The company went broke because it had too many obligations to the employees. And the employees were more interested in uh, being well off than they were in producing cars that were sellable. Anytime I'd walk into a, a GM dealership, it was the prices were outrageous and the merchandise was inferior. Whether I go to Subaru, Ford, Toyota, inferior. And the car smelled the same as when my father brought home a brand new Chevelle company car. It smelled the same damn way like the car smelled in 1963 or 1962 as it smelled 40 years later. <laughs> I couldn't believe it. I hadn't smelled it in a long time. I hadn't been in a Chevy, a new Chevy. Wow. It smells the same. Uh, but yeah, so, so I mean, business runs, and, and Jeff Bezos is a good businessman, whatever else he is. So, uh, yeah, it would be nice if, if he could uh, make his employees wealthy, but it's going to compromise his company. Uh, so, so, so it was said, and I, I, I understand that because I see... I've known enough people who sit on their asses and they don't work. And that's just the way life is at the company. And they get away with it. And 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 so, ooh, you know. So, I mean, as far as the, you know, but I mean, as far as as an individual, I think it just magnifies his shortcomings. Uh, Steve Jobs, for all of his innovation and genius, didn't know how to manage his health. He had no clue about his health. Yeah, it was pathetic. It, it was uh, it was like uh, he was uh, dying all the while he was alive, uh, and uh, it, and the wealth did nothing to save him. Uh, certainly, yeah. It, there is a great emptiness in wealth. There is a great emptiness, uh, uh, as Oprah said. You know, it doesn't solve your problems, but it sure does help. Uh, and and I, I think it was a very cogent statement by her. And of course, you know, I mean, she's not a person that you can admire. <laughs> I'll agree with that. Uh, or, or even envy. Uh, and then, you know, she tried to, to put her two cents into politics and realized she had to, you know, to get off that horse very what fast. Did, what did she even try to run for? Well, she talked about running. And then I think when it gets into financial disclosures and all you own, it's like uh, Caroline Kennedy backed off when they wanted her to, you know, when she was thinking of running for senator because they want financial disclosure. And look at all, all these guys are crooked anyway. Why, why do we care about their financial disclosure? Uh, because the ones that are in there are basically – on the take anyway. <laughs> yeah. It's just that they're, 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 you know, they're patted on the back. They're, they're in the fold. Uh, because, you know, there's no honesty in politics. So she, she backed off real fast uh, because she wasn't going to stand up. Trump, uh, you know, he just basically told them to F off and never revealed anything. 
which was to me, it was smart. Uh, why should he give away his fortune? Why should he tell anybody what he owns? Uh, you know, that, that, you know, it's none of their business. And, and even if he did show off, it wasn't, Russia wasn't going to show up. I don't think, uh, it wasn't going to show up on what he would have released and maybe it would have, but why, why does he, why does he care? Why, why does he want to give into that? Why do you want anybody to know what you own? Uh, it's not in anybody's, you know, it's not in his best interest and it didn't stop him from becoming president. So I, I don't know these guys, you know, it, it depends who they are and what they are. And Richard Branson likes a lot of publicity and he likes to portray himself as a great adventure. He seems to like adventure and he seems to have a lot of fun. Yeah. Oh God, don't, uh, don't, let's uh, don't even get me started. <laughs> I, I don't, I mean, he does. He, 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 he seems to have a lot of fun and enthusiasm and he projects fun and enthusiasm. I don't know. Uh, <laughs> It's one of those things where I, of course, I personally hate him because of uh, everything that was stolen from me on uh, on, on the Virgin Airlines. Uh, so uh, it, it's it's just the, as far as I'm concerned, he disgusts me just by looking at him. The <laughs> fact that he's alive. Uh, that being said, of course, uh, what uh, what Peter describes is, of course, the horrors of capitalism. This is capitalism. This is why capitalism is a system that is intrinsically flawed. Uh, it's anti-human in the sense that uh, you cannot really function for all the reasons that Peter has uh, brought up. And uh, so this is, of course, why um, other societies have uh, developed a far better way of handling uh, the uh, the worker situation with a social net. Uh, there's no, there's no net in this capitalist system that we have in America, and they propagandize enough people so that they think that this is somehow better. Yes, it's better for the billionaires. This is the problem. Uh, if you want to look at a place that's similar where they've got this gilded age going on, it's communist China, where you get all these billionaires that are uh, working off of the uh, backs of people that uh, uh, they're employing as basically, like Peter said, uh, with the animal analogy, they're employing them basically as animal uh, labor, as if they were nothing more than horses that they're whipping. That idiot, Alibaba, who's just physically so repulsive. You, you just look at him and, and you just say how, how, you know, if I were that guy, I'd kill myself just by, you know, just so I wouldn't have to look in the mirror and see that in my reflection. <laughs> but Alibaba was... He's uh, look at his bank account. His bank account probably makes him much happier. You yeah, know? yeah, Jack Ma. Jack Ma is the owner of Alibaba, of course. And uh, yeah, but Jack Ma, when he was being interviewed... Uh, and he speaks perfect English. Uh, he basically was saying that, yeah, if you work for me, expect to work 17 hours a day, you know, six days a week at least. Yeah. And it's like, uh, well, that tells me all I need to know. <laughs> I mean, uh, this is an individual who, of course, is just using people as uh, fodder. I mean, uh, so obviously, and then if we were to take the the business model, it's like you said, this is why they have so much rotation, of course, but that's better for the company. Yes, it's better for the company. And uh, but what's better for the company that may make the company a success is not necessarily better better for the economy. It's not necessarily better for the economy as a whole that these companies have attained so much power now where they can charge the prices that they want. I mean, the products that they produce or the services that they're delivering, they're able to gouge us now for far more than they were in the past. And this is because of they, they, they've, you know, we've, we've broken all the unions. Uh, for all the reasons that you mentioned, because the unions went too far. And uh, that's why there's a balance. There has to be a balance. This is what you have in fascism. And this is why I argue for the fascist economy, where the state controls the corporations, as opposed to the corporations controlling the state, as we have here in a capitalist economy. Uh, but in a fascist that's economy... That's a good question. Yeah. Because this, and it also addresses, uh, uh, in part... Uh, Simon Shakes, you know, wh where do you th see things going? At what point does the state inherit and direct corporations? Um, corporations and government are both ruled astrologically by Capricorn 
which is ruled by Saturn. And it would be, so right now we're going, undergoing a restructuring. And you will see some dynamic restructuring in the next couple of years and how how this is going to impact. If we go back to similar times when the United States was formed, the United States um, restructured itself with a government that was there to serve the corporations, which weren't so much corporations, they were individual rich people and individuals who had farms and, and businesses. But the government was set up so as to, with the idea that it would serve these people and, and, and have an economy. Right now, uh, and, and of course that was to break away from the tyranny of uh, England, which tyranny consisted of making you pay a little bit of tax. <laughs> yes. uh, and, and making you pay a little bit of tax and and but there was also other downsides. I mean, they would put their soldiers in your house, and they they were they could do anything they wanted. Uh, and and I don't think the United States government was ever that repressive to its citizens. Uh, it, it would have been too repressive to its minority populations, uh, who were not considered citizens, but to its recognized citizens. So I think in this time, you have. Uh, the tyranny is from both the government and the corporations. You have you have tyrannical corporations, and you have this madness of, of what you call corporate raiders and and uh, what was this uh, you know raiding the company for the stock and mm -hmm. people just taking obscene amounts of money. Yeah, these so-called uh, leverage buyouts and shit. Yeah, where investment bankers are just, uh, you know, these are just people who are stealing at the white collar level. As a matter of fact, the term for it became gold collar. This was no longer white collar crime. Now we're talking about gold collar crime is where people are basically pirating uh, the economy. Uh, they're plundering the yes, yeah, and the board members are are there. It's all about power. It's just like this thing we're talking about Cuomo and Democrats. It's about power. So if you have power, you execute it. This is what's done in the in the Middle East. It's like if you have power, you exercise it. If you if you're not on the take, nobody understands you. They don't trust you. You have to be on the take. So this is how uh, how the, the corridors of power work. They're not, there's no honesty. There's no principle. You want to give the appearance of having these things, but you don't want to have, you know, integrity is a joke if you're going to survive amongst sharks. So, like, say, right now we're, we're undergoing this rebellion against tyranny. And the, the rebellion, you know, is... Is, is got its own problems because so much of it's orchestrated. Uh, and then they're tearing down the statues, the icons of white supremacy. Uh, and you wonder how much of it is being done for political reasons rather than a, a genuine protest by, by people with a, with a real gripe. You can make a case for, for both, you know, and, and then, so the United States is losing its, its credibility as, and despite all the credibility it's lost, we still have a government and the government still runs and it still performs. And if it didn't, we'd be in a lot worse shape. So things have to sort themselves out and how they sort themselves out is, and then there's also this, you know, issues of the pandemic and all the changes in this, but it seems to me during the pandemic, uh, there are certain businesses, stocks that do well, and there are those that don't do well. Right now, landlords are taking it on the chin because they're they're not they're going broke. 
But I think you know, that the didn't the court overturn that uh, that eviction uh, preemptive. In other words, you can start evicting people again. I think. Uh, yeah, some... but you still are out a lot of money for the last year. <laughs> yes. So the thing is, the correct solution would be from this incredible money supply is just write the landlord's checks for seventy percent of you know what they should have gotten they'd be happy with that and you just give them the money and and let the tenant go and uh or just even pay for the tenant to stay there the government will do that not that not that that's a great idea but it's like this whole thing of like say if we go back to denmark in the 70s mm -hmm. and i can't speak for denmark recently but the government gave a damn that every person have a right in a place to live. They would be protected to the nth degree. And I assume it was the same in the other Scandinavian countries. Now it's, it's a different situation because of all the immigration. I don't know how they cope with things now. But if we go back to that socialistic state where you paid anywhere between 40 and 60 percent in taxation, mm -hmm. but everything you had food, yes, you had a house, yeah. and you know, you could walk in the park on Sunday and have a job. Uh, and everybody was kind of copacetic, and it's, um, it, it's you know, the United States it was never built that way, it, it was never ever, uh, you know, it was like, let's not take care of everybody. Let's take care of ourselves. It's just a different mindset. Let's take care of ourselves. Mm -hmm. In Transylvania, mm -hmm. it was back in the thousands of thousands of years ago, mm -hmm. take care of yourself. But with the new people being created, you had to push them away because there was no room for them. So they had to go into Hungary, into Bulgaria, into Greece, into Germany, and and prosper there. They were kicked out or moved out, much like the people from eastern United States had to go west so they, they could explore new territories because there wasn't enough to sustain them or they were, they said, oh, we, we, you know, what is ours is ours. You have to go elsewhere. So, you you know, you push out people. And, and that's part of the way of, uh, you know, living space. So what, what happens with people now where you have, um, how do you accommodate all these people? The Northeast has a very pretty good way of accommodating people because there's so much business and activity up here. And when people start moving out, it creates more jobs for people and more opportunities. I mean, there's there's so much money in this area that, uh, you know, you see houses, you see all sorts of stuff going on. Um, of course, you know, one of the big problems is that businesses, of course, as you said, now are ready to go back into business. We'll see what happens, of course, with this new wave of the pandemic, but uh, it, it's just going to shut everything down again to an extent. But nevertheless, you know, the businesses that are trying to start up again, there's nobody responding to their help wanted signs. I mean, basically, a lot of people aren't, you know, here we have all these people unemployed. Uh, it's not the unemployment benefits that are keeping them from looking for jobs. Uh, most of them would rather be working, but none of them are going into these restaurants or for these service jobs that uh, where they need the help so badly. It's 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 a bizarre situation. Well, I know. But but then again, if you go to some place like Chipotle or or even the Apple Apple stand we have here <laughs> or you know or stores there's people working there mm -hmm. and you can get what you want uh, there's no shortage of places to go uh, maybe not as quite an abundance of there was before the pandemic mm -hmm. but uh, you know you can still pretty much go to stores and, and for all of the you know, incriminations level at Jeff Bezos, 
he's got the best store in the world. Okay. It's the best store in the world. You can go and you can buy stuff. You can get generally better prices than elsewhere. And you can get it delivered to your door. Uh, yes, this is, this, this is, this is a monopoly. Yes. <laughs> it's pretty much, he's, he's come to monopolize, uh, the market. It's not like we have a choice this, at this point. It's kind of like, well, but, those, but, 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 the, but there are different sellers yes. and they will give you the best price. See, that's what he will give you the best price of the different sellers and the recommended price. And more often than not, sometimes the recommendations are not good. Mm -hmm. But more often than not, they are. Uh, you have to be careful. You have to read the reviews. They also allow people to put up bad reviews So on the product. So there is competition involved. And he's doing, he's actually keeping, you know, he's fronting for the marketplace. It's a, it's a monopoly. You can order from Alibaba and Jack Ma. Ma but uh, I don't know if I'd want to, you know, it's like, it's a different environment. You know, the, the, the Chinese competitor, yeah, Alibaba. Right. right. Uh, it's, it's a different different experience. And, and of course, I'll, I'll talk about that. If not tonight, then certainly, um, you know, during Arc of Narrative. Uh, Amazon, yeah. Amazon if, if you're like a Prime member, uh, you also can return anything. Right, you know, right. I mean, it's such a good store. And I, I mean, I'm not complimenting Jeff Bezos, but it's it's like, it's it's just such a good store. And if I, like, go to a store to buy something, I'll find it generally cheaper on Amazon. And as they say, I don't even have to go buy it. Understood. It would, uh, look, I, 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 I lost uh, that. Yeah. It would be, oh, okay. I got to go here. I got to go there. <laughs> I got to go here. It's, it's, uh, you know, it's going to take up a whole afternoon. You're going to have a list of stores you're going to have to go to. The health food store we used to have, uh, it, it closed down because it, it's, it was always expensive, but it couldn't compete with Whole Foods. It couldn't compete. It was nice to go to once in a while where you could get something or get a drink or even a meal, but it, it just went out of business because it could not compete uh, with Whole Foods even before Amazon bought it. So, <clears throat> as I say, it's uh, what will replace Amazon? I don't know. It's, it's very socialistic in a sense. Like if you went to, somebody once explained to me, uh, it was again in Denmark, this guy from South Africa, we were going in, you know, to buy some cold medication or something. Mm -hmm. And he explained to me that in South Africa, you don't have choices of different medications or different vitamins. You go to a desk and you say, I want vitamin C. And they go back on the shelf and bring it to you. There's no choice involved. <laughs> you don't pick from one a day vitamins or Flintstone vitamins, you're given, this is vitamin C. This is how a drugstore would work in South Africa, he explained to me. And South Africa was not a communist country. It, it, was, it was a capitalist country. And, and this is, you know, before apartheid. Mm. Uh, so, so, you know, this, this is America. You, you mean America. before apartheid was, was overthrown? Is what yeah, you mean to say. Yeah. 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 And, and so, so, you know, what is this, you know, in America, you have an abundance of different brands and different products, but, and, and you still have that on Amazon, you have different people selling different stuff. So like, just like a store. So it's like, we don't have, but you know, you go to Amazon and you can read reviews. It's different. It's not the same. It's, it's, it's different. It's it's a different form of capitalism, and uh, it's it's kind of a kind of a good thing as far as the buyer goes, and and so he's uh, it doesn't need Jeff Bezos anymore. Yeah, you know, he he stepped out from direct ownership. 
but uh, this is like, uh, you know, uh, I'll, I'll get into uh, a bit of this uh, during our uh, arc of narrative tonight. By the way, I just recalled that when I spoke with the Japanese Olympics, that was in the latest trans transmission before tonight. So I'll make certain to timestamp that for you. And that way... Let me say one thing about the Olympics before I go. Oh, please. I just yes. saw an article, and I never liked the Olympics. Mm -hmm. and, and it wasn't because of this. Well, the steroids didn't help that they used to take in East Germany and Russia to win all the medals. <laughs> I just saw an article tonight on the karate contest where the contestant from Saudi Arabia kicked the contestant from Iran too hard. He knocked him out with a kick. Now, this is an excellent kick. It's a textbook kick. He, he knocked him out, knocked him out cold, but he kicked him too hard. So he's been disqualified and the gold medal goes to the guy who got knocked out. Oh my God. Now, what a mockery yes. of sport. Now, they say if this is UFC, yes, he won. The guy thought he won because he threw a punch. Now, I know of an instance where we had a longtime student of my teacher, who it turned out everybody hated. <laughs> he won uh, a contest. I think they had you know, a contest in Atlantic City. I didn't even know why this guy was in a contest because uh, he wasn't any good. But <laughs> they, they, they had nobody to fight him. So one of the guys, one of our students uh, went up and fought at the last minute and he knocked the crap out of him. He knocked the crap out of him, which didn't surprise anybody. It was ad hoc. He comes up and, and they disqualified him for hitting him too hard. So the guy who got knocked out wins wins the match. <laughs> and it's like I had never heard how do you how do you get kicked out? How do you how do you get disqualified for hitting too hard? Uh, that's what you're supposed to do. And here's what happened in the Olympics. The guy kicks him, knocks him out, and this is like praising the loser mm -hmm. uh and and what's the guy supposed to do how does he hard know how hard he's gonna kick him uh and what you're scoring points this is like a gentleman's it becomes a gentleman's contest and this is the one thing bruce lee said was wrong with karate in america after the war they taught karate and nobody hit anybody because it was considered that a karate blow was so powerful that it could kill you. Therefore, nobody hit anybody. And it was like, you know, a game of tag. And Bruce Lee said, this is nonsense. So he started doing actual combat kung fu. And of course, it can be deadly. But by and large, people fight. Look at UFC. There are certain limitations on what happens in UFC. But people kick the hell out of each other. And it's, it's, you know, but it's like, ah, uh, ah, uh, ah, uh, ah, uh, ah, uh, ah. Uh. That's, that's, and that's one of the problems with boxing is boxing has rules. And in a, in a real fight, a genuine fight, there are no rules. So what are you doing? Are you teaching somebody how to fight by, uh, 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 you know, the fights, uh, the limitations in UFC are basically to prevent people from getting killed or permanently injured. But they still, that still happens anyway. <laughs> it does. But it's, it's like, it's limiting and it's more of a real fight yes. um, than, than say, even boxing where you can get very injured. Oh, um, God, yes. And and ultimately, these, these boxers, you know, they all get Alzheimer's from all of the beating they take. It's it's horrible. Uh, it, 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 indeed, it indeed is. But but as they say, in the Olympics, it, it's like, what are you trying to do? You're turning a fighting competition into uh, a form of ballet. 
Yes. Which then you should call it, you know, ballet. Uh, <laughs> yes. No, no, I hear you. I hear you. You're preaching to the converted here. This is what I was telling you. I, I've seen competition. I don't know if it was Olympic for karate, which was ridiculous. <laughs> it was it was people doing forms. It was more like Tai Chi. I don't know if it was Olympic and it was um just ridiculous. <laughs> uh, so it, it's um, yes. Yeah, so, so what, what? How can you even respect a sport where they're giving the loser, who was beaten quite badly, uh, if if he didn't? What if it was a tougher opponent, and and it's possible for a tougher opponent to withstand a kick like that right. if he's more fortified and he can take the punch and doesn't get hurt, then then they wouldn't condemn the guy who hit him because he took the punch. So you have this loser being given a gold medal. They shouldn't just, <laughs> you know, they disqualify him. And how can they give this guy a gold medal? Because, you know, the guy was too mean. I just, uh, I think the Olympics suck. <laughs> yes, well... Uh, if you think they suck now, again, wait till they're wait till they're held in communist China. I mean, increasingly, the, increasingly, the Olympics, of course, are basically catering to autocratic states. I mean, and, uh, so you have these autocratic states that are taking advantage of them to propagandize themselves, uh, like communist China. But it'll give me another um, opportunity to present to people how the Hunger Games was written by a woman whose father fought the communists in the Korean War. And um, she had spent time in Asia with her father, who was stationed overseas. And so she wrote The Hunger Games about communist China, but knowing that they, the people who needed to read it the most would never be allowed to read it if she placed it in communist China, in, on the mainland of Asia. She instead made it about North America. But it's really all about the Chinese culture. And for those who have watched it, District 13 is Taiwan. And District 13 is, of course, the 13th district that has its own nuclear weapons and ultimately uh, wins the battle against the mainland United States uh, to, uh, to liberate it from the tyranny it's under. So this, this is exactly what uh, she was conveying in her series of novels as a uh, allegory, as, as an allegory. Um, the American allegory for communist China. So I'll, I'll go into explaining that again as uh, soon enough with the Olympics. Uh, tonight, I'll certainly take what you've said and I'll add it into Arc of Narrative. I'll talk about that before I go into Hiroshima and Nagasaki, which I'll be obligated to do. And with that, of course, go into the Japanese Ministry of Magic, which it's important to cover. That, that is very fascinating. And please timestamp that for me. I will say yes. one thing nice about the Olympics before I go. And that's when I was a, a young boy in uh, 1961. And my father took me to uh, my first uh, National League baseball game in, uh, in Dod and it wasn't Dodger Stadium, it was the Coliseum in 1961 uh, to see the Dodgers uh, play the Cardinals. I wanted to see the Cardinals because I played on the Little League Cardinals. So... Uh, we went to the game, and, and of course, they played in the Coliseum, which was a, a very poor stadium. It's where the Dodgers first moved to when they moved to Los Angeles. And it was a joke of a baseball stadium. But I thought, wow. And you, you're outside in the parking lot, and you see the Olympics. For This is all from the 1932 Olympics, the, the Coliseum. And uh, they have Olympic Boulevard, the Olympic Auditorium, not near this, but it's where the Staples Center is now, uh, the Olympic Auditorium. And I say, wow, if it wasn't for the Olympics, we wouldn't have a stadium. And I wouldn't be able to see the Dodgers. And it was like, wow, I said, I'm so glad we had the Olympics because it created a platform in which uh, I could watch baseball. So I thought that was like, I was very thankful for the Olympics at that time. Uh, and, you know, they've really never really improved. They only improved the Coliseum fairly recently. 
and it's it's considered to be a very inferior place, although it holds a tremendous amount of people. Uh, right. But the uh, also Jack Parsons tried out for the Olympics in 1932 uh, in fencing. Well, wow. he was fencing, and uh, you know he didn't advance beyond. But I think what a uh, you know it's like, and of course he lived right there in Los Angeles and attended. USC, which is right next to the Olympic, uh, right next to the Coliseum. So it's it's like, yeah, so, you know, you have uh, all these people. And, and somebody did a survey. I saw it on a sports show the other day. It said, like, like over 40% of Americans believe they are Olympic caliber. Holy shit. <laughs> and I... I I, I never for a minute, and I'm athletic, but never for a minute did I think that I was Olympic caliber. Thank you. Not that, even that, close. That's, that's insane. That's, that's it, it is. It is. And uh, to to me, the, the uh, competition I always admired the most was the, the, the decathlon because it was it showed a very athletic individual, which actually Bruce Jenner won, which is. Uh, the Catholic is many different sports. Right. To yes. Strength, yes. speed. It's quite a feat. Yes. To to even compete in the Olympics at the decathlon, let alone to win it. And let alone to win it and then become a woman. Oh wow. <laughs> it's so uh, fucking sad. It is so fucking sad. That this is, by the way, just a totally different case from uh, my being supportive of uh, my son or any other people who are normally uh, going through some transgender changes in life. Obviously, there are certain people who are simply disturbed. <laughs> well, 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 see, Kenneth Grant explains it. It's like you you reach a certain state uh, in evolution of, of spirituality or whatever, where you go into androgyny, where your mind is neither male nor female, if you think of the, again, I don't like to bring Christianity into it, but it serves as a metaphor. If you think of the idealized Christ as he's portrayed in the Bible, and as he he's no longer human, he transitions into Christos, who's now the transfiguration. He's, no, he's a god, and there's no role for him as a male, although he has a male body. He's not He's not there to fornicate. He's not there to indulge in his sexual or sensual desires. He might eat as a matter of course, but this is not his role. So he is actually, to the degree he's divine, he's androgynous because he's not in the, that fallen state from grace where he's, you know, he, he wants to have that, he needs to have that sexual drive uh, he's very much separated from that. And that is symbolic of sort of an androgynous divine state. The problem with most transgender situations or androgynous situations where people end up sticking out like a sore thumb from whatever reason is this tends to be a mockery of, of that divine state uh at best it's a harmonic of that divine state at as it descends from a harmonic it goes down into a mockery uh yeah. which is a poor excuse it's a it's a mockery of the divine state and that's uh where we're it at just with viewed, with viewed the way it is what's important for the individual is to transcend uh and and that's where your your monks come in and uh and that's that's a double-edged sword too <laughs> yes i was about to say uh, by the by the way for what it's worth i'm pro olympics but uh uh certainly uh a, you know what can i say the these olympics have been historic and i'll i'll mark uh i'll timestamp who can uh, drink the most blood <laughs> like 
but like the person who can eat the most pancakes. Oh my God! Uh, they but, don't have pancakes at the Olympics, do they? Pancake eating contests? No, thank God. But they did introduce new sports that I was glad to see. The extreme sports, which are important, the skateboarding and uh, and God knows uh, that there are skateboarding is highly skilled. Yes. Oh God, yes. And 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 the girls. The, I mean, twelve years old and shit. I mean, holy fucking Christ, uh, these, these are all underage, 12 to 16 years of age. Uh, it's, uh, it's astonishing uh, what they can do with their bodies. And uh, then, then, of course, there was the chick who was doing the, the multi-flips on the bicycle, etc. And uh, so I was, I was, of course, watching the various competitions. Uh, you know, this was actually the first time I ever realized trampolines were allowed as a competition in the Olympics, but I'm glad they had it. <laughs> What about hang gliding? Oh, hopefully sometime in the future. I haven't heard of that yet, but yeah, that might be, how would you judge that? But uh, I think they should have maybe that diving that they do with those wings that, they, you know, like flying yes. squirrels. Yeah, what's it? yeah like, like Rocky the Flying Squirrel. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, you've seen that. You know what I'm talking about. Yes. And uh, uh, there was that one poor fucker who died doing that. Um but, uh, you know, what do you expect, right? I mean, Jesus Christ, this is why the crazy white people do this. It's like uh, they, they they do things that uh, you, you don't usually see any other. Or surfing those huge waves that they, they will go out and find the wave out in the middle of the ocean. Yes. And yes. put the guy on a surfboard and and then they'll have a helicopter monitoring him and boats. Yes. Uh, and, and uh, I mean, you know, it's just. Yeah, it would be interesting to see how far we can go with it in the future. Yeah, I mean, I'm not adverse to that. Uh, and uh, it's, it's just sport. It's yeah. it's sport. Uh, not but, to mention uh, there's healthy capitalism behind it. You know, people get sponsors, and then uh, they in turn can get uh, commissions, etc. Um, I forgot the term for it, but uh, by the way, maybe we, if I was more skilled yeah. in Olympic uh, events, mm -hmm. I might like it more. But it, but even at the best of of my abilities, I, I I never fit into that. You know, certainly not in basketball, and certainly not in any of those categories. If if maybe if I felt that I uh, could have competed, uh, that I would like it more. But but I can you know there's certain events, as they say, the decathlon. If they showed that, I would actually watch that if I knew when it was on. Uh, I would enjoy watching that, but. Um, not that I felt competitive in that, but uh, for most of the stuff, it bores me. Uh, yeah, oh, understood. It's, 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 it is what it is. I, I, uh, anyhow, we love you dearly. Oh, by the way, before you go, Salman, if you'd come on with us, we've kept you up so late. I'm so sorry. You, you have to get up tomorrow to, you know, do your own Olympiad there. He's, he's got to do his pull-ups, which hasn't been put into the Olympics yet as a competition. <laughs> He's practicing for it when they do. Um, so if you'd say goodnight to uh, Peter and our audience, uh, Salman, as, as as well as Peter saying goodnight to everyone, then it'll just be um, Jameson and I for a bit. And, um, you know, so I'll be with the guy who's high out of his mind and we'll see how uh, he handles it the rest of the night, which I hope will be fine. Um, but um, if Salman's still with us and is able to say goodnight, that would be appreciated. Yes, uh, good night to Peter, JMO, Douglas, everybody on Team Dietrich. I bid you all farewell with the greeting of Aslam Alaikum. Peace be upon all of you and yours. And happy Islamic New Year's to those celebrating. And happy Abu Day to all of those in Taiwan. Happy Father's Day. Thank you. Yes. Good, okay, good I'll night. Everybody on Wednesday with the, with the biorhythms. Good yes. night. Good night to all of you. Our love to both of these wonderful gentlemen. And. Good night. Yes. Um, good night. Blessed be. Uh, sweet be thy dreams and, uh, you know, peaceful be thy slumber. All right, Jameson, let's do a little test here. How's your voice? Oh, uh, I am all right, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, oh, my fucking God. Uh, so that's good. And um, so I'm counting on you and let's hope that works out fine. And uh, you oh, just... That will work out fine. Uh, there's a lot going on. Our world is on fire. Yeah, yes. Oh, yes, yes. I, I, I'm certain there's much to talk about. To uh, finish up with what I was saying, I'll go back into 
talking about these ego knots uh and i thank you very much oh, for yeah. oh yeah those 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 are freaking cunt rags yeah um yeah what they do is um they claim oh yeah we're eco-friendly nothing they uh nothing they produce is eco-friendly and then they go off in space every other day which is like <laughs> adding more emissions so that we can so that they can accelerate the rate at which we will all go extinct yes <laughs> yeah as as their way of saying fuck you to the world yes yeah yeah it, it really is that um honestly uh it, it's one of those things where it's like the final blow really the the salt in the wound it's just the final insult and uh I, I I just want to thank you, of course, for um, being with us through this, and uh, it, it definitely, like I said, wouldn't be possible without you. So, oh, there we are, Daniel. So, Daniel, <laughs> thank God you're here with us. Um, this way, I can finish chewing some of this and um, get some calories into myself, even though I'm not really hurting for calories. Uh, I, I'm just so glad you're here, so I can chew. Mm. Tell us a bit about what's going on with your day. And um, you did mention some stuff in the chat room, and I appreciate that. It's, as you say, obviously, uh, what's his name? Uh, Cuomo, who I've already kind of blocked from my mind, isn't a rapist per se, because that would have come out already. But um, yeah. uh, he's, he's basically what he is. Uh, and um, and obviously, we were talking about the, the martial arts, UFC and all that. And he, I don't know if you saw what happened in the Olympics that Peter Moon was talking about, but if you did, uh, you know, give us some perspective on all of this, both Bruce Lee, what he was doing, what Peter Moon was talking about, uh, et cetera. You know, I, I, I haven't, I haven't seen any of the Olympics. I'm just, I'm going to be waiting until I can catch, you know, catch maybe highlight clips of them all because that would be so much to keep up with. But, um, I do look forward to that um, sometime in the near future. Wonderful. <laughs> Thank yeah. you. Thank you. That's, that's nice. And um, now, obviously, you were in, in, in excellent shape and still are. Uh, but um, you heard what Peter said. There's all these people who have deluded themselves into thinking they're Olympic quality. And, and to imagine somebody... Somebody must not be at all familiar with their body or, or, or realistically in tune with it to, to, to even entertain such a delusion for the majority of these people. I mean, because these Olympians, they're training every day. And these are people who live what they do. They, they get up in the morning, they do their gymnastics, and they, I mean, oh my fucking God, the, the idea of someone thinking that they could do something at that level without that level of commitment is... It, it, it's, is this video games? What the fuck creates it's, this? It's it's, a, it's it's even it's even sadder when I can still remember the the intelligence level of a fourteen year old in the nineteen eighties compared to the intelligence level of a fourteen year old today. Thank you. Yeah, it's it's awful. It's frightening. It's frightening. We're yes. in for um, Peter Moon used the term. I forgot what he said. We're in for some kind of what the fuck did he say? like little change he said some kind of change or something i mean it, you know and i was thinking well what a what an understated term we're in for massive dislocation <laughs> it's what we're in for at the very least yeah not... this is gonna this is going to be like a death fest oh have you have any of you ever watched this show called metalocalypse metal apocalypse no no what, what it, what's it about Oh, it's, it's 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 like it's it's like a show that follows like this uh, death metal band, and it's it's a cartoon you know, okay. that was on Adult Swim, and every time these guys give concerts, people just like die and <laughs> gory things happen, and it's you know it's something that I would find amusing, and um, but but yeah, it's it that that's the kind of thing that it seems like we're going to be heading towards in the real world, and I am not very happy about that. Well, um, that's reassuring <laughs> to know that you're not happy about it. Yes. Uh, oh, by the way, the ladies have said goodnight to Salman. That's so cute. And um, the uh, but anyhow. Um, oh, yes. And Daniel Arola ordered the Roswell Deception book through Amazon. 
<laughs> yep. <laughs> Which I believe is also what uh, Pac-1 did, who got his copy. And uh, yeah, ob obviously Amazon is delivering a lot of my shit too. And people I'm dealing with are, are dealing through Amazon. I mean, but uh, honestly, we don't have a fucking choice. This is not <laughs> capitalism. It's monopoly. Uh, and uh, so that needs to be stated. It's uh, it's like... Um, at this yeah, that, you, you know, that's that that's a it's i'm glad you bring that up because i always encounter people who are always bashing capitalism uh online who are maybe friends of friends in their comments about like oh capitalism doesn't work capitalism is broken and then they don't realize that we're not in a capitalism we're in a monopoly but capitalism is it's like communism it's an ideal it can't be reached uh, the, the whole idea about communism is that we're all living collectively and you know, uh, the sheer equality of it is if we uh, were to even try to emulate that, uh, there's, t there's two things it would require. Either we would have to have enormous cybernetic uh, intervention, meaning physiologically we would become like the Borg, or we would uh, organically, like genetically, uh, become a termitary. We would, uh, insect colonies are a form of communism. Uh, the social insects is, is, is what we would be emulating. And, and these experiments have all collapsed because people cannot live like that. Uh, and it's not living anyway. It's not a life worth living. Uh, and uh, the same with capitalism. It's an ideal that uh, cannot be reached uh, because obviously whoever gets in power and, and starts accumulating money, uh, it's a, uh, oh shit, uh, Benny, Penny Bradley. Oh fuck, that's right. I owe her a book. God damn. <laughs> Penny wrote me, I guess I need to order through Amazon and then drive to the Tenderloin to get it signed. Uh, Penny, that's right. I'll send you the books. <laughs> Holy shit. Oh, God. Uh, <laughs> she, I promised her a autographed copy of the book. So, uh, oh, my God. So I, I do have to send it this month. So I haven't even been to the post office yet to pay my bills, honey. So let me, uh, I'll, now that you've reminded me, I'll remind myself uh to do that send uh send that out well i'm uh well i'm oh shit i need an address uh, so honey give me your address to send it to in the private message box there we are and uh so there we have that and i'm sure she's heard that and uh so aside from that though um to get back on to my point uh yeah capitalism and communism these are ideals that can never be reached because they're going to mutate into something else along the way it, it, there's, there's nothing else possible they, they can't they can't be attained because they're simply that they're just vapid ideals yeah they're unattainable yeah. uh situations uh whoever gets uh you know enough uh money that's amassed then they make certain that nobody else can knock them out of their perch right i mean this is what happens constantly this is what happened with bill gates when the government had to step in and use their monopoly busting uh laws to uh you know, break into Bill Gates's world and everybody. He started this propaganda campaign uh, to make people feel sorry for him. And the, just think of what money can buy. The fact that you're that filthy rich that you can buy a propaganda campaign to make people feel sorry for you. Uh, and you had idiots out there saying, why are the, the government, why are they picking on this man simply because he's a good businessman and a successful businessman i mean oh my fucking god most of these people can barely put food on their tables and they're shedding tears over a man who has all the money in the world and uh, <laughs> it, it's just the insanity of it uh the, the sheer insanity is it's beyond me it's 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 uh, anyhow with that i turn it over to, to you gentlemen while i type here to penny bradley um oh my god uh, so she shamed me she shamed me into <laughs> sending me that. Okay. oh my god what's that uh, that's uh daniel rolla is the bull in the china shop he's uh he's, yeah yeah um he's making noise oh no worries so, uh, so, so, so go on, tell us a bit about, uh, uh, anything that comes to mind, Daniel, certainly. How was your day? Oh, hang on. I got to step outside for the garage. Oh, sure. Sure. I'm making a little bit of noise here. Uh -huh. All right. Okay. I'm out of here. All right. Well, it's, uh, it's actually been pretty eventful. 
we had company, but, uh, you know, I still kept up around the house, made a few errands. Uh, I uh, picked up some good dope, so that was a really good day. Cool. Yes. And uh, enough to make your head swim and the world around you uh, spin in circles, as happened to our man uh, Jameson here. Uh... <laughs> Uh, no, not not like that. But I mean, I'm I'm already I'm, I am pretty high right now, though. Cool, and uh, <laughs> and and uh, oh my god! Uh, so uh, go on, both you gentlemen, since both of you are out of your minds with uh, dope. Perhaps uh, while I'm decompressing, no less. Uh, then maybe I'll get a contact high if I hear the two of you talk. All right. Well, um, uh. Well, there's no shortage of things to talk about. Uh, uh, we do uh, supposedly the pandemic is setting off a deadly rise in speeding. <laughs> why? How? Uh, I mean, why? Well, this is according to the Associated Press. Uh, apparently, uh, this is this happening in Portland, Maine. Wow, that's not far from New York. Motorists put the pedal to the metal during the pandemic, and police are worried as roads get busy with the final stretch of summer travel. The latest data shows the number of highway deaths in 2020 was the greatest in more than a decade, even though cars and trucks drove fewer miles during the pandemic. Wow. Um, yeah, I think people are just losing their minds. <laughs> if they had any in the first place well whatever they what what whatever little bit they they whatever tin, whatever <laughs> was hanging on point, by yes. like little tendrils and whatnot which which just ripped apart at this point yes summer is an incredibly dangerous time and it culminates with labor day that's that last hooray said uh pam uh, shadow fisher of the Governor's Highway Safety Association. Uh, basically, people are flying down these roads, according to the uh, Maine State Police, uh, on, inter on Interstate uh, 95, and it's uh, just ridiculous. Well, it brings up something so that we bring Daniel back into this, because I want this to be more of a conversation between the two of you. So, Daniel, yeah, um, sh yeah, share with uh, us some of your driving uh, experiences while high or something, or whatever you wish. Well, that that sounds that sounds like a that sounds like a, a symptom of uh, some serious anxiety, you know, on the collective scale of people speeding due to the pandemic. They got to be in a hurry to get to something really quick, you know, before uh, uh, something happens to them or whatever. But uh, yeah, that that's that that's that's what that's my take on it. Yeah. That's actually a very, very uh, that that makes a lot of sense. Yes. Also, um, Maria Gregorich uh, brings up what happened in Canada, which she says uh, early in the pandemic the highways were empty and everyone started accelerating, so it becomes like the autobahn or something. <laughs> I mean, it's it's like that here in Houston all the time. You know, I was about to say, cowboy <laughs> country, right? Um, yeah, pretty much. Now I I don't speed I, I I like to cruise, you know. But when but when I do, but when I do see someone that when but when I do see someone that's in a hurry, I will get I will move out of the way. Um, most of the time, just about everybody on the road is all is all in a hurry to get somewhere, you know. And that that's what I've noticed uh, quite a bit, especially in these last handful of years on the road. Um, <laughs> I, you know, I've, I've seen some, I've seen quite a few near hits. I've, I've actually seen some collisions that, that weren't too major. Just mo most of them had to do with the, one of them looking at their phone or maybe both of them. But uh, right. the airbag comes on and boom. You know, but so far I haven't, well, actually, uh, well, recently I did hear of a fatality somewhere uh, about 30 minutes away from where I live at now. Uh, you know, up in the northeastern area, that um, I really felt bad about. Uh, I don't know. I'm afraid I might know that person because there was a familiar name in the list, but uh, I hope it's not. But uh, I don't know. I, I might follow up on look looking back up again sometime soon. Yes. But uh, other than that, other than that, um, uh, it's a uh, it's it's also a thing that I do to my own ego, is that I. 
I desire to refrain from road raging or being irritated by other people or even believing in the fact that rude drivers exist, even though I know that they do. It's just that um, if, I, if I'm going to be cool, you know, I'm, I'm going to have a cool environment. People are going to be cool with me. You know, even even if in the moment they might get irritated, might you know, I might be in their way, you know, it's not going to last, you know. Mm-hmm. And and I'm and even now, I, I've even noticed the same thing happening in the parking lots when I go to the store. You know, there's people like they're like looking left and right, left and right for a good space, and they pass up like three of them. And I'm not in a hurry. I just kind of just cruise my way into it. As soon as I see one, whoop, it's a good one right there, close to the door. Incredible. Yeah, I I, I appreciate you bringing that up, and uh, of course. We have such a limited amount of parking spaces in San Francisco, but um, at least mm. we don't have a bunch of uh, drunk people running around with guns who are high on uh, religious mania, uh, as you see in Texas. So uh, maybe you yeah. can tell us a little bit about some fights that people get into over parking spaces. That ought to get that ought to accelerate pretty quickly <laughs> down there. Actually, that, that uh, su- uh, surprisingly, that that really doesn't happen as much. Maybe in the grocery stores, but it's like downtown parking. There's always some guard and there's always somebody collecting the money because, you know, you got to pay for those spots. Um, but in, the, in some grocery stores, yeah, there would, be, there would be the occasion where the other driver will just wait until the other driver goes into the store, goes up and keys the car or whatever, or maybe leave a note if they're lucky. <laughs> Holy shit. Yeah. Uh, I mean, this keying cars stuff. Um, this it's it's really disturbing to me that someone would do that. But they this is what people do. Um, tell us a bit <laughs> uh, about yeah. You know. that, that's uh, that's that's happened all the time throughout the years when I worked as a dancer. There's always the one dancer or another that I know that's going to roll up with some new ride that he wants to show off with, and I, I'd always predict to some of my other fellow dancers, watch, it's going to get keyed tomorrow. By somebody that's mad at him. <laughs> True enough, we'll see what happens next. You know, when they pulled up the next night over. <laughs> oh my God! It, it's yeah. like um, that's awful. Uh, but you know, they brought it on themselves in a sense. I mean, but then you're kind of yeah. trapped. I, I mean, yeah, you... it's it's their it's their environment and lifestyle, you know, and the people that you know they allow into their lives so that they can act a fool that way. Mm-hmm. And um. Yeah. So, um, uh, tell us a bit uh, about um, what about um, you? You were. We'll just tell us about anything. Come on, both of you talk. I want to hear both of you talk, and um, I'll finish chewing this, and then I'll go into monologue again. Finish pissing all over Bezos because I think it's economically important to outline the egonomics of this, and um, you know how it reflects us all being victims of the big space fuck. But yeah, you know, both of you gentlemen, carry on for us for a little bit. Thank you. Well, I I can't really think of anything bad to say about Amazon or Jeff Bezos so far because uh, <laughs> you know I mean doing business with them is pretty it, it's pretty convenient. <laughs> yes, that's a problem. It is, <laughs> uh, the, but it's not that we should be challenged by these services. Uh, and I don't even mind that it's a monopoly. It's the really the hypocrisy behind it. Uh, I'll go into that. You know, certainly you don't need yeah. to talk about that. Um, so, um, oh, yeah. He, well, yeah. he's certainly not. Uh, well, he certainly doesn't treat the the workers. Certainly aren't treated uh, well. Yeah. And uh, uh, Peter Moon can say whatever he wants about that uh, workers, but you know, I. You treat your workers like trash. How do you expect to keep them? Hey, well, Actually, when Peter, yeah, go on. Uh, go on go I, on. I, um, I understand. I understand what Peter is saying because because he was ta- he was talking about the mechanics of that. Well, That's actually well, yeah. a technique. And and he ha- they ha- they have to have workers that depend on the boss, you know. And and, and if they if they give these workers wings, they're they're going like, hey, just on the boss. Well, I mean, yeah, I, well, I have seen instances I've worked around people who were like if I did have co-workers who when they were given any ounce of leniency, they would just go ape shit with it and they would just muck it up for everyone else who, 
you know, were decent workers. But then again, you know, I guess my I, I have a cognitive bias from being someone who was em, always employed on the lower echelons. So I I I, uh, I suppose I can sort of appreciate what he was saying from that perspective. Yeah, from no, a business um, perspective. I it, I just I'm just reminded of what I what I've um, learned in um, in Mongol history about Gen- about Genghis Khan mm-hmm. is that um, he he promotes his people um, on based on based on um, meritocracy on meritorious efforts. You know, I mean, he he actually observes you know and see who earns you know what they get. You know, and he doesn't. Well, you know, I mean, so far, I mean. So far, on the records and what I've read, there's no he didn't practice no any nepotism. You know, right. he, he everybody everybody he he appoints or whoever's in that in that office deserved it. Mm-hmm. Yes, thank you for sharing that. That's that's uh, yes. So is this uh, one of those books where they've kind of distilled like um, uh, twenty leadership tactics of Genghis Khan or something like that? Is it something like that you're reading that in? I'm just curious. Actually, I, I I do have a book called The Leadership Secrets of Attila the Hun. Okay. <laughs> that I got back back in the late eighties. Wow. Okay. Tell us about that. <laughs> oh. uh, I don't really remember much about it now. I mean, all, all, all I, uh, most of what I could remember from Attila the Hun is just mostly the uh, mostly the um, atrocious military stuff. <laughs> yes, yes. That's always easiest to remember. Uh, okay, let, let me see. But but I still I have it on my shelf more as a novelty now. Mm-hmm. Uh, and uh, yeah, yeah, and and of course, uh, I'm certain in that book they don't uh, you know recommend anyone go out there and commit atrocities. Um, no, no, no. <laughs> Uh, let me see if I can get this. I'm, I'm, I'm having some exchange with Penny Bradley right now, and I'm just trying to send her an image here. Uh, and, um, y- you know, it could be because my, um, what do you call it? The external hard drive has been having some problems lately. Uh, and also, I get so easily distracted because so many of my files are filled with porn. So I try to send her an image of a flower or something, and I'm just distracted by everything else that I see along the way. Uh, but, um, okay, so there we are. Let's see if this goes there into the, where I can enter that. There, it entered. Um not that I mean to share all of these details with everybody, but what the fuck, my life's under a microscope anyway. You know, like like Cuomo's is, but then, of course, he kind of invited that in his own well, way. Well, yeah, I, I, I think he takes a sort of grim satisfaction in it, though. I, I honestly think he, 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 he he's, he's like so warped that he, he doesn't realize that this is something you're supposed to be ashamed of. Uh, like... He also might consider it like a movie, like all of this is charming and everybody's supposed to be charmed by it and that they should be like just considering him, uh, you know, a nice guy, etc. You know, an active boy or something. It's just, it's just awful. I mean, awful. if somebody, if, if a guy touched my face, I would punch the, sh- I would knock his fucking ass out. <laughs> and, and that's uh, it. With what you've heard tonight about what we were talking about earlier, Daniel, did you have any uh, input concerning that? Oh, about oh, about what Damo just said about the guy touching the face. Yeah, yeah, uh, that and Cuomo and all that shit. Well, yes. Oh well, um, yeah. I, well, actually, I I keep uh, I, I can't help but to, but to notice um, that uh, that's that's probably about, about as far as it gets sexual misconduct. You know, on, on that technical level, but uh, you know, it it, it, it I had. I haven't seen I haven't seen or heard about anything that goes any further than that, mm-hmm. you know. Which which makes me even more curious, you know. Which is you know, I don't know, I me mean, how, how they're how they're um, how they're reframing what um, Governor Cuomo is, other than just uh, other than just some uh, touchy feely Italian dude, you know, <laughs> that likes to act Italian. Yes, he's le- he's simply lecherous. Uh, y- yes, but y- you know things have changed. Because it, Joe yeah. Biden was accused of that too, you know. But uh, they got it on footage. I mean, remember that little girl that Joe Biden was? Oh yeah. Holy shit! Yeah. Uh, that was disgusting and uh, just total sleaze shit. He's uh, so. Um, 
Yeah, these these guys these pol these these male politicians are all creepers, man. They're they're just creepy ass human beings. Yes, yes. Politics is Hollywood for ugly people, and so they uh, <laughs> they want to have their celebrity cake and eat it too, uh, just like the uh, you know just like the Hollywood people. And uh, so there you have that. Um, let me go mute for a little bit. I'll let you guys carry it on for a little while longer. Uh, by the way, for people who are wondering, um, uh, savoring this Coppa Italiana, this is dried, cured pork shoulder. And this pork shoulder is produced in Italy, uh, sliced and packaged in the USA. But, um, uh, you know, there you go with that. Enjoying the savory taste of this uh, this pork with my tea. Um, I just want to kind of finish that up before I get into back into monologue again, and um, that'll provide me enough calories to piss all over Jeff Bezos, and then move on to the um, uh, the serious stuff for the night concerning the context of Hiroshima and Nagasaki, which people haven't heard before. The magical context. And um, so um, aside from that, I want to thank Jameson for uh, giving me such a uh, a positive feedback on uh, the uh, latest uh, Blood Boy with his nice little fuck you, you fucker t-shirt that was... <laughs> yeah. And it's all about garnish. This is something that I've explained before. And uh, this was the fact that uh, when uh, you we all eat a meal with our eyes uh, before we even touch it with our taste buds. And and uh, uh, the appearance is so important. And uh, uh, e oh, so um, uh, Maria is asking about what was that I was eating? Oh, the um, Copa Italiana, the dry cured pork shoulder produced in Italy, uh, sliced and packaged here in the United States, uh, but imported uh, cured meats. Yes. And uh, so this is from the uh, uh, Voroni family. Uh, established in 1925, uh, just a few years after my mother was born. Uh, there we have that. And um, so I'll get back into that. It goes so well with my tea. and um, uh, But uh, you very much reminds me, of course, of the taste of the blood that I was enjoying over Father's Day weekend. And uh, with that, of course, you noticed our man uh, Salman before he left. He was saying, have Happy Abu Day. Abu, of course, is the Arabic word for big daddy or, um, you know, father. And uh, so that was, of course, brings us back to the memories of someone far more unpleasant, the idiot uh, Abdul Karim Haq, uh, who uh, was, uh, you know, changing his name from Abdul, which means slave, as in slave of Allah, a proud slave to be, it's, it's, uh, you know, to Abu, as in daddy, as if he's usurping the position of the father figure, God himself, which in his own mind he was, you know, all part of the stupidity there uh, with that individual. Um, you know, I don't want to think about that because it ruins yeah, my appetite. Yeah, yeah. yeah he's bad enough. It's bad enough he lacked a sense of humor. Yes, it was. He was so stupid about, you know, uh, Daniel Arola. He kept saying how racist he was. It was just so fucking <laughs> stupid. You know who else was hypersensitive like that was uh, that idiot Derek Talley. It was like, you know, um, honestly, when you're that hypersensitive to the world around you, uh, then uh, you just need to, uh, you know, it's time for you to leave this place anyway. So, it's time to check out. Yeah, thank God he's dying. <laughs> no, uh, in my city, black people love me, especially when I'm riding in a car with them, because every time we get pulled over when I'm riding in a car with them, as soon as the cop sees me, they let us go. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm their token. <laughs> yeah, and and uh, it, there's that, or they 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 mistake Daniel Arola for a secret government experiment, and so they just uh, <laughs> you, know, they, you know they just let him go on with whatever he's doing because they figure he's tagged, you know, like a like I, one I, of those. I, yeah, yeah, go on. I well, just they, grin at them. <laughs> there we are. Yes. Uh, and uh, it, well, there must have been some. But, you know, you, you've never discussed this. I mean, Pacquan was, of course, he was talking about being jailed in the past. Now, it wouldn't surprise me if Daniel Arola was never jailed, but I'm just curious. Were you were you ever jailed? I mean, I was oh, actually kind yeah. of surprised to find oh. out. Oh, you were? <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. 
<laughs> yeah, I've I've had I've had a, a little too much fun back in my day. Oh, tell us about some of this. I mean, I was I was just so shocked with what Pac One was saying. So so you know he was in for a fairly you know not very long. It wasn't like he did really hard time, but he was in for you know fairly long period of time, months. You know, and that's as far as I'm concerned, it would be just horrific. Uh, a day is a long time. Yeah, yeah. And uh, the, um, but in terms of uh, yourself, Daniel, so how long was it and what was going on and how did you, how did you fare? I'm assuming, of course, that you probably were able to hold your own without anyone bothering you, obviously. Uh, and... No, 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 no one, no one would even look at me like that in jail. I mean, you know, I, I held myself up. I mean, I, I was, I, I didn't even try to act tough around them. They just kind of knew, you know, they just kind of knew better when they saw me. Right. Yeah. Right. Especially well, the and, older guys. Right. Yeah. What, what, and, and now, how how were you fitting in? You were considered one of the younger guys, not one of the older guys, right? Were you considered one of the older guys in prison? Mm, I don't know. I mean, I they just they just cut. They just never they just never wanted to mess with me, you know. And what? I guess they could tell why they didn't want to. Yes. Yes. Well, I'm sure they saw you training basically you know doing your moves in the prison yard and shit or did you do that well, when... well i uh well actually that i i didn't give any of them any any cause to even want to look at me um any any lesser than i am because i i i i also drew a lot too so they they like art you know okay. that that seems to that seems to soothe them yeah you know? yeah yeah i just drew a lot of stuff for did them. You, did you draw things for others? Like, uh, did they ask you, could you draw a picture of me and you drew one for them? Or could you draw a picture of a girl or something and you do that for them? Was there anything like that going yeah. on? Yeah. Yeah. Uh-huh. Wonderful. Yeah. I've, I've, actually, I've, actually, I've actually managed to pull off some sketches that I, you know, was surprised at because I didn't believe at first that I could because mm -hmm. I told them that I, I'd do my best. But, I, but, I've actually been, but I've actually been spot on once or twice. Right. Are you willing to tell us what you were in for? Oh, well, uh... uh <laughs> Watch, I don't remember. That would be funny. I don't remember. <laughs> <laughs> I just wound up in jail. Uh, I woke uh, up in jail. I was there several months. I don't know what I was in for. I don't remember. Uh, well, yeah. I mean, I've, I've been down for fighting. I've been down for uh, being in possession of dope, unpaid tickets. Mm -hmm. uh, the usual. Now, surprisingly, I have not been arrested while on duty as a stripper, so that would have really sucked. But it, so that I, I've been, I've been very fortunate there. What? Now, what? I forget. It's been so long. I know it's. This is stupid because I was in the industry, and I know sometimes they would raid these places. I never got caught in one in the sense that you know, I, it, it's. But it's just like they they take the whole staff generally. Uh, but. Uh, in terms of uh, what do they arrest people for again? I mean, do they consider it a form of prostitution, or they're just searching for drugs? Usually, of course, they... yeah, it's it's usually, it's usually either a prostitution or drug trafficking, mm -hmm. but mostly prostitution. But mm -hmm. uh, no, I haven't. I haven't really. Well, actually, throughout, throughout my throughout my years of working in my own city, I haven't really heard of any cases of somebody being busted for it. I mean, you know, in, while while um, while they're on duty or while they're working, but uh, but the girls, yeah, they get busted all the time. That's so fucking sad. That's you know. So there's sexism here. There is sex, gender bias. Well, well there, there's there's also there's also clubs that get left alone because you know they they treat the police right. Other than that, some girls they get away with it good to know that's good yeah. to know. and of course go on educating us about your experience in jail what else was there that you saw or experienced oh uh, let's see other than that there, there was there was one bum he was uh he was mad he wanted to punch something he punched somebody and uh he ended up punching the wall like about about six, about six feet away, about six feet to my left, and just sitting there on the bench, just watching this guy, ends up punching and breaks his hand, and uh, and then everybody just kind of just got it. As soon as they heard the crack, 
they got up and they just all started laughing. Oh, God. As if they were watching the whole time, but most of the time they weren't even noticing. Uh, I, I'm, <laughs> that's that's so fucking sad. And um, I'm surprised they didn't clap, too. It sounds like something they would do would be to clap and laugh and point. Um... Oh, oh, yeah, they did. Oh, God. oh yeah. It, it, of course, it, it, attract, it attracted the attention of the officers. And, of course, you know, a medic had to come in and get the guy. <laughs> and... He, he he was taken to an infirmary, right, to fix his broken hand. Yeah, yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. There was. And yeah, I I um uh, I had to go into the infirmary one time in the jail. Um, I got I had like about three stitches on the on the inside of one one of my fingers from a knife that the uh, that slashed at me. Fortunately, it was just my finger that it slashed. So someone did attack you. Huh? Oh yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah, so, yeah. What, what was the story behind that? Okay, well, actually, I've been see this uh, this one trip to the jail that I've been in for fighting. Okay, I was I defended myself against like nine guys, but uh, I ended up I ended up hurting um I ended up hurting them one of the employees on accident because I thought it was one of them. So that's what the cops took me down for. Other than that, other than that, I didn't go down for fighting the other guys. That was for self defense. That's and what about them? Since you were defending yourself, did any of them get punished for attacking you? Oh yeah, oh yeah. So some some of them were still on probation. So they ended up going back to prison. Oh god. Oh, so this was <laughs> outside the prison. Uh, Inside the prison. Inside the prison. Where this? Uh, this this was um this was um. This was when I went to um. This was that I went when I went to one of these bars in downtown Houston. Okay. From five there that that I went that I went down for. Okay, I see. Yeah. I think well, I, I see. Oh, yeah, yeah. Well, I've I've been uh, I've I've been in jail for fighting more than once. Right, right. You yeah, know? I can imagine. I, yeah, go on. Yeah, and there, there there actually was one time in a small town called Victoria, Texas. It was late at night and I was at a stop and um, I was just taking a break. Uh, I was coming from like South Padre Allen do from doing a show. And I, um, well, long story short, I ended up getting into a fight with these two guys at a convenience store. Um, there was, um, there was a, a, a deputy of that town that pulled in and he took us all in jail and we, we were all we all ended up in the same cell, and I dared them to get up to fight me, but they of course they didn't. We all ended up kind of getting along, and uh, of course you know the the cops were the cops were at the station. They were all bored. There was nothing to do, and they all all were just shooting the shit with us, just cracking jokes and whatever. And they ended up letting us go. They didn't even book us. Wow. They just wanted they just wanted to hold us in so we could behave, so we can. Before they let us go. Okay, cool. That's that's very <laughs> so Texan, ended, by the way. Ended, that, yeah, that that's very Texan. Yeah, they can, I, I ended up, yeah. yeah, yeah, I ended up making friends with these guys. Uh -huh. Yeah, I mean, yeah, it can yeah. go that way, which is fine, or it can go the other way, where you know the the cops can be incredibly brutal. And um, <clears throat> it, it's just... I've been I've been pretty fortunate with with them, you know, with close uh, situations with police compared to uh, my darker skinned friends. Yes. Yes. Yeah. It, so, so uh, uh, yeah, I, I was, I was the oriental good luck charm there where, where, where cops are concerned. That's amazing. And, and so, yeah. you know, it can work out that way. And um, I'm look, you know, I'm glad it worked out that way for you. And of course the, oh, uh, yeah. Yeah. And in prison, of course, you've seen the abuses that people can suffer from the guards. I mean, did you ever see that documentary where they were showing the one uh, prison where the guards were just uh, abusing all of these people? That was in Texas. But of course, Texas is so large. It's like a nation all its own. So I'm sure it has its prisons where they're like third world and other types. So go on. I've seen I've seen a lot of prison documentaries, but uh they, they somehow they they can't touch uh, the they can't touch the stories that um that I've heard from the police that um that have worked the prisons before and uh, and they they always they always talk about the gangs that run them because yeah most mostly prisons have they 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 mostly have to do with gangs anything 
Yes. So when and you some, were in, sometimes, yeah, go on. A lot of times, the a lot of times the warden's in on it too because you know they're making money. Oh, of course. Yeah. Yeah. Very much so. And um, so that brings up a question: When you were in prison, were you forced to become I, a part was, of a gang? I, I was never in prison. Oh, okay. Well, I've only been to jail, jail. I see, I see. Okay. Now, correct me so, if I'm wrong on this. Pac One was in prison, right? Isn't that what he was just describing? Yeah. I, I, yeah, I don't know. I didn't hear that. <laughs> okay. Yeah, that's fine. And um, uh, at, at any rate, um, in in your case, um. Thank you for disambiguating that. And that's important. Not that I care. I mean, you know, this is like one of those things where, yeah. you know, I'm certainly not one to judge. And um, God knows it's only through various circumstances that um, I, I've avoided prison. Of course, um, oh God, I don't even want to go there. But <laughs> in terms of uh, uh, of the uh, situation with uh, other things that come to mind, um, a, anything going on in current events, uh, Daniel, that you feel um, have have brought, um, you know, uh, that you think we should be paying attention to or that caught your attention? Um, I actually did something very uncomfortable for lunch. I went to Papacitos and, uh, of course, uh, the, of course everybody, everybody eating didn't have masks. Except for the staff, you know, and they're serving us. And uh, even though I am vaccinated, I was still kind of uncomfortable about that. But I was comfortable that there was some black people behind me watching my back, and there were fine people other than that. But, yeah, that's about it. But the food was good. Good. Um, and um, what's your vaccination? Mine, of course, is the Jensen uh, vaccine, and... Um, uh, it's the one shot and you're done. What did you, what did you get? The Moderna. Okay. With a booster yeah. shot. Yeah, with the two shots. Yes. MRNA. The, you got the magic. Yes. That stuff is, well, that will make certain you never get it for all intents and purposes. Uh, and if you, get, you know uh, what I, I mean? I'm, I'm saying not, I'm for all sure. intents and purposes, yeah. of course. I'm, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I'm just talking about statistically. Okay. Not... Yes, you can get it. Yeah, if you get it, it's it's statistically again not going to be much comparatively speaking. You'll still feel like shit, but you won't die yeah. statistically. Yeah. Uh, but, um, yeah, you don't want to get it, of course. Um, and, yeah, of yeah. Course. And uh, but but bearing that in mind, because uh, you know Jameson was was bringing that up for a second. Uh, it, go there, Jameson. To tell us a bit about vaccines and and why some of them are not as necessarily you know you they're not your well, get out of jail free card go on no 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 they're not um if you have a weakened immune system stress can weaken your immune system drug use etc cetera, etc cetera. you know if your immune system's weakened by for any reason the vaccines aren't going to be as effective so at, you're you're, uh, you're pushing the uh, limits on your vaccine, right? Is that the purpose of <laughs> no, <laughs> what no, you're no, doing? no, no, no. The purpose of what I do is to be able to keep myself from becoming a raging uh, cauldron of destruction, and so self medication keeps me from you know just going off. <laughs> Mm. Uh, uh, understood because... and and you know uh, in all fair oh, i'm sorry daniel go on please oh no um i i um i i um i emphasize with um jmo's sentiment there because uh, uh i because i would feel that way if i wasn't getting um pushing smoking weed as much interesting interesting <laughs> i mean so you're telling me that if you weren't smoking weed as, you know, to the point where you're so saturated with THC that you, um, you know, <laughs> you, that it, uh, that basically uh, someone could smoke your cadaver, uh, were you ever to uh, die on us, we, we could just use that as a, a, a source of um, getting high for a period of time. Uh, but uh, in in terms of, you're telling me that... I think that's what they did to Tupac's ashes. <laughs> 
You mean that some people were smoking them or something? Is it is that is that a joke or did yeah. that really happen? I wouldn't no, be surprised the, if the, uh, I well, actually yeah I wouldn't be surprised. His uh, uh, Tupac Shakur, the rapper, yeah, he, um, he he has his boys, the Rough Riders. It was said that they it was said that they um, smoked his ashes from his urn, rolled it in some rolled it in some blunts, Jesus and just Christ. got together and just smoked it. That's. That's, I don't know if they smoked at all, though. But you know. Yeah, yeah. That, that's that's pretty. That's pretty. On that, Maria Grigori says good night. I don't blame her. Love you dearly, <laughs> yeah, honey. Yeah. <laughs> and um, you know, love all the ladies who have shown up for tonight. And uh, let's check into the live chat with that. Peggy Wood um, is probably still with us. Tim Sunnyverse has joined us, and I think that may even be Sunnyverse. And uh, so uh, he's. Um, saying happy taiwan father's day what tea are you drinking uh green tea um and uh he says bon appetit concerning uh the pork shoulder and uh, sarah j says does san francisco have a good public transportation system how well is it maintained um it uh, it did yeah, uh, yeah, that's funny that's the can of worms okay <laughs> sarah j is opening a can of worms i spent all my life using the public <laughs> transport system and i can tell you uh i try i try to forget it uh this is like um in a sense i'm still using it because i'm using cabs uh, so to me that's a form of public transport uh but the um yeah all the time that i grew up using the public transport Oh my fucking god! No, it's uh, it scarred me so much that you know I avoid using it like the plague. Um, when I, you know, every once in a while I have no choice and I have to get out of one area. And um, if the bus is there and I know the general direction it's going in, I'll take it. Uh, but um, it, it's. You know, it, it just takes me to another hellhole that I've got to get a cab in. I mean, it's not like they connect in any way, shape or form that goes anywhere I'm going. Um, so comparatively speaking, uh, the San Francisco uh, public transportation system is uh, one of the uh, best in the world, supposedly. I mean, compared to other major metropolitan cities, uh, better than anywhere in the U.S., and it sucks. <laughs> so, uh, I can't even imagine what it, it, in other places it simply must not exist. Uh, but um, yeah, by the way, Jameson went on a bio break, as he calls it. He'll he'll be back soon enough, I suppose. Uh, but in... actually, within within the within the last decade, the city of Houston actually starts having a um, a train system for the downtown area. Okay, and and uh, yeah. so have, and, have... and that helps a lot for transportation. Okay, and and in um, so have you taken advantage of this? Uh, used it or? Uh, no, I have not. But I but um, I like the way it looks. It looks really cool when it you know when when I drive through when I drive through the downtown area. But no, I have not been on it. Okay. And uh, so, so, so that's, that's. I believe I believe it's usually mostly for. I believe it's usually mostly for people that work in downtown, or you know, some or so, some people that reside there, mostly workers. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right. And uh, so, uh, very, very good. And uh, with uh, that, of course, uh, again, I'll check into the live chat here. So, um, Marky well, Miller. Um, yeah. Go on. Oh, oh, I was going to say, um, Simone Biles, yeah. Houston, her homecoming, according to one of my old black friends, uh, they, they said that her homecoming, her, her welcoming, her, her welcome home, uh, I guess, party or parade or whatever, um, was, was kind of, what, what he, what he said was akin to, um, when, uh, when, uh, the people of Ethiopia see Emperor Haile Selassie when he comes out of his balcony, you know? Uh, how you know how they praise him yeah yeah you know he's i mean he's that old so he you know he went back there you know to, to how to how glorious uh, the event was and uh and simone bowles is, is very well loved here in the city i i don't remember anyone hating her for anything wow that's incredible yeah. thank you that's very touching uh, by the way a shout out to peggy wood she says i can't hang anymore laugh out loud good night y'all with a heart Mwah. love you honey 
And Marky Milk says the Bart, of course, in set. Don't, don't even get me started about the Bart. <laughs> Holy fucking shit. Uh, and, uh, in, you know, there was a time that was marketed as the most advanced transit system in the world. Uh, it's an acronym, B A R T, for Bay Area Rapid Transit. It, uh, it, it's as far as I'm concerned, completely fucking useless because it closes down uh, very early in the evening and doesn't open again till morning. Uh, you know, it, it like closes before midnight, which means that if you come in to see a concert or a play or something in San Francisco using BART, you're stuck here overnight because many of these events will end after midnight and, uh, you know, plus whatever you're doing with your friends thereafter. And, uh, and, and therefore, what the fuck? It's useless, right? I mean, and, and it doesn't need to stop because they've got their own police system. In other words, if you don't know this, uh, BART has BART police. These are people who are on duty 24 fucking hours a day in shifts. And uh, so they have jurisdiction uh, one mile either side of the track. Uh, so the, the, you know, you could keep BART running 24 hours a day. Uh, they simply don't think it would be as, uh, you know, profitable to do that. Uh, it, it's just stupid. Um, so, you know, no point in having it. Uh, and, um, that, that we have that, uh, of course we've got, uh, Hey, hey Douglas, Hey, um, is, is that, uh, is that one cab driver of Jihad Bakla still around? Jihad Bakla. Uh, uh, he, 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 that... you, you mentioned him a long time ago in the past, and um, I, I, I had met, and I had uh, mentioned to you that the uh, that the the word bakla in his name yeah. is uh, is Tagalog for homosexual. Oh, that's so fucking funny. That is yeah. f- funny. Uh, Jihad, Jihad bakla. bakla. Yeah, yeah that's yeah. yeah. I I don't remember him consciously, but is he the guy that I was talking about? Not the murderer, or was this someone else I was bringing up who was just some stood out for some reason? It, it was yeah, he, yeah, he he stood out for some reason, and um, you you um you you pointed out his name because you read it on his i on his uh, driver's ID. Mm-hmm. Yeah, 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 that's and, right. Uh, Holy shit! And yeah. uh, and I had a and I had to rewind to listen to that again. Did you just say Buckla? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, you, you know, the funny thing is that you get into some cabs and you see this stupid little like video display that's on the back seat. I mean, it's on the back of the front seat in front of you when you get into the cab and you get reminders like assaulting a cab driver is a felony and shit, which just goes to show you that, that the, you know, they drive you to the point where you want to kill them. Uh, these, these are, <laughs> you know, this, that's all that proves. It, it, it's like a reminder, please don't kill me. I'm an asshole and, and shit like that. <laughs> uh, but um, so, so that being said, uh, Jameson has returned. And uh, again, you, you two gentlemen talk. I'm going to finish this last slice of dried pork. I'm going to savor it and, um, uh, it, and um, you know, um, burn bandwidth while I do that. Thank you. All right. <laughs> so... Anyway. That that was nice. That he starts coughing, <laughs> yeah, and then Jameson starts going, "Oh yeah." So I mean, it's like, come on, come on, guys, you could do better than that, really. Well, I was I was trying to remember the names of the other Olympic athletes that reside in Houston that uh, were medalists, but shit, I forgot their name. Um, oh yeah, yeah um, uh, Sony, uh, she's a she's a Hmong. She's a wow. she's a medalist. Yeah. yeah. Yes. I, I forgot what I forgot what sport I forgot what sport it was exactly. Uh, I it was gymnastics or dance, something like that. But anyway, um, yeah, Suni Lee or Suni Yi. Um, yeah, I I read an article about her on her homecoming. She lives somewhere in the uh, somewhere uh, southwest of Houston, but she, she does live in the great she does live in the greater greater Houston area. There is a small Hmong community here. Wonderful. I yeah. love the Hmong people and um, good people. I've never met uh, a bad Hmong. Um, and um, uh, so thank you for that. And uh, both of you gentlemen, go on, please. All right. Uh, well, how have things been going in your uh, neck of the woods? Oh, well. Was, Why don't you two we, we talk about, about something that you ago. both know about, like drugs or something? I mean, Jesus, oh, the okay, kind of drugs uh, you guys do, you could go on about that for hours. Um, well, I, I just, I just got, I just got a new bag and some good shit. 
Oh, really? Oh, well, yeah. I'm, what's your, I'm riding it right now. All right, well, what's your favorite strain? Oh, uh, well, uh, <laughs> that that's the, the funny thing about um, strains is uh, I'll, I'll ask about them, I'll get told, and I'll always forget them. Ah. Uh, <laughs> Even 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 when even when I'm growing it, but oh. I don't know. Next next time I get a chance to, I'll, I'm going to make sure to remember. <laughs> Have you ever had a outer body experience on a high? That's that that's no, that's an interesting segue. Oh yeah, oh yeah. I've had. I mean, I've but I've had it on accident. Most of the time, when I'm high, I, it, that, it's usually on accident and without any intention, but I'm aware when it does happen. Yeah, please do tell me, oh, please do uh, relay, like, one of these uh, instances. Uh, well, well my, my, my thing about out-of-body experiences is that uh, I, always, I always tend to end up... Uh, being behind myself or, or somewhere where I can see my back, you know, um, because of course, you know, I, I always, I, I always have to practice some measure of safety first. Uh, I don't know, maybe it's a symbolic thing because, you know, me watching my, me watching my own back, you know, I got to protect myself while I'm out of my own body you know, in some way or, 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 or um, wherever I go, I'm still, I still have a thumb on it. You know, where I where I can still watch my own back, but I use I don't I tend not to travel. I just I just uh, observe myself. I I take inventory of uh, what uh, what I remember, what my talents are, but it, it which mostly is around most mostly ends up being about martial arts and shit. You know. Um, where I analyze things on what I did uh, in the last practice, you know, or or what can I do so I don't make this mistake again, or I'll get my ass kicked, things like that. Um, yeah, usually, yeah, it, it's usually, usually mostly, usually it always leads to that uh, that kind of observation. But I, but I do get curious and wonder now and then, but uh, not as much. All right, so I had this one, one interesting experience where uh, uh, a friend of mine at the time had gotten some purple haze, and so uh, this was back when Borders Bookstore was still open. So we left that place, <laughs> and uh, you know we went to go smoke by uh, Battery Park, and um, so. We uh we wind up walking back up Broadway and I started to notice that I started to feel really hot and I felt like I was vibrating and the thing is it was like one of those days where it was like maybe 20 degrees outside but I had to like open my jacket and everything and so uh we decided to uh he went to a McDonald's and then we left McDonald's and what happened was uh while we were leaving McDonald's you know next thing I know I see all of a sudden I see myself, I'm looking at myself from behind, like I see myself from behind walking down the street with a dude who I'm hanging out with. And I'm like, whoa, holy shit, where am I? I'm like, <laughs> <laughs> I've had those before. That, that joint was like spontaneous. Like it, it, it was like, so, it was like I, I, I leaped out of my body for like, like, for a few seconds and then I was was right back in my body and I was consciously aware again. And I was like, holy crap, what the hell just happened? That joint blew so, my mind. Oh I wanna follow up with that. Um oh, oh see now when when I'm when I'm sparring, you know, with the with my stick fighting guys, when I'm sparring, I, I also I also consciously practice to see my um, to, to watch myself as if, I'm, as if I'm seeing as if I'm seeing myself from you know someone else's eyes you know by matching the experience of an out of body experience but while I'm still in my own body and moving or I get to watch myself while I'm still while I'm still operating from the first person perspective but at the same time there is that part of my mind that is also watching myself 
so that I can uh, observe the whole situation and uh, my sparring partner or whoever is done fighting so that I know what moves to make or what angle to attack from or, you know, or maybe uh, which way the wind's blowing or whatever. But yeah, th- th- there's that level of awareness that uh, I work on building. Wow. Wow, how many years does it take to to, to, to uh, hit the? Po- how many years did it take you to uh, hit the point where you're at now, with that? Uh, well, I've, I've been I've been practicing pretty much my whole life, technically since uh, 1983. Yeah. That that so. sounds like a pretty incredible skill to be able to see to to be able to like almost feel what your opponent is feeling and see what they're seeing. I mean, that, 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 that's, uh, wow. Well, actually, um, you know, one of the fastest ways to know a person is to fight them, you know, because when you observe each other and yourself in action, you get to know exactly who this person is, you know, in so many words. And, you know, and it goes without saying at the same time, you also recognize yourself and your own limitations, you know, due to, due to how far you're exerting yourself in that, in that um, moment of uh, high energy, high stress, you know, in, in combat mode, you know, because it, because when you're in combat mode, you're at that edge of mortality, you know, and when you're at that edge of mortality, you see your life flashing. And you recall, you remember who you are, and you know all the shit that happens, you know, before you die, you know, that kind of thing. Wow, I, <laughs> I mean, I, I've gotten into fights, but I've never experienced that. I mean, I've, I've even gotten knocked out, and I haven't experienced that. It's, it's always been something where it's just been a will to. Well, I'm not well, going to say it on air. Um, it's just been that's, a desire. That's teach me how to beat someone. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. But by the way, Veronica Barrera is in the chat room. I want to say, uh, uh, she says, Hola, Douglas, everyone, and Maria Bella, happy new moon. And so, hola. yes, yes, thank you, honey. Uh, hola, and uh, buenas noches a todas, uh, Senora Veronica. And uh, so, and of course, there's a Mr. Um, uh, Misha, uh, aka Blipnosis. Uh, who looks very much like he's a hybridized alien himself. <laughs> he says, thanks, DDD. Love your offerings ongoing. God bless you, sir. Uh, Femfriend suggested to me that the moon was artificially installed to dominate reproductive cycles, indicating that fertility was originally elective. Um, that's pretty far out. <laughs> that's a lot of work. Uh, to uh, the, the impact fertility, um, it's uh, it it seems more natural and organic to myself. Uh, but I can understand people getting the spaceship impression. It, uh, it it's you know has that kind of feel at times too. Uh, but it, because it is it is abnormally large for a moon uh, compared to the planet that it's orbiting. Uh, we are effectively a binary planet, really. And it's amazing that uh, here we have uh, one planet that has so much of an, a bi, you know, a biome, uh, so, so many biomes, an ecosystem, a bionomy, and the other uh, planet seems uh, dead, uh, effectively. But uh, we'll, we'll find out. Now, we're getting some, uh, some further messages here. Uh, let's check into that. And I do want to emphasize to these two gentlemen, I'm about ready to take the deep dive, but let me refresh myself just a little bit first and I will, um, return of course to, uh, to start monologuing in earnest and we'll have six hours for me to cover a number of subjects. Uh, but, uh, the, you know, right now you gentlemen are doing so well and you are on such a roll. Let's get back into that. You were talking about seeing yourselves from outside of the body, uh, your ability to uh, see yourself in the midst of a fight. Uh, this kind of, basically, Daniel Arola is kind of getting high off of uh, combat and uh, basically kind of having an out-of-body experience where he's seeing himself while he's uh, being beating the shit out of others. 
uh, <laughs> Minnow, Amir <laughs> Kozlik, who I believe I've seen before, tells me um, they. I'm not quite sure what he's saying, and I'll leave it at that. It's nothing negative. It's just uh, kind of like word salads. Uh, but, uh, you know, I guess uh, inspiration, it comes in uh, comes in many forms. <laughs> All right, let me uh, leave you two gentlemen for a moment. I'll go uh, mute. Uh, both of you, men, carry on. I'll be right back, and uh, and then I'll effectively take over at that point. Uh-huh. You know, I, you know, I, I am, I'm not always a fan of tripping out when I'm out in public, but there have been those occasions, like uh, one night when I was at a black metal show, uh, I, I was uh, tripping on some strong ass acid that night, and I didn't mean to, but I uh, said, ah, fuck it, but uh, that night it was, uh, it was wild because uh, there ended up being a, a riot in that show because the band quit playing because uh, shit, be- shit just kept being thrown on the stage. So I didn't blame them. So, so as I was getting ready to leave, you know, everybody got mad. Tables, chairs were being thrown. And I was just slowly just walking towards the door. And all this shit, I see it thrown all around me. I could have ducked and ran and dashed, but, you know, Somehow, I was kind of ignorant enough just to just walk slow and just be normal. But I didn't get hit, you know. And then it was like, hey, did, did, I just, did that just happen? And so I watched the rest of the riot. The cops came in. I just went ahead and just walked over to the car for the rest of my ride to come out there. <laughs> wow, that's, that, that, that is really interesting. I mean... Uh, what is acid like? I mean, you know, what 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 is the come up like? Like, what do you start to experience? When do you know it kicked kick kicks in? You know, like, I mean, take uh, us well, take us through like the journey. Well, for myself, for myself, I I, I aimed it to be initially as a physical sensation thing, because um, what it does it is it um, it's like steroids to your senses. You know, to your sense of touch, sense of smell, you know, um, whatever, whatever that uh, comes up into your mind as a memory and the emotion that's connected to it, it gets enhanced. And the more enhanced it is, the more real it appears to you. Thus, hallucination occurs, you know. And see, um, your your sense of emotion, your sense of feeling also increases. And uh you know, you, it's kind of like you're on this, this uh, sense steroids or something. And from there, you're in, that, you're in that sense of experience where you feel like you can create reality from your imagination. Well, what's happening is you're experiencing the process of creating reality from imagination, yet it's only going to last during that trip, you know. But, you know, whatever you're going through, I mean, it's real to you, you know. Just don't catch yourself watching any flat earth videos or any of that shit. Or maybe avoid oh YouTube. <laughs> you know? Yeah, I mean, that sounds like it would be an awesome state to really do some painting or, or listen to music or, or create music, even. Well, I, uh, I, I enjoy tripping and having sex, especially if my partner is also tripping, too. So that way the, the experience is mutually shared. <laughs> and, uh, oh, man, that's just amazing. Ooh. You know? But, of course, you know, we, we, we have to practice in a controlled environment, you know. Yeah, yeah, just yeah. on I mean, that level of intimacy. Well, that sounds like it would be pretty intense. Um, I mean, oh, I, 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 couldn't, yeah. I couldn't imagine what that's like because I oh, have oh, never oh. experienced that, but... <laughs> I mean, it well, sounds like it I, I sounds still, like something interesting. I still can't, I still can't imagine it. I'm just happy that I have the memory. <laughs> it's it's like that. Ah, I see. I see. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean that, that. I mean that level of experience. What I can say is, you know, I'm. I I've had some unpleasant encounters with marijuana. And I, I, that's as close as I get to psychedelics, being psychedelics. 
Mm-hmm. And uh, I think that's I think the reason why is because it's like it does the same thing. It, it's it's like but the problem is my brain reacts by like the heart racing really, really, really fast if I from what really stone and or marijuana. And, and so for some reason, there reaches a point where like if it's past a certain threshold, I can't tolerate it because it literally feels like I'm going to die. You know, like the uh, air is. I- I, I, I'm, I'm assuming I'm assuming that um, that the effect of THC is adapting accordingly, you know, with with the medication that you take. Well, no, this 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 actually occurred at a time when I was just when I wasn't taking any medication, when I was just on when I was only using the THC. Oh yeah, cool. Yeah, this was like this was like uh, a little like a little. Like almost a year and a half ago, and uh, like I, 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 I had too much of this. Like, and 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 this is this isn't even like the stuff used. This is even like the the street stuff, which is like the really good hallucinogenic type stuff. This was like the uh, stuff that um, the vape. This was like the THC vape. So I vape yeah. like too much of it. And, you know, mm-hmm. I, I, I decided, you know, this isn't doing much for me. So I decided it would be a neat idea to take the actual oil from the vape and just put like a drop, put a few drops on my tongue. And next thing I knew, I, I felt like I was like having a heart attack. And uh, it seemed like, like as far as fractals are concerned, the, the entire room felt like it was like a, a Four fifth dimensional matrix of spinning madness, but the mm-hmm. problem is like uh, with the psychedelics, though it's like you don't have any control over it, you know. And that's I guess that's the reason why I sort of drift more towards dissociatives because in a dissociated state, like even if things are spinning and whatnot and things are going crazy, it's like yeah, okay, that's nice. Anyway. Back to what I was doing, <laughs> you know. It's, mm. it's, it's so so so. It's like you know, there's, there's a little more control over the experience with dissociatives, at least until the point where you um, hit salvia to the point where you like literally just drop out, and you know, then yeah, then there is no control. But still, it's like because you're dissociated, it's like it's okay, you know. Yeah. Mm. It's it's not as intimate. It's like it's like you're experiencing yourself experiencing something from but you're still like distant enough to be able to be an observer. Whereas like even with like uh, even with like just like very potent strains of marijuana, it's like it's like it's too intimate. It's like it's too close. It's like the world is too close to me. It's like oh my gosh, you know, it's like the it's like everyone it's like if you're outside, I don't know. It's like when I was like, oh, 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 yeah. There was this time when I, when I, uh, when this dude I knew who used to like mine diamonds in uh, Herkimer, New- he used to like uh, mine Herkimer diamonds, like upstate New mm-hmm. York somewhere. So this yeah. dude gives me like a, uh, he gives me like a L, and he says, you know, he just, he, he says, you know. It, it, he says, just consider it a gift from me, you know, whatever. So I, I smoke it, and I'm like, okay, this is cool. The next thing I know, like, I hear everyone around me talking, like, super loud, and it gets louder and louder, and it feels like it's going through my body, and it's not pleasant. And then it seems like, and it seems like everyone, and then I'm looking at people, and it looks like they can all read my thoughts and and everyone keeps saying like he's high yeah he's high <laughs> he's high yeah he's high <laughs> i'm like oh my god <laughs> I, I know what that's like <laughs> and it, it's it's just like you know it's just like that doesn't happen on dxm like on dxm it'll reach a point where i can be like it will reach a point where I'm walking down the street and like the and the sidewalk starts to wave like it starts to ripple like like it starts to get seismic almost like and 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 
visually like everything would be distorted and there would be even moments where it almost feels like there's almost like a weird tilt like it's it, it it'll distort your dis- your your perception but it doesn't feel like it's right like like everything's right up on top of you you know what i'm saying it doesn't it doesn't have that sort of like cuz 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 the, the, the psychedelics they just they just grab you and just like rip you apart like rah, 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 rah. you know it's crazy man <laughs> i yeah. mean it, it it enhances your senses all right yeah i i think uh <laughs> yeah well if anything uh what i love about dissociative is, is that they numb your senses as well to some degree because you could like literally get hit and you won't feel it or if you're suffering from like pain because you're dissociated it just won't register so you'd be like yeah that hurts but okay i could keep going <laughs> But uh, on psychedelics, it, if 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 you were on psychedelics and someone broke your arm, can you imagine what that? Would, I I imagine that would be like horrific. Uh, yeah, I imagine that would still suck. <laughs> well, that would that would super suck because because not because because uh, all that all that all that's gonna be like magnified, magnified, magnified. And I, I guess that's the reason why they say if you're going to be on something like that, you need to be in a safe environment. And, and they always recommend having like a, a, a trip sitter. Although I've, I, although I've encountered guys who've, who've uh, I've encountered guys on acid when I used to hang out on 14th Street who would just go walking around. And I'm like, how the fuck are you walking around, dude? And they're like, I don't know, man. I don't know, man. And, and and there was this one guy I was playing chess with, and he and and, and I was I'm, I'm playing chess with him. He's like, "Oh man, oh man, hurry up, hurry up! I gotta go." Oh, oh man, this is getting intense. And I'm like, "Dude, why why are you taking asses and walking around Manhattan? It just doesn't make any sense." Yeah, that's pretty weird. Yeah. You know, they're probably as much of a danger to anyone who tries to harm them as, <laughs> as anything else. <laughs> so uh, they're not necessarily in all that much danger. Uh, anyhow, let me get this over to Selena. I forgot to send her the photographs, which I usually do. Uh, and I totally forgot to do that. Um, uh, so i got to get, get her my apologies as well. Uh, so sorry, I forgot till now. Love. And uh, both of you gentlemen continue talking, please. And um, while mm. I do this. Oh man! Uh, now, uh, other than psychedelics, now of course the one thing that'll be a, that, that's always going to be the biggest head turner at the parties is always going to be somebody with cocaine, you know. And you you could be you could be fat and ugly, not even bathe, but you're guaranteed you're going to get some chicks all over your shit, you wait, know, wait. just because you got some. Right. Which drug is this? Oh, we're talking about cocaine now. Oh, yes. Well, there you go. That's there. You have that. Uh, by the way, do you have a yeah. source for that where you're at? I'm just curious. I mean, I mean I've mean, i got mine from uh, my environment, but I mean, I was just, you know, wondering if you, like, um, like what's up with well, you concerning that? I, I, I grew up being familiar with it. I, I, I grew up around it, around people that used it and sold it. And so, of course, I was associated with them. I used to sell it when I was 15, you know. But Jesus I never, never fucking did Christ, how did that happen? <laughs> Tell us about that. Uh, well, I got away with it because I was always the quiet guy. You know, okay. they never, they never, you know, suspected the quiet guy. And, of course, and everybody trusts the quiet guy, you know, when it comes to drugs. Mm-hmm. You know. And so, I mean, it was, I, I just had it easy that way. I, I. I could get into I could get into the richest clubs, the the clubs that people get in line for to tip the doorman a uh, hundred bucks just to skip in, mm-hmm. things like that. I used to just get in all these clubs and just watch these people party in the VIP room, you know, see this lifestyle that I could be enjoying if I wanted to be like them. But I'm thinking, nah, nah, I have it better here. <laughs> just selling this shit to them, you know, and. Uh, of course, you know, it, it went on for so long. I never intended to, you know, sell forever. 
right. I made sure I, I knew that I stopped before you know anything got bad because everybody else that I knew that was selling was getting busted and going to jail. And uh, yeah, I was like, fuck it, I gotta quit. Yeah. So that's when I went back to martial arts and started, some, started studying some other martial arts style that I never knew. Started at white belt again, just you know, changed my life again. Mm-hmm. And and uh, so uh, yeah, and and that and that's great. Uh, I'm so proud of you that you you did that, and uh, the fact that you had the wherewithal uh, to uh, realize it was uh, you know that everyone around you was. Uh, fallen down and you didn't need to go that route um so you're just really glad that you uh uh were you know you got out of there in time now the there's now the, the, i did learn a lot about people around that around cocaine and i i found that a lot of them that um that did of course a lot of the strippers that i knew of course no Hell, none of them will say. None of them are going to say no to that shit. And uh, <laughs> on, on one level, on one level, there's there's some of these girls that I did know intimately, and a lot of them, they ha- what they have in common is that they do this, you know, to to um, I guess I guess as their as their best uh, means to replace the love that they weren't getting from home mm-hmm. or whatever. You know, kind of like Don Jr. You know, all on cocaine and shit just to make up for the love he's not getting. No, that kind of shit. Uh, on that level. <laughs> yeah. That's, uh, you're, okay. Uh, yeah, yeah, that makes, that makes sense. Just forgive me for being distracted. Uh, these, uh, honestly, I, I don't understand why this works sometimes and then not on others. Uh, you, you know, there's been a slight format change to Facebook. So what I'm trying to do just is working out differently from the way it normally would happen. Uh, it's amazing. I got up everything that I did as soon as I got home uh, in terms of publishing the posts that I published. It's amazing. I was able to get that done before, uh, you know, just before we made the phone call and then get done with what I did get done <laughs> once we started the phone call. Okay, so let me try to remember what I'm trying to do next. Uh, both of you uh, go back. How about you? Have you ever tried cocaine, uh, Jameson? I mean, certainly. No, you, you know, I do no, no. that That is one thing I probably will stay away from. Yeah, because you know mm-hmm. that once you're on it, you you just couldn't stop, right? Well, no, yeah, it's, it's, it's not yeah. that. It's that uh, something that something that that's that that's that much of an upper would probably uh, have me die of a heart attack or stroke out or some shit. I see, okay. Or, or I'd probably wind up going into a seizure. All right. And uh, so that's, a uh, well, then it's probably wise that you avoid it, yes. <laughs> and, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. I, 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 yeah, I, 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 I like to limit things to, like, uh, I would limit things to just, like, uh, dissociatives, you know, uh, dextromethorphan, PCP, ketamine, uh, salvia divinorum. Uh-huh. And, uh, and, 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 oh, yes, uh, tell us a bit about salvia, uh, Mr. Arola. I mean, uh, we've had other guys talking about how masochistic uh, that shit is. Uh, so uh, you can tell us a bit about your own experience if you've had some. Uh, I, I've already talked about it once. So I, I, did, I spoke at one time, one evening, maybe two us, just to make sure I knew what I was taking. But um, it uh, it was uncomfortable for, for myself at that time when I did it. Uh, I don't know. I didn't. I didn't really see the. Uh, I, I didn't really see any means for myself to enjoy it. Mm-hmm. But I mean, I'm sure somebody else does. But I don't know. It just didn't. It just didn't fit me. Okay, and that's fair yeah. enough. Yes, and so uh, thank you for repeating that. If you've spoken about it before, uh, it's one of those things I don't retain in my mind. Uh, so I'm sure many of our listeners don't either. So re- re- repetition stories. There's nothing wrong with them. And, yeah. uh, what I will say is, uh, Salvia was one of the greatest experiences I've ever had in my life. I can I can even remember what song I was listening to, and like I, I remember I was uh, I was I was in this girl's apartment. You know, she she uh, this 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 is this woman, this young woman who I've had a back and forth with for, for a quite a long time, honestly. Uh, I she just fell off the face of the earth, and I have never heard from her again. But um, hopefully she's okay. Uh, 
I know I did a lot. Well, I'm not going to go there. Let me just, let me, just <laughs> go back to the, let me just go back to the trip because you know I, I don't I don't want to go into the you know personal spiel about that. Mm-hmm. that w- w- what I'll say is I, I remember I was lying on the floor and I had my headphones on and I'm listening to music. <laughs> And then all of a sudden, it seems like all of a sudden it feels like gravity just, 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 just it feels like a, something, a vortex just reached from behind me and pulled me down into the floor, like super deep. And then next thing I know, like my eyes are closed and I'm like, I'm like this fractal, I'm like, I'm like on this fractal train and, and I don't even know if that makes sense. And we're, we're like. Going on, it, it starts off like a sort of roller coaster where we're just like going down, and then all of a sudden it's just like blasting through different. Oh my gosh! It's it's, 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 it's literally on so it was happening like on so many dimensions that it wasn't three dimensional. It was probably like four dimensional, five dimensional. So it's hard to describe, but it was like I was part of some collective of some some fractal things, and um. And I was starting to ask them, like, uh, so how long how long have we been here? How long have we been doing this? And 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 they said, like, uh, oh yeah, we've been here for we've been here for etern- eternity. And I'm like, wait, eternity? What? I'm, I'm like, so 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 is this the real me or is that the real? Wait, what's the real me? And they're like, oh yeah yeah yeah, you were always like this all the time. I'm like, what? <laughs> It was it was just crazy, and then and then eventually like the visuals start to fade, and the uh, like the just the, the visuals it's, it's like it was just crazy, man. It was it was awesome, and I, I remember the colors. It was like it was like a deep blue, and there was like a a sort of like green background that looked like it it had like oh my gosh, if you were to take like uh have you ever seen like those uh those uh what do you call it those super cubes in mathematics mm-hmm. hypercubes yeah yeah if you were to take hypercubes and you just stack them all over the place and they were all around you and it was like sort of like green and then it turned turned into like purple and then into black and it was just like it was just really incredible man and 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 my entire body felt like it was on fire it felt like I was the thing that was being smoked like I like. I didn't smoke salvia. Salvia smoked me. Well, there you go. Uh, I'm sure we can all agree with that to an extent. Uh, in terms of you know what salvia does, most people feel as if it's smoking them. Uh, and and I've yeah, and I've seen it knock you know big uh, boys down. Uh, and uh, it's it's nothing to play with. Uh, they took it casually and took that big. Uh, Took that big huff and uh, and just hit the floor, you know. Like uh, anyhow, uh, interesting that Costa. So Brendan. Uh, so uh, uh, let's see what he's doing right now. He should have a different job at this point. Uh, and uh, 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 yeah. want to see if he he can uh, join the conversation. Uh, yeah, asked him that now. I doubt he will, but uh, he seems to have seen what I was uh, what I had sent him, and so. Hopefully he doesn't misread, uh, you know, what happened earlier. He's he's got a picture of himself in front of this gate uh, that looks like uh, um, it's an actual archaeological site, but I'm sure that can't be. <laughs> I don't know whether he photoshopped that or what. Or um, but there are of course uh, Rosicrucian museums in California where they have such Egyptian kinds of. Uh, uh you know constructs uh, just like uh what do you call it they've they've tried to re- rebuild or uh some egyptian type uh f- what would you call it architecture and uh so uh, maybe he's there someplace like that one of those rosicrucian type you know temple museums or something uh, but uh other than that oh, oh yeah yeah i see what you're talking about yeah he's it's it's got like the uh the cartouche yeah 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 him. yeah I, aeroglyphics and, 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 and shit and, and, yeah and it has a hieroglyphics on it yeah it's yeah. really it's really cool yeah it's nice and uh, of course he he wants to be a ling- yeah. linguistic anthropologist is that what did i just hear is that him or is that is that daniel it was me coughing it was oh. me coughing <laughs> <laughs> Oh, that's cute. Okay. Uh, all right. So, 
took care of most of these uh, reactions and whatnot. Let's, uh, Emmerich Korslik, where do I remember him from? Anyhow, uh, let's get started in a second. One more check into the live chat because it's always so fun to go in there. And the real tech geek, there he goes. He says psychedelics are the next marijuana to get into investment wise. Uh, that's that's cool. I, I think he's joking. I think. <laughs> and uh, other than that, um, it's uh, it, you know, and Marky Milk was bringing up that fact that uh, he was watching some video of a sandwich arrest on uh, Bart uh, from uh, way back then. No eating on the Bart and. Uh, of course, I doubt mo they would even enforce that these days. Uh, maybe they would during business hours. Well, probably not. But um, oh, you know who earlier brought up something? It was uh, Nancy Volker, who's probably not with us right now. But if she is, uh, do wave your hand there, honey, or uh, you know, say something so I know you're there. But Nancy Volker was bringing up when we we were talking about. Uh, different awkward things that were going on um uh she was uh by the way before i even read what she says chris collins said i enjoy many genres which include plenty of experimental and avant-garde bands with all untraditional sounds and song structures but the grateful dead is absolute shit and simply unlistenable yes thank you he says i have a strong distaste for that whole scene thank you yes yes uh yes the music sucks and so does the whole scene uh and uh so then uh nancy volker was saying tries because we were talking about what were we talking about uh, awkward things people were doing or something she said try someone jerking off in front of you on the subway on the way home from work laugh out loud wearing white pants that had a big yellow stain when the train stopped by the time the train stopped truly laugh out loud I'm glad she took it well. Um, you know, I found it extremely disconcerting when I that there was this sleaze bucket old British type of dude who was jacking off to me on the on the bar train, and uh, I I found that a violation. Uh, just when somebody's you know staring at you hungrily and jacking off in public transport, uh, yeah, it's just. Uh, this just yeah, that's, that, 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 that is very disturbing yes yes and they follow you from from you know train to train in other words you you, you switch to a different train and they follow you it, it's like first you go to a different cabin in the train you know i don't know if you can dignify them by calling them cabins well, see, on the part this like, is uh, this this is why i advocate people taking book bags with them and Carrying like uh, bricks and rocks with them, so you could throw a, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you could throw throw a brick or rock at them. <laughs> that'll, kill, that'll keep them away. Yes, yes. Uh, they, they, these people certainly deserve such. Uh, okay, well, we've got six hours left, but I'd better get started. Um, my love to both of you, gentlemen. Uh, Daniel, uh, do say good night. Um, and Douglas Mark says it uh, is disturbing. Yeah, I guess. Uh, I guess been fun it's been real and uh we'll get going i'll talk to you later bye yes good night daniel blessed night daniel thank you so much for joining us um it's so wonderful to have friends like daniel who's been with us for so long and uh honestly uh <sighs> it's just uh, makes me sad to think of uh you know judith Agert was really upset when she felt that daniel wouldn't speak to her anymore and uh but this was of course because he felt she was treating me very poorly and uh y you know it was um it sat all the way around oh my god uh that she has to be the way she is but um such is life i'm sure you had your own pains with that girl you were talking about uh when you were bringing up yeah. the drug experience yeah 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 uh quite a bit um it's probably the only woman, young woman of all the women that I've uh, been with that I've, well, all the women that I have, like, one-time encounters with. It's probably the only young woman that I remember. And the interesting thing is I never fucked her. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, there, there we have that. I mean, there's an element of you, as you said yourself, that's virginal. Uh, and uh, he certainly our man Daniel <laughs> tries to talk you into uh, some kind of rectification of that, but uh, you know. Such I, as... I I I seek that, but on the same so on, on the same token, I can see how this is working in my benefit. I mean, it, uh, there was a time when it there was a time when it really did hurt me, and I really did feel angry about it. 
and I really hated the world because I couldn't get laid, you know, but uh, that that's past. And I realized, yeah, I could be getting laid, but I have this time that I could spend doing other things like exploring the uh, how 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 much of a headache I can amass <laughs> from too much ingestion of uh, of toxins. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh... <laughs> I mean, it's, it's, you know, uh, it's, how do I say this? It's, it's what it is. Uh, the, um, I, uh, it's, <laughs> I don't know what to say. It's, it's like, uh, uh, uh it's, 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 it's not going to be this way forever. I'm, I, I'm not uh, really I, certain. Oh, well, by the way, I'm not judging if it is. It, it, it's uh, the, uh, you know, some of the most, brilliant and creative people in the world um they, they kill themselves at a young age with uh, some level of abuse i mean poets like was it walt whitman uh, that comes to mind let me see if that's the individual i was thinking of who died at a at an extraordinarily young age and uh, this came from uh, just drinking a lot in his case and uh it wasn't him it wasn't walt whitman he lived forever okay some other poet i ran across the other day i i, I forget his name probably so tragic that i that i you know, and then the, you get guys like, um, you know, one of my favorite authors, uh, William Hope Hodges, uh, who wrote The Nightland. Uh, and uh, William Hope Hodges wrote many other supernatural works, um, uh, some nautical works that were brilliant. Uh, and uh, so here's this individual who then in World War I uh, dies leading uh, a fucking cavalry charge into machine gun fire and cannonade. I mean, what's the fucking point? <laughs> it's like uh, uh, he could have uh, produced uh, novels and works uh, for, you know, 40 more years at least if he hadn't uh, done something stupid like that in the name of king and country, you know, on, on the, you know, really. Uh, well, I don't. I, I have no intention of dying here. Um, and uh, honestly, I, I I've I've blown through my finances getting these awesome ass boots. So I okay. prob So I probably won't be uh won't be doing the drinking thing anytime soon. Understood. No, no, no. Definitely, definitely appreciate it. And uh, you you know it. Uh, it just uh, is what it is. It's it's nothing to get defensive about or you know guilt yourself out over. It's uh, it's it's just something that uh, you know sometimes uh, we just puzzle at it in only in the sense that uh, when you suddenly said the room was spinning around, that came out of nowhere, and I thought you were sick. <laughs> so uh, it was just an unusual way to present what was going on. Uh, when when you first brought that up in the tax box, uh, but uh, you know I'm glad to find out that well it, you're just having a pleasant sensation, uh, and uh, so Douglas Marks was saying thank you for the shout out Doug hugs Douglas of course that's uh, and he says yay the chemtrails are everywhere with toxins all over the planet we're all ingesting toxins, and uh, yeah. <laughs> okay um yeah maybe um it, you know uh, chemtrails bust that bubble yeah. right away yeah I, uh, I don't even know if it's worth bothering it's it's like yeah. that, just trust most of the chemtrails most of the chemtrails are coming from the uh three assholes launching penises up into yeah, space thank you thank you <laughs> i i mean uh really yes so what was it was one of these gentlemen here uh marcus grix was in uh uh, Australia earlier. I hope I acknowledged him. Uh, if not, hopefully he hears this later. And um, just taking a look around here at um, who else checked in earlier. But I'd best get to work. And all I'm doing right now is kind of avoiding work. Once I get started on monologue, of course, I very seldom pay attention to what's going on in the, in the chat room. So I do appreciate it if you do so. And uh, bring it to my attention, of course, if there's anything you feel I need to be paying attention to. Other than that, uh, say goodnight to everyone for now, dear Jameson. And, of course, I may still call on you, but, you know. Good night, folks. Wonderful. Bless you, son. 
All right, uh, so let's go back to talking about the Egonauts and close that subject. Uh, basically, in addition to vanity projects for billionaires, these pseudo-events were advertisements, promotions for the brands prominently displayed throughout the breathless television coverage of these space-going uh, billionaires. But advertisements for what? Human exploration is about the future, and space exploration is a long bet on a very distant tomorrow. What kind of future will the billionaire space race promote? Well, one clue, shortly after emerging from his 10-minute space flight last month, Jeff Bezos thanked Amazon customers and what? employees for their primary role in paying for his Blue Origin joyride to the edge of space. He's right. We did pay for it. 82% of American households are prime members, and the company has 1,298,000 employees. We also paid for the Apollo program, of course, only there's a difference. To put Neil Armstrong on the moon, we paid taxes and elected representatives to decide how to spend them. In the 52 years between Armstrong's July accomplishment and the Branson Bezos accomplishments, the United States has radically restructured its entire economy. Specifically, we've handed it over to billionaires. Now, rather than paying taxes, we pay for our prime memberships. Instead of NASA, we fund Blue Origin. We've elected people who defund NASA so businessmen can lead us to new frontiers instead of test pilots and physics PhDs. Historically, astronauts were the best and the brightest. The pioneers of the 1960s were war heroes and accomplished pilots who combined physical skill and courage with crisp engineering minds. Neil Armstrong, a legend among test pilots, flew more than 900 different types of planes before leaving the Earth in July of 1969, when I myself was three years old. When the lunar module's computer cocked out on final approach, he manually piloted the craft to the moon's surface. Those that followed in the space shuttle and aboard the International Space Station were scientists and engineers of distinction. Astronaut. The very term used to connote something noble, something that cemented the best of what it meant to be human, really. Forget all the all-American hype. Men and women of exceptional capabilities and origins as unremarkable as their erstwhile allied Soviet counterparts, really. Armstrong was the second person in his family to ever even attend college. And his father was a state government bureaucrat. John Glenn's parents were a plumber and a teacher. Sally Ride, the first American woman in space, was a Ph.D. physicist. Her father was a community college professor. And her mother volunteered as a prison counselor. Former NASA chief astronaut Peggy Whitson, a Ph.D. biochemist who spent more time in space than any other American, at 665 days, if I remember, grew up on a farm in Iowa. And all praise be to the FAA, which, just before Bezos took off, issued a new policy requiring that a space crew member actually contribute to the mission before receiving astronaut wings. In the prime space future, we won't have astronauts. We'll have these egonauts instead. The problems of the prime space future go deeper than who gets to ride Jeff's cocket to the common line. An ever-expanding array of technological innovations, businesses, and services now fall under the rubric of space. Space, 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 space. One of the earliest and still most important benefits of space exploration was the GPS, the Global Positioning Satellite System. It's hard to overstate the importance of GPS, which is foundational to our mobile economy. GPS was born of a United States 
DOD, a U.S. DOD, at the United States Department of Defense project in 1973. It continues to be run by the DOD, which makes it freely available to all users. Because we're all under a military junta in effect. Mm. And if that doesn't tell you the military runs America, I don't know what fucking does. Bezos and Elon Musk are launching thousands of satellites over the next several years to enable their Kuiper and Starlink systems. There's a lot to celebrate about these projects which promise broadband internet for remote and underserved regions. But do we want Bezos and Musk or any shareholders in their companies to control that access? With the number of satellites projected to grow from 3,000 to 50 fucking thousand, space hauling will be an enormous business. Bezos dreams of moving pollutive manufacturing to space, which seems both insane and amazing, and nothing I myself haven't recommended before. Musk wants to build a colony on Mars, which seems more like space execution than exploration. It was Peter Moon who brought up the example of uh, overflow colonies being a form of mass execution. Hmm of surplus population. But as humanity expands to become a space-faring species, who should control who gets to go and what we do up there? To whom do the benefits of all this technological innovation flow? Well, to quote us Jeff Bezos verbatim, I want to thank every Amazon employee and every Amazon customer because you guys paid for all this. Bezos' appreciation, however, comest after Amazon has been repeatedly exposed for labor violations. So the Amazon founders, bald-faced braggadocio, immediately elicited scorn from many of his own employees who toil in extreme working conditions for little pay and with bathroom breaks only half as long as Bezos's short little rocket ride. The majority of tweets amalgamate it into something like, Quick, while Jeff Bezos is in space, let's pass a hundred billion dollar landing from space tax, unionize Amazon, bring Amazon into public ownership, and pay workers a living wage. But American taxpayers should be just as roiled as Amazon wage slaves for not being mentioned by the Bezos boy at all. Commentators have already pointed to Bezos's blue origin and Sir Richard Branson's earlier trip on Virgin Galactic's Unity spacecraft as being privately funded, but in Bezos' case, that is far from the truth. From the very start, the giant retailer's business strategy has relied on dodging taxes and pocketing public subsidies. Uh, in truth, Jeff Bezos should have thanked American taxpayers for paying his space ride. Dodging taxes and winning public subsidies has been core to Amazon's business strategy from the start, when its e-commerce sales elude its state and local sales taxes. Later, as the retailer expanded its distribution network, Amazon aggressively demanded passes on paying local property taxes in exchange for the promise of bringing jobs to a community. And when Amazon finally turned profitable, the company used various tax reduction schemes, including paying executives with stock options and running transactions through offshore tax havens. This enabled Amazon to become one of a number of highly profitable companies that have contributed next to nothing to the costs of the federal government. Early on, Amazon located its shipping centers in states without sales taxes. 
It successfully argued that the transaction occurred when or where the package left its distribution center, not once it was left at the customer's front door. This tactic saved Amazon customers billions of dollars and gave Amazon an enormous competitive advantage over brick-and-mortar stores that had to collect sales taxes. As Amazon evolved, fast delivery became more important, leading the company to rapidly expand its vast distribution network closer to its customers. Recognizing that this would challenge the underpinnings of its sales tax dodging strategy, Amazon began to demand, and often, well, most often receive, lucrative tax breaks and other cash subsidies from communities where Amazon opened facilities and created jobs of the sort that you yourself would never want to hold, jobs of wage slavery and uh, drudgery uh, that uh, be exhausting to the point of, well, literally murderous, where you work yourself to death. Over the years, Amazon has collected nearly 3.3 billion U.S. dollars in 200 different tax subsidy deals with state and local governments. That's according to Good Jobs First's subsidy tracker database. In many cases, that means when an ambulance is dispatched to an Amazon warehouse to tend to a worker overcome by heat stroke, Amazon has left the cost of such services to other taxpayers to pay. Or when Amazon hires an educated worker, it does so knowing that it often contributed little to pay for local government's investments in schools. In the three years between 2018 and 2020, Amazon reported 44.7 billion US dollars in US pre-tax profits but paid just 1.9 billion United States dollars in American corporate income taxes according to a 2021 analysis by the ITEP the ITEP the Institute on Taxation and Economic Policy. These paltry payments gave us to Amazon an effective tax rate of just 4.3%, a fraction of the tax rate paid by typical middle American U.S. families, and only a fifth of the 21% statutory United States corporate income tax rate. I mean, really? Really. And if Amazon had paid the full 21% corporate tax rate over the last three years, the company would have paid 7.2 billion United States dollars more in federal taxes, money that could have been used to invest in basic research, education, national security, and COVID-19 aid for struggling families and small businesses. Bezos' New Shepard suborbital flight recreated the historic 1961 flight of America's first astronaut, Alan Shepard, hence its name, New Shepard. Back then, the U.S. corporate tax rate was 48 fucking percent. If Amazon had paid that same rate on its income in the last three years, the company would have paid an additional 19 and a half billion United States dollars in U.S. income taxes. Amazon is not alone in not paying its fair share in federal taxes. Back in 1961, 
Corporate income taxes comprised 22.1% of the federal government's revenue. Just yesteryear, corporations paid 6.6% of Uncle Sam's bills. Despite U.S. corporations being far more profitable then, well, than when Alan Shepard flew aboard the Freedom 7. Bezos' claims to have invested about $7.5 billion U.S. dollars in Blue Origin to date. U.S. taxpayers have invested many times that amount in Amazon through sales tax loopholes, property tax subsidies, and federal tax avoidance schemes. It is we, the American taxpayers, along with Amazon's hard-working, underpaid workers, that made this billionaire's 10-minute thrill ride possible. I know two things about Blue Origin. One, Amazon's customers and employees paid for it, just like Bezos said. Two, the Commonwealth may register progress, but there will be less public spillover from the technology and an increase in private capture. Imagine the tax avoidance that will occur in space where nobody can hear the IRS scream. The counterweight to market externalities is democracy. And a democracy that cedes ownership of its future to a winner-take-all market will lose control of that very future. Democracy acts through governments and taxes, whether we like it or not. This is what brings us to the right stuff. While Bezos was high-fiving his employees after his jaunt into space, NASA scientists were working on projects for all mankind. The Perseverance rover on Mars has its own drone, which is sending back amazing pictures. In November, NASA, along with the European and Canadian space agencies, will launch the James Webb Space Telescope, the successor to the Hubble. Under development since 1996, it promises to advance human knowledge about the formation of the universe and the origins of life itself. It's unlikely these projects will attract any venture capital money or support a... SPAC, uh, S-P-A-C. And uh, for those of you, of course, unfamiliar with the acronym, that is, of course, a special purpose acquisition company, also known as a blank check company, a shell corporation listed on a stock exchange with the purpose of acquiring a private company, thus making it public without going through the traditional initial public offering process. Hmm. Now, in terms of what we're trying to do tonight, checking in again to, oh, yes, Our Lady Sarah Thomas, uh, the... uh, Yes, she says, ready to dive into transmission. Jemo, I could tell you some really crazy acid and shroom trips from my teens. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry, honey. Oh, my God. The Real Tech Geek says, sounds like both of the companies want to build a space elevator. Oh, we wish. And he says, Bezos wants a space station for the rich. If anyone and DD saw Elysium before. And Sarah Thomas says, totally Elysium. Yes, yes. Yes, I I know of the film. I didn't need to see it because, you know, I I wouldn't mind seeing it, but I'm not anxious to see it. Not something I'd go out of my way to see because, you know, I know the dystopian situation it presents is an easy enough conclusion. So most certainly nothing surprising 
as far as watching it might go. But one of these days I intend to. All right, my dear man, Jameson, take over for a few seconds. I'm here. I'm going to stay here. But I just got to, you know, shake my head, clear the cobwebs, and uh, then I'll dive back in. Uh, oh my god, right. sometimes I can suddenly feel so sleepy. But that's the crash, that's the decompression happening in well, certain levels. Um, yeah, right, well, right now, I'm whipping this dude's ass in Magic the Gathering Arena. Can you do that while still talking? Can you, can you? Yeah, okay. yeah, totally. Cool. Um, Jameson can walk and chew gum at the same time. I'm gonna take my earbuds off for a few minutes and uh, drink water, try to get myself slap my face until I get back into the you know the rhythm so thank you young man well it does seem we we get to enjoy a burning world where all these uh rich elite elite pricks try to convince people that they're doing things for us when they're actually just shitting on us and making things worse um and uh unfortunately this is the stage we're at um now I try to be optimistic. Uh, what I can say is it doesn't seem like uh, any attempts at accountability for these people is uh, ever going to be put in motion. It seems to be pretty much like a free uh, shit show right now. Um, it doesn't seem like uh, anyone... What I would say is that the, the democracy that as we see it, as we know it, and the fact that it has been completely overturned by capitalism, it's pretty much on its way out. Uh, it's dying. Um, this is one of the reasons why I do actually agree with uh, Douglas's idea of a sort of centrist government or a fascistic government being more uh, efficacious as far as uh, having the people's best interests because uh, whatever we have going on now, it doesn't work. It's horribly ineffective, if anything. Um, and it seems like the only people getting... Uh, the only people getting hurt are the people who aren't like uh, crooks or billionaires. And um, this even goes, uh, you can see if you want to take a look at how predatory these people are, you know, you all one needs to really do is look at what's going on in the world of cryptocurrencies, where it seems like every other day somebody is uh, coming up with a scheme to defraud people out of uh, millions of dollars okay I am since I'm losing so badly I can just go into looking at some of the other things going on in the world um oh we have uh, Zuckerberg's cash fueling uh, GOP suspicion and new election rules uh now, Facebook founder Mark Zuckerberg donated $400 million to help fund election offices as they scrambled to deal with the coronavirus pandemic late last summer. At least eight GOP-controlled states have passed bans on don donations to election offices this year as Republicans try to... Uh, Oh, wait a minute. What the heck is going on? Republican legislatures are granting him that wish. Uh, at least eight GOP-controlled states have passed bans on donations to electric election offices this year as Republicans try to block outside funding of voting operations. The legislation often comes as part of Republican packages that also put limits on how Voters can cast ballots and impose new requirements on county, city, state-based election officials. Um, basically, Zuckerberg is an asshole who is basically fueling what these uh, Republicans want, which is to fuck everything up. And I'm not going to say the Democrats are any better because they are enabling this shit to happen. This uh, response is spurred by anger and suspicion on the right that Zuckerberg's money benefited Democrats in 2020. 
I don't believe it did at all. Conservatives have long accused the tech mogul social media platform of censoring right-wing voices as part of its campaign against misinformation, which is absurd because every other fucking, uh, oh my gosh, uh, last year every other ad that I saw was for Donald Trump or some fucking right-wing piece of shit. Um, Zuckerberg's money was largely distributed through a nonpartisan foundation that had liberal roots. Conservative groups cite uh, cite analysis that the money went disproportionately to Democratic leaning counties in key states such as Florida and Pennsylvania. People saw that and looked around and they were increasingly concerned about why you would have a billionaire funding our elections through the back door, said Jessica Anderson. Well, I mean, we already had the Russians do it, so I mean, who cares if uh, Zuckerberg does it? Executive uh, <laughs> Director of the conservative group Heritage Action, which has pushed the bans in several states. But uh, many election officials say the effort is short-sighted and fueled by paranoia. Election offices argue they are chronically underfunded and now cannot benefit, benefit from donations that still flow to so many other branches of government, including police, schools, and libraries. Uh, furthermore, they say there is no sign of favoritism in distribution of grants from Zuckerberg and his wife, Priscilla Chan. Wow, she must be self-loathing to have <laughs> married that son of a bitch. Elections are more expensive in populous urban areas, and especially more so last year when states scrambled to shift mail voting to deal with the pandemic. Um, Republican-leaning areas were already discouraged from accepting election grants due to conservative suspicion of Zuckerberg. The Republican Attorney General of Louisiana last year ordered his state's election officers to turn down grants from the nonprofit, the Center for Tech and Civil Life, which distributed $350 million of Zuckerberg money. So I guess he was funding something to improve voting, and <laughs> I'm I I somehow don't think he did this out of the kindness of his heart at all. No, no. It's it's this this is total bullshit. Yeah. But um, so so help me out here. Uh, I'm trying to place this. When we were talking about Melanesia, the Enverins of uh, Australia, was that was not the latest episode in which I talked about the Olympics. It was the episode before, right? Oh, do I have that right, or was that in the same episode? <laughs> no, no, no. I think that well, that was in the same episode. Was it? I mean, I'm yes. not doubting you, but um, let me take a look at my sent box. And uh, see, because I, I sent that to Louis Rogers, the one in which I, I spoke of Australia at length. Let's check my sent box and see if our memories serve us right. So that was, uh, okay, you, you know, that was the episode before, I believe. Let me check here. Okay, well, Let's my yeah, memory was the episode before is... last. That's right. All right, my my memory is so distorted, man. <laughs> it's like it's it's like it, it, will, it will piece together something that happened last week to something that happened last year, and all of a sudden, crunch it into like a coherent day, and I'm like, holy crap! Yeah. Oh my god. Uh, so um, so it's, we... it's I'm a permafried man. Oh well, no worries. <laughs> I mean, you did okay. I mean, honestly, you've been doing all right, and uh, yeah, I'm permafried myself, so that makes two of us. And um, so let's. Uh, I'll get back into the. Uh, is there some points you need to make with what you're what you're conveying now before I dive back in? No, no, just that uh, Republicans are pretty much anti-democracy altogether, mm -hmm. based on what I'm reading. Mm. Yeah, yeah, very much so. Uh, <laughs> that's just reinforcing a, a known point. Um, and uh, so, uh, y you know, what I was saying, uh, and thank you so much, uh, hugs, uh, Jameson. Uh, 
What I was saying, of course, was that uh, it's unlikely that any of these private projects will attract any venture capital money or support their special purpose acquisition uh, company, their, their, their need for a blank check, which is what they're asking for. Uh, companies with no commercial operations formed strictly to raise capital through initial public interest, really, uh, which they generate. Uh, so this is the kind of, uh, how would we say, they're basically shell corporations listed on the stock exchange with the sole purpose of acquiring profit <laughs> and not producing anything in return, really. Uh, and uh, it's, uh, they've become, of course, the preferred way of many experienced management teams and sponsors to take companies public. Uh, but, uh, you know, uh, uh, obviously as an investor, uh, there's a lot you need to know about SPACs or blank check companies before you invest, I would, uh, presume, uh, I mean, why people invest in entities with no commercial operations is beyond me, but then I'm not at that level of gambling. Okay. That's well beyond my game. Uh, so in terms of, uh, private space projects other than what I've just articulated concerning their business potential. They might be dressed up as achievements for humanity, but their aim is to return capital to shareholders. And when that's the criteria, the astronauts and their efforts become limited in scope by that very function. And if form follows function, what form do you get with that particular function? A giant penis in the sky, the big space fuck. Is this a Mach 3 train wreck or a galactic ATM? Whatever you think of space travel as a human endeavor, space tourism is awful business. Even assuming all go as well, it makes no fucking sense. These are vanity projects, pure and simple. And the only people that will ever make money from them will be the early investors who bail out before impact. Most businesses are either demand constrained, as in the market for its product is limited, or supply constrained, meaning they can never make enough of its product. Virgin manages to be both. To meet its profit targets, it has to sell about 3,100 tickets per annum every year at a whopping $400,000 each, a 60% increase from the current price. After an ad, the entire world saw the product has a waiting list of, guess it, Jameson, how, how many people you think are on that waiting list? Take a guess. For what? <laughs> fucking drugs man uh you know to go into fucking space on the virgin plane uh i would guess i don't know 10 well 600 people effectively Are you yeah you, but that's like well, what's that you may as well be 10 that many yeah you're surprised at that many my brand strategy class at section four has 1500 people and there's dramatically lower odds you're going to blow up in your chair. But even if there were an annual demand from 3,100 people willing to pay that fee of 400,000 bucks to supply the space flights, Virgin would have to make two flights per day every goddamn day without mishap ever. Because one mishap will stop it all. So far, in all of 2021, it has flown, but twice. The true addressable market for space tourism is zero. It's the mother of all product market mismatches. By comparison, Google Glass and Cheetos flavored lip balm, which is an actual thing I found out at my latest celebration. <laughs> We're on point. 
Virgin Galactic may achieve great things, but the stock, which trades on the NASDAQ as SPCE, you know, like space, 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 is a Mach 3 train wreck. The worst case and most likely scenario, death. Rockets to space are controlled explosions of thousands of gallons of flammable material. Reentry is a high-speed fall into the searing heat of friction. Virgin Galactic, in case you did not know, has already lost one pilot, Michael Alsberry, who died when his Spaceship 2 craft broke apart in the atmosphere. You don't want to die up there. It's really unpleasant. Believe me, you'll die aware that you're burning alive and disintegrating. Not a fun way to go. 590 people have headed into space that are acknowledged by the Allied governments, and 19 of those are admitted, officially acknowledged, to have never returned. Meaning space travel is more dangerous than base jumping. What we were talking about earlier with the fucking squirrel wings, the flying squirrel shit. Space travel is more dangerous than that. A space tourism fatality is a question not of when, but... Well, not of if, but when. So, if it's a question of when and not if, well, exploration and innovation are worth risks, even to a human life. Floating weightless for 300 seconds is not. At that point, fuck, you've got nothing to live for. Which is why... That old bitch, who looks like a man, said, Yeah, these seven, I got no fucks left to give. Well, she might want to float in space, because if she dies, she loses, like what? How much amount of life has she got left anyway? Ten minutes? Richard Branson understands all these risks. Last May, he sold... Half a billion United States dollars of his Virgin Galactic stock. And this April, he sold another 150 million U.S. dollars, trimming his holding to less than 25% of the company. He was able to make both sales because he took the company public in 2019 via a SPAC that, as I said, a blank check front company, special purpose acquisition company, Shell Corporation. In other words, a dummy front company for gold collar crime. Controlled by the former Facebook employee in this case, Shamath Palihapitiya. That was her fucking name. Some South Asian either Pakistani or Bangladeshi, Shamath Palihapitiya, either that or it sounds almost like a Polynesian, uh, you know, I don't believe that we see Polynesians at that level of business uh, involvement these days. They're so rare as a people and that, well, let's just say it's a safe bet she's either Pakistani or Bangladeshi. But I'd like to find out. Oh, it turned out now that I'm checking out this fucker's name, Shamath. It's actually a dude. Uh, I had no idea because I've never heard of a man or a woman named Shamath before. He also shed his entire personal stake in the company back in March. You see, billionaires vote with their wallets. And the two largest shareholders believe their capital will achieve greater returns elsewhere. They aren't banking on this shit. The billionaire space race's success won't be measured by forming successful colonies in the solar system, but rather by countering calls 
As Princeton space historian Harris Durrani put it, for global redistribution. If successful, the billionaires will have convinced the public that their wealth is not only legitimate, but that it is somehow bettering humanity. All while they contribute emissions to the planet's burning. Okay, now that I've kind of condensed that, uh, any any observations of your own, Jameson, before I dive into Hiroshima and Nagasaki? Uh, just that. Um, no, no, no real observations. Just that we're fucked. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, but who's fucking us? I mean, this is one case where it is right to hate the billionaires. This is a case where those who are engaging in this shit, this is just like somebody uh, literally jacking off in your face on public transport. This is where you're sitting in public transport and the guy's walking around waving his cock and spewing on on people. <laughs> You know, this is, you know, jacking off and spewing on people. That, that's this is what this is. And uh, the, they're just ejaculating on us from above. Literally, literally just, uh, you know, pissing and shitting on us and, and uh, just saying that uh, that it's what we need and shit. This is what you need. Uh, and uh, suck it up. It's um, these people deserve to die. Uh, this is like, uh, this is like, uh, what would you call it? It's the ultimate, you know, talk about getting off on a big bang, a big masturbatory, you know, and it's, it's worse. It's it, it like, uh, and, uh, saying that they're doing it for your sake, you know, I'm doing this for you. And it, it it's, it, you've heard my, my case on this. If you don't get yes. it by now. Uh, not you personally. I'm talking to anybody listening. If you don't get it by now, you you're unable to get anything. I mean, you, you your head's up your ass or something. Uh, but uh, these people are a danger, and honestly, uh, f- for doing this, they they really ought to uh, face some level of uh, uh, what would we call it censure, censure and ostracization uh, from the public, uh, not praise. Uh, and certainly not your investments. Now, in terms of uh, Hiroshima and Nagasaki in the time we have left, and it'll take some time uh, to talk about uh, magic in the uh, Japanese uh, defense. And um, here we are. The Real Tech Geek says, SPACs, you have, to be, you have to be careful with and treat them like trash. Thank you. Yes, he says, in the past year... There have been over 200 SPACs. I mean, I'm surprised there's that many suckers out there who've got money to burn uh, for these guys. He says, I mean, treat them like a day trade. Yes, understood. Thank you. Thank you. That's from The Real Tech Geek. Deeply appreciate it. And um, so, all right. Uh, Let's get into uh, what I was going to um, talk about from the beginning. And uh, now that I've had my opportunity to shit and piss all over Jeff Bezos like he did with us, you know, dropping that jet fuel all over uh, all over the planet. Oh, by the way, he says uh, after Virgin Galactic had their successful trip, everyone expected the stock to go up like crazy. I knew it was going down. They even announced a 500 million share dilution. What a freaking joke. Thank you, Real Tech Geek. Thank you. So he's just validated what I've said. And I haven't even been monitoring the situation that closely. And, uh, and believe me, I'm no, uh, obviously, I'm not some wealthy uh, investor or uh, day trader. I uh, monitor these things casually. And uh, even I can see what's going on here. Um, other people who cannot, I feel bad for them. Honestly, there may be idealistic people who think that these billionaires are the barnstormers of the space age. That, yeah, we're back to like the barnstorming years for aeronautics. And it's all a crock of shit. Nothing could be further from the truth. By the way, Karen O'Connor says, Love from Karen, Lily Louise, and Betty. 
from Ireland, Dublin, Dublin, Ireland, <laughs> double X, lots of shamrocks and green hearts. God bless you, honey. Love you too. In turn, love you dearly. All right. Let me get myself some uh, breath here, oxygenate further. Obviously, uh, you know that it, it's just, um, it's amazing that I don't get myself into a state of, uh, I don't know, some level of hypertension or something with this shit. Mm. People might think that, but my biggest problem is hypotension and kind of like uh, going into, falling into the danger zone of falling asleep. By the way, what I'm confused about is why I'm still seeing the SpongeBob icon on some of the Skype um, uh, calls or something uh, here. I see Jameson Reese call started and there's a SpongeBob icon. Did you did you like change your icon in the middle of the call or something? So I'm seeing uh, SpongeBob no, again not because at I'm all. seeing it in front of me uh, as you. I'm seeing you in front of me and when the okay. white circle moves it's you. So that's good. And then the SpongeBob I guess is just when I refresh the page maybe that'll change. So when I reset the page later or something. Not going to do that in the middle of a call of course. Yeah, yeah, it could be that. Yeah. Uh anyhow, um God, how I dearly wish I was. Yeah. What, what, what's what's up? What's up? Oh man, you, you you love that SpongeBob, don't you? Yeah, yeah. He's joking. Yeah. Every, everybody understand this much. He's joking. I mean, you know, personally, when it comes to the SpongeBob cartoon, I've got nothing against it, but I got nothing for it. But as for the SpongeBob thing, it's just creepy. He he gets the creepiest looking SpongeBob <laughs> shit. Where this this is like SpongeBob. Do you know where SpongeBob lives in the cartoon? Bikini, uh, b yeah, the bikini, bikini bottom. Atoll. Yeah, where they did all the atomic testing and shit. So that's like, yep. uh, so so he's supposed to be all <laughs> mutated and cancerous and tumorous and shit, but they never show that. Uh, but uh, you know, maybe they ought to start. Oh my God! Uh, you know, we've got the uh, La Palma Islands in the Atlantic. We've got the fucking, uh, you know, the dome out there in the Marshall Islands uh, that that's ready to burst open and uh, kill the Pacific. Uh, so, um, you know, we're fucked yeah. either way. And, and yeah, well, honestly, I, I was honestly thinking about California and then, uh, uh, then and then you just said that and I'm like, OK. Well, here we go. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> why, why, why even bother? I'll just I'll I'll I'll, I'll just uh, take what comes here in the East Coast. Thank you, thank you, and and uh, that's 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 important. I I think that that's uh you know an important conclusion to draw is just uh just take it as it comes honestly it's uh it's 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 literally futile it's literally futile to try to run away from what's coming in at all yeah because because i mean uh the only alternative is those uh those flood uh those 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 uh flood plains uh in the middle of america where everyone's just fish belly white and wants anything black dead. Not so, to mention, ooh. not to mention that they got, um, you, you know, the heat dome and shit. They're they're baking when they're not flooded, uh, and uh, you, you know, there there you have that. By the way, when I spoke of that tsunami last time and uh, the kinds of uh, fuck Fukushima Daiichi, America's got all these nuclear reactors all up and down the Atlantic seaboard. Oh yeah, know, once those things, yeah. once those things go, oh man, once those things go off, yeah, yeah, that's and, it. We're all we're all dead. Yeah. Anyway, you know, and and and, and it's going to be a horrible death. I'd rather be washed away by the water, honestly, than die from the radiation. Because mm -hmm. radiation seems like it would be infinitely more painful. And and uh, but let me tell you something. When I was talking about that, when I was speaking about the Black Swan event, and one of the things that I brought up that people were writing me afterwards about, wow, you're really delusional. How could you be silly? You have these fantasy ideas of these Godzilla type kaiju uh, coming out of the sea and uh, feeding off that radiation. And uh, granted, I was being facetious about uh, heading towards the nuclear reactors and feeding off the radiation. But again, these people speak from their own ignorance. Uh, let me tell you all something. If you scour naval reports 
from both World War I and World War II. There are many reports that after dropping depth charges, the explosions sometimes resulted in enormous unknown sea creatures, some of them larger than the battleships dropping the depth charges themselves, that were seen thrashing about after being shocked, shell-shocked, or injured by the depth blasts. These reports have never been investigated. And what I saw at the Presidio military base revealed that by orders of magnitude more, and my own father's eyewitness sightings of such monsters. There was, in the Antarctic, a incident where the Stellar's sea cow, the uh, sea cow was hunted to extinction in the 1700s, reached 30 meters in length. This was, of course, towards the polar regions of the north. But in the Antarctic, they've encountered these kinds of sea cows that, fuck, they were seen with fucking antlers, uh, almost. Some kind of, like, uh, spinal kind of uh, protrusion that was part of their organic... Uh, Morphology, if you don't believe in Godzilla, you would if you saw that shit. Honestly, the uh, kinds of creatures that are out there, we don't know about at all. And with uh, something like a tidal wave of that world-shattering proportion, they'll be washed up along with other things that you'd never dream existed. Uh, so at that point, we're talking Atlantic Rim here, and, uh, at that point, your world changes, uh, you're going to begin to, um, appreciate, finally, that there's, uh, that you don't know anything about it, as opposed to everybody now on the internet thinking they know everything, uh, just because they can look some things up. Uh, the majority of the time when you look up the important shit, you never find any results. Now, uh, when it comes to those bombs that were dropped on Japan, it was committee meetings and memos and largely arbitrary decisions that ushered in the nuclear age. And this brings us to the bureaucrats who singled out Hiroshima for destruction. It was on the 10th day in May of 1945, 72 hours, but three days, that is, after German forces on the fields of Europe had surrendered to the Allied powers and thereby effectively ended proactive prosecution of World War II hostilities in the Atlantic at the conventional level. There was still years of guerrilla warfare and uh, the werewolf resistance movement insurgency to contend with covering the retreat of the Reich's exodus into Unterland via the Antarctic, where some of these creatures that I'm uh, alluding to uh, were sighted. That you had a carefully selected group of scientists and military personnel meet in an office in Los Alamos, New Mexico, with Germany practicably in disambiguation from practically out of the war, the top minds within the Manhattan Project, which was the American effort to design an atomic bomb of their own, of course, focused on the choices of targets within the 7,000 home islands of the Japanese Empire. And this group was loosely known as the Target Committee. And the question they sought to answer essentially was this. Which of the preserved, that was their term, meaning remaining, Japanese cities would best demonstrate the destructive power of the atomic bomb? Now, General Leslie Groves, the army engineer in charge of the Manhattan Project, had been ruminating on targets 
since late 1944. And at a preliminary meeting, but two weeks earlier than the day that I'm anchoring as our starting point, he had laid down his criteria. The target should possess sentimental, this was the term they used, sentimental value to the Japanese, so its destruction would adversely affect the will of the people to continue war. Now, what he's talking about is what today the United Nations would describe as cultural treasures of human uh, impact, meaning that uh, they would describe this as cultural treasures that belong to all humanity. Something that is a treasure to the human legacy that we should struggle to preserve at all costs is exactly what the Americans sought to destroy, specifically in the person of Leslie Groves, who was, of course, the forerunner to Michael Aquino, one of the forerunners, one of the forefathers of the military Satanism that would usher in the age of Aquino. General Leslie Groves was the kind of man who sponsored Jack Parsons. Mm. Now, he said, aside from that criteria, the target should have some military significance secondarily. He put that as secondary to cultural genocide. Military significance would imply munitions factories, troop concentrations, and so on. And tertiarily, it must be mostly intact. So that would demonstrate the awesome destructive power of an atomic bomb. And fourth on the list of criteria at the bottom, quatrarily, it should be big enough for a weapon of the atomic bomb's magnitude. Now, Groves asked the scientists and military personnel to debate the details. They analyzed weather conditions, timing, use of radar, the radio detection and ranging, or visual sites, and priority cities, thereafter noting that Hiroshima was the largest untouched target and having thus far remained off of United States Army Air Corps General Curtis LeMay's list of cities open to incendiary attack, they concluded it should be given consideration. Tokyo itself, Yawapa, and Yokohama were thought unsuitable. Tokyo being catastrophically misperceived as all bombed and burned out with only the palace grounds still standing, which will be the whole point of my covering the magical ministry of Japan. Now, a fortnight later, after this meeting that I started our description with, our lesson in history, at the formal May 10th target meeting, meaning that the May 10th target meeting was about a a fortnight after Curtis LeMay, or excuse me, General Leslie Groves, had put forth his criteria that he hoped would enable these brilliant minds uh, to meet on and decide, Robert Oppenheimer, the chief scientist on the Manhattan Project, ran through the agenda. It included height of detonation, gadget, which is how they reference the bomb, Gadget jettisoning and landing. In other words, bomb jettisoning and the impact thereof. Status of targets uh, and psychological factors in target selection, meaning which would be the greatest cultural treasure to all humanity that they would attempt to wipe from the face of the earth. Mm. Radiological effects and so on. Joyce Clenham Stearns was a male, believe it or not, with a name like Joyce. And this was the 19-fucking-40s, mind you. 
And uh, I never understood that. There are dudes out there in history named Joyce. Um, guys that like became poets and shit. And uh, this guy became a physicist. And he represented the U.S. Army Air Corps and was a scientific administrator on the Manhattan Project itself whilst simultaneously serving as the director of the Metallurgical Laboratory at the University of Chicago from November of 1944 through July of 1945, and Twasty, who named the four shortlisted targets in order of preference. At the very top of the list was Kyoto. Now, Kyoto was the ancient capital of Japan. It was the basis for all geopositioning, geomancy, or feng shui, in Japan. Because as the ancient capital, it was a city long ago, the first city on the Japanese home islands, as a matter of fact, when all the rest of Japan was but rural and countryside, Kyoto was the first city in Japan and served as its capital for a thousand years. And it was, of course, ultimately considered to be tainted by the Southern Dynasty, dynasty experience because, of course, my mother herself was descended from the Kyushu Dynasty of Southern Japan, and since the Kyoto city, built in a perfect geographic location, surrounded by running water, still water, high ground, all of this adding to its defensibility, its, able, its ability to resupply, this is what enabled it to become the first city on the Japanese home islands. And uh, because of that, people in Kyoto have a very arrogant attitude towards all other Japanese. <laughs> all of the Japanese really don't like to deal with people from Kyoto because, uh, and they especially don't like to go to Kyoto uh, because the Kyoto people have this arrogance based on their historical uh, supremacy over the rest of the Japanese home islands. And they look on everyone else's upstarts. You know, that's no longer the case, of course. In the postmodern age, things are changing very rapidly. But to give people just as some example of this when it comes to Kyoto, they have what the Japanese call the Kyoto language. Uh, the people of Kyoto speak Japanese, of course. But uh, they have uh, a way of saying things very subtly to indicate... Um, that, um, well, to indicate things that people would otherwise just say out loud. Um, my mother taught me when someone from Kyoto says, your child's very, er very energetic, uh, as in he's so full of energy. What they're really saying is, shut your goddamn kid up. <laughs> get your, yeah, you know, get your child uh, out of my face. And uh, when they say something along the lines of, uh, oh, would you like some tea? That means get out of my house because it means you've overstayed your welcome. In other words, since you're making yourself so much at home here, why don't I just act as your servant? You know, your, your average white person, this would be so subtle, so understated. Uh, they wouldn't know what to make of their shit. They would just, uh, you know, completely lose it. And, uh, you know, do something stupid like, oh, yeah, I'll take some of that tea. Oh, yeah. Oh, my kid's real energetic. It takes a Japanese person to understand this subtle nuance and uh, get what they're uh, being told. Uh, so, of course, the Kyoto is where we ultimately get uh, much of this uh, magical understanding of the uh, four directions uh, based on the four guardians. I've mentioned before about the monsters in Chinese culture and uh, the monsters of the Great Wall uh, I've spoken of. And uh, when I spoke of how that has a basis in the creatures of the four directions, 
Of course, the Japanese inherited that conceptualization from the Chinese in terms of the monsters of the four directions. But of course, it became culturally Japanized. And uh, their feng shui is uh, therefore uh, just basically uh, a kind of um, mutation of the uh, Chao Chao, the Tao Tao uh, monstrosities of uh, the Great Wall. And uh, they interpreted the Americans to be based on that kind of greed, that kind of extra, extra, how would you say it? External threat from out of reality itself, a threat that's existential in nature, then the, rightly so, because the Americans were out to completely exterminate them and ultimately all Asians uh, so that they could repopulate Asia with whites. This is what they had originally intended to do to Europe with the unleashing of the American Army and Navy flu. And uh, so if uh, you don't understand that, you, well, read uh, the uh, book, and uh, then you'll, uh, you'll understand. Uh, the Roswell deception will, you know, explain everything and uh, put it into uh, perspective for you. And um, it's, it's something that uh, hopefully will become, well, the education that everybody needs. So the Tao Te, the Tao Te monsters that uh, I was uh, describing that you saw in the Great Wall are just one of uh, many types of monsters. But uh, in China, the ancient Chinese culture, there were four major monsters of the four directions, the malevolences of Chinese mythology. And uh, so when it came to those four malevolences, these kinds of anti-gods that were then uh, kind of the guardians at each one of the corners of the compass, they also uh, serve as a kind of threat but they also serve as a kind of ward to other monsters. So the Tao Te of the Great War that are depicted in that uh, film, uh, they can also serve as a propellant, meaning, or a repellent, a repellent of extra cosmic evil like the anti-gods. Because after all, this is their world. Uh, even though they are out of this world in a sense, well, in several senses, it is their world in that they are tethered to this world via via the minds of man. So uh, when it came to uh, these malevolences uh, in ancient times, two of the ruling gods had eight virtuous sons each, and three other gods had uh, one son each, Hundun, which was chaos. Uh, and if I remember correctly, uh, Zhongqi, who was completely devious, whose maliciousness uh, passed down through generations until the time of Emperor Yao, a legendary ruler in Chinese mythology. And uh, there was, as well, during Yao's reign, a fourth evil son, Yao Te, greedy for uh, food and drink, uh, born to the ancient Jin Yun clan, uh, a beast who hoarded food and refused to share with those even in the most desperate need of charity. He became the fourth malevolence. It was... Uh, the Emperor Yao's uh, minister who expelled these four malevolences and their clans to the four edges of the earth, one in each cardinal direction, tasking them with warding off the extra stellar entities, the extra cosmic threat of the anti-gods. They themselves are monsters, but they are also those that were that ward off far worse. It's like the devils and the demons. 
who themselves rebuke the anti-gods and the cultists uh, who themselves would not be allowed to reside even in hell. So when it comes to these creatures and uh, someone in Japan who wanted to build a house, he'd call up the Japanese sorcerer, the wizard, which in the Japanese language is known, as my mother was known to an extent, as an onmyoji, and they would ask where they should put their houses or build their castle. The onmyoji would be consulted uh, before anything was ever done. And uh, when it comes to building the house, you have to take into account the four guardians, the Japanized version of the cardinal malevolences of ancient China. And uh, to the uh, uh, east would be Sairyu. Uh, and uh, to the, uh, well, the guardian of the... Uh, well, Sergio to the east, uh, then it would be uh, Suzaku to the south, uh, Byako to the west, and uh, if I can remember who was uh, to the north, uh, it would be uh, Ginbu. And now in terms of what these monsters manifested as, to the east, uh, Sergio would be the dragon, as in the traditional Chinese sense, very serpentine. Uh, in terms of Suzaku to the south, think of a golden condor uh, kind of avian, uh, a thunderbird. Uh, Byako to the west would be a white tiger of supermassive proportions. Genbu to the north would be a serpent astride a massive tortoise. Think of Gamera and uh, combine him with Manda as like a permanent symbiotic partner. Mm. And those would be the guardians of the four compass points. Each guardian would be associated with a geographical figure uh, based on the geography of Kyushu, the Japanese Rome, the Rome of Japan, the Rome of the Japanese Empire. Uh, Seryu is represented by running water, Suzaku of the south, and Seryu is to the east, the dragon to the east. That's the running water that was east of Kyoto, uh, Seryu is represented by still water, meaning the pond, the lake. Of course, you would emulate that on your own property by building a koi carp pond, a goldfish pond. Uh, but, uh, of course, there was an enormous body of water that was south of Kyoto that, by the way, over the many millennia has dried up completely. Uh, leaving Kyoto, the ancient capital, vulnerable to the south. And, of course, Byako to the west was represented by the roads. The, uh, and, of course, the uh, creature, the guardian to uh, Gembu to the north was uh, represented by the high ground, meaning mountainous terrain. Um, so imagine ancient Kyoto had all of this mountains to the north, the highway uh, to the um, to the west, uh, the uh, running water to the east, um, the massive lake uh, to the south. All of this is what would be taken into consideration to build any fortress or uh, the in any building, any home in Japan. Uh, that way, any construction would be protected on all sides by the four guardians. 
this was an idea that was taken very seriously, and this led to the Japanese uh, landscaping technique. Uh, and, of course, uh, all of this was, uh, y you know, uh, they would consult the Anmyoji, I'm about to buy a house, you know, uh, what would I, uh, what should I do about, you know, should the river next to it be flowing west to east or north to south? Uh, which the Anmyoji would tell people things like, hey, build a pond here on the south side to balance out whatever direction the river is flowing. Or pr plant some trees in the north side, because that's kind of like high ground. So uh, that is, uh, uh, you know, the during the Heian era of Japan, Heian meaning peace, the uh, era of peace uh, before there was Showa, who represented, of course, uh, peace as well. That, of course, was the emperor who brought Japan to victory in World War II, Hirohito himself. But in ancient days, the era, the period known as Heian, H-E-I-A-N, the Heian capital that was to become Kyoto, that was uh, sitting right in the middle of those four features that led to this Feng Shui. The Kamo River was to the east, now that I remember. And uh, Oguro was that uh, massive uh, pond to the south. Ugura Iki. Ike. And uh, the road to the west was that highway for horses and carts at the time. Was uh, Sanindo, the road to the west. Uh, to the north was Mount Funaoka. And so there was Kyoto in the middle of these four features that became uh, the features of Japanese Feng Shui or Geomancy. And of course, uh, unfortunately, as I said, uh, Uguro Pond, Ogura Iki, Ike, Ogura Ike Pond no longer exists. So Kyoto is vulnerable to the south at this point. And uh, so what uh, the capital did was it provided an example of instead of as above so below as below so above the running water still water the road the high ground to the four guardians that is uh all representative of what you seek in architecture in japan another thing the on myoji would do is of course uh uh exercise homes after they have been abandoned they would uh, dispel all the demons therefrom. So th this is why it's important to know about uh, Kyoto, to know about just how different they are from other Japanese, the, uh, the kinds of attitudes they have towards other Japanese and other Japanese uh, feeling intimidated by them. Uh, you know, the Japanese themselves are famous for doing that to foreigners. So you can imagine if Japanese are treated that way by the people of Kyoto, uh, foreigners may as well bother not to show up. Mm. But here they were when they were trying to decide for targets. They decided that Kyoto was their primary target. Secondarily, Hiroshima. Thirdly, Yokohama. And fourthly, Kokura. Which, by the way, should have been their primary target because Kokura was Japan's national arsenal, which everybody knew. So they weren't going after military targets as their primary targets. They were going after the cultural centers. Of course, Tokyo has overtaken Kyoto as the capital. My mother was born in Tokyo. And Tokyo was, ever since, its establishment as Yedo. Once it became Tokyo, it was a world-class city. It was a city that economically impacted the world. And uh, as far as my mother was always concerned it was the greatest city in the world um now as for the target choices of the mad bombers back in america these were all large urban areas of more than three miles in diameter capable of being effectively damaged by the atomic blast they intended to inflict upon the japanese people and uh, they concluded they were all likely to be unattacked by next August at the time that uh, they were planning their mass murder, which is what the dropping of an atomic bomb is. 
Now, someone immediately raised the possibility of bombing the emperor's palace in Tokyo, which they all agreed was a spectacular idea. This is very important. They all wanted to bomb the emperor's palace in Tokyo. Uh, but uh, when it came to actually carrying that mission out, they all said, well, it's militarily impractical. Now, both by way of precedent experience, because all attempts to do so till that point in the war had been inexplicably repelled by quote-unquote mysterious forces. And uh, simply the planes would not return alive, or rather the crews would all die in the planes, uh, would sometimes land themselves. By the way, you can look this up. There were incidents where U.S. planes, bombers, would land themselves. This was where the majority of those incidents happened because the crew was all missing or dead. And, of course, they had to factor in Hirohito's own Hitler bunker, as they called it. So-called because it was known to have been both designed and constructed by Germany's master engineers. Which, lead-lined and concretized, rendered it invulnerable to atomic attack. Mm. Now, these forces were identified in what are still extremely classified materials these mysterious forces that killed the bomber crews as having been marshaled by the imperial Japanese on Myoryo, literally the yin yang ministry, the uh, ministry of the Tao. So Japan had created thousands of years ago, the ministry of magic run by wizards, the sorcerers. The sorcerers were called on Myoji. Masters of the Occult Arts. So basically, the Am Yoji were like the Jedi, except the samurai conducted all the glamour combat. These professionals were called Fushi in China. Ceremonial masters, or masters of ceremony, where they were Taoist magical practitioners, not directly related to the inner alchemy schools in China. The Chinese state still employs them. Albeit, in communist China, in intelligence, just as such people were employed in Japan, and in terms of my native heartland of Taiwan, they are free to operate as, well, employees of the state at times, depending on their contract, or otherwise, servants of the people. Now, technically, the... On Myorio still exists. It was abolished during the Meiji Restoration upon the death of its last proper Grand Master, uh, Suchimikado Hauruo. And uh, my mother told me of him. But its functions were split into three organizations two of which fell under the purview of the Imperial Japanese Navy. And as a liaison between both branches of service, the Imperial Japanese Army and the Imperial Japanese Navy, my mother became aware of its existence. But there was one, the Astrology Department, that was allowed to exist under Suchimikado Harinaga. Suchimikado being a title kind of like the uh, emperor of the occult. And uh, kind of like uh, Doctor Strange presents himself via the Marvel Comics franchise, the master of the mystic arts. And uh, Suchimikado Harinaga was the last Onryo no Kami uh, for a while. Before it was abolished as well, and absorbed into the Jingi Khan in 1872. The Jingi Khan was abolished in 1945, and its functions were absorbed into the Imperial Household Agency as the Shikibu Shoku, the Board of Ceremonies. So the Board of Ceremonies, which still performs many of the old ritual functions of the Onmyorio, the Onmyorio, 
the Ministry of Magic, the latest of which is, well, the latest of such acts or ceremonial rituals, uh, was the series of divinations on the enthronement of the new emperor and is the modern-day version and descendant of the An Myorio of a thousand years through to World War II. Um, well, more like 1,200 years at the very least, uh, or more. So when it comes to the uh, On Myorio, I'll try and explain what uh, their ministry is about. I'm uh, going to take a short break to refresh myself because, of course, you know, my biggest problem is I didn't sleep when I was partying so much over the past two days. <laughs> so to prevent myself from falling asleep, I've got to kind of uh, walk around, oxygenate, and, um, you know, take a few lines of Coke from my doggy bag. <laughs> Let me cut that, put that on some glass, and inhale that. So, Jameson, to the rescue. Jameson, my son. Be there, lad. Yes. There he yes. is. Okay, my man. Okay, I'll go mute. I'll be back soon. All right, folks. Now, to give you your mental lashing for the night. Okay, we have... Um, oh, we have a fire devouring Greek island's forest. Residents urge to flee. Uh, pillars of billowing smoke and ash turned the sky orange and blocked out the sun above Greeks, Greece's second largest island Sunday. Um, I'm doing that while I'm reading this while simultaneously whooping ass in Magic the Gathering. Wow, talk about multitasking. Uh, the fire on Evia is an island of forested mountains and canyons laced with small coves of crystalline water. This began on August 3rd and cut across a popular summer destination from coast to coast as it burned out of control. Scores of homes and businesses have been destroyed and thousands of residents and tourists have fled, many escaping the flames via flotillas and even operated in the night of darkness. Yeah, the, uh, these fires seem to be breaking out all over the world. This is a part of global burning, or shall I call it global Im immolation? Yes, that's a better terminology. That actually sounds cooler as well. But that's exactly what it is. It's a sort of global... Well, I... It's, it's actually a mass human immolation since we're burned doing this to ourselves. So... That's what it could be called. In dramatic scenes Sunday afternoon, fast-moving flames had encroached on the seaside village of Pefki, burning trees on the fringes and entering the houses' yards. Panic residents raced with water tanks, hoses, and branches in a seemingly futile effort to extinguish the flames. Yeah, I would say it would be a better idea to get the fuck out of there rather than trying to extinguish the flames. I don't know why people don't have the survival instinct that they used to have. I, I don't know why people... It seems actually like many people don't have a survival instinct at all, and this baffles me. It actually alarms me that as many people are alive as are alive, honestly. Uh, late Sunday, firefighters managed to stop the fire before it advanced further into Pefki on the island's northern coast. Pefki residents and tourists fled to the port of Aedipsos to take the ferry to the mainland port of Arkitsa, 150 kilometers northwest of Athens. Acrid, choking smoke hung in the orange-gray air, turning the day into apocalyptic twilight. As people headed towards Pefki's pebble beach, dragging suitcases, clutching pets, and helping elderly relatives. This is quite different from what um, what I saw from the people in California, which uh, Douglas Dietrich gave us a photo of, with people literally sitting out there camping in front of the flames. Because, you know, Americans are just so fucking 
at budget dumb that they 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 think it's like uh ufos projecting holograms or some shit oh my gosh we, we've actually gone we've actually degraded that much as a culture i mean we i mean granted america had never had a culture to begin with but i mean it's degraded even be even to that point uh uh, okay, here are some descriptions. We were completely forsaken. There were no fire brigades. There were no vehicles, nothing, David Angelo told the Associated Press, adding that the villagers' hoses were inadequate to stop the fire. Angelo described the frightening hours before the uh, evacuation. You could feel the enormous heat, and there was a lot of smoke. You could still, you could see the sun, a red ball, and then nothing else around, he said. Angelo's complaint was echoed by others who decried government efforts, citing what they saw as a lack of firefighting forces or planes or delays in their arrival. Which is to be expected because I'm sure that uh, the Greek government has their own rampant corruption all over the that they're dealing with literally all over the place. Uh, this is a, these are really interesting times to live in, honestly. Um, there was ash and smoke everywhere, said Christina uh, Satao, who has been in a seaside village of Agios, Georgios. It's very sad that they did not send help in the first days and they left the island burning. It was unfair that many people lost their property and livelihoods. That is actually quite sad. That's that's extremely sad. I mean, how would how how would someone deal with that? I I never had to deal I mean, how would you deal with having to evacuate your home and knowing that everything you had was burned to the ground? How would you even know? Well, I mean, how does one even restart or rebound from that? I mean, you just wind up homeless and you die. Oh, man, I lost this match. Holy shit. Yeah, I I was not expecting that. Okay. they I, I've been getting my ass handed to me, folks, in, in Magic the Gathering Arena. Like, it's like not even funny it's it's really sad honestly at this point it's almost like playing that game is a form of masochism but going back to the fires uh we have before us one more difficult night heraldus said all the forces that have been fighting a difficult battle all these days will continue operating unabate with unabated in intensity uh with the same self-sacrifice uh, apparently there was fire burning elsewhere as well because they were there was a, they were also fighting a fire to the south. The wildfires stretch gr stretch uh, Greece's firefighting capabilities to the limit, and the government has appealed for help from abroad. More than 20 countries in Europe and the Middle East have responded, sending planes, helicopters, vehicles, and manpower. The fire department said Sunday, 575 firefighters, 35 ground teams, and 89 vehicles were battling the Evia wildfire, including 112 Romanian and 100 Ukrainian firefighters. Four helicopters and three planes provided air support. The more major fires were also burning Sunday in Greece's southern Peloponnese region, while another broke out Sunday afternoon on the southern island of Crete. Another massive fire that ravaged forests, homes, and businesses on the northern fringes of, Gre of the Greek capital appeared to be on the wane. That blaze burned through large tracts of a national park of Mount uh, Parnitta, Nitha, the largest forested area remaining near Athens. Firefighters were worried that Mount uh, Parnitha fire would rekindle, so they they and the military had been patrolling all night, uh, Har Dalius said. On Friday, a volunteer, a volunteer firefighter, firefighter died after suffering head injuries from a falling electrical pole. 
north of Athens, while at least 20 people have been treated for fire-related injuries, including two firefighters hospitalized in intensive care. The causes for the fires are under investigation, and at least eight people have been arrested around Greece. Holy crap! So this was... These are man-made fires that are going on all over the place. Holy shit. Massive fires have also been boring across Siberia and northern Russia for weeks, forcing the evacuation Saturday of a dozen villages. In all, wildfires have built, burned nearly 15 million acres this year in Russia. In the U.S., hot, dry, gusty weather has also fueled devastating wildfires in California which seem to be ongoing. Yes, uh, Chathuga is here, folks. He has manifested as a force of just insane people who are deliberately trying to burn things down. Yes. Because yes. that's just what they do. Thank you. This is... So you're talking about the massive wildfires, uh, where? Yeah, yeah. California, uh, Canada, where? Uh, this was the Greek islands. Okay. Uh, yeah, uh, Greek, uh, this was Greece. Um, there, and they were also going into the fact that there were fires around Russia, there were fires around the U.S., and in Greece they had arrested eight people suspected of arson for starting the fires. Incredible. Yeah, it's uh, so sad and uh, disgusting. And these people, whoever's doing that, they need to be uh, burned alive as an example. Well, um, uh, I, I am um, I'm 100% sure that they are all men. Yes. Oh, guaranteed. Guaranteed. Yeah, you so, can. So, I mean, there is a problem with the Y chromosome. No argument from me. <laughs> it's, just, it's just incontestable at this point uh, yes and uh wh while i was doing that i got my ass handed to me in uh magic the gathering arena while oh. i was trying to work on a spell simultaneously and read this article i don't know why i have to do more than one thing at once in order to keep doing it for a long period of time but it's just how my brain operates oh my goodness Okay, well, there you go. I mean, I can't say I'm sorry for having led to your losing that particular match. Uh, oh, but... no, no, no. You didn't contribute to that at all. What what happened was um, I, I was doing good. I had the guy down to four life. And then all of a sudden this guy busts out the monster that just replicates like a billion snakes on the field every turn. So it's like, oh, my God. So it's like, why, why, even, why even continue playing him at that point? <laughs> <laughs> well give me a second here to get my uh little neck warmer on and uh electronic one my earbuds are off okay now i'll get my earbuds back on and get back to work i uh, brought some tea with me uh so i can uh remain caffeinated and black tea of course which is a little bit more uh, potent uh and um okay then Thank you so much, son. Deeply appreciate your uh, keeping a bandwidth burning. Okay, let me try and get back into what uh, the uh, uh, On Murio, um, the Bureau, is about. Uh, bless you, and uh, you can retreat back into the magic or start another card game and uh, uh, see what that gets you. Uh, and uh, this is what he does throughout the night, people, uh, which is, uh, he says, I, sir, God bless you. Thank you uh, for that acknowledgement. Always very, uh, very good. Um, okay, then, uh, in terms of the um, on Murio, let's uh, delve a little bit into the uh, not just the school of magic. If you take a look at the uh, the characters which comprise uh, the name of the on Murio, uh, then uh, they actually kind of uh, would be translated loosely as uh, as basically a kind of uh, uh, dormitory, really, which implies a kind of a school. And uh, that is something that uh, was... Uh, how would I say this? This is like a, uh, uh, it's like, oh God, I so want to avoid this, this analogy because it's just so fucking wrong. 
<laughs> but uh, the first thing that comes to mind is, of course, uh, Hogwarts. Uh, and, uh, you know, I, I really do not want uh, people to go there. And you're going to have a difficult enough time looking up uh, the Japanese Ministry of Magic if you're going to use the English language anyway, rather than the Japanese characters, because all you're going to find is this Hogwarts shit and uh, this uh, Harry Potter bullshit that will simply uh, lead you nowhere uh, because it's made out of nothing. It is, uh, you know, that woman who's a a transphobic individual anyway and was uh saying all kinds of shit about uh, uh people uh, like my son so she's like someone who uh is uh frozen in time yes jameson reese emphasizes fucking pop bullshit he says yes thank you uh, that's that's it in a nutshell people so uh i'm trying to deflect you from that and yet at the same time you know what inescapably comes to mind uh, when you think of a school for sorcerers. Uh, you know, that's going to be what comes to mind because of popular culture. Uh, so uh, we definitely don't want to, uh, to go there at the same time while I'm uh, trying to, you know, he says, what about Avatar? You mean the blue people film? Is that what you're talking about? The no, uh, no, no, no. Like the uh, air bending, you know, like oh, how they had like okay. the yes, how, yes, how, like they better. had like the air bending schools and whatnot. Yes, you know, yes, much various. Better. Much better, much better. The cartoons only. <laughs> don't don't take a look at the horrible feel. You know, the film that was produced by M yeah, Night Shyamalan. The, the film is garbage. I, I I I never took a look at it, and I'm glad I never did. Yes. Um. But uh, uh, the cartoons, both both of them are highly recommended. Yes. And I don't see why people thought that uh, there was a lesbian relationship in there. I didn't see it. it I oh, mean, I saw the Legend of Korra. Yeah, you know, yeah, I yeah. saw the whole thing through the end, but it didn't seem like it seemed like they were just uh, they were just really close friends at that point. OK, that was I mean, a, 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 I mean, we, we are talking all, about we are talking about yeah, Abdul Qadim Haq, who interpreted yeah. that. So. Yeah. Oh, okay. So he interprets two women as holding hands as being lesbian. That's that's odd. That's that's the level He's of warped. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> uh, it's not uncommon to see female friends hold hands and things like that because they're not as cringy as us guys are. Right. That's you right. You wouldn't see us guys holding hands as friends because we just it's just not right. We're just guys. We're dudes, and and dudes shouldn't exist. <laughs> <laughs> I I can make a case for that too. It's a, a, you know there are women out there who like men, but um, these are like um, you know you just have to ask why. Uh, honestly, um, the um, like I said, I, I guess there has to be some guys around. Uh, you know, I used to enjoy male company or appreciate men and look up to men. You know, I, I got over it. <laughs> the so. thing is, the thing is, at some point, it feels like it feels like, OK, uh, can we could we just hurry this up already? Mm. It's like, OK, you know, say what you got to say. Get 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 going. Get going. You know, if if it's a woman, then it's like, all right, you know, let's just, I, I just want to be in her presence. Yes. You know? Yes, there we are. There we are. So, thank you, son. I will now um, get back to the Ministry of Magic uh, and uh, in, in Japan and uh, what that was about so that people can get an idea of uh, what defended uh, Japan in terms of its uh, imperial family and castle. And uh, y you might think that a lot of this has its roots in Taoism, but in a sense, no, not really. Uh, of course, if you go back to uh, medieval Japan, or rather ancient Japan, forget medieval, uh, ancient is well further back in the mists of antiquity than that. Uh, life, of course, was tough and unpredictable. One minute you could be plowing your field and minding your own business. And um, the next moment a warlord could be, you know, plowing over you, <laughs> plowing you into the field. Uh, and uh, uh, you could be cooking some noodles outside and a demon could snatch you up. Uh, if you were a female, uh, they would prefer females to men and uh, take you up into the mountains and... Uh, 
and drag you away into the mountains forever. This was, of course, something that would happen with Japanese primates that were um, the Japanese version of Yeti or uh, Yowies in Australia or Sasquatch in America or the Almaty, the Almas of uh, Siberia, Cyberasia. Um, the Japanese had their own, and this is what would happen uh, or could happen. And uh, so um, when it came to... Um, so it's these were all very real in the... Um, demons and evil spirits it was a harsh world and people needed to protect themselves from bad spirits that made it worse and of course uh, japan was right across the east china sea uh, from uh, the uh, uh, the emperor who ruled all under heaven as the chinese themselves would claim and uh, therefore, in the 500s and the 600s, Japan brought in a lot of books and ideas from China. At the time, Japan was uh, great friends with the South Koreans. Uh, you know, now that's going to sound strange because, of course, South Korea is a new phenomenon, you might think. But that's really not the case. <laughs> South Korea, uh, you see, the Korean Peninsula was actually divided into three kingdoms. Actually, as it is today, there is an element of Korea to the extreme north that is beyond the North Korean border within Manchuria. So within Manchuria, there is a third Korea that you've never heard of, but you can look this up yourself. Uh, the third unknown Korea in Manchuria. You can look that up. And uh, that, of course, is basically uh, administered by communist China in this day and age. And uh, they act as an outlet for illegal North Koreans to infiltrate into communist China as cheap labor and, uh, and shit. So uh, in the time of uh, ancient Japan... There were three Koreas as well. And uh, when it came to the extreme uh, southern uh, or southeastern uh, Korea, uh, that was a Baekje, B A E K J E, Baekje. And Baekje and uh, Japan were, uh, were close allies. And uh, this is where much was imported from China was through Bakshe. And uh, so um, it's through Bakshe, Bakshe that uh, the, in, when that kingdom fell, overtaken by the southern Korean uh, kingdom of Sia, or the central Korean kingdom at that time, uh, then the Chinese ideas were already integrated into, into Japan, uh, which became an ally of Sia after it conquered Baekje. Uh, then uh, the concepts of yin and yang and the five phases, meaning what you Westerners would consider the pentagram. I'm talking about the real satanic looking pentagram that kind of curly cues into itself like a pretzel where you see all uh, the sides of the star angling into, um, you know, so that you get the inverted pentagon effect in the center. That's the, uh, that is the five phases uh, that were taken from Taoism. But yin and yang is really independent of Taoism itself. It's something that existed before Taoism and then became integrated with Taoism, but it's really not a product of Taoism. Uh, and uh, the five phases, of course, that would be the equivalent in Asia to the Christogram, the, uh, the five-sided star, which represents the five wounds of Christ and wards off demons. So that pentagram, that's the one you see painted on my left hand in, uh, well, let's take a look at which episode that was. Uh, let's see, it was the, um, uh, let me look at my channel here. That was uh, the Bonus Army Massacre Memorial Day episode a week ago, and that is uh, dated Wednesday, uh, July 28th of 2021. And um, so that one very popular episode got 41 upvotes. Uh, so thank you, everybody. And uh, that is the episode on which you see that type of uh, pentagram, kind of. Kind of. It's not not really because that kind of pentagram is very difficult to draw. And, uh, a, you know, you could make a professional tattoo of it. 
but it really requires, you know, graphic artwork to display it um, most effectively. Okay, so we got that and uh, out of the way so people understand a bit of what we're talking about. And uh, so then um, in, in terms of um, Taoism, if you study that, though, you'll find out about a lot of these concepts regardless. Now, the Japanese put all these concepts into a blender and uh, they uh, also, uh, well, tossed in some ideas from Buddhism, uh, Shinto, uh, the native religion, and even uh, other religions that no longer exist, other kinds of practices. Uh, and, of course, um, they called the result of this synthesis of uh, these uh, various practices, uh, Buddhism and Shinto and animism, uh, this was all together synthesized into what became Anmyodo and Do. Whenever you hear the Do, like Aikido or Bushido, uh, Do means the way of. Uh, that means the, the mastery, the craft. Uh, the the path, the way of whichever philosophy you're studying. Butsudo would mean the way of Buddha. Uh, Bushido means the way of the warrior. Inindo, the way of invisibility, meaning the way of ninja, uh, the, n what you Westerners call ninjutsu, uh, because you get that jutsu from jujutsu, and therefore you decided to call the craft of invisibility ninjutsu, which is kind of a kind of a vulgarization uh, the correct name would be inindo the way of invisibility uh, like aikido the way of the key the mastery of the life force uh, on myodo would be the way of yin and yang and uh, so that is uh, the um, that's the craft which my mother was a mistress of so, uh, it's a set of magical spells and rituals for fortune-telling and fighting evil spirits. And uh, so, uh, in 675, uh, the emperor created a ministry of magic uh, for the Japanese government. Uh, the year 675, Anno Domini, uh, at the same time that there was a uh, dictionary... Uh, that was created, uh, that um, was a uh, basically a Judeo-Japanese dictionary, a, a, a Japanese-Hebrew dictionary, was created around that time uh, as well. So uh, this is the time when uh, you had a, um, uh, as I said, um, you've always had a very strong Jewish influence in Japan, it is the original 12 tribes of Israel having nothing to do with all these Eastern Europeans who resettled in Palestine and call themselves Israelis. They have nothing to do with the original Israel. Uh, the original Israel, the tribes that uh, uh, vanished, uh, they went to all corners of the earth, and one of them resettled in Japan. And um, their descendants are what constitute the Yamato dynasty, uh, the, uh, the imperial Japan and uh, their dynasty today. My mother was not descended from that dynasty. Her Chinese uh, father was allowed to marry a Japanese woman in Tokyo uh, before the war, which was extremely unusual. But he was allowed to do this because he was of uh, dynastic heritage from the ancient Kyushu Southern Dynasty that had been established by the original alchemist who had been dispatched by the first emperor of China, Emperor Qin, to seek the elixir of immortality from the islands of Japan. And he settled there instead uh, because of the whole um, uh, situation being one where otherwise he would have committed himself to a kind of uh, mass murder of uh, children that he was not willing to participate in. It was the emperor dispatched him the emperor of China, dispatched him to Japan with thousands of children, about 1,500 young boys and 1,500 young girls. And this was so he could test them surgically for the efficaciousness of the elixirs of immortality that he was to uh, test upon them. And uh, it was expected that uh, the majority of them would die in these tests uh, so that the emperor of China could obtain the final product 
that would uh, render him immortal. Um, and uh, it was the um, the emperor who decided he was going to uh, basically stay in Japan instead, and he established what became the Kyushu dynasty, the dynasty of the south that was Sinitic or uh, Chinese descendant, and that was uh, the man who um, sired, fathered, uh, my mother was of that dynasty. Um, so uh, when it comes to um, that ancient uh, dynasty, I'll go more into that um, some point soon. And uh, I, I'm just getting some incoming news notifications that the changes to uh, Earth's ice are irreversible in terms of climate change. Um, mm meaning we're going to see sea level rise and all that good shit. Um, just something that uh, we don't want to see. Uh, but um, this is what we have to look forward to. Honestly, I don't want to take up um, the rallying cry of uh, our man, uh, Jameson Reese. Uh, but, you know, it's hard not to say we're fucked. Uh, of course, hopefully this will lead to massive um, rehabilitation of our planet uh, and um, will change our ways and will um, evolve, uh, you know, one can hope, right? I mean, I'm an optimist and I like to think that we have the... Um, uh, the capability of doing this and um, otherwise of course uh, there is no hope uh, if we were to assume otherwise uh, by the way I'm getting an incoming uh, notification something about Andrew Cuomo I'm not going to look at that because that's just like uh, you know if I look at that I'm just going to start laughing and <laughs> we won't be able to go anywhere from there uh, so um, when it comes to the uh, uh, Kojiki, the uh, sacred book of Japan, the origin story of uh, Japan. This is uh, something where uh, you find out many of these ancient uh, Japanese secrets they're from. Uh, and of course, one of the uh, things that you'll find out about will be uh, Amaterasu Omikami-sama, her most Augustine over goddess of daylight, the sun goddess, as uh, she's known. And uh, so this is uh, the um, woman from uh, whom all Japanese are descendant. Uh, she was originally, of course, a high priest of the sunken continent of uh, Mua. Uh, the uh, Muvaya is the easiest way for people to pronounce this. And uh, now that I'm racked my brain by that kind of tangent, uh, going back to the lost continent of Mu, uh, sunken into what is now called Zealandia, which you can look up, which is the eighth continent of the world, uh, overwhelmingly submerged, and its mountaintops appearing from the surface of the sea are what form the uh, islands of New Zealand. Uh, now I remember that the first emperor, uh, Qin Shi Wang, uh, surnamed Zheng, uh, but taking on the royal title of Di Yi Wei, Wang Di Qin Shi Wang, uh, who reigned in kingship uh, from um, maybe 247 to 246, uh, was when he got started and died around 221 or 220. Uh, he conquered all other warring states and united Zhonghua, the kingdom of Qin, which was named after him from whence we derive the name China, spelled Q-I-N. Uh, he is uh, the man who dispatched the Taoist alchemist Zhu Fu, uh, who was known as Gao Jia. Fang Shi Zhu Fu. This is the Chinese version of the kind of Japanese sorcerer that I'm teaching you about now. So uh, when uh, we speak of the Japanese wizards, the An Myoji, of which uh, my mother was considered one, uh, the Chinese version of that is Fang Shi. And the Fang Shi. Uh, the uh, Taoist Fang Shi or Dao Jia, uh, Dao Jia Fang Shi Zhu Fu, and that Taoist alchemist Zhu Fu was uh, basically dispatched to the shores of the Eastern Seas 
with an entourage of one and a half thousand, fifteen hundred young men and uh, one and a half thousand or fifteen hundred young women to utilize as a human experimentation pool for efficacy testing in the isolation of the elixir vitae. Uh, but uh, when he uh, did reach Japan with all of those children, the emperor had bequeathed him to experiment upon. Uh, he reached Japan at a time when it was not even yet Japan. At that time, it was called Wa Kokugwaya. Uh, wa means, the character Wa means uh, state of harmonic equilibrium. Uh, it's the ancient name for Dainippon or Greater Japan. That means that the Wa Kokugwayans, or the Japanese people at that time, were known as the embodiments of inner peace. So he took the children with him. He never returned. He instead settled to established the uh, southern dynasty, the, uh, uh, the Kyushu dynasty of Japan. And uh, like the War of the Roses or the uh, battles between kings in England, ultimately the Yamato dynasty of the north uh, overwhelmed them and they returned to China. But that was thousands of years later, or at least, uh, you know... Um, 1500 years later, <laughs> seriously, about a thousand, uh, about a thousand and a half years later, mm, they would return to China. And that was the dynasty from which my mother's father was uh, descended. Now, uh, it was around 600 to 500 uh, years uh, before Christ. That uh, and remember what I've just described to you occurred about um, maybe um, 247, 246 to 221, 220 um, BC. Uh, this is like uh, in in terms of uh, uh, 600 to 500 years uh, BC. Uh, that was when you had uh, the first. Uh, uh, Hebrew Nihongo, uh, or Japanese Jewish language dictionary, was uh, compiled. And uh, so uh, it was uh, compiled, if I remember correctly. Let me see if I remember who, who did that. Uh, but uh, it was compiled at the time that the uh, uh, Japanese uh, were... Uh, were confronted with the incoming Jewish population, that uh, tribe of Israel, that propelled them into an entirely new age. Uh, in other words, until then, Japan had been essentially in the Stone Age, and they were taken into uh, the Bronze Age by the arrival of that particular tribe of Israel, which resettled in the Japanese home islands to establish what would become the Yamato dynasty, uh, the uh, uh, Kuzoku, the imperial family of Japan. And uh, so uh, the uh, portable shrine, you see the Japanese um, lifting at every uh, celebration, which we're going to see uh, during this Japanese ghost season. Uh, that is the, uh, that Mishkan, uh, that, uh, rather that Makuya, that Japanese uh, shrine that they're lifting on their backs during these celebrations, that is representative of the Jewish Mishkan, the Holy Tabernacle, that portable shrine where God and man encounter per Exodus, uh, well, uh, book 29, uh, chapter 29, excuse me, the book of Exodus, chapter 29, uh, verses 42 through 43. Um, and of course, uh, it was uh, Jimu Teno Eka, the first emperor of Japan in 660 um, uh, BC, uh, per Western chronometry, uh, that uh, he was uh, the man who, um, well, the Makuya minority of Japan, which are Japanese Jews that have been there for thousands of years, uh, they will attest to the fact that the uh, three, the triune sacred treasures of that most ancient extant imperial dynasty on earth, the Yamato dynasty of Japan, are Judaic relics bearing the shield of David. The six-pointed symbol of Judea is a shield, not a star. 
and uh, my mother herself had an amulet to that effect. And uh, so uh, basically it was the articulated objective of the United States government in World War II that the Trinitarian treasures of uh, Koshitsu Yamato or the Imperial House of Greater Manifest Balance be confiscated for scientific analysis, reverse engineering, and reproduction in Masonic alignment on destruction of the original reliquary as culmination of their ethnic and cultural genocidal policies. Of course, the United States government was forced to rescind these uh, anti-godly hubristic objectives, uh, among so many others, when they sued for peace in 1945. This is why it was so important for the Japanese to win. The war against them was the ultimate act in Judeophobia, if ever there was any. Uh, the Japanese being very much the carriers of that ancient uh, Israelite culture. So, uh, at the time that the On Muro was created, the Yin and Yang Bureau, uh, and of course we're going back to ancient days when uh, you had the... Um, uh, input of much uh, Judaic uh, religion. Uh, this was then in service of the God of the Israelites in many respects, combined with, of course, the earthly God, the emperor, who, like Heracles, like Jesus, was half man, half divine, a descendant from the, uh, the dynasty and lineage of the sun goddess, uh, which represented the high priestess of Mua, the sunken continent now known as Zealandia, which had transplanted themselves on the Japanese home islands with the sinking of that continent. This is what all of the tori, those gates, those wooden gates that represent Shinto all over Japan represent is the teleportation gates that brought her people to Japan, the Japanese islands, from the sinking continent of what today is known as the submerged Zealandia, the ancient continent of Mua. And uh, you would pronounce that as M-U-A, Mua, and uh, the people would really properly be called Muans. But uh, everybody in English, just make it easier on yourself, say Muvaya as the continent and call them Muvayans. And uh, they interbred with the uh, Jewish tribe, that had relocated onto the Japanese islands to create what we know today as the Japanese. And uh, as for the Onmyorio, uh, the Yin and Yang Bureau, they had four main jobs, magical rituals, being in charge of the calendar, uh, astronomy, and uh, timekeeping, uh, as well as, of course, astronomy. And uh, so uh, those seem like unrelated jobs, uh, but it was a time when things like philosophy, religion, astronomy, and fortune-telling were not clearly separate fields. Uh, people saw them as uh, basically uh, disciplines that um, uh, really were quite interrelated. And holistically, that makes so much sense and uh, is, of course, so much more true. Now, understand that these people are society's magical protectors. This is why... This magical bureau was uh, created was because these were created to protect society. And, of course, the wizards themselves, who were part of the Anmyorio, they were the Anmyoji. And, of course, as I said, uh, they were practicing the Anmyodo, the way of yin and yang. So the Anmyoji, or the yin-yang uh, <laughs> practitioners, uh, the uh, Yin Yang people, uh, so to speak. Uh, ji. The um, here we have these wi these wizards on Myoji who practice the magical art of Yin and Yang, but they're society's magical protectors. So that means they're state employees. They're all government bureaucrats. Uh, their golden age in the Heian period, uh, where they um, could read your fortune, drive out demons and evil spirits, and even were said to be able to turn little paper dolls into uh, servants uh, if they weren't using them in a voodoo sense to to destroy you. Uh, they could have these little dolls uh, serve themselves. Of course, today you would think that uh, Magic the Gathering is just arguing with paper, <laughs> which it is. 
Uh, and of course, uh, Disneyland, the Magic Kingdom, that runs through the manipulation of children through marketing. Well, those are different forms of magic too. Uh, and uh, but to the Heian period Japanese. Magic was very real every day in, in the sense that it was all pervasive, unlike what we think of it today. And since these people were government employees, dwell on this for a minute, okay? Uh, they're public servants like a mailman. Uh, but instead of bringing you mail, they're bringing you magical protection. But because they sold their services, it's like a mailman that you pay every time he brings you the mail or you don't get it. But people also wrote to the Anmyoji asking for advice. So it's like a mailman that you paid, but you could also uh, call him up specifically for suggestions on how to write letters. <laughs> Think about that. Okay. But these are the Jedi of Japan. And uh, so uh, these are people who essentially were indispensable to Japanese life, and they consisted of two major clans, just as there were two major dynasties for thousands of years in Japan. Uh, there were two major clans that comprised the Anmyoji, uh, specialized in uh, churning out these sorcerers, the Abe, from which was descended Abe of the prime minister of Japan, uh, who I said was responsible for Abenomics and should have won a Nobel Prize in economics for uh, rehabilitating the Japanese economy. He was a descendant of one of these clans. The other clan was the Kamo clan. These were the Tesla and Edison. Their founding uh, fathers were the Tesla and Edison of Japan uh, and uh, the Abe and Ka Kamo dynasties were like the Coke and Pepsi of their time. Uh, the Windows and Windows 7 are, are anyhow. So like with a doctor, if someone didn't like the advice of one clan, they went to the other clan to get a second opinion. Okay, uh, does, is all of this hanging with me so far? Getting <laughs> And uh, so the two top on Myoji of the Heian period uh, that became the superstars of their day uh, the Luke Skywalker and Obi-Wan Kenobi of their time were Kamo no uh, Yasunari. And the one that's really popular, if Brendan Zogit were with us, he could name this son of a bitch off the top of his head, was this uh, super sex symbol, Abe uh, no Semai. And uh, he, every Amyoji enthusiast will know of this person. Probably he has a Yu-Gi-Oh card. I could bet you your ass. He's got a Yu-Gi-Oh card that Brendan Zogit would know about. Uh, of course, you know, Abe is spelled A-B-E. We're going to get some idiot out there going to be asking me about Abe Lincoln uh, killing vampires, right? You know, as in Abe Lincoln, vampire killer. I don't want any smart ass bullshit like that, please. <laughs> I don't need to hear about it. Uh, so, um, if you wanted to become an on Myoji, uh, they took in a limited number of students chosen only from among the noble classes. So, you have to be noble to be an on Myoji because the nobles were a pure bloodline from the serpent seed. They were uh, the descendants of the draconian or the detraconic bloodline of the Hachurui, the serpent people, who uh, to a degree had hybridized with uh, the culture of Mua, the sunken continent, uh, destroyed in a catastrophic war, a cataclysmic war using Scalar weapons that turned, uh, that, that basically liquefied the solid ground beneath people's feet and literally sank the majority of the continent of ancient Mua, leaving uh, only what we call New Zealand on the surface today. Those are the uh, ancestors of the noble class of Japan. The more noble you are, then the more of the serpent bloodline you have within you, the more closely related you are to the Hachurui, the reptilians, which is why the Americans hate the reptilians so much because the Japanese won the war. Is all of this making sense? Is that coherent? Uh, Jameson, is this something people can follow or? Perfectly, perfectly. Oh, okay. 
it's Jameson, of course. So he's he's got his head so deep into this stuff. I don't know if that's reassuring. He can follow it. <laughs> yeah, I can follow it. I mean, uh, they're they're basically uh, the David Ike. Reptilians evil. They're basically saying the Japanese are evil. Thank you. Mm-hmm. You got it. That, that's that's all he's saying. So basically, he's and carrying then, out the American propaganda of World War II. He's he's yeah. carrying that. Yeah, he's he's just a allied propagandist. Thank you. There we are. Thank you. Thank you so much. And you put it, by the way, Jameson said it best. The Zulu um, wizard or sorcerer that he's dealing with is just basically riding him uh, and thinks the guy's an idiot. Thinks David Icke, the white guy's an idiot. Yeah, he's, he's riding him for money because that's all he's uh, he's going to he's going to he's going to just play into this uh stupid white dude's uh fantasies as much as he can thank to milk you. it yes thank you thank you so much perfect god bless you okay so uh the aeon uh nobility um provided these sorcerers and the smooth cheeked students spent um their time at the uh at the you know um i really don't know the name for the school uh, because it was a secret school that my mother attended but it's basically the on Myoji fucking Hogwarts okay <laughs> and there you had all the tools of the uh, of, of, of the trade uh, and the magical art of yin and yang uh, your feng shui charts and everything and uh, uh, then uh, when you got fully employed uh, you were employed mostly by the people with money who wouldn't be the peasants, right? I mean, uh, what would the peasants have to offer you? You would work for them more like charity uh, and maybe in exchange for food or regular supplies, uh, but it would be the nobility that would give you your gold. And uh, so it, once you um, were employed, it would be by the upper class in the capital. Uh, now, you might think that there would be only a few of those, right? Uh, like the number of people today who go to fortune tellers or, uh, or, or, you know, to lose their money. But no, the Amyoji were busy all the time because uh, the people of the upper class of Japan, which, of course, we're talking about a whole race of people that um, were in charge. They were spiritual hypochondriacs. In other words, they were concerned about their spiritual health. If anything happened to a Heian noble, they would send messages. They would relay by courier messages to the Anmyoji uh, to ask whatever any event meant in their lives. Uh, so they would ask for advice about the smallest things. Uh, where to plant a tree to protect from evil spirits. Uh, so they paid the Anmyoji to conduct all kinds of tasks. Uh, this would be stuff you never even thought of that really put you into the mindset of the Japanese thought process. Uh, the most important things they did was to pick the best locations for buildings based upon how much spiritual protection the location had and how to build the house to exploit that that is where we brought in the four guardians of the four cardinal compass points uh the modeling uh based on the rome of japan the rome of the japanese empire ancient kyoto which as i explained those people are still very uh how would i say they have a very uh, they believe, of course, they're better than all of the Japanese and who can blame them? I mean, they were the capital of Japan for over a thousand years. So uh, everyone else looks like a bumpkin to them. And, uh, you know, they treat Japanese the way Japanese treat foreigners. <laughs> and so that's uh, uh, something to remember uh, about that. And people would send urgent letters to their on Myoji asking really specific things, uh, as I said, about, uh, you know, housing construction, uh, what to do to get themselves the right level of uh, protection. Uh, and uh, so um, that all brought back running water, the still water, the road, and uh, of course, uh, the high ground. All of this would be the fortressing in the spiritual sense to render your home uh, invulnerable to evil. 
And um, and so this is what uh, the Anmyoji were doing for the emperor of Japan. And uh, that's what protected him, uh, believe it or not, from all of the Allied bombing. Uh, the high ground and the four guardians. Uh, of course, another thing, as I said, the Anmyoji did was drive out evil spirits from abandoned homes. Because any home left empty for a long time collected evil spirits, demons, and well, you know, general negativity. And if anyone saw someone lurking in an empty house, uh, they would assume it was a demon or a fox, which they believe could assume human form because foxes would, you know, make their nests in, in homes. And uh, therefore, they could turn into humans too, if you look this up in Japanese mythology. So they'd call in on Myoji over to perform a ritual to exercise the fox or the, uh, the squatter ghosts basically, and um, these are demons, and this would involve a henbai uh, ritual that would involve chanting a spell and stepping on the ground in a pattern and doing some hand movements. Uh, so the, the most prominent foot pattern would be left foot, uh, right left, uh, I, I think, if I remember how my mother did it. Yeah, left foot, right left, right foot, left right, left foot, right left. And, uh, you know, right foot, left, right. And um, it's this ritual originally was done when exposing oneself to danger uh, before a perilous journey, before going to war. Uh, the fact that uh, the uh, Anmyoji would be doing this when you're, um, you know, exercising a home uh you're, you're talking about these uh nobles uh moving into an empty home would have the Anmyoji do this because empty homes were that scary and so uh that that ritual was the specialty of that famous uh um sex symbol of the Anmyoji who is now on japanese Yu-Gi-Oh cards as i said uh that um uh abe no semi Abe no semi. That is, of course, one of the founding fathers from whom the recent prime minister, uh, Shizue, Abe Shinzu, was descended. So, um, of course, the uh, gods uh, could be violent. So there were unlucky directions and these uh, violent kami spirits, the uh, minor gods, godlets, if you will, uh, they, uh, they could kill you. So you would plan your travels by avoiding certain directions. Uh, and uh, therefore, um, the Anmyoji would tell you which directions to go in your travels when you go from one home to another. And uh, this, of course, is the consultation that the nobles would ask for when they spent time with their mistresses and uh, then had to travel home to get the beating from their wife. Uh, then, uh, you know, it's, it's like they would ask the uh, Anmyoji for the safest route home. And uh, so they wouldn't die before they got there. Uh, so all of this is uh, taboo directions, what not to take. Uh, so... Uh, uh, all of this, well, you know, as as I said, the Amyoji pretty much uh, ran people's lives. They were there to calculate the movements of the gods themselves. And uh, they also had these little dolls, not like the Barbie dolls that, uh, that well, I had no problem playing with, <laughs> but other boys would. Uh, but basically... Uh, you know, dolls are made of paper, wood, grass, straw. But most of the time, most commonly, they would look like paper on a dead man's money you would see in China and uh, cut to a kind of human form. And uh, this would, uh, you could purify someone. The Anmyoji would rub the doll on the person's body and then cast it into a river, uh, getting rid of spiritual pollution. And uh, they could write a person's name on it and curse or hurt someone by poking holes in it and ripping off a part of it. Or they could take two dolls, each with a name, and pray for the two people to fall in love. So they could, uh, you know, arrange a kind of spell, uh, 
that would cast a, a, a love spell on somebody with that, mate two people together, uh, if such was desired. Um, and uh, you might try doing that yourself and see if it works for you. Uh, and uh, it's something that, um, well, you're not on Myoji, so it probably won't. Uh, but there's other things that uh, they did as well, as a matter of fact. Uh, they would uh, uh, imbue another type of doll with a spirit, making it their servant. And uh, so um, the on Myoji's main duty, however, above everything I'm describing, was to offer the emperor security. He is not simply... Uh, society's magical protector, the Amyoji is the protector of the state. That is the most important take-home point. The Amyoji's main duty is to offer the emperor and the state protection. These are the magical uh, wards, the uh, wardens uh, for the Japanese empire. And that is, of course... Uh, the organization my mother was privileged to be made a part of because of her background from her father's side of the Chinese vampires who were the Magi who had existed as Christians before there was a Christ waiting for his arrival, the first people to see the star child, the Magi who traveled out of China to uh, baptize Jesus Christ himself on his arrival and uh, give him the title of Christ, which is a title, not a name. And uh, so because of that incredible background, uh, my mother was made an Anmyoji. And uh, that means she interpreted omens uh, when an accident or a uh, uh, something strange happened in a public building. Uh, then uh, that was to be interpreted. A temple or a shrine, uh, they asked an Anmyoji to investigate uh, and, uh, and perform a ritual. So they did lots of purification rituals to cleanse curses and calm vengeful ghosts. Now, these rituals were huge, okay? This is not just like somebody comes in there, collects some money, and does some shit. Uh, in one case, after the capital was moved, this is when they moved the capital from Kyoto to Tokyo, which is kind of an inversion, Kyoto to Tokyo, which is an inversion of Kyoto, uh, that purification ritual uh, had 2,000 people chanting with 2,700 lit lamps. We're talking about enough uh, whale oil uh, to uh, probably cause a genocide of a species uh, of maritime animal. Uh, during the New Year, the Anmyoji went around town purifying, uh, well, uh, uh, the, uh, um, how would you say this, um, harmful ghosts, of course, spirits, vengeful spirits, harmful energies, uh, particularly negative areas, vortices, negative vortices would be uh, unsnarled. Uh, this was to ensure that the New Year started clean because when the year starts right, it, um, it stays that way. And uh, so think about that, of course, uh, when uh, we've got the new lunar year coming now for the Muslims. And, uh, but as for the Anmyoji, uh, they led three yearly state ceremonies, one to protect the capital against spirits, one to protect it against fires, and one to protect it against diseases. Now, disease defense was predominant because, of course, uh, we have, uh, look at what we're dealing with now. Uh, as I said, out of Asia is where all flus come from. All flus are Asian flus. Of course, when I was saying this to Penny Bradley, she was saying that could be interpreted as racist. No, that's just reality, unless they're completely unnatural, and uh, like the American Army and Navy flu was. Mm. And because uh, all of these, um, uh, as Japan grew and built roads, and more people started moving around, populations became more mobile, this meant epidemics spread. You know, like uh, jealousy uh, uh, among a group of uh, girlfriends or something like that. And uh, so with these epidemics spreading as they did, uh, like um, then the Anmyoji, the disease outbreaks that were rampaging across the country, that would lead to famines because the farmers died off. 
Uh, the numerous droughts didn't help either. The devil traveled the country, dual welding sickness and starvation, and bodies literally piled up by roadsides and floated down rivers. So the roads and rivers, the means of transportation critical to the state and the economy became sources of spiritual contamination. And people knew that ghosts and evil spirits haunted the roads and rivers because they saw them. So the Anmyoji were deployed to perform roadside rituals to drive away uh, the restless dead and, uh, and, and basically to uh, make transportation safe uh, for the Japanese again by cleansing the grounds, cleansing the earth. And uh, this was uh, especially a long path of disease spread. Uh, so um, despite the common belief that the Japanese did not do animal sacrifices because they're all vegetarian, uh, my mother would attest that, yes, the animal sacrifices were performed. The Japanese do indeed sacrifice animals in these rituals or they're not real. The blood is necessary. Without the blood... There is no effect to magic. So, uh, especially horses and cattle. Uh, that was the best way to stop epidemics. Uh, life for life. Uh, take the animals instead. The court actually tried to stop this because of their Buddhist background and uh, the Buddhist influence. So they issued edicts uh, to stop the sacrifices of uh, of animals uh, and blood offerings by passing edicts saying stop that uh, but um, uh, you know killing animals of course not being a very Buddhist thing to do but of course the Amyoji knew better uh, there is no way that magic works without blood you can't replace it with jelly or uh, that's liquefied or Kool-Aid or some red looking bullshit it has to be blood and in very very dire circumstances, then it has to be human. So that is, of course, uh, part of uh, the uh, winning of World War II and the mass sacrifices conducted of certain victimized populations that kept the imperial palace safe uh, from American bombing. So the Anmyoji were not just a critical part of the daily life for the elites, uh, in the Heian period in which they uh, had their origins, but uh, became part of Japanese life forever. Uh, they are the guardians of Japan. So uh, when it comes to the uh, on Myorio, the, uh, the ministry of uh, magic, uh, then um, you basically, of course, you've got the peasant class that uh, uh, was producing food while the uh, Anmyori were, for the purpose of the state, recording omens and interpreting them. Like if there was a meteor shower, they would analyze it and tell the nobility uh, what that meant. Uh, and uh, so they created calendars. They kept time. Uh, every two hours, a person pounded on gongs and drums to let you know precisely what time it was when you woke up and, 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 um, killed the person who woke you from the only sleep you had, right? At four in the morning. <laughs> but, uh, the, uh, timekeepers had very, uh, extensive water clocks. Uh, the device is called a Rokoku, Rokoku. And that is the Japanese water clock from a thousand years ago uh, that told exact time. Uh, so um, the um, Myoji for the Anmyoro, uh, Myoryo, they, um, there were only originally supposed to be six uh, of, of these super sorcerers uh, on Myoji in the original bureau. Of course, over time, Everyone who uh, became part of that bureau of the uh, on Myorio, uh became recognized by the general public as an on Myoji, and uh, therefore um, they began to teach the craft. Uh, and uh, from the original six super sorcerers, 
And um, so anyone working with that bureau um, would be known as on Myoji, just like anyone working for the post office would generally be assumed to be a, a male man. Uh, so if I were to try and describe... Again, some of these terms so that you could uh, remember them and educate others on on Myorio. That's the government office. O N M Y O R Y O. That's the government office on Myorio, uh, and the uh, people who worked in it, uh, who were all assumed to be sorcerers by the public, uh, were the on Myoji. Uh, o n m y o j i. Understand these are all romanizations of the original Japanese characters. The Japanese don't use the fucking alphabet. <laughs> and um, then, of course, uh, the anmyodo. That is the actual set of magical concepts, methodologies, techniques, uh, the knowledge that they employed, that they deployed, uh, based on the yin yang principle. That is the uh, the way of uh, yin yang on myodo, and uh, that's O N M Y O D O. Okay, and so there we have the uh, the people, and uh, these uh, these sorcerers. Uh, they're not doing Naruto hand signs. Okay, uh, they're a part of daily life, serious business, the backbone of the state. Understand that. And of course, the government wanted to keep these ideas secret. So, uh, and because the government wanted to keep these ideas secret, uh, they banned non-Anmyoji from studying these concepts or even showing anyone the rituals. The only time you saw these rituals were at state ceremonies. Uh, therefore, the public feared these people more than they feared the secret police, the Kempei Thai, the thought police, the Gestapo of Japan. Uh, anyone who saw anyone in the magical uniforms, they uh, would essentially uh, flee. Uh, they wanted no part of it uh, in terms of the damage these people could do. But then, of course, that begs the question, in the modern state of the modern um, state of uh, World War II era Japan, how do you recruit new Anmyoji if the teachings are secret and no one else knows them? Aside from what I said, the people coming from the nobility, traditionally, uh, without um, some um, new blood, uh, anything stagnates. Uh, so uh, otherwise, the office would just die out in the modern sense. So that's why within the uh, bureau, uh, the Anmyorio, uh, it was a school, and uh, so they recruited students and taught them uh, the uh, different um, uh, fields of study in Anmyodo, the way of yin and yang, before making them actual Anmyoji. And there was a lot to learn, so they started specializing. This was something the Japanese had never done before, but by the industrial age, uh, they began to specialize in uh, Anmyoji, who would uh, do only the divination, others who would do only the astronomy, uh, and others who would conduct the wards, uh, meaning that they would uh, protect the palace uh, from fire, which is why the palace never burned throughout the time the Americans firebombed Tokyo. And these different specializations require different tools, all kinds of tools like charms, uh, divining devices, and those little dolls that uh, serve the function of voodoo dolls or early biofax simulacra. Uh, and uh, so when it came to um, uh, all of these specializations, the number one purpose of an Anmyoji, any Anmyoji, was of course to uh, uh, protect the emperor and the capital from evil spirits, diseases, and of course, sexy foxes that would uh, basically represent themselves as humans. Uh, so their services were not supposed to be for individual citizens any longer. By the time of the industrial age in Japan, they were solely servants of the state. Of course, back in the Yan period uh, and uh, throughout the rest of Japanese history, uh, the elites in the capital uh, were uh, demanding services 
And uh, so when the rest of nobility was asking for such, uh, then uh, the the An Myoji responded. And uh, uh, so it's like American democracy in that sense. Uh, but in Japan, it actually worked. Uh, in other words, the Anmyoji uh, began to protect uh, everyone. It, well, there were so many nobles, of course, because in um, at the bottom of it all, uh, in the time of my mother, we're talking about not that long ago, uh, with her generation still, uh, everyone in Japan, in one way or another, was ultimately related to the emperor. Uh, so uh, in that sense, uh, when they're serving all of the nobles, uh, the Japanese considered themselves a noble race. Uh, that meant that they were public servants serving everybody. Uh, so they uh, started helping individual nobles for payment and uh, became part of the daily lives of the Heian elite in particular. Uh, this was the period in history uh, when the Anmyoji uh, reached um, the peak uh, among us level popularity and uh, influence that they had. And uh, they didn't see themselves as religious figures. They were more like tradesmen, like armorers, tailors, or blacksmiths. The armorers would sell armor, the tailors would sell clothing, the blacksmiths would sell the tools. Uh, the Anmyoji uh, treated it like a, a normal job, uh, magical rituals. They're selling magical rituals, uh, something that put rice in their bowls uh, and uh, clothes on their back and coins in their horse purses because, you know, they were all male until the time of my mother, uh, something that I should have mentioned before. Uh, so this was an all-male market in terms of delivering the service. Uh, and um, as I said, they drew the ideas from uh, the native Japanese uh, beliefs of Shinto. And uh, of course, they were uh, combining this uh, with all of these rituals that they derived uh, from Buddhism, Taoism, uh, Confucianism, uh, Chinese folk traditions, uh, rituals for health, for uh, longevity, living longer, protection, uh, purification, uh, the uh, um, uh, fortune telling. Uh, and um, so um, hopefully, well, with so many rituals and techniques, the Heian nobility uh, consumed it all. Uh, and uh, needed it um, when, uh, and of course, it all goes back to that house building because of all of the requirements uh, concerning uh, what today we think of as feng shui. Uh, they would call up an on Myoji and ask about the best location uh, because of uh, you want to have a place with positive energy, right? Uh, needed that pond on the south side, uh, and. Uh, so before building the house, the Anmyoji would purify the land via the ritual. As I said, these could be enormous rituals like happened when they moved the government. By the way, in those days, 2,000 people would be like uh, 200,000 people today gathering. And uh, so uh, to, to conduct such a ritual of government uh, capital relocation. Of course, Jameson says he feeds on the negative energy. But of course, normally people want to drive out the demons and evil spirits, which would render Jameson homeless. And they would uh, uh, consult the An Myoji. Uh, also, what, if in those days, it was for the tiniest things, like if they were planning a trip, which direction to take. Uh, if they spent time with a sick person, a sick person, they needed uh, someone to uh, purify them. Uh, and... Uh, so beyond the house calls, they did important rituals for the state that benefited everyone. Multiple yearly state ceremonies. Uh, as I said, they protected the uh, uh, capital with uh, these, uh, against spirits, with one type of ceremony, one type of annual ceremony, against fires and against diseases. Uh, so they tracked bad energies around the capital and purified places with negative energy to prevent evil spirits from spreading. And they had rituals against epidemics, as I said, travel to these areas ravaged by any epidemic and cast purification rituals to block the disease's path. And they also did rainmaking rituals, now that I remember, amidst the droughts and famines devastating the country. Um, and, uh, but, um... 
the uh, when they after the Heian period and the nobles ultimately were um, overwhelmed by the samurai warriors. All of this was uh, placed behind the uh, kurumaku, the black curtain, meaning it all went covert, taken off the books. Mm. And, of course, there was a brief um, uh, period of time during the Yedo period, before Tokyo became Tokyo, uh, that there was a resurgence of Anmyoji public overt practice, uh, but um, then it went back behind the uh, Kurumaku, the Black Curtain, yet again. And uh, so, uh, the rest of Taoism was not integrated uh, into An An Myodo, but uh, the yin-yang principles were. And uh, to try and put that into some perspective, the five phases, as I mentioned, and the yin-yang, they could stand on their own. They weren't part of Taoism to begin with. Uh, during the Warring States period, around 2,500 years ago, they belonged to their own school of thought, the yin and yang principle, and uh, the school of yin and yang, as it was known. It was only melded into Taoism later during the Han Dynasty period. And, of course, you had uh, the five uh, paths of, uh, of, of power. That, of course, is pentagrammatic, and that emerged out of the Christian aspects of uh, Asia uh, before there was a Christ in the expectation of his coming. And uh, that was the symbol of Christianity prior to the crucifixion, prior to after which the cross became the symbol of Christianity. So what many people identify now as something that looks satanic is actually the original Christian symbol uh, before Christ. The five phases, as it's known. You can look up the five phases and you will see what I mean. Um, okay, so let me take a short break here. Kind of, I think of my mother when I speak of these things and it um, just um, depresses me because I miss her so much and miss her teaching and I miss her, her magical abilities. Uh, so honestly, um, I'll bring Jameson back on for a few more minutes while I check what time we have remaining. <sighs> and uh, still a lot Hello. of time. And uh, so, my dear friend, oh, Veronica Barrera's with us. Hey, honey, Mwah. love you, Signora Barra. Uh, I'm sorry, <laughs> Signora Vero. All right, Jameson, um, hold the stage for several minutes while I take a breather, okay? Thank you. Gotcha. All right, so um, let's see what we can pull out of the out of the dredges of our burning world in which uh, Cthulhu is washing everything away and uh, Cthulhu is burning everything. Um, I'm going to see what we can find as far as international stories are concerned because world news usually seems to be more fascinating to me. Uh, the earth warming is likely to pass limit set by leaders this is actually really bad news that's not good at all um let's see what they have to say about that earth's climate is getting so hot that temperatures in about a decade will probably blow past a level of warming that world leaders have sought to prevent according to a report released monday the United Nations calls for a code red for humanity. It's just guaranteed it's going to get worse, said the co-author Linda Mearns, a senior climate scientist at the U U.S. National Center for Atmospheric Research. I don't see any area that is safe. Nowhere to run, nowhere to hide. Yes, that, that seems to be... Um, that seems to be sort of the conclusion that I drew as far as the uh, idea of trying to uh, escape what would be considered a, uh, I don't know, that La Palma thing. Um, it's, it's not even worth trying to escape it because uh, no matter where we go, it's going to be a, a, shit, a shit storm. 
Scientists also ease back a bit on the likelihood of the absolute worst climate catastrophes, of course. Um, I say that we should rather, rather than ease back, we should try to emphasize it as a means of preventing it. Uh, the authorities, the authoritative intergovernmental panel on climate change, the IPCC report, which calls climate change clearly human course and unequivocal, makes more pres- makes more precise and warmer forecasts for the 21st century than it did last time it was issued, 2013. Oh, that's a no-brainer. I mean, we're we're pretty much effed. Uh, Each of the five scenarios for the future, based on how much carbon emissions are cut, passes the most stringent of two thresholds set in the 2015 Paris Climate Agreement. World leaders agreed then to try to limit warming to 1.5 degrees Celsius since the late 19th century, because problems mount quickly after that. Um, all right, I cannot do two things at once, apparently. Uh, let me just read this, uh, the hell with the game. Uh, all right. The limit is only a few tenths of a degree hotter than now because the world has already warmed 1.1 degrees Celsius in the past century and a half. Under each scenario, the report said the world will cross the 1.5 degrees Celsius warming mark in the 2030s. Earlier than some past predictions, warming has ramped up in the recent years, data shows. Uh, what this is saying is basically uh, we've we failed to, we more or less failed to prevent the global catastrophe scenarios. In three scenarios, the world will also likely exceed 2 degrees Celsius, 3.6 degrees Fahrenheit over pre-industrial times. The other less stringent Paris goal with far worse heat waves, droughts, and flood, flood-inducing downpours. Unless deep reduction in carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gas emissions occur in the coming decades, the report said. This report tells us that recent changes in the climate are widespread, rapid, and intensifying. Unprecedented in thousands of years, says the IPCC Vice Chair, Cole Barrett, Senior Climate Advisor for the U.S. National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. The changes we will experience will increase with further warming. The uh, 3,000 plus page report from 234 scientists said warming is already accelerating sea level rise, shrinking ice and worsening extremes such as heat waves, droughts, floods and storms. And need I not say they seem to exclude the obvious fires, tropical cyclones are getting worse. Uh, they're getting stronger, wetter, while our, the Arctic Sea is dwindling in the summer and permafrost is thawing. Another problem, uh, now this is not related, this is somewhat related to the topic of what I'm reading, but if that permafrost thaws, who's to say there isn't some sort of uh, virological, uh, who's to say there aren't species of viruses and ba- or bacteria within that permafrost that would be far more lethal than anything we've ever seen before. Um, If if something like that, I mean, if uh, there's no telling what can happen, I'm pretty much catastrophizing, of course, but uh, the world is locked to a 15 to 30 centimeters of sea level rise by mid-century, said a co-author of Bob Kopp of Rutgers University. Nearly all the warming that has happened on Earth can be blamed on emissions of heat-trapping gases such as carbon dioxide and methane. And most natural forces like the sun or simple randomness can explain one or two-tenths of a degree of warming, the report said. 
in other words, most of it, most of it, we're doing to ourselves. Why is humankind so goddamn suicidal? I would tend to think that the whole goal is to try to survive, um, and that goes back to essentially what uh, L. Ron Hubbard uh, discovered: the purpose for life really is just to survive. Um, anything we can do to slow down, anything we can do to limit, to slow it down, is going to pay off. Uh, tell Bob, tell a uh, guy named Talbot, he said. And if we cannot get to 1.5, it's probably going to be painful, but it's better to not give up. Honestly, uh, at this point, I would say, uh, this is this is one of those times where um, all those people who are prepping for all these weird things they should have been prepping for this by not buying those big ass fucking uh, turbo sized trucks that eat up god awful amounts of gas just to flex and say we're survivalists we're gonna survive the apocalypse the apocalypse is gonna be caused by Nibiru no it's gonna be caused by your dumb fat ass. Which you know these stupid pieces of shit, they 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 never think, and uh, this is precisely why we're in the place we are in. Um, now um, we're also experiencing weary U.S. business businesses confronting a new round of mask mandates. Yes, the mask mandates have to return. Uh, this uh, Delta strain is not something to be sneezed at or laughed at. Businesses large and small from McDonald's and Home Depot to local yoga studios are reinstituting mask mandates as U.S. coronavirus cases rise once again. Bars, gyms, and restaurants across the country are requiring vaccines to get inside which is good because i got my card after a largely mask free summer it's a reversal no one wanted to see brought on by the fast spreading delta variant and new guidance for the u.s centers of disease control but business owners and workers say they will do what they can to keep their doors open and not slow the economic gains of the last few months We'll see how that pans out for them. We've already been through the worst of the challenges when we shut down indoors last year, said um, Brack May, the chef and owner of Cowbell, a New Orleans burger joint. Let's get ahead of the curve here. May recently began requiring customers to show their vaccine cards for indoor dining. He said he wants to protect his workers who are required to be vaccinated but have young children at home, as well as his neighborhood, where some musicians recently contracted the coronavirus. May expects that eventually vaccine rules like his will be commonplace. Next month, New York City will start requiring vaccinations to enter restaurants, gyms, and theaters. They should be requiring that now. Why are they waiting? But for now, customers are far more likely to encounter mask mandates. After lifting mask recommendations for fully vaccinated people in May, the CDC reversed course in late July, recommending masks for both vaccinated and unvaccinated people in areas of higher transmission. The shifting guidance has caused confusion over which rules to enforce and how. Walmart and Walmart and Target, for instance, recently began requiring masks for employees, but not for customers. Oh, that's just dandy. In areas where virus transmission rates are high, McDonald's is requiring masks for both employees and customers. And they should definitely consider like Actually, I saw a McDonald's on uh, Broadway uh, um, in Broadway, Manhattan. They have the uh, they have like the tables and chairs outside. That's how desperate they are to make money. 
a handful of places like Louisiana and the San Francisco Bay Area and Las Vegas are mandating masks indoors. Many business owners didn't wait for the CDC or their local gov- governments before ask- acting. In mid-July, uh, Tamara Patterson reinstated a mask mandate and reduced seating capacity from 200 to 65 at Chef Tam's Underground Cafe, the restaurant she owns in Memphis, Tennessee. I need every dollar and dime and penny I can get, but if I don't have employees healthy, I don't have a business. If customers are sick, I have nothing, Patterson said. I'm trying to impersonate that southern drawl. You know, I hope I got that somewhat accurate. Customers are generally receptive to the mask mandate, Patterson said. Only one has walked out. Um, The scary thing is that we have assholes who are willing to take out a weapon and shoot people if they're told, uh, you need to wear a mask, sir. So, I mean, as an employee of one of these establishments, you can understand why so many people are don't want to go into the restaurant business or don't want to um, – why so many people don't want to apply for jobs that deal with that sort of thing because uh, your life is literally on the line potentially. We're a tourist uh, – Pam – uh, Pantera Galley, a women's clothing store in Bisbee, Arizona, reinstated a mask mandate for customers a few weeks ago after watching cases climb nationwide. We're a tourist sound, so it's just a matter of time before it reached us again, said Lisa Wines, a Pantera employee. Many people are fine with the new mandate, she said, but some turn around and stomp out the store. <laughs> That's actually quite hilarious. Not every business supports the mandates. Uh, uh, Basilico's Pasta A Vino, a restaurant in Huntington Beach, California, has rail- railed against masks on social media. A sign on the door requires patrons to prove that they're unvaccinated. Oh, wait a minute. A sign on its door requires patrons to prove that they're unvaccinated? What the fuck? Why would they do that? I guess they're trying to encourage the spread of the coronavirus. Well, that's just groovy. Some workers also don't want to see mask return. Uh, Drew W., a grocery store employee in Houston who asked not to use his full name for fear of reprisals at work, said he was fully vaccinated months ago and enjoys the freedom it gives him to go without a mask. Few stores around him are enforcing the new CDC guidelines, he said, and he won't either. I didn't get my mad doses and do... I didn't get both my doses and deal with the rather gnarly side effects, only to be told to go back to the way things were during the pandemic, he said. <laughs> well, the pandemic's still fucking on. Yeah, that's uh, the the problem. Um, I mean, I, I, people think this is... I, I don't know. Americans are just butt-shit stupid. There's no way... We're... This country is essentially done. I, I, I give up, man. <laughs> oh, yes, it's awful. It's um, honest. It, honestly, it's uh, and um, I'm not quite sure what Peter. Well, you know, when Peter talks about the, uh, the, the the various doctors who he cites about this, I'm not quite sure exactly what they're saying. I, I you know, I'm, I'm not quite sure what. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so you don't get that either, yeah. right? Yeah, the, no, uh, no, no, no. I, I, I don't even pay it any mind. Uh, uh, that when he goes into the vaccine thing, I don't listen. To, I, I won't entertain it at all. Yeah, there, there, I, yeah. There are just some things I need to put boundaries on, and that's one of them. Yeah, I, I have to admit, once I got the vaccine myself, I stopped worrying about it, and of course the. Um, you know, now I'll try and get a supplement for the vaccine simply because the one shot and you're done. Uh, it's found to be pretty, pretty good when it comes to the uh, Delta. It's actually better at handling the Delta. 
than it is some of the other mutations that have developed out there. But uh, in terms of, uh, you know, supplementation, I'll, I'll get as much as I can. And uh, they're offering that at General Hospital, which unfortunately is still retaining the name of Zuckerberg because they'd have to give all the money back to him if they changed the name and, um, you know, dropped his name from San Francisco General Hospital. But I have to find out when I can go there for one of these supplement shots, uh, you know, how it's done. It's, it's just... Uh, Oh, you know, we'll see if I can reach them. And uh, yeah, I, I, I'm going to have to speak to my uh, therapist about that, because uh, although he said, you know, you could just probably go into a uh, pharmacy and ask them for a certain type of shot. So I'm, 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 I'm going to do my own investigation because oh, oh, I want to because they, they've got a new third shot potentially for for your you got the mRNA shot, right? Yeah, but I, I, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm thinking about trying to do the, like, mix, mixing different vaccines like they do in Germany. Right, just right. To be like, just to be, like, super immune. Yes, yes, I get it. I get it. Yeah, I mean. And, uh, and, 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 and the more, and, and as this progresses, uh, I see more and more people who are going anti-vax and who are claiming that, you know, the vaccine is killing people. I, 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 I haven't seen yeah, there are rare cases where that can happen, but usually it doesn't. That's right. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, how would I say it? It's just, it is what it is. And um, we've got to, you know, stand our ground. Now, one thing Peter Moon did say, which was, you know, what we all know, was that uh, it's along political lines. It's just basically the Democrats are pro-vaccine and uh, the Republicans are generally anti-vax. It's, uh, so. Yeah, so, I mean, uh, I, I'm, I'm more or less at the point where it, that I'm fine with that yes. because uh, the Republicans will, can just uh, call themselves off. Yes. Yes, and um, I mean, we'll we'll see what happens. I, I honestly uh, am surprised that we're not seeing more deaths uh, yet, or maybe they're just not. Tr maybe they're trying not to spread panic or something. But oh, eh. it could be a combination of both. Uh, it's a, probably a combination of both of those things. Uh, I get the feeling that by the time uh, we start to near the end of winter that's when we're going to really see the body counts start to stack up um probably before then uh honestly um it should be starting soon i mean it is starting now we're getting a lot of um what is it uh, death rates going up uh, the cases going up it's a terror this is like something that is just uh like i said you had that one woman who um uh, was talking about how angry she was at um it's, it's not even really, um, Peter's still talking about it as a vaccine issue, but like I said before, it's really a, it's, it's COVID denial. It's, it's just mainly many of these people think that COVID isn't real and that it, this is all sphere porn and uh, that they have nothing to worry about. So it's, there you have that, right? And yeah, that's, it, it, and, and it's completely absurd. You know, I mean, I've, I've went as far as to get a mask brace for the mask that I, for a silk mask that I have. So just, it, what it does is it just seals everything around your face mm -hmm. just so that the mask is like completely just so that there's no gaps that air can get into. Right. Right. Well, that um, yes, you're very cautious, but I don't blame you. Your immune system must be fairly fragile considering the damage you do to yourself <laughs> so. honestly uh i was born with a fragile immune system i'll be perfectly honest with you because when i was a kid i got sick so often it wasn't funny mm -hmm. yeah i understand you know i was a sickly child so uh it's uh and um it's it's a miracle i'm alive really since i was in uh, such a filthy environment growing up uh, the Tenderloin of San Francisco, uh, it's, you know, uh, it took, um, I mean, it's just, it's just amazing what that takes out of you. And uh, so um, it's, it's amazing. I'm still alive and I'm very fortunate in that regard. So what I've got is a question, of course, I've got multiple communique now, and they're asking me about the school. Of course, everyone wants to know about the magic school. So I'll tell them a little bit about that. I suppose the the, the school. Yes, might... 
We we must emphasize it's it's more like the uh it's more like the air temple of of like Avatar rather than Hogwarts. Yes. Yes. Just thanks. because you know, uh, just because Avatar comes closer to representing, you know, what Eastern culture de- is more like, you know, mm-hmm. whereas Hogwarts is just—I I, I don't know what the fuck that is. Just, <laughs> What's the name of the authoress again? Who's, who's the authoress? Uh, I cannot remember her Rowlings. name. Rowling. But- J.K. Rowling. Oh, oh J.K. Rowling. Yeah, yes. yeah. Yes, she's she's she turned out to be really transphobic and of course she lost a lot of fans after that because uh, uh but you know beyond that what is so what is the name of the slytherin or something is the the serpent school right in the in that whole harry potter series and that just doesn't make any sense because she portrays them as having no redeeming features and there is that nothing good ever comes of them so what's the point of that particular school of magic then it's it's like well of course in her universe it serves only as the foil right it, it's the foil uh, to her hero uh and uh but it, it makes no sense if if, it, if people are existing simply uh for the sake of doing damage unto others there's no need for their services in the sense that they serve nobody in inside of their community, right? <laughs> so, yeah, yeah. So. I mean, I mean, if you have people who are who are only going to be baneful practitioners, why would they even bother working in a group? Yes, thank you, thank you. Because that... they, they're gonna they're gonna wind up killing each other all. <laughs> right. <laughs> Thank you. It, it's so stupid. It doesn't make any sense. I mean, this is like. I mean, you know. I mean, all one has to do is, is look, look on a uh, forum, on any forum, where they discuss magic, and you'll see people who practice baneful magic ripping each other apart online all the time. I mean, I love it. Um, I've been following a particular piece of drama between the uh i mean both both of these are sources that i respect as far as knowledge is concerned of uh, the major of the temple of major rye and this guy uh named uh slate in sorcery um and, and it's, it's it's quite amusing to see them go back and forth and take pot shots at each other but when they do present information on certain things of the uh cult nature it's things that you know you are really difficult to find elsewhere so that's why i've been like listening to both sources but i mean it's like these guys it's like don't you have anything better to do that's so awful i mean honestly uh with all the time that's sunk into um internet feuds that's that's so it, it's 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 a waste of talent yes Yes, so sad, and uh, but uh, definitely appreciate your bringing that up as an example of what not to do with one's time. Um, so thank you so much for helping me out through um, the, the nights like this. Of course, you become indispensable, and this is really uh, again why they may be trying to take out your ability to you know maintain call, uh, you know maintain yourself on call if they're honestly doing something to sabotage your electronics outside of your home. Uh, so that's uh, yeah, hopefully, hopefully it's not some kind of energy beam weapon that's going to cause me to get cancer or some shit. I doubt it. Not not that wouldn't have anything to do with your fire hydrant. <laughs> that would be uh of course, you know, I mean anything's possible. I mean they could replace it with a false fire hydrant. It's not the first time something like that hasn't been Well, well, well it's uh I got to show you uh what I have to do is I'll have to uh send you the pictures over Facebook because uh it's on my other computer, but um I'll basically show you the pictures where they... Actually, I put it on my timeline, so I could just send them to you. Okay, and that's fine. Thank you. Okay, so um, just to um, educate people a little bit about the Japanese Hogwarts, and there I go, right? The the Avatar. What would be the name of the Avatar school, son? Do you remember? (laughs) Oh, it's like the uh, Air Temple. Air Temple. Think of Air Temple, yes. Uh, so, uh, basically, of course, it was subsidiary or integral, a part of the on uh, and the on itself, to solidify this in people's minds conceptually, the hierarchy of this was but one of the bureaus in, um, what we would call, uh, the, uh, 
not uh, how did my mother say it uh nakatsu kasasho uh nakatsu kasasho and the nakatsu kasasho would be the ministry of central affairs that would be under the ritsuryo system which was the system of centralized government based on the ritsuryo code and uh, the department was responsible for the compilation of fortune telling astronomy uh time itself and the calendar and it was renamed the taishi department or the bureau of divination between the years 758 and 764 um so uh, this is of course anno domini uh okay so i'm getting the messages from jameson reese now and uh i can look at them soon enough uh, in the uh, meantime, uh, the Onmyo no Kami, uh, and uh, Kami, of course, means the gods, the, the, the gods in the plural, the pantheistic sense. Uh, the Kami can occupy trees, uh, uh, rocks. They, they, these have their spirit, their their presence among us, as do robots, as do uh, uh, automobiles. Uh, they have a presence you can feel when you're maintaining them. Uh, now, the Anmyo no Kami was the director of the bureau, uh, the the, um, the sorcerer of spirits, of gods, of the gods, who was staffed by the Anmyoji, the yin and yang practitioners. Uh, that bureau was staffed by all of them, as I said, uh, and they, even though some of them may not practice magic at all, as long as they were affiliated with the bureau, even as clerical or um, uh, custodial, they would all be identified as Anmyoji by the general public. And they performed spells based on the Anmyodo, the way of yin and yang, the occult divination system based itself, which itself was based on the Taoist theory of the five elements. So when I speak of the five paths, these are the elements in Asia. There are five elements instead of four, and they are wood, water, fire, uh, metal, and uh, earth, and uh, I believe, and if I remember correctly. Now, um, there's some variants, of course, depending on um, interpretations. And uh, so you had uh, at the school, uh, what was called an Anmyo Hakasi, the yin and yang master. And the uh, Anmyo Hakase trained the Anmyoji, uh, the sorcerers. And you had a Temon Hakase, the master of astronomy, who practiced and taught astronomy. Uh, and a Reiki Hakase, the calendar master, who compiled and created calendars. Uh, the students were known as Gakuse. And, uh, well, you had students who would be the equivalent of today's postgraduates, uh, basically taking the graduate programs. They would be known as the Tokugyo no Sho. Uh, so they would all study under those aforesighted staff members. And in addition, there was also the Rokoku Hakase, the clock master, the man who managed those water clocks that I sprack above. And uh, he announced the time. Uh, and uh, the Anmyoji Abe no Seme, that uh, super um, sexy uh, Anmyoji, the one who's now on Yu-Gi-Oh cards. Uh, he was assigned to one of the institutions, uh, Tenman Hakase, uh, the uh, masters of astronomy and uh, the Anmyo no Kami Haruo uh, Suchi Mikado, uh, whose very name has the emperor uh, integrated into his very title. He passed away in 1869. Okay, so we're talking like yesterday in historical terms. And the Anmyoryo was officially abolished, meaning on the books it was abolished. It went off the books in 1870 during the time of his heir, uh, Erinaga uh, Suchimikado. And uh, so the Suchimikado, that has, that's a family name, a title, uh, and um, I've never been able to ascertain whether that was actually a family name or a title special. And I think it's a title uh, from what I know of the Japanese language that doesn't sound like a natural Japanese name. So, uh, but they took it as if it were their last name. In other words, they, um, their identity 
even that of their family, was sublimated uh, into their profession. In other words, their profession uh, displaced any familial ties, if that makes sense. Like a priest, that would make sense, right? Even if they're not priests, uh, then uh, they certainly, in certain areas, became almost worshipped themselves, though that was not what they were supposed to encourage. So in terms of the personnel, you had the uh, uh, kame, kami, uh, the, basically like a spirit in human form, in human flesh, and that would be the director, the equivalent to a uh, jugoi noji, the uh, junior fifth rank, lower grade, the uh, uh, suke, uh, deputy director, equivalent to the juro kui nojo, uh, junior sixth, sixth rank, upper grade, the jo, uh, the secretary, equivalent to the uh, Jushi Chinojo, the junior seventh rank upper grade, the uh, Daisakan, the senior clerk, equivalent to a Juhai uh, Chinoji, uh, the junior eighth rank lower grade, the uh, Shosakan, the junior clerk, equivalent to uh, uh, the Daihatsui Nojo, the greater initial rank of the upper grade. By the way, I'm saying this mostly for the benefit of Brendan Zogit, if he ever listens to this, because he would uh, probably have seen all this kind of ranking inside of his uh, Yu-Gi-Oh cards or something. <laughs> and, uh, uh, you had the Shisho, a lower ranking clerks, uh, newly created. Uh, Ryosho, the administrative officials, the secretary commissioners. Uh, about 20 Shibu, low ranking bureaucrats. Uh, about two... Uh, uh, what they would call uh, jikicho, who would be like factotums. And so then you had people responsible, aside from the personnel I've just described, who were responsible for skills and education, which, as I said, there were supposed to be six super sorcerers at any given time, the basis for the entire ministry. Uh, about six anmyoji, the uh, equivalent to uh, what uh, would in Brendan's world be something like a Jushichi Nojo or something. Uh, and um, so then you would have, of course, the, um, the specialists, the uh, at least one Anmyo Hakase, equivalent to a Soshi Chinoji, uh, a senior seventh rank, lower grade, uh, 10 Anmyo Nojo, uh, students of Anmyo, uh, and Anmyo Tokugyo, uh, or Tokugyo Nojo, the top Anmyo students, this would be the star pupils who would be entering into kind of uh, honors degree, postgraduate type uh, intensive internship. Uh, at least one Tenmon Hakase, the equivalent of a Shoshi Chinoji. Uh, ten Tenmon Nosho, uh, students of astronomy. Uh, tenmon uh, Tokugyo Nosho, uh, top astrology students. Uh, different, you know, disambiguated even back then over thousands of years from astronomy they disambiguated astrology from the astronomy which by the way in and of itself is a leap that most cultures would never take until the renaissance uh and then of course you had the uh at least one reki hakasi the equivalent of a jushi chinoja uh, 10 reki nosho or calendar students uh and then the uh the reki uh tokugyo nosho the top calendar students and uh and finally, you would have like about two Rikoku Hakase. These would be the clock masters equivalent to uh, Soshi Chinoji and uh, Jushi Chinoji, the junior seventh rank are of lower grade. And about 20 Sushi Chinjo, uh, or rather, excuse me, Sushincho, uh, the uh, timekeepers. And the timekeepers rang the time bell in accordance with the Rokoku Hakase. And uh, so uh, when it comes to the way of Amyodo, what was being taught, the curriculum, uh, understand that uh, Amyodo is also known as Inyodo, literally the way of yin and yang. It's a system of natural science, really. That's all that magic is. Uh, combined with astronomy, uh, the uh, uh, assembly of an almanac, as in the farmer's almanac, uh, divination and magic that developed independently in Japan based on the Chinese philosophies of yin and yang and wujing, which were the five elements, uh, metal, wood, fire, water, and earth. Yes. And the philosophy of yin and yang and wujing was introduced to 
Japan at the beginning of the 6th century, uh, influenced by Taoism, uh, Buddhism, Confucianism, and evolved into the earliest system of Amyodo around the 7th century. So in the year 701, meaning the first year of uh, the 8th century, the Taiho Code established the departments and posts of um, Anmyoji, who practiced Anmyodo in the imperial court, and Anmyodo was institutionalized uh, thereby. And from around the 9th century, during the Heian period, Anmyodo interacted with Shinto and Goryo worship, which is the worship of ghosts. And uh, that is something that came out of Taoism. The understanding that uh, ghosts are not all evil, that the restless dead deserve love too. Uh, so there were sites in Japan that are were popular centers of Goryu worship. They still exist in Japan today. Mm. So if you could um, go back in time, you would have seen people who were literal ghost worshippers. Um, so, the cult of Goryo, uh, the acting ghosts recognized as non-wrathful spirits, uh, then you had formalized uh, worship thereof in certain cases. This was not a universal Japanese religion. This was a emergent cult of the time. Uh, no doubt, in well founded in the worship of ancestors, taken to uh, adapting in those who weren't your ancestors <laughs> in gatherings known as Goryo-e. Goryo -e. It would be like holding a seance. Uh, the white people would hold a seance and you invite all kinds of ghosts in that aren't your dead relatives. Uh, so uh, it's uh, to placate and send these ghosts away is one thing. Uh, but they can also become uh, objects of worship permanently consecrated. Uh, so, um, the uh, understand this. The kami are the spirits. The godlets of the pantheon, they're not viewed as goryo. Completely different thing there. Goryo are specifically spirits of people who had lost their way. So, if you make an extended family of them, well, that can happen. Like, you see some of these churches that, uh, um, where they, uh, you know, invite in. Spiritualist churches do this. Spiritualist churches do this in the West. So, it's a Japanese um, uh, kind of manifestation of that. And uh, so, uh, you know, uh, my medical cosmetologist, V, had a friend once who just, her life was constantly impacted by ghosts and it was not a positive but she was part of the spiritualist church that kept inviting them in so for her it was a negative to be addicted to this church to be addicted to uh, uh, the western form of ghost worship which is uh, our Goryo uh, cultism which would be um, spiritualism in uh, the United States or spiritism uh, so when it comes to uh, the um, uh, obviously, this is all unique to Japan, what I'm describing. And Abe no Semai, se Semi, he was uh, active during the Heian period. He's the most famous of all the Anmyoji, uh, the Amyodo practitioners. And in Japanese history, he's appeared in all kinds of Japanese literature in later years. Um, and, uh, of course, the ministry itself was under control of the imperial government. That must never be forgotten. This is like like the FBI or the Bureau of Labor. <laughs> it's, uh, and later, of course, uh, was influenced by its courtiers, uh, the, the court nobles, the uh, uh, Suchi Mikado family until the middle of the 19th century. We're talking about the mid-1800s, at which point uh, all this was publicly prohibited as superstition and went behind the uh, kurumaku, kurumaku, the black curtain, off the books. And now, uh, of course, in the 5th and 6th centuries, the principles of yin-yang and the five elements were transmitted to Japan from China and uh, Baekje, as I said, uh, what was then Southeast Korea, along with Buddhism and Confucianism, particularly by a very obscure Korean monk who was heavily Sinified, that means Chinese acculturated, named uh, Gui Luke. 
and yin yang and the five elements, as well as the divisions of learning to which they were linked, astronomy, calendar making, the reckoning of time itself, the divination, and studies based on the observation of nature were amalgamated into fortune telling. And this process of judging auspicious or harmful signs present in the natural world was accepted into Japanese society as a technique for predicting good or bad fortune in the human world. Now, such techniques were known mostly by Buddhist monks from mainland Asia who were knowledgeable in reading and writing Chinese. And over time, demand from members of the imperial court who believed that on Myodo divination would be helpful in their decision making made it necessary for the laity to perform the art, meaning that they had to take people from out of the noble class because they really started needing a lot more sorcerers. And uh, because of that, they had to stop you know, said, but of course, nobles were always considered the best or the best material to work with, but because they just needed so many more, they had to mobilize and uh, began to recruit, as I said. And the Anmyoji began to appear around the middle of the seventh century as a profession in which even common men uh, could uh, become uh, a sorcerer. Um, and uh, under the Taiho Code, enacted in the early 8th century, the departments of the imperial co court, uh, to which the Anmyoji belonged, were defined by law itself, codified into law as to what their responsibilities were. And so, just like an FBI agent showing up at your door and flashing his badge, the Anmyoji could show up and say, I'm here to put a curse on you, or to protect you from evil. It would generally be the benevolent, I mean, there's no reason for them to go around cursing their citizens, but obviously that potential was there if the citizen was considered a danger. It would be something similar to this. Understand this. Um, in Britain and medieval Europe, uh, your equivalent of that would be the term outlaw. Now, we hear the term outlaw these days, and it has this kind of almost romantic a connotation and seems anachronistic as hell, like uh, something from the Old West. What does it mean? Outlaw. Well, in the original medieval sense, if you were declared an outlaw, you were well and truly fucked. You have absolutely no idea what that means. Robin Hood was declared an outlaw. Okay. Now, first off, you're going to say that makes perfect sense. What's the big deal? Okay. This is the big deal. If you're declared an outlaw, uh, you've got everything going against you at that point. Uh, it means you are no longer subject to the rule of law. Imagine if this happened today with today's communications to someone where suddenly uh, the state, the state, meaning your federal government says you're no longer subject to the rule of law, that you are outside the law's protection. Yes, and not only that, they would usually, uh, Jameson Reese says, it's like having a bounty on your head. This also would be coupled with the fact they usually would put a bounty on your head aside from that. But when they say you're outside the rule of law, that means anyone can kill you, beat you, rape you, have their way with you, enslave you, and they would not be held accountable by the law. You could literally be abducted by someone and chained to a wall uh, and raped every day the rest of your life, and the person who did this would not be subject to any punishments. That's what an outlaw entailed. That meant you were no longer under the rule of law. Anyone could do whatever they wanted with you. So uh, that gives Robin Hood the really hard edge that you never thought of before, uh, because also uh, this meant that anyone who provides you succor, meaning any shelter, any sustenance, would be uh, considered an accomplice, an aid abetant to your criminality, and they would be subject to execution in the medieval uh, codification of outlaws and how to treat their rel relatives. Their relatives would have to turn them away because to invite you into your home and shelter you would be a death sentence for the rest of the family. So the family would rebuke you. The family would say, we have nothing to do with him at that point to protect themselves, the rest of the family. You're totally on your own uh, and you, you're like a wild animal. You'd be considered like a rabid dog. Uh, so people would be seeking you out just for the simple fun of killing you or torturing you and doing whatever they wanted. They could literally put you on public display in a cage and, uh, you know, feed you and keep you alive while torturing you the rest of your life, uh, which conceivably could be years. 
on public display in a circus and make you perform and you would, they would not be subject to this is the horror of that potential. Okay. So when, uh, this basically would be the equivalent of the Japanese, uh, on Myodo being dispatched to conduct a curse on somebody in, uh, that their sense, it would be like, uh, so this sort of thing could happen. It's not out of the realm of conceivability, but, uh, so this was of course, uh, uh, as I said, uh, very much uh, from around the 9th century during the Heian period on Myodo interacting with Shinto and Goryo worship, ghost worship in Japan, developing into a system unique to Japan. Uh, and until then, uh, on Myodo emphasized, you know, the way uh, the magical uh, practice, uh, the, uh, the skill it emphasized divination for uh, policy decisions by high government officials, but since the Heian period, on Myodo has emphasized magic and religious services such as warding off evil for preventing natural disasters and epidemics, or for the productiveness of grain, as well as curses against opponents. Now, because Shinto places importance on purity, Shinto priests were required to perform misogi, ritual purification, and fast, meaning starve themselves, before performing these religious services, so their activities were restricted. On the other hand, since Anmyoji did not have to perform misogi, or fast, they were able to deal with kegari, or uncleanliness, more easily, and they expanded their activities beyond the support of the Shinto priests. It gradually spread from the imperial court to the general public thereby. This is where they became like mailmen. And uh, not that they were everywhere, but their services were demanded everywhere. And so they became very much like traveling practitioners, uh, professionals. Uh, in the 10th century, Kamo no Tariyuki and his son, Kamo no Yasunori, they made great advancements in Anmyodo astronomy and calendrical science, the science of chronometry, measuring time. And from among their students emerged Abe no Semai, the great sex symbol of the Anmyoji, uh, who displayed superior skills in the divining arts of Anmyodo, by which he gained an uncommon amount of trust from the court society. And uh, apparently he was very attractive and charismatic as well. And uh, Tariyuki and Yazunori passed on their skills in astronomy, not astrology, mind you, but astronomy, to Semai, while their advances in calendar making went to Yazunori's son. And from the end of the Heian period into the Middle Ages, astronomy and calendar science were completely subsumed into Amyodo. Uh, and the Abe and Kamo families that I told you about, the Coke and Pepsi of Japan, they came to dominate the art in the imperial court. Oh. And um, so in terms of Anmyoji, uh, which also another title my mother taught me about was Inyoji. Uh, that um, was but one of the classifications of civil servants belonging to the Bureau of Anmyo in ancient Japan's Ritsuryo system. People with this title were, of course, professional practitioners of Anmyodo. So the Anmyoji were specialists in magic and divination. Their courtly responsibilities ranged from tasks such as keeping track of the calendar to mystical duties such as divination and protection of the capital from evil spirits, like the Americans and their bombers, their fire bombers. And so they could divine auspicious or harmful influences in the earth and were instrumental in the moving of capitals, in which, of course, had Japan truly been threatened by an American invasion of Japan itself, the capital would have relocated to Beijing and they would have become another foreign dynasty over the Chinese. The heirs to the Mongols and the Manchus would have been the Yamato dynasty over China, at which point they would have mobilized the Chinese as their troops under Japanese officership. And uh, just at that point, of course, the Americans could never win. And uh, that's what made the Chinese a modern army, an atomic age army, not because they had atomic weapons, but when China uh, entered the atomic age, it was considered an atomic power because they had a population so vast 
uh, a quarter of the Earth's population, 25% of all people on Earth were Chinese, that they could absorb atomic attack and still keep on coming. So uh, obviously uh, a Japanese dynasty over China was unbeatable. Um, the, the Americans would never have won the war. They just, this, there was no way the Americans could win. Uh, I'm talking about no matter what happened, the Americans couldn't win. Uh, they couldn't invade the home islands. And if they did, they had what I've just described to face uh, because the Japanese would have relocated the capital with help from people like my mother to conduct the protection of the capital in transportation. Um, so uh, it is said that an Anmyoji could also summon and control the Shikigami. And uh, that is something that uh, might require some explaining. Of course, I want to get back to the subject of the bombs. And, uh, you know, if I spend most of my time here tonight doing this, I might have to talk about the bombs on Wednesday, which is fine. But the Shikigami, uh, that is the term for a being from Japanese folklore that is thought to be some sort of kami, uh, represented by a spirit, represented by a small ghost. And uh, so it is, well, the Shikigami, or the Shiki no Kami, that's a um, symbol of the Amyoji's power, because the Amyoji can freely deploy the Shikigami with magical powers. Uh, and uh, so, how would I, it's, well, it's, these are, well, they're small ghosts that are like, I guess Europeans would think of imps or something, or homunculi. The sorcerers would summon the shikigami to aid them in battle. Uh, it is a... Uh, so the shikigami are s servant spirits, uh, deployed by the Anmyoji for rituals. Uh, uh, well, some are used as charms for good fortune, um, but they're powerful spirits to fight by your side. And uh, so servant spirits summoned by Japanese sorcerers. Uh, so shikigami manipulation or combat. Um, you can channel a magic item's power to enhance its improvised attacks. Even if it was never meant to be used as a weapon. This is how my mother could turn something like a fan into a lethal item or a tea kettle. Uh, so this is done through the summoning of the spirits. Uh, and uh, so you've got it as kind of a missing link between Kami, the godlets, uh, and, uh, and ghosts. So uh, there we have that. And um, also sometimes they could be a brute demon. And... Um, that's uh, something else to bear in mind. Um, so enough of that for right now, because I'd have to look through my mother's notes to really get the meaning behind it. But I'm giving you what I remember off the top of my head. So um, that should be good enough for now. Uh, other than that, um, let's see now. Um, see what else I can uh, uh, remove from my mind. Um, and during the Heian period, the nobility organized their lives around practices recommended by Anmyoji. So the practice of lucky and unlucky directions, providing an example like I gave, depending on the season, the time of day, and other circumstances, a particular compass direction might be bad luck for an individual. If one's house was located in that direction, such an individual was advised not to go back directly to their house, but had to change direction, or katatage, uh, as my mother said, by going in a different direction and lodging there overnight, perhaps. And such a person would not dare to go in the forbidden direction, but stayed where they were, even if that resulted in absence from the court or passing up invitations from influential people. Because any of those people might be setting you up, right? And uh, Or um, simply well-intentioned, but leading you to your doom uh, unintentionally. Uh, so the uh, famous um, Anmyoji, uh, Kamo no Yasunori, uh, Abe no Seme, 
Uh, oh, by the way, he lived from 921 uh, to the year 1005 AD. Uh, so he lived past the year 1000 AD, which was the 2000 AD of, um, you know, the day, meaning everybody thought it was going to be apocalypse or the dawn of a new age. Of course, it really was. 1000 AD was a time when Europe finally became majority Christian. It really took till 1000 AD. Until 1000 AD, the majority of people in Europe were actually pagan. And uh, it was only in around 1000 AD, a thousand years after the death of Christ, that the majority of Europe became Christian. That was a phenomenal change uh, that was millennial, millennial in nature. Now, after Semai's death, uh, during that year, the emperor Ichigo uh, had a shrine erected at his home in Kyoto. Mm. And of course, to prevent my father Adolf Hitler's home, in which he was born from becoming a shrine, they converted it to a police department. And um, so, uh, there you go with that. Fuck the Austrians. But um, in terms of the Anmyoji, we have here an official position belonging to the Bureau of Anmyo, of the Ministry of uh, the Center, under the Ritz Suryo system in ancient Japan. And um, they were assigned as a technical officer in charge of oriental divination and geomorphology, what you would call feng shui, based on the theory of the yin yin yang five phases. And in the Middle Ages and the early modern period, that term was used to refer to those who performed prayers and divination in the private sector. And some of them were regarded as a kind of clergy. So uh, there you have that. And in terms of some of the philosophy, the yin and yang five phases philosophy, uh, in terms of that, uh, well, what it had to do with the establishment of the Bureau of Anmyo, well, based on the ancient Chinese concept of yin and yang and five phases, which began in the Jia and Shang dynasties and was almost completed in the Yao dynasty, it was that all phenomena are based on the combination of yin and yang five phases of wood, fire, earth, metal, and water. An Myoji is the uniquely Japanese profession that is responsible for utilizing all of these elements in context of astrology, calendrical, uh, I Ching, uh, the Book of Changes, uh, water clocking, uh, etc., which are all intimately intertwined with this conceptualization. The yin and yang five phases philosophy itself, which is the premise of this magical system, is uh, known to have come directly from mainland China, the northern and southern dynasties, or earlier, or via the, the western part of the Korean peninsula, known as Goguryeo. Goguryeo or uh, Bakshe, depending on who was ruling uh, during the Asuka period, uh, or at the latest, by the time of the five classics doctors who came to Japan from Bakshe, Bakshe, in 512, I think the year was, or the I Ching doctors that came to Japan in the year 554. And at first, the influence of these studies on politics and culture itself was minimal. However, by 602, uh, when we had the compilation of the Judeo-Japanese dictionary uh, between Hebrew to transliterate from the Hebrew, between the Hebrew and the Japanese, uh, Gwaliuk came to Japan from Baekje, and taught various studies, this very obscure Korean monk, uh, including the yin and yang five phases. He taught them to 34 selected officials, including the prince of Japan, Prince Shotoku. And as a result, an official calendar was adopted in Japan for the first time, and Japanese missions to Sui, China, were launched in the year 607 uh, to absorb Buddha's teachings. Uh, yin and yang five phases philosophies and the calendar system and in addition the influence of yin and yang five phases philosophies became apparent in the establishment of prince shotoku's 17 article constitution and the 12 level cap and rank system 
and thereafter, the imperial court continued to send international students to accompany Japanese missions to Sui, China, uh, and later Japanese missions to Tang Dynasty, China, and invited many monks and scholars from mainland China or the west coast of the Korean Peninsula to further absorb knowledge. And as the introduction of various schools of thought progressed, Japan came to believe that it was important to consider the movements and positions of the Chinese constellations to determine the good and bad fortune, disasters, and fortune based on the principle of compatibility of birth and death, to divine the future, and to obtain guidelines for all personal matters. And later, Emperor Tenmu was such a master of astrology and fuge that he took his own divination tools and told fortunes during the Jinxian War. He also had a deep knowledge of the yin and yang five phases philosophy, which led to the establishment of the Bureau of Anmyo and Japan's first observatory in the year 676, well before any Europeans pointed a telescope at the sky, okay? And the use of the term Anmyoji in 685 which further increased the popularity of the yin and yang five phases philosophy. In the year 718, the Yoro Code established the Bureau of Anmyo as an internal department of the Ministry of the Center, and when it was stipulated that the positions of Doctor of Astrology, Doctor of Anmyo, or Anmyoji, the Doctor of the Calendar, the Doctor of the Water Clock, uh, the Roroku, uh, should be permanently assigned as technical officers. The Bureau of Anmyo became officially in charge of divination, along with turtle shell diviners who belonged to the Department of Divinities. And uh, so in the Bureau of Anmyo, a four-grade governmental system was established with the head of Anmyo at the top, administrative officials below him, and technical officers such as doctors, trainees, and other general staff. However, since the technical officers, such as doctors and Anmyoji, were in charge of technology that had been introduced from the continent, they were appointed by foreigners who were well-versed in academics and skilled in reading classical Chinese texts, especially monks who had come from the Han Dynasty and the Sui Dynasty in mainland China, as well as from the Goguryeo and Baekje in Korea, which had... Uh, well, I think the both had power on the west coast of the Korean Peninsula, rarely from Silia, Silia, S I A W -L, L A, which uh, initially had power on the east coast of the Korean Peninsula. But you know, it was kind of like a central Korea of its day, uh, rarely from um, from them. Uh, in particular, around the time of the defeat of the Baekje Dynasty in the Battle of Baekgang in six six three. Uh, 663, the year thereof, when Japan sent reinforcements to Baekje, which was a close ally of Japan, and Siya, I unified the Korean Peninsula. A large number of knowledgeable people from Baekje came to Japan as exiles, and many of them were appointed to the Bureau. It was also possible to appoint technical officers from the civilian population. As I said, they had to start to recruit. Mm -hmm because the need was great. Demand was high. And when the Bureau of Anmyo was first established, the technical officers' duties were purely limited to I Ching, geomorphology, uh, what we call Feng Shui today, uh, astronomical observation, astrology as well, but disambiguated therefrom, making calendars, judging good days and bad days, and keeping time with water clocks. And they did not perform any religious rituals or spells like the Department of Divinities or monks did. However, they played the ultimately decisive role in the relocation of the capital by selecting good days for repairs and predicting the good and bad fortune of the land and its direction. Uh, now, of the technical officers assigned to the Bureau of Anmyo, the Anmyoji, who specialized in I Ching and geomorphology, can be defined as Anmyoji in the narrow sense, and all the technical officers, including the Doctor of Astrology, the Doctor of Anmyo, or 
I'm Yogi, the doctor of the calendar, the doctor of the water clock. Well, they could be considered on Yogi in the broad sense. And after they, uh, that group of on Yogi in the broad sense was sometimes referred to as on Myodo itself. In other words, they were the way of yin and yang. In other words, as people, they personified it. So then there were some changes in the treatment of on Myoji under the Ritsuryo system. Uh, under the Ritsuryo system, it was strictly forbidden for any outsider, not only priests and monks, but also all government officials and private citizens, to study astrology, uh, or to study the yin and yang, or to study calendars and time management, or to preach about disasters and good omens, uh, no one could do that except for those who were appointed as trainees at the Bureau of Anmyo itself. Otherwise, you would be breaking the law. Any equipment related to astronomical observation or time measurement or books related to Anmyo Do were also forbidden to be taken out of the Bureau of Anmyo and even forbidden to be simply owned by private individuals. And for this reason, until the beginning of the Heian period in the early 9th century, when the Ritsuryo system was relatively strictly enforced, Anmyodo was managed as classified information monopolized by the Bureau of Anmyo. Thereafter, to keep up with the trends of the times, Laws and regulations were often issued to revise the details of the Ritsuryo system, and as the number of government positions in each ministry tended to increase, the number of positions in the Bureau of Anmyo was also increased considerably by the middle of the Heian period. In general, the court rank of the technical officers in each ministry was set low, but the rank of the technical officers in the Bureau of Anmyo was set higher than that of the technical officers in other ministries. However, since the Bureau of Anmyo was an internal bureau of the Ministry of Center, the rank of the fourth grade administrative officials was naturally lower than that of the main ministry, and only a head of Anmyo allowed to ascend to the hall of the Seryoden, the place of daily life of the emperor himself, to report directly. In the beginning, the fourth class officials and technical officials, the doctors and on Myoji, were appointed strictly separately, and the latter were appointed by the learned monks who came from the advanced countries of China and Korea. This was because it was impossible for the imperial court, which was theoretically a secular government, to allow monks to serve freely because of the way they were treated. The reason for this was that it was necessary to return monks appointed as doctors or on Myoji to a, the secular world by imperial decree before they could be appointed as administrative officials, and such decree could not, well, should not be issued frequently. And as a substitute, secular personnel were appointed as students of astrology on Myodo and calendars, to learn the various arts of Anmyodo and to cultivate personnel who could serve and work freely at the imperial court. Later, this practice gradually became more ambiguous and it became possible for a learned monk to be appointed as a technical officer without returning to secular life and to be transferred to a higher position, especially as a head or vice head, or be ordered to serve concurrently as an administrative official. However, to raise the rank of a technical officer, who was basically a learned monk who did not return to the secular world, it was not possible to raise the rank of a technical officer without changing the position of technical officer according to the rank equivalent system, which was the basis of the Ritsuryo system. And in addition, as the training of trainees progressed, more and more secular bureaucrats became technical officers, and personnel exchanges became even more free. In any case, there were many transfers and concurrent appointments from technical officers to administrative officers in the Bureau of Anmyo, and uh, head of Anmyo, namely a director of the uh, Bureau of Anmyo, 
uh, was also a former technical officer, and many technical officials held concurrent positions in the Bureau of Anmyo in turn. So the Bureau of Anmyo became a technical government office from the Nara period to the early Heian period. However, again, with the abolition of Japanese missions to Tang, China, after 838, Anno Domini, the opportunity to invite talented foreigners from the Tang dynasty on the mainland China was lost. Uh, the unified Silla on the Korean peninsula was not as close to Japan as it once was with Baekje. Baekje. And uh, as a result of continuing to train technical officers in a closed manner by limiting the number of trainees to only 30 in the early Heian period, there was gradually a scarcity of human resources for technical officers at the Bureau of Anmyo. In addition, there was a shortage of positions due to the intensifying struggle for power among the nobles themselves. Ahead of Anmyo, who was the only man in the Bureau of Anmyo who had direct access to the emperor, was not appointed from the ranks of technical officers such as doctors, but was used more and more as a position of the nobles. And since it was the last position in the directorate, it tended to be used as a treatment for noblemen who were in relatively poor circumstances. From this period onward, there was a particularly large number of assignments outside the capacity of the Bureau, and these assignments became permanent. This was no longer a part of the consideration for monks, but was simply the purpose of assigning positions to nobles. So in the middle of the Heian period, the 10th century, the monopolistic secession of two families, the Kamo family and the Abe family, was seen, and the top positions in the Bureau of Anmyo, including a head of Anmyo, were almost exclusively held by members of these two families. And in addition, the Anmyodo practices of the two families became more religious than the original governmental positions, and these practices were heavily used by the imperial regents, the chief imperial advisors, and other officials of the imperial court. As a result, the two families were promoted to more serious positions beyond the official rank of the Bureau of Anmyo in the Ritsuryo system, even though they were in reality only practitioners of Anmyoda. In the Muramachi period, the Abe family in particular, under the patronage of Ashikaga Yoshimitsu, the third shogun of the Ashikaga shogunate, rose to become Hanke as one of the superior nobles, which was always appointed as, uh, well, the senior government positions. And he changed its name to the Suchimikado family. The Suchimikado family temporarily declined from the late Muramachi period to the Sengoku period, but in the early morning, well, the early modern period, the morning of what was to become the 20th century, the Tokugawa shogunate gave the Suchi Mikado family the right to manage all Anmyoji in Japan. And the Suchi Mikado family prospered until the beginning of the Meiji era. This meant the imperial family now was directly managing the empire's sorcerers. So that brings us to the concept of Anmyodo as a religion, and even the deification of the Anmyoji in the Heian period. After the assassination of Fujiwara no Tanatsugu in the year 785, Emperor Kamu was frightened by a vengeful spirit of Prince Sawara, his younger brother, due to the frequent incidents of personal disasters and mourning. The relocation of the capital from uh, Nagaoka Kyo to Heian Kyo, present day Kyoto, by him triggered a sudden spread of belief in noble ghost to appease vengeful spirit, especially in the imperial court, and the tendency to seek more powerful benefits from spellcasting to dispel evil spirits became stronger. 
And against this backdrop, in addition to the ancient Shintoism, religious beliefs in the stars and Taoist spells, such as those using sacred symbols, came to the focus, well, came to be the focus of attention. So, in terms of a doctor of spellcasting and spellcasters, they were all in charge of spellcasting, which had its elements of prophecy, Taoism, Buddhism, and especially esotericism, and belonged to the Bureau of the Pharmacy of the Ministry of the Imperial Household, which had been established as an institution before well, to offer prayers as medical treatment. However, Fujiwara no Kamatari, who was a researcher of Anmyoro, abolished them, and they were integrated into the Bureau of Anmyo. So in this way, Anmyodo began to have elements of various colors, from Taoism or Buddhism, especially esoteric Buddhism, introduced in the Nara and Heian periods at the end of the 8th century, and astrology, which was called Sukuyodo, which was introduced uh, along with, uh, well, right along with them, <laughs> uh, to ancient Shintoism. And with the advent of the Goryu, Goryo, the noble ghost faith, the Anmyodo became even more diverse. And, well, exempt like gratiate, spells such as changing the direction for good fortune and self-consecration, uh, rituals uh, such as the festival of the great emperor of the sacred mountain of the east, and uho steps uh, taken by the Hempai, which were often seen in an Myodo practices, all originated from Taoism, and rice scattering and liturgical incantations originated from ancient Shinto. Uh, and furthermore, in the process of the Hoke of the Fujiwara clan's expansion and establishment of power in the imperial court, political conflicts among the nobles intensified, and there were many occasions when Anmyodo was used for slander and defamation aimed at the downfall of rival forces. That trend became more pronounced with the rise of Fujiwara no Yoshifusa, during the reigns of the emperors Ninmyo and Montoku in the middle of the 9th century, Emperor Yuda himself was very well versed in the art of I Ching, and Fujiwara no Morusuki even wrote his own books, uh, titles like Kujo Dono Ikai and Kujo uh, uh, Ninchu Gyoji. Uh, of course, Kujo reminds me of that stupid, spelled with a K-U-J-O, but all I can think of is Stephen King's fucking dog. But uh, Kujo, mm, well, these books, uh, among other things uh, that uh, um, Morosuke did, he presented a guide that incorporated many taboos and manners based on the yin and yang philosophy uh, thereby. And this environment produced charismatic on Myoji, such as uh, Shigioka no Kawaito and Yuge no Koryo, uh, and also led to the introduction of a regnal year following disasters, as predicted by the Chinese classics scholar Miyoshi Kiyotsura, or Kiyotsura, which became a regular event after 1901. As a result, on Myodo became more and more important to the imperial court, and in addition, the fact that people outside the Bureau of Anmyo, such as Fujiwara no Morosuke and Miyoshi Kiyotsura, had mastered astrology, on Myodo itself, uh, the I Ching, and the calendars, shows that the classified information policy under the Ritsuryo system, which prohibited the leakage of on Myodo outside the Bureau of Anmyo, had already practically failed by this time. So, after the middle of the Heian period, the Ritsuryo system was further loosened due to the monopolization of politics by imperial regents and chief imperial advisors, and the spread of the Manor system, as it was known. And as a result, informal Anmyoji, you know, um, amateur practitioners who were not regular government officials at all, but still belonged to the Bureau of Anmyo, 
began to privately associate with the nobles, divining their good and bad fortunes, and secretly performing rituals to ward off evil. In some cases, they would even undertake to kill their opponents with curses, like mercenaries or paid assassins. And even among the official Anmyoji who belonged to the Bureau of Anmyo, there were many who followed that trend. Their behavior was far removed from the duties of Anmyoji as originally stipulated by the Ritsuryo system. The Anmyoji arbitrarily imposed good and bad fortune on the emperor himself, the imperial family, senior government positions, and nobles in relation to uh, the fortunate directions and the movements of the stars and even entered into the management of their private lives. And as Amyoji began to control the spiritual world at the center of the imperial court, they gradually went beyond their regular duties under the governmental system and began to work behind the scenes of the government itself. Kurumaku, behind the Black Curtain. Uh, at the same time, there appeared Kamo no Tadayuki and his son, Kamo no Yasunori, as well as their disciple Abe no Samai, who were on Myoji well-versed in all aspects of astrology, on Myodo, and the calendars. Uh, they deified precedent, rather they defied precedent and... Uh, became deified, <laughs> and they were promoted to even higher ranks, earning the trust of the imperial court. Kamo no Yosunori taught calendar to his son, Kamo no Mitsuyoshi, and astrology to his disciple, Abe no Samai. And they passed on this knowledge, these knowledge, well, this knowledge and these skills, only to the children of their own families, and forbade teaching them to others. The astrology of the Abe family took on the nature of preaching disasters and good omens, while the calendars of the Kamo family took on a strong astrological flavor. For this reason, only the Kamo and Abe families produced on Myoji for a couple of hundred years thereafter. <laughs> and when Abe no Samai's grandson, Abe no Akichika, became the head of Anmyo, he expressed his policy of always appointing people from the Kamo family as doctors of the calendar and people from the Abe family as doctors of astrology. And after that, the two families almost monopolized other positions in the Bureau of Amyo that were not originally meant to be inherited by these two families. In addition, even though their actual status was that of Anmyoji, they came to hold other higher official positions beyond the duties of the Bureau of Anmyo, and the Bureau as a governmental system became a complete skeleton. The Anmyoji became a charismatic spiritual ruler in the imperial court with a strong tinge of religious spells and rituals and came to wield a powerful influence. From the middle of the Heian period onward, Anmyoji had a great influence on the central government of the imperial court itself, from political management and personal, well, personnel decisions, to the abdication of the emperor, uh, meaning that the emperor could resign his seat of power if he felt that were the best by their advisement. Anmyoji were also deeply involved in the 901 incident, the incident that took place in the year 901, uh, in which Fujiwara no Takihira, the minister of the left, relegated Sugawara no Michizani from the position of minister of the right to the position of deputy commissioner of Dajaifu, the regional government in uh, Chikuzen province, a kind of internal exile. And it was around this time that many on Myoji began to be seen in local areas outside of Heian-kyo, the capital at that time, although their activities as Anmyoji outside of the Bureau of Anmyo were originally prohibited by the Ritsuryo system. In the local areas, many private Anmyoji appeared, including the Reverend Doma, as well as Ashia Doman. And throughout the middle and latter half of the Heian period, the 11th through to the 12th centuries, uh, inclusive thereof, 
The Abe family produced many masters in astrology, which was the most difficult of all the duties of the Bureau of Anmyo, and the Abe family always succeeded as a head of Yanmyo, uh, seceded into that position, while the Kamo family seceded as a vice head of Anmyo. And at the time of the Genpei War, at the end of the Heian period, Abe no Yasuchika, the grandson of Abe no Yoshihira, the son of Abe no Semai, and Abe no Suryahiro, and the son of Abe no Yasuchika, held particularly high official ranks. However, due to the loss of political power that accompanied the subsequent transfer of power to the Kamakura Shogunate, the turmoil within the Abe family caused by the power struggle between the northern and southern courts at the end of the Kamakura period and the subsequent disorder during the Nanbokucho period, the power of the Abe family temporarily declined. That's what brings us to the rise of samurai society and the fall of the official Anmyoji because the samurai warriors were not uh, in need of such ministrations as the nobility always had been. A uh, sad decline in the sense of the magical aristocracy of ancient Japan. Now, just a little check here into the uh, live stream, see what time we have left. And uh, seem to be doing well. I do ask people participate in the chat room. Of course, we always have a decline in participation around this time. And uh, Kooky Monster replaced his icon with a very disturbing uh, image of himself in the dark, uh, which is heavily filtered in red. Um, uh, God, why does he do that? <laughs> now, uh, at the end of the uh, Heian period, the latter half of the 12th century, the Heiki clan, which originated from the imperial guard of the cloistered emperor, who were highly respected during the cloistered rule, rose to prominence. And the Minamoto clan, which had defeated the Heiki clan, led to the rise of the samurai society. In 1192, the Kamakura Shogunate, a samurai government, was officially established. From the time of the Genpei War, the existence of Anmyoji was essential for both clans to establish their code of conduct. For this reason, the Kamakura Shogunate also tended to emphasize Anmyodo. From the time when Minamoto no Yoritomo, the founder of the Shogunate, went to war to seize power, he chose auspicious days predicted by Anmyoji when deciding on actions to be taken in the early years of the shogunate. The second shogun, Minamoto no Yoriye, followed his father's example by inviting an Anmyoji from the capital. However, his personal life was not influenced by an Anmyoji, and he used them only to supplement the formality of official events. After the assassination of Minamoto no Sanitomo, the third shogun of the Kamakura shogunate, in the year 1219, the regency government of the Hojo clan began to develop. The shoguns of the Kamakura shogunate came to be invited by the imperial regents and chief imperial advisors of each generation and the imperial family as puppets of the regent, the Hojo clan, which for a period of time was the most powerful family in Japan, more powerful than the emperor in terms of secular power. And since the shoguns of the Kamakura shogunate were originally from the imperial family, they naturally made heavy use of Anmyoji. And the fourth shogun of the Kamakura shogunate, Kujo Yoritsuni, received a request from the cabinet for a policy to draw an irrigation canal from the Tama River system as a public work and use it to secure drinking water and develop paddy fields after the development of the wetlands in the Musashi province, which is the present-day metropolis and 
uh, Saitama Prefecture. Uh, all of that had been completed. The area to be developed was located directly north of Kamakura, the capital of the Kamakura Shogunate, but Enon Myoji judged the location to be in the direction of misfortune. Therefore, Kujo Yoritsuni deliberately relocated his residence to another residence of Adachi Yoshikaji in the present day Subumi Ward in Yokohama City in the Kanagawa Prefecture, which was considered to be in a fortunate direction from Kamakura. A change to a fortunate direction in Anmyoro policy, and then ordered the start of construction. Thereafter, the shoguns of the Kamakura shogunate did not invite Anmyoji from Heian-kyo, but instead they had a group of Anmyoji close at hand that came to be known as the powerful Anmyodo. Uh, later, during the Jokyu War, the imperial court had Anmyoji of the Bureau of Anmyo and the Kamakura shogunate had the uprising Anmyoji perform prayers. Especially for the shoguns of the middle and late Kamakura period, Anmyoji was an indispensable presence. However, in, well, only those in the vicinity of the shoguns who came from the imperial family or nobles were enthusiastic about Anmyodo and the Hojo clan, the regent who had actual power, was not necessarily particular about Anmyodo. In addition to that, from the samurai under the shoguns to the samurai in the various regions of the Japanese empire, they were not aware of the formalities of the imperial court, nor were they in the habit of consulting Anmyoji on the code of conduct. Now, because of this, Anmyoji did not have the spiritual influence to control the entirety of samurai society, and their presence was limited to the world of puppet shoguns from the imperial family and nobles and the imperial court, senior government positions and nobles who had lost their political authorities. In the early Kamakura period, the constables and governors of the Kamakura shogunate did not have much influence over the imperial territories and noble manners. However, from the middle of the Kamakura period onward, when the efficiency of tax revenue in the territories and manners, and sometimes the territories and manners themselves, began to be rapidly eroded by the constables and governors, the power of the imperial court and nobles, who were the support base of Amyoji, began to suffer economically. The Kamakura shogunate itself was overthrown by an imperial decree of Emperor Gogaigo, but Ashikaga Takauji broke away from him to establish the Ashikaga shogunate and usher in the northern and southern courts period. Uh, the Ashikaga shogunate, which had established its shogunate in Hyankyo and supported the northern court, gradually adopted a nobleman-like orientation. And from the time of the Ashikaga Yoshimitsu, the third shogun of the Ashikaga shogunate, Anmyoji came to be heavily used again. He planned to monopolize the authority of the emperor, and some believe that the heavy use of Anmyoji was also intended to deprive the emperor of his right to perform rituals at the imperial court. Of the two families that inherited Anmyodo, the science of nature, during the northern and southern courts period, the Kamo family took the name of the Kade no Koji family after the Kade no Koji, where their residence was located, and Kamo, now Kade no Koji Akikata, was active in writing his own book. Rekiren Mandoshu. However, in the middle of the Muromachi period, the successor to the head of the mainline Hojo family was murdered, leading to the breakup of the family line and the gradual decline of the family's power. On the other hand, the Abe family was successful, and Abe no Ariyo, the 14th descendant of Abe no Semai, took advantage of the patronage of the shogun Ashikaga Yoshimitsu to obtain a senior government position. And the fact that Anmyoji, who were feared and shunned in the court at the time because of their duties, 
became one of the senior government positions was a groundbreaking event that caused sensation. And from the son of Abe no Ario, Abe no Arimori, to Abe no Arisui, and Abe no Arinobu, successive generations were promoted to senior government positions, and the Abe family, originally a middle-class noble, rose to the status of Hanke. And the generation of Abe no Arinobu in the 16th century, he seized the opportunity of the breakup of the Kade no Koji family to monopolize the duties related to both astrology and calendars for the next five generations. Since the residence of the head of the family had been located in Tsuchimikado after Abe no Ario, the Abe family changed its name to the Tsuchimikado family. And the Tsuchimikado family had gained the, the support of both the imperial court and Muromachi shogunate, and up to this point it seemed to have perfected its power as an an myoji. However, the political power of the Ashikaga shogunate did not last long, and from the middle of the Muromachi period onward, all the shogun's deputies, with the exception of the Hosokawa clan, declined. The Ashikaga shogunate became more like a coalition government of powerful constables than a shogunate control, which led to factional struggles and frequent wars, such as the Unin War. And in addition, as the transition from constables to Sengoku magnates and the uh, tendency for deputy constables and samurais in each region to conquer each other spread, they became desperate to survive. Anmyodo, which had been used formally as a complement, became less important. A succession of wars and the tyranny of the Sengoku magnates led to the destruction of Heian Kyo, the seat of the imperial court that had been the protector of the Anyodo, and the shoguns of the Muromachi shogunate, which was located in the capital, often fled. In the first half of the 16th century, Tsuchimikado uh, Arinobu evacuated his territory, which he had never visited in peacetime, to Notaoi, uh, Natasho Wakasa province. Uh, three generations of the uh, Tsuchimikado family, Tsuchimikado Arinobu, his son Tsuchimikado Ariharu, and his grandson Tsuchimikado Arinaga were appointed as the head of Anmyo. However, they rarely served in the Heian Kyo and remained in Wakasa province to perform various rituals, including the festival of the great emperor of the sacred mountain of the east. As a result, the imperial court was baffled and had no choice but to summon Kade no Koji Aritomi, a member of the Kade no Koji clan, to report on various matters. In this way, the operation of the Bureau of Anmyo became extremely unnatural. Later, as the Toyotomi clan established its power through the Oda clan, Toyotomi Hideyoshi, the chief imperial advisor Emeritus, ostracized his adopted son, Toyotomi Hideitsugo, and had him disemboweled. Tsuchimikado Isanaga, son of Tsuchimikado Arinaga, was blamed for undertaking a prayer service for Toyotomi Hiritsugo and was exiled to Owari province. Furthermore, uh, Toyotomi Hideyoshi suppressed a large number of Anmyoji. Therefore, the position of the head of Anmyo and below became practically vacant and An Anmyoji did not operate in the center of the Toyotomi administration. The Anmyodo that had existed since the Heian period completely lost its reality. With the complete collapse of the Ritsuryo system and the suppression of Toyotomi Hideyoshi, the Anmyoji as an official position in the Bureau of Anmyo lost its presence. However, Anmyodo with the, the natural science, which had until then been supposedly considered classified information, was widely leaked to the private sector 
and numerous private onmyoji were active throughout Japan. For this reason, in the middle and modern periods, the term onmyoji no longer referred to the bureaucrats of the Bureau of Anmyo, but rather to the unofficial onmyoji who received private requests and performed blessings, prayers, and divination. Furthermore, Anmyodo fused with popular beliefs and folk rituals in various regions, and each of them underwent their own changes. Around this time, from the end of the Kamakura period to the beginning of the northern and southern courts period, early 14th century to early 15th century, the book Sangoku Soden Inyo Kankatsu Hoki Naiden Kino Gyokutoshu, written under the name of Abe no Semi, became as widely known as a book of private on Myodo, which were linked to the belief in Gozutano. And from this time onward, some private on Myoji who moved from uh, place to place without having a fixed residence were regarded as lowly as other non settled people. As for, of course, the term uh, gozoteno, that is, uh, if I remember the reference, a... What was it my mother said? It's uh, basically the ox-headed heavenly king. It's a syncretic Japanese deity of disease and healing originally imported to Japan from mainland Asia, of course. Gozuteno was originally in the Polynesian Goshirja. Goshirja, an Indian deity, the guardian deity of Gion Shoja, the Jetavana monastery. Uh, so, you could say that in another interpretation, in Japanese Shinto, as a kami god, Gozu Teno is the Honji Shuijaku, the original substance, the manifest traces of Suzano, one of the original gods, like the titans of ancient Greece whom the gods made the world from after killing them and using their body parts as uh, for constructing and creating the new universe of man that would make life possible for man. It's a combinatory kami. Uh, Gozuteno, a product of kami Buddha combinatory religion, uh, worshipped as, well, literally, the name was Oxhead Heaven King. So, uh, consider that for a vision. Uh, it's, uh, basically, Gozuteno is a Japanese plague deity, historically conflated, with Susan Law. Uh, and uh, this is something that, of course, um, I'll have to look through some more notes and then try and, well, uh, basically see what else that brings out of the attic of my mind. From this time forward, some private on Myoji moved from place to place without having a fixed residence. And um, they were sometimes, well, they were sometimes called doctors. But there were also those who claimed to be on, on Myoji and traveled around Japan on the pretext of offering mediumship and necromancy services. You know, the uh, ability to talk to, uh, uh, commune with, or even raise the dead. Uh, that be necromancy. Charging high fees for their prayers and divinations. The word on Myoji has since become widely known as an extremely occult well, some would say almost fishy image. Uh, but we've had the revival of the official Anmyoji and the rise of the private Anmyoji in the early modern period to compensate for that. After the death of Toyotomi Hideyoshi and the defeat of the Western Army at the Battle of Sekigahara in 1600, the momentum of the Toyotoma family weakened. Uh, Suchimikado Hisenaga was then granted the right by Tokugawa Ieyasu to administer a total of 107 koku and six 
to, well, covering the villages of Kaide, uh, Otokuni County, uh, Yamashiro Province, the present-day Kaide, uh, Muko City, uh, in the Kyoto Prefecture, uh, Terado, uh, Otokuni County, the present-day Terado, where Muko City be, uh, Umekoji, the Kadono County, the Yamashiro Province, or the present-day uh, Umekoji uh, in the Shimogoyo, or Shimagyo Ward, the, again, Kyoto City, Kyoto Prefecture. Uh, Sain in the Kadono County, the present day Sain in the uh, Yukio ward of Kyoto City. And uh, Kishoin, uh, the Ki County, the Yamashiro Province in the, well, that would be the present day Kishoin in the Minami ward of Kyoto City. At any rate, he returned to Imperial Court with uh, 177 Koku and 6 uh, to administer he had a fiefdom. Obviously, at this point, he was like a warlord. Uh, you couldn't call him samurai, so you could only say, uh, well, uh, a cult lord, a lore lord. And when the Tokugawa shogunate was established by Tokugawa Iyoyasu in 1603, the Suchimikado family was officially recognized by the shogunate as the head of the Anmyodo sect and was in charge of geomorphology, uh, feng shui, in the well, geomancy, uh, in the construction and layout of facilities for the development of the Yedo area. And later, Amyodo was also used in the construction of the Niko Toshugu Shrine. The shogunate also began to control the activities of private Anmyoji, which were flourishing in various parts of Japan at the time, with the aim of controlling folk religion uh, to prevent the spread of rumors. The shogunate tried to uh, use two Anmyoji families from the Heian period, the Kamo and Abe family, to give authority to its measures. In addition to the Suchimikado family, which survived as a descendant of the Abe family, the shogunate planned to re-establish the Kotokui family, which was a descendant of the Kamo family and a branch of the defunct Kade Lokoji family, and to have the two families control the private Anmyoji in various regions. Bring the um, wandering sheepdogs back into the fold. With this maneuver, uh, Suchimikado family seized the opportunity of the death of Kotokui uh, Tomosuki in 1682 to effectively eliminate the uh, Kotokui family, and once again monopolize the various positions in the Bureau of Anmyo. And in addition to the patronage they received from the imperial court, they succeeded in getting the Tokugawa shogunate, the de facto government, to grant them the sole right to control Anmyoji throughout the empire of Japan. Uh, yes, uh, uh, those who dare win. Uh, it's... Uh, uh, well, victory favors the bold. And uh, that, let me check into an incoming uh, message here. Uh, wonderful lady. Uh, and uh, she does say that uh, myself and my blood boy are beautiful. Or at least one of us. I'm not quite sure if she's referring to one of us or both. <laughs> I hope. I hope to Dwayne. It's fine by me. Uh, or, let's see now. 11 to 12, we got about an hour left. And uh, taking you throughout the history of the secret society that ruled Japan, uh, I hope all of you uh, can appreciate uh, the gift I'm giving you, but most of you probably don't. <laughs> it's probably far too uh, complicated for most of you to uh, follow through. Uh, but uh, anyhow, as I said, fortune favors the bold. Uh, in addition, as I said, uh, well, the uh, Suchimikado family uh, thereafter exercised their exclusive right to issue licenses to Anmyoji. Not as Anmyoji, but as students of Anmyodo from all over Japan, and became the official Grand Masters, making their presence felt. And furthermore, the Anmyodo took on the form of Shinto in its appearance and came to be widely known as the Tinsha uh, Suchimikado Shinto. And the Suchimikado family reached its peak 
in wartime samurai society, Amyodo was largely neglected, but under the peaceful Tokugawa shogunate, it was incorporated into the rituals of the shogunate and became a subject of study by shogunate bureaucrats as a precedent for the past. Uh, Anmyoji in various regions were also active with the Oga Sawara family of the Saiwa Genji clan, a samurai Anmyoji and others repeatedly fusing and changing their beliefs with the folklore of various regions. And throughout the Yedo period, it became quite popular among the people as a folk religion. In 1684, uh, Shibukawa Shunkai, an astronomer for the Tokugawa shogunate, completed the first calendar made by Japanese, the Jokyo calendar. The Zhuanming calendar, which had been in use for 823 years, was reformed by the Jokyo calendar, and the uh, Tsuchimikado family lost the authority to arrange the calendar to the Tokugawa shogunate. After 70 years later, well, about 70 years and on, in 1755, the calendar was reformed again when Tsuchimikado Yasukuni created the Horyaku calendar. The Tsuchimikado family regained the authority to arrange and reformed the calendrical system. However, the Horyaku calendar had many flaws and was considered to be rather inferior to the scientifically created Jokyo calendar. Later, the astronomical department established under the Tokugawa shogunate's temple and shrine magistrates, regained control and created the Tenpo calendar, which was said to be considerably more accurate than the Tsuchimikado family's Horyaku calendar, or even the Jokyo calendar, which was considered more accurate than the Horyaku calendar. The policy of eliminating Anmyoji in modern times came about after that, and then we still had the phenomenon of modern Anmyoji, which my mother would personify. So after Tokugawa Yoshinobu, the last shogun of the Tokugawa shogunate, returned power to Emperor Meiji in the Meiji era, after the Japanese Civil War, contemporary with the American Civil War, in which the emperor took back all secular power, Taking advantage of the confusion of the Meiji Restoration, Tsuchimikado Haurua, the head of Anmyo, requested that the astronomical department be confiscated by the Bureau of Anmyo, and this was granted, expropriating all of the authority for astronomical observation and map survey. A cartomancy, of course, being still very conflated with cartography. Later, sensing that the government of Meiji Japan was planning to introduce the Western-style Gregorian calendar, Tsuchimikado Harua insisted on the Meiji Reformation, or the Meiji Reformation of the calendar itself, to maintain the existing lunisolar calendar. But the proposal was never taken up due to his death. On the contrary, when the leaders of the government of Meiji Japan received a proposal from Tsuchimikado Harua to reform the calendar, those who were advocating the introduction of Western civilization opposed it, saying that the, un, well, the Anmyodo should be eliminated because there was a strong risk that the Bureau of Anmyo would become the center of opposition to the introduction of modern science to promote the introduction of advanced Western technology to develop the country and strengthen military power. In addition, in direct rule by the emperor, there can be no barbarism in which a vassal exercises real authority over the emperor himself, nor any impertinence in which he directs the emperor's actions. Moreover, it is inexcusable that Anmyodo, a technique of foreign, it is Chinese origin, should be used in spite of the existence of Japan's Shinto. This argument resonated with both the pure Shintoists and the exclusionists, and the majority of them thereafter rejected on Myodo. Furthermore, Tsuchimikado Herinaga, who became the head of Anmyo after the death of his father, Tsuchimikado Harua, was still a very young boy and could not spontaneously refute these claims. 
The government of Meiji, Japan, took advantage of this period to force the abolition of the Bureau of Anmyo in 1870 and transferred its duties of astronomical observation and calendrical arrangement to the Astronomical and Calendar Bureau of the University, uh, well, the University of Tokyo, uh, the Navy Hydrographic Bureau of the Ministry of War, the Astronomical Bureau of the Ministry of Education, and the Observatory. Tsuchimikado Harinaga, the former head of Anmyo, was disappointed, well, but he was also appointed as the official in charge of the Astronomical Bureau of the University of Tokyo. But he was soon thereafter relieved of this position at the end of 1870. And astrology, Anmyo, and the calendars were completely removed from the hands of the Tsuchimikado family. On the 9th of December, in 1870, a decree was issued banning the Tensha Tsuchimikado Shinto and the spread of Anmyodo to the civilian population as it was considered a superstition. In the scientific age, the festival of the Deva and Naraka is an Anmyodo ritual that had always been performed from the time of Emperor Goyozi back in 1571 when he, well, came into reign. His death was 1617. Until the reign of Emperor Kome, who reigned from 1831 through 1867, uh, the last emperor of the Yedo period. And it was not performed by Emperor Meiji who reigned from 1852 through to 1912. The Tokugawa shoguns, like the emperors, have always performed the festival every time they were given the position of shogun by the emperors. You know, they had to go to the emperor for the consecration as shogun, uh, the generalissimo of uh, Japan. The Tsuchimikado family lost their official position in charge of Anmyodo, and also lost the exclusive right to issue the license. And although they had no choice but to further transform the Tensa Tsuchimikado Shinto into more Shinto, well, they had to get more Shintoistic, uh, they were deprived of their influence over private Anmyoji in various regions. And since the ban by the government of Meiji Japan, there has been no official event derived from Anmyodo and there has been no popularity of Anmyodo in the private sector either. This is, of course, all outside of the Kurumaku, the Black Curtain. This is all uh, in public eyes. However, in reality, calendars derived from the Anmyodo still circulated unofficially with calendrical notes, gaining popularity and walking on their own. In particular, the Twelve Directions were heavily used, and there were many people who referred to them in rituals and codes of conduct. After the Greater East Asian Pacific War, what you whites know as World War II, and the official repeal of the laws and ordinances prohibiting Anmyodo, with the repeal of the old laws and ordinances of the Meiji era, the Six Days, one of the calendrical notes once used by Anmyoji, were preferred to the Twelve Directions, and often appear on many calendars, but this is only used as a supplement. As for calendars related to fortune, the Takashima calendar, unrelated to the Jingu calendar of Issei Karan Shrine, of Takashima's I Ching divination, no relation to uh, Keiman Takashima, a businessman, an I Ching diviner of the Meiji era, by Jingu Khan, who's a publisher in Taito City uh, in Tokyo Metropolis. It's all relatively popular, but this is hardly on Myodo. And today, there be few people who rely on the arts of Anmyodo for general guidelines for behavior, and there is no trace of the authority of Anmyoji that once flourished. The Association of Tensei Tsuchimikado Shinto still exists in the Oe town uh, in the western part of Fukui Prefecture in the area of Natasho in Wakasa province, which used to be the territory of the Tsuchimikado family as a religious organization that retains elements of Anmyodo, but it is far removed from the Anmyodo of the middle to late Heian period. Other than that, there are only a few vestiges of Anmyodo 
surviving in local anmyoji, such as the Izanagi School in Kami City, which was, well, that was formerly Manobe Village in the Kochi Prefecture. And based on the occult image of the spellbinding anmyoji of the Heian period, various creative works and characters uh, have been created through manga and anime, meaning comic books and animated feature films, and uh, syndicated uh, television serials, uh, etc., uh, to create, well, these were all generated to exaggerate their superhumanity and peculiarity. In particular, from the late 1990s to the early 2000s, Anmyoji became popular and many works were created. But as for the rituals in Anmyodo, as Anmyodo itself has diversified over time, its rituals have also not been uniform. Since the rituals of Anmyodo, including its influence with other religions, are still in the process of research, it's difficult to describe them in detail. When Anmyodo was first introduced to Japan, it is thought that it was strongly influenced by the so-called Jugando, and uh, uh, basically, of course, that is a school of thought that I have looked into because of its mention by my late and sainted mother. Uh, and uh, from what I can uh, find out about it, of course, it's esoteric Buddhism and uh, the Tantras of East Asia. Uh, basically, uh, it's Buddhist as opposed to Taoist teachings as applied uh, uh, to uh, the system of protective rituals and exorcisms, that is Jugondo. Uh, and uh, so uh, that's the best way to understand that. When Anmyodo was first introduced to Japan, it's um, influenced by uh, this so-called Jugondo. And uh, that's how my mother knew of it. We're talking about a tradition going back thousands of years that uh, she uh, taught myself as much as possible. Now, in the uh, Anmyo Yor, well, I think it was the An, Anmyo Yor, Anmyo Yor Shiki, the, uh, that's literally the procedures of the Bureau of Anmyo, uh, Anmyo Yor Shiki. That's, uh, there is a book uh, entitled Ingi Shiki, in which there is a record of the festivals held by Anmyoji in the court. According to that, there are the Nuofolk religion, uh, Nuofolk, uh, Setubun, a Bonfire, the Kitchen God Festival, very much a part of Chinese culture that my mother adored, uh, the Death Anniversary Festival of the previous emperor, the New Year's Festival, and so on. Among them, in the Nuofolk religion, it is said that an Anmyoji goes to a stage, reads the ritual text, the first half of which is a classical Chinese text read aloud, and the second half is a declaration, like liturgical incantations. In addition, the medieval book uh, Bunkancho gives an overview of several rituals. The rituals of Anmyodo consisted of large, medium, and small rituals, and it seems they were used in many different ways depending on the situation. Among the representative rituals of Anmyodo are the Festival of the Great Emperor of the Sacred Mountain of the East, which is held to honor Dongyue Dadi, the, uh, or Dongye Dadi, the ruler of human life, and the Festival of the Deva and Naraka, which was held every time an emperor ascended the throne. Uh, the Bunkancho also mentions that there were various other Anmyodo rituals. Uh, the texts of some of these rituals are still extant. So, uh, in any case, uh, and um, going back to the bomb, and back to uh, the attempts to uh, bomb uh, the Japanese out of existence, now you know why the Americans were unable to touch the emperor, was because of the practitioners of magic that had been now taken off the books, hidden behind the Kuromaku, the uh, Kuromaku, the Black Curtain, and uh, preserved by the emperor to protect his family alone, and uh, thereby his dynasty and the palace, and all of their attention being devoted to that in terms of his personal attendance, uh, 
and only a few like my mother who were loose upon the world in a more wandering sense. Uh, you can see how the emperor survived the firebombing of Tokyo and how the Americans even gave up on the idea of nuking it. But in any case, and most telling in all too many ways, spanning the spectrum from inhumanity through incompetence to the mass insanities of collective auto-delusion, the minutes of the uh, target uh, group that was to decide which Japanese city was to be attacked by nuclear terrorism the minutes of that meeting quite misleadingly noted that Tokyo had been struck from the list because it was already rubble. Now, Joyce C. Stearns foremostly advised that Kyoto, which was a large industrial city with a population of one million, met most of the committee's criteria. Thousands of Japanese people and industries had moved there to escape destruction elsewhere, Furthermore, Kyoto's psychological advantage as a cultural and intellectual center made the residents more likely to appreciate the significance of such a weapon as the gadget. That, of course, is insane when the idea was to exterminate all of them and none of them would be alive to appreciate its significance. It's a self-defeating purpose. But then again, the entire war was on the part of the Americans. Now, Stearns second mostly recommended Hiroshima, a city of 318,000, which held similar appeal. It was an important army depot and port of embarkation, situated as it was in the middle of an urban area of such a size that a large part of the city could be extensively damaged. Now, Hiroshima, the biggest of these unattacked targets, was surrounded by hills that were likely to produce a focusing effect which would considerably increase the blast damage. And on top of this, the Ota River, made it uh, not a good incendiary target, raising the likelihood of its preservation for the atomic bomb. Now, that meeting barely touched on the two cities' military attributes, if any. They were attacking these cities solely on the basis of cultural treasuries as repositories of human culture. Groves, of course, was not at the May 10th meeting, but had already earlier insisted that Kyoto, Japan's ancient capital, whilst possessing no significant military installations whatsoever, boasted instead its cultural treasury of beautiful wooden shrines and temples, which recommended it as both sentimental and highly combustible. Now, Hiroshima's port and main industrial and military districts were located outside the urban regions, to the southeast of the city. So the gentlemen, if you can call them that, these mass murderers in conspiracy, unanimously agreed that the bomb should be dropped on a large urban center, the psychological impact of which should be spectacular to ensure international recognition of this new weapon. So these men are thinking like terrorists. A grand slam to impress the world with a terrorist attack. And the target committee, as it was known, regrouped at the Pentagon on May 28th, 1945, Oppenheimer sending a representative in place of himself, and the members concentrated on the aiming points within the targeted cities. The plane carrying the atomic bomb should avoid trying to pinpoint military or industrial installations because they were small spread on fringes of city and quite dispersed. Instead, air crews should endeavor to place the gadget in the center of selected city. In other words, the residential areas, the financial areas, where all the people were instead of the military. They were quite explicit about this. The plane should target the heart of a major city, hit the population, not the military. One reason was that the aircraft had to release the bomb from a great height, some 30,000 feet to escape the shock wave and avoid the radioactive cloud. That limited the target to large urban areas easily visible from the air. Now, Captain William Deke Parsons, Associate Director of Los Alamos's Ordnance Division, 
gave another reason to drop the bomb on a city center. The human and material destruction would be obvious. And of course, uh, a simple act of terrorism. This is the greatest impact on the human soft target. The human target. So, uh, it asked, an intact urban area would show off the bomb to greatest effect. Now, whether the bomb hit soldiers, ordnance, and munitions factories, while desirable from a publicity point of view, was completely incidental to this line of thinking, and it did not influence the final decision. McGeorge Bundy, a Washington insider who later became John F. Kennedy's national security advisor, later wrote that, no one on the target committee ever recommended any other kind of target. And while every city proposed had quite traditional military objectives inside it, the true object of attack was always the city itself. The population was the battlefield. The target committee dismissed all talk of giving prior warning or demonstration of the bomb to Japan, Parsons had persistently rejected suggestions of a non-combat demonstration. In September of 1944, he had warned that even the crater would be singularly unimpressive and that the reaction of observers to a desert shot would be one of intense disappointment. Groves shared his contempt for tender souls who advocated a non-combat demonstration. When the meeting ended, the committee had no doubt about where the first atomic bomb would fall on the heads of hundreds of thousands of civilians. During June, the target committee narrowed that choice. On the 15th, a memo elaborated on Kyoto's attributes. It was a typical Jap city with a very high proportion of wood in the heavily built up residential districts. There were few fire resistant structures. It contained universities, colleges, and areas of culture that's the reference to all the Shinto shrines and churches, as well as factories and war plants, which were in fact small and scattered, and in 1945 of negligible use. Nevertheless, the committee placed Kyoto higher on the updated reserved list of targets, that is, those preserved from uh, Curtis LeMay's firebombing. Kokura, too, made the reserved list. That city possessed one of Japan's Largest arsenals. It was the national arsenal, replete with military vehicles, ordnance, heavy naval guns, and, of course, uh, poison gas. It was the most obvious military target. But nobody cared. Another high-powered group ran in parallel with the target committee. The interim committee of top officials convened by the Secretary of War, Henry Stimson, to advise the president on the future of nuclear power for military and civilian use. On paper, the interim committee looked omnipotent. Its permanent members included Stimson himself, James Burns, the president's personal representative, pending his appointment as Secretary of State, and various other top military and civilian officials. The scientists Oppenheimer, Arthur Compton, Ernest Lawrence and Enrico Fermi sat on the committee's scientific panel. General George Catlett Marshall, Army Chief of Staff, and Leslie Groves himself received open invitations, well, open invitations to attend the meetings. In practice, the committee's influence ebbed away. The problem was Stimson. The war secretary anchored his authority to the committee's success and personally invited the members. Some turned up as a courtesy, but attendance levels swiftly declined. Groves attended but once. The immediate demands of the atomic mission preoccupied him. He had little time for Stimson's visionary talk about the future of atomic power. There was a war to be won. At 10 a.m. on the 31st of May, the committee members filed into the dark-paneled conference room of the War Department, back when America had one, before they lost the war, the air was heavy with the presence of three Nobel laureates and Oppenheimer. Stimson opened those proceedings on a portentous note, going on the record of who in tone. We do not regard it as a new weapon merely, but as a revolutionary change in the relations of man to the universe. The atomic bomb might mean the doom of civilization, or a Frankenstein that might eat us up, or it might secure world peace. The bomb's implications went far beyond the needs of the present war. 
It must be controlled and nurtured in the service of peace. This was already a god. This was a god to Americans. This was their god. Oppenheimer was invited to review the explosive potential of the bombs. Two were being developed. Of course, uh, the one stolen from the Axis was, quote unquote, pre-developed, you know, like a pre-owned car, (laughs) you know, like used. Uh, And that, of course, was a fissile uranium bomb. The plutonium bomb was American made. They used different detonation methods and processes. Yet both were expected to deliver payloads ranging from 2,000 to 20,000 tons of TNT. Nobody yet knew their precise power. Uh, Nobody was there from the Allies to measure uh, their effect on uh, the field of battle in Europe itself, where it had been deployed. Uh, More advanced weapons might measure up to 100,000 tons and super bombs, thermonuclear weapons, 10 million to 100 million tons of TNT, as Oppenheimer uh, so calculated. The scientists all nodded impassively. They were inured to such fantastical figures. The incoming Secretary of State Burns, as he later admitted, however, that the numbers and the destruction they implied thoroughly frightened him. He was human, after all, but beyond his horror at the statistics, he silently ruminated on the wisdom, actually the madness, of any talk of sharing the secret with Moscow. As such, Barons, the politician resolved to pursue his go-it-alone policy for America that would pointedly exclude the Russians, and indeed the rest of the world, theoretically, from the atomic secret, which the Axis already had. The bomb's power would be the future source of American power. Discussion flared on the question of whether to share the secret with Russia, by which point Stimson had left for another meeting. Oppenheimer advocated divulging the secret in the most general terms. He'd rather lamely observed that Moscow had always been friendly to science, but that he himself felt strongly that we should not prejudge the Russian attitude. Marshall wondered, too, whether a combination of like-minded powers might control nuclear power. The general even suggested that Russian scientists be invited to witness the bomb test at Alamogordo, scheduled for July. Now, such talk alarmed Barron's who had observed the Russians at close quarters at Yalta, and Groves, who was violently opposed to sharing with Moscow a secret he had spent almost four years trying to keep, Baron swooped, arguing thusly that if we were to give information to the Russians, even in general terms, Stalin would demand a partnership role and a stake in the technology. Indeed, not even the British possessed blueprints of America's atomic factories. Barons then wrapped up the argument. America should push ahead as fast as possible in nuclear production and research to make certain that we stay ahead and at the same time make every effort to better our political relations with Russia. And all agreed. If anyone noticed this first official recognition of the start of a nuclear arms race, not with the British and the French colonial empires or the greater Soviet Union, but with the Axis both in Asia and in exile, they didn't say so. And after lunch, the meeting's participants, minus Marshall, examined the next point on the agenda. One member of the committee wondered aloud if the effect of the bombing of the Japanese and their will to fight, well, for all practical purposes, would the nuclear impact ultimately differ much from any incendiary raid? And stung by the suggestion that mere firebombs were in any way comparable, Oppenheimer objected that That rather missed the point, so saying, the visual effect of the atomic bomb would be tremendous. It would be accompanied by a brilliant luminescence, which would rise to a height of 10,000 to 20,000 feet. The neutron effect of the explosion would be dangerous to life for a radius of at least two-thirds of a mile. The same could not be said of LeMay's jellied petroleum raids. Oppenheimer estimated that 20,000 people would instantly die in the attack. Now, Stimson, meanwhile, was personally preoccupied with saving Kyoto, the ancient capital whose temples and shrines he had visited with his wife in 1926, when my mother was but three years old. He requested that it be, well, she was two, actually, having been born in December of 23. Now, he requested that Kyoto be struck from the short list of targets. Uh, Japan was not just a place on a map or a nation that must be defeated, he insisted, The objective, surely, was military damage, not civilian lives. In Stimson's mind, the bomb should be used as a weapon of war in the manner prescribed by the laws of war and dropped on a military target. 
Stimson argued that Kyoto must not be bombed. It lies in the form of a cup and thus would be exceptionally vulnerable. It is exclusively a place of homes and art and shrines. Now, with the exception of Stimson on Kyoto, which was essentially an aesthetic objection, not one of the committee men raised the ethical, moral, or religious case against the deployment of a nuclear bomb without warning on an undefended city. The businesslike tone, the strict adherence to form, the cool pragmatism did not admit humanitarian arguments in the American mind. However vibrantly they lived in the minds and diaries of several of the men present so they could simply redeem themselves to history. Total War had debased everyone involved. The historian Barton J. Bernstein observed that while older men, such as Marshall and Stimson, shared a fading nostalgia for a bygone age of moral clarity when soldiers fought soldiers in open combat and spared civilians, they now faced a newer morality that stressed holistically total war, meaning that everything was to be destroyed. In truth, the American Civil War and the Great War of Europe gave the lie to that older morality, as both men knew. Marshall recommended, for example, on May 29th, in discussion with Assistant Secretary of War John McCloy, the deployment of gas to destroy Japanese units on outlying Pacific Islands, saying, just drench them and sicken them so that the fight would be taken out of them, saturate an area, possibly with mustard, and just stand off. He meant to limit American casualties with whatever means available. If he drew on outdated civilized values, Stimson grasped the moral implications of nuclear war. The idea of the bomb tormented him so much that he sought comfort in the notion of recruiting a religious evangelist to appeal to the souls of mankind and bring about a spiritual revival of Christian principles based on the bomb. America, he believed, was losing its moral compass, just as it might be about to claim military supremacy over the world. The dawn of the atomic era called for a deeper human response, he believed, energized by a spirit of cooperation and compassion based upon nuclear power. And he pointedly refused to act on his own professed compulsion, but instead uh, dwelt long uh, about putting on airs regarding the atomic question. And the question was not, will this weapon kill civilians, but rather, will any civilians even remain? He poured all of his affected anxiety into his diary, but to cover his name for sake of posterity. Officially, Stimson uh, was, of course, quite fine with the idea of racial genocide. Uh, if you were to look at what he tried to save his soul with in his diary, compared to everything he wrote on formal paper, he was completely contradictory and muddled. In the meetings, he summarized his position on the bomb thusly. One, we could not give the Japanese any warning. Two, we could not concentrate on a civilian area. Three, we should seek to make a profound psychological impression on as many of the inhabitants as possible, uh, notwithstanding the fact none of them would be left alive if his whims about the bomb that it was total in its annihilation were ever to be proven true. He meant to use the bomb to shock the enemy, to make a profound impression, with a display of devastation so horrible that Tokyo would be forced to surrender However, he insisted that it must be a military target. His statement's inherent contradiction. How could the bomb shock Tokyo without concentrating on a civilian area? Either eluded Stimson, or he lacked the intellectual honesty to confront it. Whatever the case, it provoked no comment in the interim committee meeting, and he used the task of James Conant, a prominent scientist on said committee, who was then quoted as saying, the most desirable target would be a vital war plant employing a large number of workers and closely surrounded by all the workers' houses so their families would be annihilated with them. Stimson persuaded himself that this meant a military target. The physicists on the committee's scientific panel agreed. 
Groves ticked off another victory for his anti-gods, to whom he has pledged his liege and allegiance and life and limb and earthly worship. And the war secretary's self-deception was complete. A slightly surreal atmosphere lingered as the men reflected on what they had done. The meeting that had opened with Stimson's declaration of mankind's new relationship with the universe ended with his approval of the first atomic attack on the center of a city to which he consented moments after he had rejected the bombing of civilians. Thus the committee unanimously agreed that the atomic bombs should be used 1. As soon as possible 2. Without warning and 3. On war plants surrounded by workers' homes or other buildings susceptible to damage in order to make a spectacular impression on as many inhabitants as possible, even though theoretically none would be left alive to impress. And so on the 1st of June in 1945, President Harry Truman rose early to prepare a statement for Congress. It was a bright summer's day, and he chose one of his three new seersucker suits, a gift from uh, New Orleans Cotton Company. You know, back from his Ku Klux Klan's days, where they said, oh, despite the end of slavery, this cotton was still picked by niggers. I shit you not. The president felt refreshed after hosting the Prince Regent of Iraq at a state dinner a few nights earlier. He had spent Memorial Day on the presidential yacht, cruising the Potomac, playing poker, and approving his speech for the San Francisco Conference on the Creation of the United Nations as a peace organization, the peace branch thereof, to be established in New York, then in session. That June morning, Truman received Burns' summary of the previous day's marathon interim committee meeting. Uh, Barons had skillfully exploited his position as the president's special representative, laying stress where he saw fit, emphasizing the consensus on the weapon's use and, in effect, relegating Simps, well, Stimson to the sidelines. Barnes' upbeat assessment fortified the president himself for what many feel was the most important speech of his wretched life. Truman told the rapt house, there can be no peace in the world until the military power of Japan is destroyed. If the Japanese insist on continuing resistance beyond the point of reason, their country will suffer the same destruction as Germany. But the fate of individual cities was still being decided. That month, Stimson asked Leslie Groves, then in his office on a different matter, whether the target list had been finalized and was disturbed to see Kyoto at the top of the list. Again, he ordered it struck off. Groves obfuscated. These meddlesome politicians irked him. The destruction of Kyoto was his to decide. He felt a sense of proprietorial control over how the bomb should be deployed. In his own words, the city was large enough an area for us to gain complete knowledge of the effects of the atomic bomb, Hiroshima was not nearly so satisfactory in this respect. For weeks, Groves continued to refer to Kyoto as a target, despite Stimson's clear instructions to the contrary. By the way, constitutionally, the military is supposed to be under civilian control. This shows just the opposite in effect. Then on the 30th of June, Leslie Groves very reluctantly informed the chiefs of staff that Kyoto had been eliminated as a possible target for the atomic fission bomb and all bombing by direction of the Secretary of War himself. That left but four cities on the target list. Hiroshima, Kokura, Niigata, and Nagasaki, listed in order of how well they conformed to the target committee's criteria. Nagasaki, being hilly, was not ideal, but its Mitsubishi shipyards, then out of use, by the way, where Japan's huge battleships had once been built, gave it a strong symbolic appeal. On the 25th of July in 1945, Leslie Groves finalized these targets in a directive issued to, well, for Carl Spatz, the commanding general of the United States Strategic Air Forces in the Pacific. The 509th Composite Group, 
20th Air Force will deliver its first special bomb as soon as weather will permit visual bombing after about the 3rd of August 1945 on one of the targets. Additional bombs will be delivered on the above targets as soon as made ready. A clear weather report for the 6th of August made Hiroshima the preferred target on the list that day. Seventy years ago, the first atomic bomb fell on the city. Well, 76 years ago, actually, now that I think about that, I tend to round off my numbers. Now, Soviet records produced in the aftermath of the atomic bombings of Hiroshima and Nagasaki expose the continuing importance of those terror-targeted metropoles to Russian foreign policy. The documents I source were published for the first time in Russian circa 1990 within an issue of the Soviet journal International Affairs, number 8, which I have the link there onto, and the English version was included via, well, I can link uh, uh, Peter Moon to that if he needs to incorporate that in any book in the future. The Russian Ministry of Foreign Affairs brought renewed attention to these documents more recently on the fifth day in August of 2015, the same day that Sergei Narishkin, then chairman of the State Duma and director of the Russian Historical Society, was pointing a finger at the United States in his speech delivered at an event at Moscow's State Institute of International Relations, then commemorating the 70th anniversary of the atomic bombings on the Japanese cities in which he proclaimed, Nobody should allow themselves to forget the tragedy of Hiroshima and Nagasaki, and thereafter added that if those responsible for the bombings were not punished, there could be very, very serious consequences. And now, uh, as this August marks the 76th anniversary of the uh, atomic bombings of Hiroshima and Nagasaki, we are once again obligated to reflect on the political role of the weapon that inaugurated the nuclear age. And although they have been public for 30 years, new translations of these sources that I cite are now freely accessible on the Wilson Center's digital archive at digitalarchive.wilsoncenter.org. Named after Woodrow Wilson, the evilest man that ever lived, my own analysis will provide some historical and political context and offer an initial assessment of these documents. Now, before summarizing, well, let's start with this. In writing to the Soviet leadership, the Soviet ambassador to Japan, Yakov Malik, included a nine-page report resulting from a trip to Hiroshima and Nagasaki by a group of staff members sent by the Soviet embassy in September of 1945. The document was then circulated on the 22nd of November in 1945 by Foreign Minister uh, Vyacheslav Molotov to Stalin, uh, Lavrentiy Beria, at that point appointed as head of the Soviet atomic bomb project, a decision that could not have been more idiotic, but more on that another transmission, and Politburo members Georgi Malenkov and Anastav Mikoyan. Now, before summarizing the findings of the embassy mission, Malik offered the premise that the report was limited to a recording of conversations and personal impressions without any kind of generalizations or conclusions. However, it is clear from the beginning that this report had the objective of minimizing the effects of the atomic bomb. The first paragraph mocks the Japanese press for exaggerating the after-effects of the explosion, for giving in to popular rumor that takes press reports to absurdity. The Soviet report suggests that the exaggeration of the Japanese press stemmed from Japan's attempt to save face, like these Orientals do, in light of defeat. In fact, after the bomb was dropped on Hiroshima, on the 6th of August, the Japanese military's information division, in charge of media control, intended to announce that the bomb was an atomic one. However, the Department of the Interior opposed the disclosure of the nature of the weapon. That is why, on the 8th of August, Japanese newspapers first reported that 
the enemy used a new type of bomb in attacking Hiroshima, but the details are still under investigation. That's what it says in Japanese. Mm. Nothing about it being atomic. The phrasing of a new type of bomb in the Japanese, Shingara Bakudan, was used because the expression atomic bomb, Genshi Bakudan, was prohibited by the Japanese government during the war. The ban on the public use of that phrase was officially lifted when the war entered ceasefire negotiatory phase on the 15th of August, when the Americans sued for peace, which prompted Hiroshima's local newspaper, the Chugoku Shimbun, and yes, they still had a newspaper running after the bombing, to print a few photos of their destroyed city on August 23rd. The Weekly Illustrated magazine Asahi Graph also published a brief article on August 25th entitled, What is an Atomic Bomb? However, as soon as the Allied occupation of Japan, uh, that was to, of course, expedite its reconstruction on the part of Allied cleanup of the mess they made, came into effect on September 19th. The strict press code imposed by the general headquarters of the Supreme Commander for the Allied Powers as well as the aforementioned self-censorship imposed by the Japanese press upon itself, caused a delay in the way the atomic bombings were ever reported upon in Japan. The fact remains, most people didn't know that an atomic bomb had ever been dropped. So much for exaggeration in the press. Moreover, the atrocities of the bombs were never made graphically public to the Japanese people until August 6th of 1950 fucking 2. When, of course, after the San Francisco Treaty went into effect and the Japanese had won the war, Asahi Graph published the issue titled Genbaku Higai no Shikokai the first publication of the damages of the atomic bomb. Therefore, it is impossible to believe that by November of 1945, the Japanese press had any detailed, spontaneous reporting of the effects of the atomic bomb to exaggerate with. Now, in terms of these documents of the Soviets, the parts that are highlighted in this report with a line on the left-hand margin, are most noteworthy because, well, none of these sections are about damage to human beings. Rather, they are completely, uh, obsessively, about damage to inanimate objects. They note large-scale destruction of the city and damage to buildings, the hospital, gas storage tanks, the Mitsubishi plant, etc., and offer details on potential protection. Protective clothing against a uranium bomb includes rubber and any kind of insulation against electricity. Some of the highlighted parts even emphasize signs of life. Contrary to all the evidence, we saw how in various places the grass was beginning to turn green, and even on some scorched trees, new leaves were appearing. Such bizarre details <laughs> and information may have been useful for the Soviet atomic bomb project, pushing the internal narrative that the USSR needed its own weapon as soon as possible. However, it is striking that none of the people sent to Ground Zero in the immediate aftermath of the bombings were scientists or technicians. The embassy teams included GRU members, or military intelligence agents, Mikhail Ivanov and uh, German Sergiev, uh, that's his name was German, he wasn't German ethnically. This was in August. And Taz, the Soviet news agency correspondent, uh, Anatoly uh, Vorshevsky, the former acting military attache, Mikhail Romanov, and naval apparatus employee, Sergei Kikinin, in September. Most of these individuals were bureaucrats, which also explains the lack of scientific terms and any technical observations on the effects of radiation. Until 1949, 
When the USSR succeeded in testing its own bomb, the Soviet Union's knowledge of the effects of radiation were indeed very poor. The non-specialist staff sent to observe these effects, their biased premise, their total inattention to human life, <laughs> and the markings on the documents all suggest that the report was, from the beginning, meant to anticipate and align with Stalin's intention to downplay the importance of the United States' atomic bomb while pushing the Soviet Union's own nuclear project forward. The human horror was to be ignored completely. Humanity and human life was never an issue to the Russians of any concern. And certainly, it stayed that way today. The timing of the trip to Hiroshima, well, to Hiroshima and Nagasaki within 40 days of the bombings illustrates the Soviet race to obtain its own atomic bomb. But the timing of the 2015 re-release of these documents is also significant. It came at a time when Russo-American relations were suffering a major deterioration. Russia's annexation of the Crimea in February of 2014 escalated tensions between Washington and Moscow and changed the global perception of Russia's role in international politics. Russia's military intervention in Syria and Vladimir Putin's speech at the 70th United Nations General Assembly in September of 2015 further aggravated the Russo-American bilateral relations. Now, of course... Um, in my next transmission, I will speak to how uh, the United States and the Japanese Empire became allies, even after Hiroshima and Nagasaki. And, of course, this will take us into the trade wars with China, where all of this, of course, uh, reflects upon America's need for an oriental enemy at all times, some kind of Asian nemesis whom they must pit themselves against. Uh, okay, check out another comment on uh, the post here. Oh, that's so cute. Um, and of course, oh, there we are. There's the little fire hydrant of uh, Mr. Jameson Reese's home. Let me give that a heart. What a cute little fire hydrant. It's all green, and they were digging right underneath it. And you said this is all wires and shit? I presume he's awake. Well, well, they claimed that, well, they claimed that they wanted to uh, upgrade their Verizon lines and whatnot. But they did it on such a small area that I'm thinking, uh... That's bizarre! Yeah, that looks very suspect. <laughs> this shit is super... I mean, I mean, that crap is super suspect. And, and, and that's exactly why I said what I said, you know. Because it just seems super weird. Yeah, yeah, I get it, dude. It, it's, uh... Yeah, they're, they're, they're fucking with you. They're, they're like, uh... Well, obviously, this is your affiliation with myself, which brought this on. Um, so, uh, um, obviously, yeah, yes. yeah, yeah, yes. yeah, yeah. Because I mean, I mean, granted, I was I was targeted before then, but they weren't like installing weird doodads and trinkets everywhere. Yeah, this is a whole new level. No, what was going on before was you were being harassed. You were being yeah. harassed and yeah. gaslighted. You were being mobbed, uh, but that's yeah. different from this. You weren't being, uh, you know, technologically monitored and surveilled. Okay, so. Yeah, now, now I'm being technologically surveilled. I mean, I... Congratulations! Right, well, you know, I mean, you, you're, you're moving up. Yeah, you're, you, you've up. upped your game. Uh, <laughs> so, uh... Oh, man. Well, maybe, maybe they'll learn something. Yeah, yeah, I hope so. I mean, you know, like, uh, this is uh, something that one of these days Gary States and I will talk about our story and what happened to him. And, uh, you know, it all worked out well, really. And um, he was the one uh, that was, uh, he, that basically, um, well, again, later on I'll go into his story, but he's the one that helped lead to the death of uh, the Bukaki Beret, uh, Master Sergeant of the Green Berets, John Victor Lillier, uh, because <laughs> got his uh, benefits uh, revoked. And, uh, you know, after that, the guy had nothing to live on. 
uh, because he was just, uh, you know, a human piece of shit on uh, military welfare, thanks to, uh, you know, our taxpayer dollars. Um, but uh, well, there was there was something I wanted to say about that. I did notice though, uh, when one is casting spells to kill a target, there is something that causes the heart rate, the blood pressure to go up in the person in in the person casting the spell. Oh yeah. Uh, I don't know why that happens. I just know that it does happen, and uh, I'm fairly certain that it's a sort of a life for a life thing. It's mm -hmm. a sort of trade off. If you survive it and the other person dies, you're lucky. Uh, but uh, if you're someone unhealthy like that piece of shit was, yeah. there's no way he was going to survive. Well, he thought he was it. healthy, comparatively speaking. But, of course, he found out. <laughs> he found out the hard way. Um, the way that motherfucker looked. Well, he, well, you see, there's a, well, there's, there's a such thing as called over self-evaluation and yes. that's what he suffered from well it's the same as so many americans thinking they're olympic level quality physique right i mean yeah i'm not even close to olympic level i i, I couldn't even i couldn't even do i couldn't even do uh, uh, uh basic training air force basic training <laughs> anymore <laughs> I'm done, man. <laughs> Fuck that shit. I could walk a bazillion miles, but and you know, it's not like they have a walkathon in the Olympics. So, yeah, uh, I, 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 I don't know what the hell these uh, these Americans think they're smoking because almost like sixty percent of them are overweight. Yeah, it, how the hell are they Olympic level? It's it's part of like you know, it's like you drink enough beers and. Uh, uh, you know, you look in the mirror and you think you look 10 years younger. It's, 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 you know, it's pathetic. It's, um, uh, honestly, this is the level of a people who are deranged, uh, from, um, uh, deluding themselves in any number of ways. Uh, there's, uh, it's, it's just, uh, what can you say? There's nothing to say. It's, but it's funny as hell. And, um, it is. It is. There. There is some. Well, there is some degree of a uh, what a sadistic joy one can gather from the shit show that's going on in America. Oh yeah, and this and, population. Oh yeah, it, it, it's 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 morbid entertainment. Yeah. And by the way, did you see that one white guy who uh, was running? By the way, walkathons. Walking used to be a sport. Um, so someday it might be again if, you know, they made extreme sports uh, accepted in the Olympics. Maybe someday walking will be brought back. Uh, and uh, but in terms of uh, the, uh, uh, you know, one of the things I saw that was really weird uh, when I was with my son 